So I think we are live now. Doctor, we are live now. Yes. So good morning, everyone. I welcome you all on behalf of BOA and MOS for this summer focus virtual symposium. Uh, today is our uh, we are in Payman Hall oculoplasty session. So our chairman for today is Doctor Nirmala Subramanian, Madam. Co-chairman is Doctor V M Sastra Budde Sir. Convener is uh, Doctor Adit Gupta. Co-convener is Doctor Mukesh Sharma and myself, moderator Doctor Pravin Patil. So I think uh, if everyone is here, shall we start the session? Yes, please, definitely. Okay. So our first topic for today is uh, Doctor Adit Gupta is going to talk about the lateral canthus and minimal incision lateral canthoplasty. So I request Doctor Adit to start the session, please. Okay. Uh, is my screen visible now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's visible. Okay. I, I, I. A very good morning to everyone, and I thank uh, Team BOA and MOS for giving me this opportunity. Uh, as we all know that the lateral canthus is basically formed by the fusion of two limbs, the upper and the lower limb of the lateral raphe, which then go and fuse onto the lateral vitnal's tubercle. Now, the vitnal's tubercle also receives contributions from the uh, lateral horn of the levator muscle, the inferior capsulopalpebral fos fos uh, fascia, and also the lateral check ligament from the lateral rectus. Now, all this is important because this provides mobility and movement to the lateral canthus, which we'll see later on. Now, an ideal lateral canthus basically is situated around 1.5 to 2 millimeters above the medial canthus. It, is a, it has a sharp angle with gray line to gray line apposition, and there is absence of any length disparity with good tone to the lateral canthus. On the contrary, an aged lateral canthus is look, looks sagging. It lies well below the medial commissure. In this photo, you can see that it's almost 1 to 2 millimeters below and lacks adequate tone, leading to laxity and sometimes epiphone. Now on the end on view, you can see the difference between the two females, where you can see that the picture on the right hand side shows that the lateral canthus and the whole face as such looks aged. Now there are quick tests which we can do in the outpatient basis as well, which uh, give us a gross idea about the lateral canthal tendon and the inferior eyelid laxity. Distraction test being one of the most commonly used, wherein you pull the eyelid down and see if the eyelid distracts more than 8 to 10 millimeters, it is said to be grossly lax along with some component of lateral canthal laxity. But a more direct test would be to test the laxity of the lateral canthal tendon itself, wherein if you pull the lateral canthal tendon medially, you can see that the lateral canthus almost displaces right from the orbital rim, which is here, to almost here. Now, if it displaces beyond the lateral rimbus, it is said to be grossly lax. Similarly, a snapback test gives you a more about the of the lower eyelid and the orbital cell, wherein you pull the eyelid outwards and let it recoil on its own. If it doesn't recoil back spontaneously without a blink, then it is said to be lax. I additionally do a fluorescein dye test, wherein I put a, instill a drop of fluorescein dye into the uh, conjunctival caldi sac and look for egress of fluorescein from the lateral canthus. If this happens as seen here, then certainly there is some uh, issue of epiphora happening in this lady. Usually we get these patients very often in our OPD. One thing that we should not miss, especially nowadays with uh, the predominance of allergic eye disease and also predominance of sleep apnea syndrome is a floppy eyelid syndrome because these patients need special management. And these patients can be a, a mimicker of chronic dry eye because of frequent rubbing of the eyelid and in incongruous uh, globe and eyelid laxity. Here you can see that this young patient has uh, a fornix which can be seen in the in this picture and on pulling up the upper eyelid you can see that the lacrimal gland also is very often prolapsed in these patients. Now when we talk about uh, lateral cancel procedures traditionally what we would often do is the open procedures which is also the lateral tarsal strip which has been the most robust procedures whenever uh, we used to operate. Now a traditional canthoplasty usually uh, involved opening up the lateral canthus separating the limbs and then going ahead as seen here. Here we are doing a canthotomy along with inferior cantholysis. The periorbita is exposed and then a tarsal strip is fashioned in the lower eyelid. Here you can see that the tarsal strip is well fashioned and then it is uh, the conjunctiva is denuded and then reattached. Now although this is a very robust procedure, it can be avoided in cases where there is moderate laxity to mild laxity of the lateral canthus but because it can lead to formation of eyelid webs if the skin is tightened too much which then requires head plasty and web revision. Secondly, when we are shortening the inferior eyelid selectively, it can lead to imbrication of the eyelid, which can lead to ocular surface problems. 
now as we move from functional to cosmetic era do we actually need to separate the upper and the lower tendon especially in cases of functional epiphora and this is why closed procedures have been uh, developed which i'm going to basically be talking about but the third one which is minimal incision canthoplasty this is a short video just to demonstrate how this procedure is performed now in 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 minimal incision canthoplasty you cannot do it for certainly gross laxity like this patient where you would have to do a lateral tarsal strip but it is more reserved for patients uh, where uh, you see these cases where wherein because of chronic rubbing the eyelid has become lax and you get these patients coming into your opd with frequent watering from the lateral canthus along with skin changes on the lower eyelid so what happens in this procedure is that we uh, make a small 5 mm 4 to 5 mm incision well within the lateral uh, edge of the eyelid crease after the incision is made you expose the periorbita of the lateral orbital rim once the periorbita is exposed you need to look for the common canthal tendon now here you can see that i am exposing the periorbita the yellowish thing that you see is the periorbita it is a glistening structure and my forceps is well within the orbital rim so this is a good landmark to achieve after this is done with the help of a steven stenotomy scissor you just make a small tunnel so this tunnel is beneath the orbicularis and now i am approaching the canthal tendon now this is called as end glove lysis because we are doing it through a tunnel and the common canthal tendon is detached now i am not separating the upper and the lower uh, eyelid or or i am not separating the canthal tendon but i am just detaching the common canthal tendon and then the next step is making a raw surface for the uh, inferior and the common canthal tendon as seen here and after this a loop of 4o proline suture is then passed well within the rim and then externalized and a knot is tied which will be shown in the subsequent video so you make the same entry point for this loop of 4o uh, proline suture and then take a take a bite of the periorbita from within come outside similarly the second bite is passed in a similar manner through the same entry point and then to pass it via the periorbita and once this comes out you can tighten it here and you can see immediately that the lower eyelid is well uh, tightened and comes into position uh, this case was performed for an in ophthalmic socket where there was a laxity of the lower eyelid and you can see that the tone is good now uh, the good thing about this procedure is that in cases of revision blepharoplasties or eyelid retractions you can additionally perform a mini face mid face lift by tightening the sous so you expose the suborbicularis oculi fat pad and then the same thoro uh, proline suture is used to tighten the uh, sous and then hitch it up to the periorbita on the lateral uh, orbital rim now this this provides an additional support to what we have already done and is indicated in only a select few cases after that the incision is closed and this is how you can see uh, this is just a short this but you can see how the a uh, declivity of the lateral canthus improves and you can see that the eyelid is well snug as compared to the superior picture this is a case of revision blepharoplasty uh, where a general plastic surgeon had performed and a web was formed which had to be revised and then a lateral canthoplasty was performed you can see that the uh, shape of the eye is retrieved and this is a cosmetic uh, canthoplasty where a young female wanted a almond appearing eye is and this is how it looks at 3 weeks at 1 week it looks over corrected but then it drops down similarly this is again a cosmetic patient where a minimal incision lack we also published our data of long term follow up of this procedure where you can see that it doctor one minute more yeah i am almost done so it certainly stays uh, this the mean follow up in this was more than a year and you can see that uh, all the lateral canthal height as well as the inferior scleral show stays improved in these procedures even one to two years after follow up uh, this is a small descriptive uh, picture collage which shows the same results obviously these procedures where we lift are going to sag down because it's a rule of gravity so i expect that after 5 to 10 years this might be need to this might have to be revised if the patient's desire so to summarize uh, minimal incision canthoplasty is a good procedure uh, which avoids the risk of webbing scarring misalignment and lymphedema which is more more commonly seen in lateral tarsal strips it is useful for mild to moderate lower eyelid laxities and early ectropion cases uh it basically is uh, not indicated for floppy eyelid syndromes and for gross laxities or facial palsies where you would require an open procedure thank you thank you dr adit uh, for this nice presentation and now our next speaker is dr mukesh sharma he is going to talk about senile entropion management first so i request dr mukesh sharma to start please 
Good morning, everyone. Uh, my screen is visible to you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. So at the outset, I'm thankful to BOA and also to Sumit for having me here. So today, I shall be speaking on lower lid antropion, which is a fairly common procedure uh, condition. Uh, we all should be aware about lower lid anatomy before uh, entering in. And it is of paramount importance. We all know surface is the skin, then orbicularis, then we have got the septum as it is there in upper lid. It is not so well formed as it is formed in upper lid, but it is there. Behind septum, there is fat, and then there is capsulopalpable fascia. So but we all should be aware about these anatomical landmarks. Entropion and ectropion both are part of same disease process where we get horizontal lid laxity. If there is laxity of both posterior lamina as well as anterior lamina, then we get ectropion. But if there is laxity of uh, posterior lamina, but anterior lamina tone is intact, then we get entropion. A uh, fair amount of uh, idea about lid laxity can be done by uh, this pinch test. And Sometime we have got overriding of pre uh, septal orbicularis over pretarsus. You can see here, this is overriding of orbicularis. Pre septal orbicularis has overridden the pretarsus over uh, orbicularis, and this leads to the entropion. Now there are various treatment options. Uh, transfers everting sutures, which is kind of temporary procedure. It uh, when it is combined with the incision in the conjunctiva, then it is known as Weiss procedure. Then we have got Quickert procedure. Again, the extension of same procedure. Here we do transfer shortening also. Then Wheeler's procedures, lateral tarsal strip, and Jones procedure. So we shall briefly discuss these procedures one by one. Transfer everting suture, generally it is a temporary procedure and it is combined with other procedures if your correction is not that much. Very simple thing. Here you pass sutures through conjunctiva uh, around you know, fornix, much below the tarsus plate and you come out anteriorly close to the left line. So when you uh, tighten these sutures, you get eversion of lid. So this is a very simple procedure and you pass such three sets of sutures. When there is transfer split of lid along with these everting suture, then it is known as Weiss type of procedure. And when uh, along with this, there is a, a correction of horizontal lid shortening also, then it is known as Quickert procedure. Then there is a Wheeler's, another procedure, Wheeler's procedure, where we do double breasting of orbicularis muscle, but it is not favored that much because it create a bunching kind of appearance here. Then the Jones procedure, it's a very good procedure and it deals with the problem area. Basically you strengthen the lower lid retractor that is capsulopalpable fascia. Only thing is that wherever horizontal laxity is too much, then we have to go for LTS, lateral tarsal strip. Otherwise, this is a very good procedure. I'll show you a brief video about it. So this is the case of entropion. You can see overriding of tarsus plate. Then incision is made on skin. You can see orbicular is shining through. Now I am cutting the orbicularis also. You can use your scissors also to further cut it.
so you have cut skin and orbicularis now you will reach on to the septum so this is the septum which is not so well formed so it is incised and rudimentary fat which is there it has prolapsed out in some of the patients you get significant fat in other patients you don't have that much of fat so skin orbicularis septum fat and underneath is the capsular palpable fascia so you need to just plicate the capsular palpable fascia so again the septum fat and capsular palpable fascia so what is done is that you just plicate the capsular palpable fascia by passing three or four vicral sutures again the same so a vicral suture is passed posteriorly then you take one bite anteriorly you also include orbicularis into it and come out so you pass three sets of such sutures just measure your tightness and finally you also resect out some amount of skin and orbicularis and this is your final appearance so this is a very simple procedure and works well in many cases wherever there is horizontal lid laxity which is not so severe then it can be done then the lts procedure lateral tarsal strip generally it is combined with the transverse everting sutures so uh, it is a procedure of a kind of choice in all cases now atropion as well as entropion so what is done here is you can see the some laxity is there so you just detach your lower lid cut the lateral canthal tendon then incise the skin at lash line just so you are preparing a strip of tarsus plate and you will have to remove epithelium from all sides so this is strip is fashioned here now the superior uh, epithelial surface is removed so that there will not be any granulomas now you reach periosteum doctor 8 minutes more all right doctor time up doctor hmm one minute more no i'll be done in 30 seconds so this is periosteum now you will be passing non absorbable suture through tarsus and then through the periosteum and then just tighten these sutures and you are done so it is combined with everting sutures so to conclude each patients need to be assessed for type and severity of entropion this should be entropion i'm sorry for it and a tailor made approach crafted according to suitability should be done in every case thank you thank you for your patience here thank you sir
now dr saptagiri shram matla sir is going to talk about uh, ectropion surgery lessons learned over years i request dr uh, saptagiri sir to start his presentation please yeah just a minute good morning one and all uh, am i audible yes sir yes sir yeah. okay okay at the outset i would like to thank uh, dr sumit and the entire uh, bombay ophthalmic association for inviting me for this session it's a wonderful uh, i mean uh, lineup and uh, topics are also very well selected uh, it's also a privilege to actually to talk and speak in front of my teachers and uh, all my colleagues thank you once again boa and dr sumit uh, so uh, what sumit wanted me wanted me to talk about was uh, the lessons that i learned in the process of ectropion surgery uh, i just i'm do i'm not that very experienced uh, not that old hatha uh i just share my experience what i learned from the times when i started my practice and what i'm doing now so what is the etiopathogenesis we all know that the classically described etiopathogenesis that we did throughout our ms days was that uh, ectropion is caused because of a combination of factors which involves the laxity and this loosening of the medial and lateral canthal tendons and also there is a low lid retracted dehiscence and based on these three factors as dr mukesh uh, mentioned earlier based on these three factors the surgeries have all been devised and the surgeries are basically it's a medial uh, pure medial you can do a medial canthoplasty or a lasic procedure and if it's a global one you can combine the medial canthoplasty with a lateral tarsal strip or the classical uh, byron smith modification of the kun zimnowski's procedure now all these procedures have stood the test of time and they're still well practiced but there's been a slight change in way things have been understood i'll just show some pictures of my earlier patients where he's having a low lid uh, ectropion basically more uh, present medially with large punctal ectropion and he underwent a classical lateral tarsal strip with a medial conjunctivoplasty and the success is fairly good i mean he's quite happy and uh, functionally it's very nice uh, these surgeries of course they work very well as i said they stood the test of time but then then came this major uh, thing from uh, gutoff and uh, kotovets in the essentials of ophthalmology where they described the entire uh, pathophysiology of how an entropion or an ectropion would occur now it's always a thing that entropion and ectropion actually share the same uh, pathogenesis but some patients will have ectropion and some will have entropion so there are certain terms uh, which we have to get uh, used to that the one is the intercanthal line which is this red line which connects the medial canthus to the lateral canthus and then in the medial part there is a small angle which is created by between the intercanthal line and the uh, lid margin and this is important to realize that this is an acute angle in uh, in in all patients and this the intercanthal line is usually in line with the equatorial line but in some patients who have a, a lower uh, lateral canthus as uh, dr adit showed in the in some of his cases it is very important to recognize there that the intercanthal line in that case will be lower than the equatorial line in such patients if we do a lip tightening procedure that will like a lateral tarsal strip without raising it and uh, compensating for the uh, lateral uh, lower position patient will actually have more epiphora and they may actually have a uh, it's something like a, a, a tight belt on a, a large belly so that's what exactly happens and then we all then they describe that the medial ectropion is equal to the loss of this acute angle which develops and that's why the patients actually have watering and the role of orbicularis is very important is that uh, the vertical deviation of the orbicularis plays a large role in actually either having an entropion or patient having an ectropion so whenever the lid turns inside because of the preceptal override onto the pretarsal you'll have a, a entropion and sometimes it may slip down when in which case uh, you'll have an ectropion so the simple effect of lid sutures is that in ectropion you'll have an inverting effect that's because these lower lid retractors are attached back to the lower part of the tarsal plate at the same time the orbicularis is also pulled anteriorly superiorly so that causes a inverting effect whereas in entropion what you do is you actually transfer the force of the low lid retractors anteriorly on towards the skin and this uh, preceptal override is actually pulled down and that corrects the 
uh, entropion. So basically, it's a very similar surgery, just a slight difference in where you're going to anchor your sutures, which is going to cause a major difference in the outcome. And also that the uh, tarsus, the stability is also disturbed uh, either in entropion or ectropion, whereas in normal, you have a nice square-shaped pillar, whereas in an entropion, you have a, a shape like this, and in ectropion, the shape is different. So uh, now uh, this was a patient who presented with uh, bilateral low lid uh, ectropion. So we advised for an ectropion surgery. And he said, uh, I don't want a surgery right now. I don't have that much time. I'm looking for a shortcut sort of a thing. And he had some function which is coming up. So then we thought, uh, why don't we try something called the inverting sutures rather than doing the everting sutures, which is done for uh, entropion. We thought we'll do the uh, inverting sutures. So this is a short video showing the uh, inverting sutures for low lid entropion. So basically it is just very similar to the way an everting suture would be taken for entropion, but it's just a reverse way. So we start from the, uh, just below the tarsus, take a grab of the low lid retractors and come out lower down onto the skin. So this has a nice uh, inverting effect. And also we we'll see that the uh, entire uh, uh, the orbitrax actually moves upwards. So this was the patient I've done bilaterally for him since he had a bilateral uh, low lid ectropion. I'll just forward this. Yes. So that was the effect on, on table. And this was how we looked uh, the first day post-operative. So the lid seems to be nicely inverted out and uh, inverted in and uh, he was fine. Then what happened after a week of uh, suture removal and then uh, after about a month later, he again came back with uh, uh, low lid ectropion again. So this time we thought we'll do something different. We plan to do a low lid retractor reattachment in which we'll be attach attaching the low lid retractors onto the posterior border of the in posterior inferior border of the tarsus. So a standard uh, uh, lid, I mean, lateral canthal incision with a inferior canthotomy and canthalysis was done. And then the incision is extended just below the tarsal plate, all uh, along, along the inferior border of the tarsus, the conjunctiva along with the uh, retractors is incised, right? And we stop just short of the punctum. Because if you go, tend, tend, tend to go Beyond the punctum, that will be much more overcorrected, and the anatomy is little more dis difficult to disinsert there. So, as Dr. Mukesh mentioned, you get to see all the layers. That is the orbital septum. Once it's opened up, you will be able to see the fat, and that's a low lid retractor. So we can just confirm that by asking the patient to look up and down. So, the moment he looks up and down, you can feel the tug on the low lid retractor. It's very much similar to what we see during ptosis surgery. And here, I'm just taking uh, bedded knots to anchor the uh, uh, loaded retractors back onto the uh, in, in posterior and inferior border of the tarsus. Uh, we take, I've taken just three such with the uh, 6O vicryl. And the conjunctiva need not be closed separately because it just attaches back onto the uh, posterior border. Uh, sometimes if you find that there's a lot of basins of the conjunctiva and the fornix is also not very uh, well formed, we can also close the conjunctiva with a, I mean, a 6 o vicryl such that the knots are placed inside. And once uh, I've taken three sutures here and then I'll be anchoring the uh, uh, canthal tendon back to its place. In this, this can also be combined with the lateral tarsal strip. But in this patient, I did not have to do a lateral tarsal strip because there's not much of lid laxity as such. So I just had a, a canthus forming suture and just anchored that canthus back to the periorbita. Now, the, we could have done a um, lid crease incision for the lateral canthal tightening in this case also, but it was not required since anyway, the canthus had to be open and low lid had to be disinserted. I mean, the uh, low lid lateral part had to be disinserted to approach the low lid retractors. So I'm attaching it back to the periorbiter, tightening the uh, lateral canthal tendon. Mm -hmm. The way Dr. Adit described that we can actually take it up anywhere that we want. We can either tighten it uh, higher up also, but in this case, it was not required. So I'll just be forwarding it a little bit. 
right? That's we, that's the amount of tightening that we can achieve. And once the um, tightening is done, we close the uh, wound uh, accordingly. So on tables, it will be much more tighter than what we require because over time that will actually settle down. So this was the preoperative appearance after the uh, lid sutures were taken, uh, the uh, inverting sutures, and this is how the outcome was after about a month of the surgery. Now, uh, the advantage of this surgery is that we can do it at, at any age. Uh, this is actually a young child. Uh, he's about uh, 13 years old who came with a low lid ectropion of the left eye. And we did the same surgery for him and it had a very favorable outcome. So uh, nowadays I've moved on from doing a simple LTS with a medial consumer trochlastic. Not that it doesn't work. It does work wonderfully. But uh, after a good understanding of the exact pathogenesis of entropion and ectropion, I feel that this is a much better surgery and uh, it corrects all the factors which actually cause either entropion or ectropion. And the same surgery can be done for entropion too. The only difference is that in ectropion, we attach it to the posterior and the uh, inferior border. Whereas in entropion, what we do is we have to advance the low lid retractors onto the anterior surface of the tarsus or onto the lid, low lid crease. That corrects the entropion. So it's a very similar surgery for either entropion or ectropion and which has very gratifying results. And this can also be combined with a tarsal strip or we can also do a medial conjunctivoplasty if it's a global entropion, entropion or ectropion. So that brings a conclusion to my uh, talk. And thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Saptagiri. Thank you, Dr. Uh, 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 thank you, sir. Just to interrupt here, I'm so sorry for the technical team. There are so many uh, speakers of the next meeting who are uh, in the waiting list and uh, I uh, request technical team to please let them in the meeting and don't keep them in the waiting room. There will be hardly 8-10 people, but they will not be happy if we keep them waiting. So Sai sir and the technical team, please make me host so I can allow them inside or you allow them inside, please. Uh, Praveen sir can go ahead with the session. Yeah, Sorry for the interruption. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Our you. next talk is by Dr. Udmil Chala Madam. She is going to talk about psychiatrical electroplasty. Excuse me, Dr. Praveen. I think we should have at least one question after every talk. We don't want to have it uh, as a monologue. So I have a question here for Dr. Saptagiri. Uh, so Dr. Saptagiri. Yeah. Are you here? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I'm audible? Yeah, yeah. So my question yes, yes. to you, or rather my comment here is that uh, you have detached the uh, lateral canthal tendon and then you have not attached it uh, superiorly. You have just reattached it when you were uh, doing your aponeurotic surgery here. So my yes, in is either you do not detach the lateral canthal. You need not to detach lateral canthal when you are doing your surgery. You can make a little skin incision also if you require. But once you are detaching it, then you have to attach it high up because with time it will not... Uh, act as a natural lateral canthus. Once you are reattaching it, you have to attach a little high up. You have to make some kind of lateral tarsus strip because after one year, two year or three year, it will fall back. So my comment only is either do not detach it. Once you are detaching it, then attach it little high up. So what is your take on it? Um, uh, I agree with you, Dr. Mukesh, that it can fall down. But usually what happened, my experience with uh, attaching it, the way I do it is that... Uh, I use uh, uh, something like uh, uh, Ethibond that is uh, more of the uh, uh, non-absorbable long-acting uh, uh, sutures onto the natural canthus. So I decide on uh, preoperatively on the assessment whether the actually patient requires a much higher attachment or not. Because most of the times, uh, it, if it's what has not fallen all these years after my intervention is not going to fall down very much is what my take is. Uh, for those patients actually who have a saggy for whom it has actually fallen down, there may be a tendency for it to fall down, but a strong periosteal attachment, uh, I, I have not had this experience where it's fallen down very much after beyond a month, actually. Uh, so that's been my experience over the years. I'm sure uh, I mean, it may be different, but uh, the reason why I did not attach it too higher was he did not have very significant uh, lid, lid laxity as such. 
and I wanted to uh, go through the lateral canthal area because it would give me much better exposure and also much better control. And uh, the reason I do, of course, uh, attach it much higher at times. But in this particular case, I did not attach attach it much higher. Uh, mm, that was the only it. thing. I mean, so I modify it accordingly to the requirement. I mean, as as on table. Correct. My only concern is because we are attaching it onto the periosteum while nature attaches it uh, with the bone. Mm -hmm. So we cannot attach it or we do not attach canthal tendon to the bone. We attach it to the periosteum and it has a natural tendency to fall down. Anyway, your point is well taken. So the next speaker is Dr. Urmil Chawla. We all are aware with the potential of Dr. Urmil Chawla. She is a prolific surgeon and she keeps on doing very good work. So we look forward to hear Dr. Urmil today on cicatricial electrophion. Dr. Urmil, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for the kind words, sir. And I am audible, sir. Yeah, sure. I'm... Okay. Thank you. Thank you. At the outset, I would like to thank BOA and especially Dr. Sumit uh, for inviting me for this talk. Uh, without taking much time, I'll just go ahead with my topic. Uh, uh, cicatricial electropion remodeling with 5-FU and definitive management. The previous speaker, sir, has already uh, talked about ectropion in detail. I would just go ahead. Uh, again, it's not going. Just a second. Uh, yes. So ectropion, as we all know, it's an eyelid malposition and characterized by rotation of lid margin outwards, resulting in its fall away from the globe. Out of all the ectropions, I'll be focusing on the cicatricial ectropion. And cicatricial ectropion is the result of scarring, as we all know. So a word about scarring, it is an area of fibrous tissue that replaces normal skin and fibroblasts being the vital constituents of the scar. And it goes undergoes the stages of inflammation, proliferation, maturation with collagen fibers remodeled to improve the overall tensile strength of the scar. They can be mainly traumatic scars due to mechanical, chemical injury or burns. And 20% of the all scars are periorbital scars. And so the significance of cicatricial ectropion. And the consequences of these scars can be physical, aesthetic, psychological, social, and emotional. And hence the need of understanding and uh, managing them with the goals of relieving the symptoms, reducing the comorbidities, decreasing the scar volume, and maximizing functional and cosmetic outcomes. Especially the periorbital scars, they are aesthetically disfiguring. They cause functional loss of eyelids and are a challenge. And as we all know, besides the other complications of this scarring, cicatricial wound healing occurs. And especially when it is present in the lower lid, it commonly leads to cicatricial ectropion, though it can be present in lower or upper, but lower has been found to be more common. And it is usually associated with shortening of the anterior lamellae. Clinical consequences can be keratitis, scarring of the cornea and conjunctiva, globe perforation, and blindness. So uh, we can go ahead as soon as the patient presents it with us. Uh, we have, initially, we can go with the medical management of uh, lubricating eye drops, horizontal taping of the lid, uh, hyaluronic acid filler injections can be given. But uh, scar modulation is one of the very good ways by which we can start with the treatment and we get very good results, which I'll be sharing. Uh, medical, as I told you, lubrication, plastic dressings, all these things. But we have to be careful, especially in uh, patients with uh, corneal epithelial defects and prior herpes simplex simplex <laughs> infection. They be, should not be using steroid-containing ointments. So coming to the scar modulation part, there are various natural therapies which are available like onion extract, honey and all, but these have not picked up too much. So the various other therapies to prevent scarring are the intralesional corticosteroid, laser therapy, bleomycin, interferon, 5-FU, botulinum and a long list. I'll be concentrating on 5-FU with my experience. It is a pyrimidine analog or anti-metabolite. Irreversible inhibition of enzyme thymidylate synthase occurs and it inhibits the DNA synthesis. It reduces the fibroblast proliferation and inhibition of collagen type 1 production is there and largely it causes reduction in the star, star formation. Only works on metabolically active and proliferating cells. No collateral damage of surrounding cells is there. It halts the rapidly proliferating fibroblasts and in this way scar degradation is promoted. It is otherwise an anti-cancer drug, systemic, systemically used for anal, breast, and other cancers, and topically also used. In ophthalmology, its use is an off-label use. Initially, it was started with the use in trabeculectomy, then OSSN, and nowadays for reducing scars. It is contraindicated in debilitated patients and other bone marrow suppression and pregnant. There are side effects, but these are few. I have yet to come across many, uh, very few side effects. I would say pain, itching, burning, stinging. Uh, they are not at all significant and the uncommon ones I have yet to see. Only I have seen one telinjectasis patient. 
the literature also says that 5-FU can be used as a, a safe and probably more effective than other options in the management of cutaneous scars. There have been comparison between 5-FU alone and uh, corticosteroids, triamcinolone, acetonide, and also combination. Uh, again, combination is found to be more effective. And so the literature is showing all the things. And however, if you use only corticosteroid, unpleasant side effects like telling dictasia, fat atrophy, rebound effects are seen. However, 5-FU has no major side effects per se. Uh, the monotherapy of 5-FU gives 45 to 78% excellent scar improvement. However, the combination gives us 96% of uh, improvement and uh, it has been found to be better. I'm sharing my experience with you uh, with uh, individual 5-FU being used. Uh, in the this is the way we use it. It's a very simple technique, can be used by anybody. Uh, patients are given 0.4 to 0.6 ml of 5 FU injection subcutaneously. Three injections every four weeks. Maximum six injections can be given. Initially, we give lignocaine injection around the periorbital scar. This is followed by a when, uh, 5 FU in a 1 ml syringe. And all around the periorbital scar area, we can inject this. If the scar is bigger in size, we can take a little more amount. And all around, we can just inject it in the subcutaneous area. At each visit, the patients are evaluated for redness, swelling, and tissue inflammation. And uh, this way, uh, these injections are repeated after every four weeks. The outcome indicators were the subjective assessment, the Vancouver scar scale is used, digital photographs are compared, and adverse events are checked. I'm sharing you cases which I have treated with 5 of you. You can see the amount of cicatricial ectropion that has improved, the contour. Again, in this patient, in mild to moderate cases, you can see the improvement in the scar volume also overall, and the medial uh, scar contracture has also reduced. This was a patient who had lag of thelmos, and after two, three injections, we, we were able to give her a relief, and lag of thelmos was improved. The scar, uh, in all the mild to moderate cases, in few, I have not even been uh, requiring any further treatment. The uh, atropion part has been relieved. You can see in this, the contour over the lower lid. Another case, we uh, showed improvement. And this is another case in which improvement in lag of thelmos was there. These are few cases in all of them we could see improvement in the amount of cicatrix uh, that was there. All the patients were satisfied. And this most important thing is that the scar becomes very soft and mobile. And the patient has great relief, I would say, because the tightness is less. And now the patient feels that oh, khichavat nahi, that is not there. And only one patient developed telling jectasia, and none of the patients showed any reaction. This was the single patient who showed selling telling jectasia. So is there any role of 5 you before surgical correction of cicatricial ectropion, which is the definitive? I would say yes, it definitely helps. These are few cases of cicatricial ectropion which presented to us. Uh, they had mild pain, redness, visual equity was normal, lower, lower lid, eye, lower eyelid was involved, scarring was present, rest all was normal. We injected 5 you in them and you can, uh, after the 5 you injections, we could see that there were, the fibrotic band had softened and there was a lot of relief, but obviously 100% effect could not be given in uh, severe cases of cicatricial ectropion. So we need to go ahead with the definitive management and that definitive management in cicatricial ectropion is, it requires the lengthening of the anterior lamella by a skin graft and so a full thickness skin grafting is done. This is a short video of the, how the skin grafting is done. After applying the uh, lid sutures, the marking is done over this fibrotic band scarred area and an incision is given. The entire uh, scarred area is removed. Even the fibrotic band involving the skin part, we just dissect it out. Once it is dissected, we have a uh, coloboma, you can say it is formed. We measure it at different sites, the central part, the site, and then Similar markings are taken on the retroauricular area. The marking should be at least one to two millimeter more than what we require in the host point. And if the graft is small size, we can use the retroauricular area or otherwise we can also use the supraclavicular area for the taking the graft. So the so skin graft is raised and this graft is then prepared. Defatting is done so that it just contains the skin and the dermis and the uh, epidermis. And after this, it is placed at the area of the defect. And uh, we start with the suturing at the apex of the at one edge, and the six zero silk sutures are uh, used for uh, giving the suturing part. All sutures are applied all round. After the suturing, uh, we also need to take care of the retroauricular part where we have taken the graft. So that is also undermined a bit. The margins are undermined, and suturing is completed over there. In the end, uh, where the in the graft area, we definitely need to give some stab incisions to prevent the hematoma formation and uh, for the acceptance of uh, the graft also. So this is the a, a double bolster is applied in the end. So these are the few steps you have just seen.
So post-operative, immediate, we, uh, when we next day we open it, the double bolster is then removed. Initially, the uh, uh, graft takes a black color in the first few days. It is like a black ishal, but slowly it takes uh, over the color of the skin. Uh, this is another case yeah, yeah, where uh, yeah. four weeks. This is another case where we could get improvement in the ectropion part. These are few cases. In all, we could get the improvement. This is one case where uh, along with FTSG, I had added an LTS because the, the droop was a little more on the lower lid. So the only FTSG was not helpful. So a lateral tarsal strip can be added to the procedure to give a better contour to the lower lid. Ectropion surgery, as we know, it is safe and effective. Recurrence can be common, common even after the grafting procedure. Uh, possibility of local post-op bleeding can be there. Uh, so my take home message would be that five of you alone or five of you along with TCA is efficient, safe, cost effective, reduces the cosmetic blemish. Right now I'm uh, doing a thesis on the combination comparison of five of you alone with five of you combination. So initially I shared with you my own experience with five of you, but definitely the results with combination are slightly better. And finally, the definitive treatment of full thickness post auricular skin graft and severe cicatricial ectropion. It provides good cosmesis and relief from the symptoms and early prevention of exposure keratitis secondary to ectropion. Thank you. Thankful to my team and especially acknowledge to Dr. Khurana sir and Dr. Jyoti who were part of my team and uh, working on this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Ormil. Very nice talk. Uh, I have a question for you. Yes, sir. Uh, 5FU, we all know that it has become a uh, kind of treat standard uh, treatment now for scar issues. Yes, sir. Only, uh, my question is that how much time you wait uh, for doing surgery after 5FU injection? Uh, sir, I, uh, after after the last injection, as I told you, sir, in few patients, we need to give three or four. I have given maximum five injections also. The, uh, although in my study, we have kept six injections also. But after five, I have found enough softening of the tissue and the fibrotic band really becomes supple. So after my last injection, after two or three weeks, minimum two weeks I have waited. But uh, depending on the patient's uh, personal opinion also, we take the patient for the surgery, definitive treatment, sir. All right. Generally, uh, I think... Doctor, uh, Doctor Ulmer, I yes, have. Uh, when you do the injection, before that, do you try to release the scar uh, tissue with the help of needle? No, ma'am. No. The space is quite tight. Uh, and if we do that maneuver, it might help in you know uh, uh, releasing some scar tissue before you inject. Uh, Ma'am, I have not tried, but it's a very good suggestion. I might uh, try in my next few cases because we just go through the uh, needle to the scarred area and inject 5FU. I have not tried to uh, meddle with the scar as such, but definitely your suggestion is well taken. I'll try in few cases and I'll let you know how it works. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, one more point is that uh, do you uh, also do tarsorephy once you are doing a skin graft? Because uh, and, sir, I'm not doing tarsorephy. In the first two, three days, I give a lit traction suture from the lower lid to the frost suture is going up. And uh, I keep it tight for one or two days. Uh, as of now, I've never needed to do a tarsorephy, but that can be an option if needed. But the traction suture serves the purpose for the first few days, sir. A good traction suture is serving the purpose. All right. Actually, graft, it gets crumpled down sometime if lid is not immobile. But all right, you are getting good results. That's yes. fine. So, Thank our you, sir. Speaker, is uh, Dr. Vidya Shankar, and he'll be speaking on very important topic, trichiasis management. Dr. Vidya Shankar, please. Um, I'll stop sharing stops. my screen. Yeah, please. Yes, I've stopped. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, well, thanks for BOA for the POS, as well as for all the delegates and faculty who have come amongst this bad uh, COVID times. Till now, 22% of oxygen was there and there, but even that is being insufficient for all of us. So actually there is a saying saying that familiarity breeds contempt. We have been taking uh, the atmosphere for granted. So that's why probably in the similar way, even a small lash also can be quite uh, uh, getting us into a lot of trouble. That's why basically we are trying to have this particular uh, session. If you are seeing over here, uh, the mighty tiger will easily pounce on the small monkey which is going here and there. 
the monkey also is knows uh, its uh, limits and but even then is able to trouble the mighty tiger so the small lash also sometimes gets us quite intrigued gets us quite debilitated and we are not able to perform our daily duties so we are over here in order to treat that so trichiasis is basically the small lash is getting misdirected and it is growing from the anterior lamella these are basically because of trachoma herpes zoster ophthalmicus many of the autoimmune diseases could be even post surgical if you have not uh, redone the lid margin properly also iatrogenic trichiasis can happen if in, in during enucleation we have not been taking care of the conjunctiva again there could be a misdirection of the lashes during chemical injuries thermal burns mechanical as well as in small children when there is an extra fold of skin giving rise to an epiblepharm there can be a misdirection of these lashes so basically all of these lashes will give rise to a intense foreign body sensation epiphora inflamed conjunctiva this patient could complain of a lot of pain and because of the punctate epithelial erosions corneal ulcerations and things like that if this is not being treated early enough then it can give rise to scarring giving rise to corneal astigmatism or it can give rise to opacification probably nm opacification which would which would give uh, rise to a lot of uh, dispersion of light so whenever we have this particular problem of misdirected lashes which is getting into the eye and causing a problem all of this we just pick it out during the opd we just put in a swab stick with a little paracaine exactly at the base of that lash and we just mechanically uh, remove it this will give rise to an immediate relief to the patient but we all know the the cycle of the lash is going to come back after 7 days this patient is going to start and especially now after the lashes have been taken out the lashes which comes back is even more pointy and that's going to give rise to more of uh, the problem so in such cases we do a procedure which is the electrolysis it is basically for few isolated lashes what we generally use is an electrocautery using the radio frequency uh, procedure we are able to take off these lashes when we push in this needle through the um, opening of the lash right up to the um, base so the other forms of treatment are cryotherapy argon laser ablation this uh, of course with cryotherapy there is a segmental is for treating segmental trichiasis a double free star cycle 90% success rate but it can give rise to a lot of lid scarring if it is not done properly argon laser ablation are done in few centers but most of the places it is a radio frequency electroepilation which we use for the treatment of this trichiatric lashes the idea of my book is it's a practical book i think it's not really uh, much uh, place to do research or references it is meant for surgeons who can uh, see it read it i can hear something can else from practice so please uh, concentrate on practical points only the references you can give is suggested reading in the end thank you very much so when we take care of this uh, lid margin repair sometimes if you have not done the proper repair this lashes itself itself could uh, be going inside so uh taking doing a good lid margin repair is going to prevent this when we are seeing in this picture there are a lot of lashes over here this is a kissing nevus but uh, even nevertheless there are lashes present over here which are going and uh, irritating the cornea so in such cases we take off the entire we we will have to reconstruct the uh, uh, the anterior lamella as well as the posterior lamella over here too a similar procedure is done and we are able to give rise to a good uh, reconstruction in the medial aspect when we talk about dystrichiasis dystrichiasis is uh, an additional row of lashes but i have just put it in over here 
so that we can understand that if there are going to be multiple lashes which are going and rubbing against the cornea, we can take care of uh, the similar thing as well. Uh, this, this is a procedure wherein multiple uh, lashes are turning inside. So we basically try and disconnect between the anterior and the posterior lamella. The anterior lamella is the skin and the, sub, uh, and the orbicularis. The posterior lamella is the tarsus which you are seeing. Once we have been able to disconnect between the two, double freeze thaw of the posterior lamella and then reattaching the anterior and posterior lamella is what we will we are doing over here. So we are able to give rise to the lid margin without the additional lashes or without the lashes which are uh, penetrating into the eye, rubbing against the cornea and causing a problem. I would end with this slide. Dr. Mukesh, sir. Yeah. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Vidya. It was a nice talk. So, uh, what is your procedure of choice for a uh, few uh, trichiatic lashes? Like you have enumerated all the procedures. So, what do you feel is the procedure of choice? If there are a few misdirected lashes, an electrocautery should be more than sufficient. But the only thing is when we are doing an electrocautery, we have to make sure that we are not charring up the anterior lamella. That will give rise to more of uh, a problem. If there are multiple, probably five or six, and if they are closer together, then the double freeze thaw works well. All right. But there are issues with cryo application. There will be scarring later on and uh, sometime if a regular lead margin may be uh, there. All right. So point well taken. And uh, please stop sharing, Dr. Vidya. Now we have uh, next speaker is Dr. Neelam Pushka. She is professor at Dr. RP Center Ames, a very good surgeon and a close friend. We were batchmate uh, during our postgraduate days. So it's always a pleasure uh, hearing Dr. Neelam. Dr. Neelam will be speaking on management of eyelid retraction. Dr. Neelam, please. Thank you, Dr. Mukesh. Good, good morning, everyone. I'll be talking about management of eyelid retraction. Just trying to share my slideshow. Good morning, everyone. So uh, eyelid retraction, as we know, is a relative condition where the eyelid does not rest at a position considered normal for a particular population. Or if there is a presence of asymmetry more than one millimeter in eyelid position with scleral show. As you can see here, this is a typical patient with the thyromegaly, with the uh, exophthalmos, and with the upper and lower lid eyelid retraction. This is another patient you can see here with congenital eyelid retraction. He also had high myopia. So coming to some common causes. So amongst congenital, generally it is the primary cause in which the uh, lid retraction is there since birth and it is stationary. And amongst the acquired causes, we all know we come across thyroid eye disease, sometimes overcorrected ptosis. There can be compensatory lid retraction in patients with ptosis or it can be because of trauma or in long-standing facial palsy, we can see lid retraction. So if we divide the lid retraction according to the lamella affected, it helps in deciding the uh, management for us. So uh, if we see here in the diagram, generally we talk about two uh, lamellae, the anterior and the posterior. But as we go slightly higher up in the lid, we have three lamellae, the anterior, middle, and the posterior lamellae. And depending on those three lamellae, we can decide uh, what is the cause and accordingly we can treat the patient. So anterior lamella, as we uh, know, is basically skin muscle layer. 
so uh, so the causes are basically burns or trauma or any chronic dermatitis and we all know when there is shortening of the anterior lamella uh, we need to augment this with the skin graft or with the flap this is a patient who had thermal burn very typical symmetrical and you can see there is ectropion with lid retraction and the treatment done in this was the uh, skin graft was taken from the post auricular area and you can even appreciate the graft area in this particular patient so uh, coming to the posterior lamellar pathology that can lead to lid retraction we know the posterior lamella is basically tarso conjunctival layer and various cicatrizing causes especially we see in younger population is sjs and in older population it is because of trachoma it can be there because of burn so uh, we know that if there is a posterior lamellar shortening we need to augment the posterior lamella with some mucosal graft and lip mucosa is the mucosa of my choice which i generally use for lengthening the posterior lamella though cartilage graft heart palate graft and ma many more grafts are described and this is how we place the uh, graft in order to lengthen the posterior lamella we place it in between the tarsal border and the retractor like this as shown this can uh, similarly it is done in the upper lid also so coming to the middle lamellar pathology this is i think the uh, most common uh, pathology which we come across the major chunk of lid retraction we see uh, they are basically because of the middle lamella being involved that is uh, thyroid eye disease so we need to understand that middle lamella it basically consists of levator muller complex and septum in the upper lid inferior retractors and septum in the lower lid and causes we all know commonest is thyroid eye disease but it can be post surgical overcorrection in ptosis patient or because of some cicatrization condition this is a very typical case you can see of thyroid eye disease where there is bilateral exophthalmos with lid retraction this is another patient who was operated in right eye and you can see that there is overcorrection of the uh, ptosis in this and this video i'll be showing uh, in a short while from now so uh, evaluation of a case of lid retraction is very important to look for the cause in cause basically we need to see whether it is the anterior lamella or the posterior or the middle lamella which lamella is affected so that we can decide the uh, nature of surgery then if it is a recent onset kind of you know lid retraction we should give some time for the lid to stabilize especially in patients with thyroid eye disease or in patient uh, in a child who is born with uh, you know retraction so we should uh, first investigate and let the lid stabilize then it's very important that we understand the normal position of the lid so that we know what lid retraction is normally the lower lid it rests at the uh, lower limbus and the upper lid it rests around 1.5 to 2 mm from the superior limbus now grading of upper eyelid retraction and lower eyelid retraction is given by waller and uh, if we see according to the severity the mild retraction is 1 to 2 mm moderate is 2 to 5 mm and severe is more than 5 mm and severe and severity of the lower eyelid retraction mild retraction is 1 to 2 mm moderate is 3 and severe is more than 3 mm lid retraction now uh, talking mainly about how to uh, you know weaken or lengthen the uh, middle lamella to correct the lid retraction so for the mild retraction generally you know uh, uh, less invasive surgeries like lps weakening by tars tarsotomy this video i'll be showing a very simple procedure and or you can do muller's excision we know that muller's muscle helps in lifting the lid by 2 mm so we expect at least 1 to 2 mm you know droop in the lid after the surgery or we can do lps recession without cutting horns but for moderate retraction we generally have to do a combination of uh, uh, these technique above mentioned technique or we can also do levator marginal myotomy or we can do lps recession but cutting horns especially the lateral horn if there is lateral flare is very important and along with that you can put uh, you know a, a suspender sutures or adjustable sutures but for severe retraction that is more than 5 uh, mm retraction uh, along with the recession it's always better to put spacer because this will give you more predictable results or in very very severe retraction like say 10 12 even more than that mm of retraction uh transverse uh, blepharotomy has been described in patients with thyroid eye disease 
some cases now uh, this patient uh, uh, was basically a case of congenital upper lid uh, uh, retraction as you can see here three millimeter retraction in this muller's excision was done with tarsotomy and conjunctival approach most of the cases i do by conjunctival approach uh, and in this uh, basically post op day one we always expect some ptosis if it is equal that means the our surgery has probably failed so we expect ptosis in the post operative period so like in this patient there was a ptosis and this is 10 months after the surgery this is another case of youth thyroid ophthalmopathy you can see that uh, though the patient was youth thyroid but the presence of lateral flare along with the uh, lid retraction is very important sign which suggest towards thyroid eye disease so this patient had a uh, 2 mm of lid uh, uh, retraction and this muller's excision was done and along with that cutting of lateral horn was very important to take care of the lateral flare as you can see here the picture here you can see this is the muller muscle which is around 10 to 12 mm in height this is being excised this is a transconjunctival approach being used and here you can see the cutting of the lateral horn you should cut it nicely properly till the superior fornix taking care of the lacrimal gland so this is we see severe ptosis in this particular patient on post op day 1 and this is one month and this is two month follow this was the tear then uh, another case of eyelid retraction because of overcorrected uh, ptosis i'll be showing video in this patient basically the lid retraction or the difference between two eyelids uh, was 2 mm and in this one more thing you must notice is that the lid crease was quite lower down 2 to 3 mm from the lid margin as you can see more clearly over here so in this even the shifting of lid crease was required so this is a video showing the simple procedure which can be done in patients with mild lid retraction also otherwise so after filling this upper border of the tarsal plate with the help of blade you give almost 90% thickness cut uh, in the tarsus 1 to 2 mm from the border this has to be given through and through and the two uh, uh, portion of the tarsus should be completely separated throughout and since this was a case of operated uh, ptosis so there was fibrosis in this so i am using this uh, sharp dissection over here but generally this is not required otherwise and you can see that uh, underneath the tarsus you can see the muscle uh, uh, over here and so after doing that in this patient we wanted correction uh, droop of 2 mm so 4 mm uh, gap was given between the two uh, cut edges of the tarsus so that there is a droop and now you can see the shifting of the lid crease from the 2 to 3 mm from the lid margin and this is a double arm suture i am using here so this is the gap you can see around 4 mm uh, a gap was left between the tarsus and this very close to the uh, previous one i'm taking out the suture this is 60 silk i'm using here similarly other two sutures were also taken out now you can see the shift of the lid crease from 2 to 3 mm it is now say around 6 7 mm away here you can even use adjustable sutures if you want to and this is a traction suture which i uh, use in all my patients with lid retraction So nowadays I have stopped using peg, but here I am using peg. So this I keep according to the position of the lid for around two to three uh, weeks. So uh, this is the PO picture you can see here. This is the lid crease PO, and this is the post-op group. Slight overcorrection you can see, slight doses which we expect on the, you know three weeks follow-up. Generally I do the suture removal around two to three weeks from surgery. this is very interesting article i wanted to share in which the orbital septum was used as a spacer between the levator and the tarsus this was a turnover orbital septal flap technique with levator recession which was done in patients with thyroid eye disease in 12 eyelids in this what was done was the orbital septum was uh, cut from the orbital rim and then it was flipped down and along with that the levator was disinserted from the tarsus and then the septum was used as a spacer between the levator and the uh, upper border of the tarsus and uh, in this authors uh, they found 2.5 mm reduction in the palpebral aperture using this technique 
So the septum is something which is there in these patients, but then we should remember that in thyroid eye disease, we do expect some thickened you know, uh, septum, but otherwise in a normal uh, person, the septum is not that thick. So this was one of the limitation which even the authors, they uh, had um, uh, written. So on the same principle, what I did was in one patient, I used Muller's as a, you know, spacer. Dr. Neelam, we are running short of time. Okay, so basically in this, what I did was Muller's muscle, I took as a spacer between the LPS and the tarsus. This is a patient with three millimeter retraction. This is the post-op immediate, and this is two, three months after the surgery, you can see. This is a, a report of where the label mucosa was used as a spacer by uh, me and reported in four cases. And uh, uh, this was in severe eyelid retraction cases. And we found the, that the, uh, this really works very well. Uh, this is the um, uh, picture from the same publication. You can see T and the post-op. This is a lower lid, T and post-op. And this is just to show how the mucous membrane graft, graft was placed between the LPS and this edge was sutured to the tarsus, and the sutures were taken out from the desired level of the lid crease. This is 20 millimeter of the mucous membrane graft was taken in this, in a ratio of one is to two. And this is the post-op picture, lower down. Sometimes there can be persistence of, you know, lateral flare in these patients as complications. Size of the spacer depends on the graft which we use. Generally, I use lip mucosa in a ratio of 1.5 to two millimeters. Again, to highlight, if there is lateral flare, you cut the lateral horn nicely and keep graft slightly, you know, larger size than the medial side. Temporary procedures include in injection Botox, like in this patient with upper lid retraction. You inject two to three millimeter from the superior border of the tarsus, say around five to uh, 15 units of uh, uh, Botox can be used. Basically, you have to inject in the central and the lateral part, and this is after injection. Really, tarsorephy, we need to do in patients like this with malignant exothermos. So uh, basically, lid retraction has numerous etiologies. Complete evaluation and thorough knowledge is very important. Written informed consent and explaining the uh, complication and risk involved should be done uh, uh, nicely so that patient knows the you know, exact result what they expect. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Neelam, for such holistically covering the topic. Now I'll invite Dr. Vikas Menon. Vikas Menon, we all know, is a very good surgeon and also a thorough gentleman. So today, Dr. Vikas Menon will be speaking on uh, uh, management of SJS. Dr. Vikas, please. Good morning, sir. Uh, hi. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mukesh, for the kind introduction and thank you, BOA, for having me. Can you see my screen? Sure. Okay. Let me just please go for start slide. the slideshow. Let me... So can you see the slideshow? Is it coming as that? No. Okay, now no. it is. Yes. Yeah. So I'll be talking about uh, SJS. Now it's a very vast topic, and eight minutes is a less too less a time to cover everything. So I just uh, confine myself to the practical aspects and the things which we uh, actually do, and go less into the theory of the problem. Just to give you a basic idea that SJS or TEN, that is toxic epidermal necrolysis, is a it's kind of a same disease, but if less than 10% of body surface area is involved, it is known as SJS. But if it is uh, more than 30% of body surface area involved by the blistering disease, which affects the skin and mucosal membranes, then it is known as uh, 10. And the etiopathogenesis, we know all know it's an immune-mediated process. Sometimes it has like genetic uh, uh, implications as well. And uh, there are various uh, immune reaction triggers which can actually stimulate the immune system to uh, go into uh, a reaction which is so fulminant. Most commonly what we see are drugs and most commonly out of all these drugs with the list which you can see on my screen are sulfonamides or more commonly anti-epileptics like carbamazepine. So these are the drugs which we see most often leading to uh, SGS or TEN like uh, syndrome. Although there are other factors also which have been reported, but less commonly. So SGS, if we want to understand basically what, how to intervene, when to intervene and what to do, we have to understand what stage actually the patient is coming in with. So if we have a patient which is coming in within the first two weeks of onset of the problem, 
that is the stage when the condition can be called as an acute SJS uh, stage. Now, when the patient is in acute SJS situation, patient usually requires an ICU setting and, uh, uh, and a team of uh, people, physicians, ICU specialists, critical care specialists, dermatologists working on the patient because it's a generalized disorder where the skin is getting sloughed off. In the first two weeks, the, the eye is not so badly affected. What you see is usually bilateral conjunctivitis in most of the cases. But in some cases, you do see corneal or conjunctival ulceration. This is a child who presented with an acute stage of SJS lying in ICU. You go there and examine such patients. So what you can do in such a situation is basically intervention at this stage is kind of a preventive therapy to avoid or to prevent further more damaging sequelae of the inflammatory response that is happening in, the, in, in these patients. So, if at, in, in such cases, what you do is, sorry, uh, so slide. Uh, uh, so, basically, what you need to do here in such a situation is putting amniotic membrane graft uh, by releasing whatever symblephron formation has occurred. You can simply remove it with the form of a, with the help of an earbud or maybe a, a glass uh, uh, stick. You can just remove all the symblephron because they are still fresh and cover the entire ocular surface, including the lid margins with an amniotic membrane graft. The amniotic membrane serves as a barrier to prevent symblephron formation, as well as uh, it, it also has certain growth factors which aid in uh, the epithelial healing. Then there is the subacute stage, which is the next stage where you have a smoldering kind of uh, chronic cicatrizing conjunctivitis. At this stage, you may see some amount of fric acids happening. The surface is not so bad. The lid margin is not so bad. But there is trichiasis and there are irregular lid margins here. But more often, what, when we see these patients, they have already entered the chronic stage. And uh, in these patients, the lid sequelae are seen in about 35% of SJS patients. And these have chronic dry eyes. They have variable amount of symblephron formation. There can be a, a, a bit of initial shortening as well. And uh, there will be destruction of limbal stem cells. All these lead to lot of scarring on the eyelid tissue and damaging or damage of the normal anatomy of the eyelid. So here you can see in this photograph, there is total destruction of meibomian gland orifices and the meibomian gland orifices, uh, uh, instead of uh, being as prominent openings here, you they are just like flat, basically scarred out areas and you have a lot of dystichiatic cilia growing in there. You evert the lid and you see variable amount of cicatrizing changing changes happening on the tarsal conjunctiva as well. So in more chronic cases, you may see uh, patients coming with cicatricial entropion, uh, as you see in this patient with lower lid entropion on one side and trichiasis on the other side. Then in more advanced cases, what you find is deposition of keratin on the lid margins. Now, uh, this keratin can be really damaging, especially when it is happening in the setting of an extremely dry surface. So you, on one side you have a dry ocular surface, on the other side you have keratin deposited on the lid margin on the tarsal conjunctiva and every time the patient blinks, you can imagine what kind of havoc this keratin uh, runs over the ocular surface which is already so dry. This leads to extreme degrees of photophobia. Patients are not able to open their eyes properly. Children are not able to continue with their education. This is so much uh, disruption to the normal life that an individual can have. Now, in the acute stage, I've already mentioned the, the team support is required and uh, you, you do this AMG thing. So, AMG has to be covered edge to edge. Now, there are some uh, AMG inserters which have been developed, which facilitate the use of AMG in ICU settings. Uh, in the chronic stage, one option that you have short of surgery is a scleral contact lens, which kind of acts as a barrier between the roughened lid margins and the dry and already compromised ocular surface. The problem here is these scleral contact lenses are really expensive and uh, they require that the surface should not have much semblephron uh, uh, there and the furnaces should be adequate to accommodate a big contact, such scleral contact lens, which may not always be the case in a situation like this. Now, so what we commonly do is a mucous membrane graft, which we've been doing now for the last couple of years and uh, getting good results with it. So this is a brief video to demonstrate the technique of mucous membrane graft. An incision is given after reverting the eyelid just along the gray line. So this is, uh, and then the incision is also extended onto the tarsal conjunctiva 
to include all of the keratinized tissue so the purpose here is to remove the entire keratinized rough conjunctiva from the tarsal uh, surface remove a part of the lid margin which is also affected and subsequently replace it with a smooth lining provided by the buccal mucosa you have to go very gently here in the section has to be very meticulous and gentle requires lot of patience takes lot of time because you don't want to actually damage the eyelid margin because if you damage the eyelid margin then there are more chances that you may end up with uh, inflicting more entropion on the patient so with a little bit of patience with a little bit of uh, careful dissection under a microscope one can actually remove this whole strip of keratinized conjunctiva and uh, lid marginal tissue once both upper and lower lids or whichever lid is predominantly involved once you've done that remove that lid of all the keratinized tissue then uh, buccal mucosal graft is taken we all are familiar with techniques of for taking the buccal mucosal graft uh, we've been doing it for contracted sockets for a long time now and uh, so this is the same technique not anything new only thing that you require here is to make the graft very very thin and uh, compared to a, a socket uh, situation where you are using a buccal mucosal graft this has to be really thin otherwise this will, the lid will look very bulky and cosmetically ugly and then you place the buccal mucosa over the lid margin and with running buried uh, interrupted uh, continuous sutures on the lid margin side then you are these are interlocking sutures that we use on the lid margin side then and the posterior part of the uh, of the tissue is secured with the help of a glue so then glue is used here so that there are no sutures on that side to rub against the cornea so this is how we secure the lid margin graft using a buccal mucosa in place so these are few examples where this surgery was performed now this patient has fornicial shortening as well as lid margin keratinization patient was a young child uh, having allergy to and developed steven johnson syndrome forming anti epileptic treatment this is after a few years of follow up uh, the lid margin remains smooth pink and the surface is much better another patient who had severe uh, photophobia unable to open the eyes significant amount of keratinization and after buccal mucosal graft as well as tarsal fracture to relieve the entropion the patient is able to open the eye comfortably and uh, go about a normal education and schooling in a normal way another patient who has a significant amount of roughness on the edges caused by steven johnson syndrome As you can see a lot of keratinization again after a few years you can see how well the surface the, the lid margin now looks after being replaced by a buccal mucosal graft the lower lid of a patient who is having this keratinization on the lid margin again you replace it with a buccal mucosal graft and this is after a few months of the surgery you can see how smooth the buccal mucosa uh, looks on the lid margin and even look at the ocular surface uh, the inflammation has gone down the congestion has gone down significantly and the patients are much more comfortable after the procedure however there can be few complications what which one must be aware of before starting this procedure number one you can cause stosis if you are going further away and uh, disinserting levator then thick grafts will cause cosmetically unacceptable appearance of the eyelids the grafts may not always uh, take up well on the on the bed uh, particularly if your grafts are not properly sized or they are not thin enough sizing is very important of these grafts in such situations and graft shrinkage though rarely seen can happen entropion or ectropion can also be seen as a complication so another significant problem that we see in these patients is entropion now entropion can be difficult to treat in patients of sjs so one of the methods is this that you can split the at the gray line advance the the posterior lamella and uh, recess the anterior lamella and cover the 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 advanced 
tarsal edge with mucus membrane graft at the same time that you are planning to do a buccal mucosal graft uh, another technique is that you do tarsal fracture so once you have done a buccal mucosal graft so you wait for some time for the graft to take up and then you can proceed with a normal tarsal fracture which you would do in any other entropion situation this actually works for even these more severe kinds of entropion because now you covered the graft the, the surface with uh, first with the smooth buccal mucosa and after some time then you are doing it as a routine elective procedure to correct the entropion so both the elements of a rough lid margin as well as entropion are taken care of so in tarsal fracture we reverse the eyelid and uh, we give an incision about 2 mm away from the lid margin to the tarsal plate and uh, then we pass three everting sutures from the tarsal plate to emerge on the skin side so there are three such sutures used and you can tighten them on the skin side and get the eversion that you want of the lid margin the tarsal fracture can also be used in situations like this where the lower lid is predominantly affected so this is a patient who underwent tarsal fracture for the lower lid so to conclude uh, the eyelid changes in sjs remain difficult to treat and there is no single perfect solution so you have to actually think for the patient whenever he is sitting in front of you and plan your strategy accordingly you may have to proceed uh, perform more than one surgery and lot of patience is required on your part because the surgery itself is long that mucous membrane surgery as well as uh, for the patient also he has to make frequent visits and lot of psychological counseling is required for these patients which should not be ignored so this is one such patient who was not able to open the eye at all uh, but after mmg and entropion surgery subsequently she is able to manage thank you very much thank you dr vikas we all know sjs is a very difficult entity these patients are really very difficult to manage and you require to do extensive surgeries all four lids are sometime need to be operated so really very difficult scenario and i think you have very nicely elucidated uh, everything we have got 2 minutes for question and answer if anyone want to ask something they are welcome to do it uh, dr vikas like yes, in acute cases of sjs when do you uh, perform this surgery mucous membrane graft like how much time you wait before doing this particular surgery sir, norm, sir it depends on when the patient comes to you normally when the patients come to us with lot of keratinization that is when we perform this surgery and this usually such patients will come after a few months have passed from the time of acute stage at least 3 to 6 months have passed most of these patients will give a history of sjs around 6 months back so that is the time when they start having these problems more that is when they have this keratinization the entropion <laughs> this kind of problem happens and that is the time when you need to perform this surgery in acute stage the surface is not so bad and that is the time when you can just manage with an amniotic membrane graft all right so uh, my question was that suppose patient has reported to you immediately after sjs so like what will be your uh, preferred mode of treatment like uh, first you will go for amniotic membrane or you would like to wait till keratinization is occurring or you will preempt the creatinization by doing uh, mmg first yeah amniotic membrane at an early stage amniotic membrane graft copious lubrication use of topical steroids can actually prevent further more devastating complications so if a patient comes at a very early stage then in the acute stage yes uh, the uh, lubrication topical steroids and more conservative measures help and amniotic membrane graft does help and it can prevent the more severe keratinization and disturbance of the lid margin subsequently so at that stage it is for amg and lubricant now our experience at least amg does not really help uh, we have to go to mmg or mucous membrane graft but yes in a very acute case immediately i think that's the only modality of treatment yeah. so uh, we have had a very nice session and very uh, like uh, all the speakers they did justice with their talks so with this we come to the end of our session i thank everyone for attending the session and for participating in the session thank you
now i think we go for the next session our time is over thank you thank you thank you mukesh sir and thank you thank everyone you. for being there and uh, for a wonderful session now we are just about the time we have finished and we'll start with the second session uh, doctor yeah uh, moderator of the second yeah. session yeah uh, good morning all welcome to the session on aesthetics and ptosis uh, the session would be chaired by dr betharia sir co chair person is dr ak grover sir uh, as convener we have dr akshay nair and co convener is dr milin nayak so without much ado i would request the chair persons to start the proceedings betharia sir is there or grover sir you can start morning everyone we have an excellent session lined up and we are grateful to the boa for having given us the opportunity to organize this session we have uh, all the aspects of aesthetics and of functional surgery lined up but particular emphasis is on aesthetics ptosis and some grafts um i welcome you all on behalf of uh, all the chairpersons and co conveners and we also have dr betharia who's joined us now and i'll request him to say a few words before we hand you over for the start of the session dr betharia please chairman dr betharia can you unmute yourself please am i audible now yes sir now you are audible ha uh, good morning everybody and thank you dr ashok i think without wasting time let us start the session and i request uh, the convener to start conveying the session please uh, so dr akshinaya sir and uh, with uh, the permission of the chair we will start the session the first speaker is dr devraj shom sir Uh, sir has started sharing the screen his talk is on rejuvenation techniques for the under eye areas and we all know he is uh, one of us uh, who uh, does a very facial cosmetic work in the mumbai and is uh, world renowned for the same over to you devraj shom sir thank you so much sumit for inviting me here and uh, thank you so much to the entire boa my teacher dr lahane uh, dr ragini madam dr preetham uh, swapnesh uh, and all the other members of the boa thank you so much for having me here it's good to see friends in this pandemic out here uh, uh, my name is devraj shom and i will be speaking on under eye issues today and combination therapies for the same uh there are some financial disclosures which are in place i am a, a asia pacific uh, key opinion leader for allergan mers and aptos for approximately the past decade and uh, obviously acknowledgments needs to be given to the aesthetic clinics uh, the remaining consultants in the aesthetic clinics we are eight consultants at this moment uh i always say that the eyes say it all socially and otherwise when people look at each other they look into the eyes and when you look into the eyes it really conveys age whether it is a top bollywood superstar or it is any one of us aging spares no one and because the under eye area is an area which has the thinnest skin of the human body the rest of the face might look taut and might look young but it's the under eye area which really starts to convey age and we all know that the og curve is something which is a sign of beauty in males and females but is more easily demonstrable in females and this is best seen when the female is looking at 45 degrees it's basically a concavity below the under eye area followed by a convexity of the malar area followed by another concavity and then the convexity of the mandible so essentially this is a sign of youth and essentially what aging is that everything is sagging downwards and medially and if everything is sagging downwards and medially the under eye tissues are slowly and steadily shifting downwards leading to the nasolabial folds becoming more prominent as we age and under eye hollows uh, uh, developing as we go ahead and age as well the symmetry of the eyes are extremely critically important when you look at this beautiful model you possibly have not even noticed that there is an asymmetry in the lip 
And if you look carefully now that I bought it to your uh, notice, you will go ahead and see that the right side of the lip and the left side of the lip are very different from each other. And you did not notice this because the eyes are perfect mirror images of each other. So oculofacial plastic surgeons all over the world play a critical role in aesthetics because if you can operate on the eyes, you can operate on the brow and you can operate on all the surrounding areas, it does make for a very, very aesthetic face and it is something which can really transform faces in that sense. Now, as I said, the under eye areas show the earlier signs of ill health. Depending on whom you're speaking to, dermatologists may feel that fillers will be a panacea which will solve everything. Plastic surgeons believe that blepharoplasty is a similar thing. But actually, mm -hmm. the truth is that you will uh, go ahead and require uh, uh, all sorts of treatments, all different types of treatments in order to uh, treat people. When you look at this particular patient, the question that usually arises is, is, do we treat it medically? Do we treat it surgically? Or do we treat it both? And generally, under eye areas occur along a continuum. What that means is that basically what someone will treat with surgery, others will treat with laser and fillers. And actually having both tools in your armamentarium are very critical. And that's where I think the role of oculofacial plastic surgeons really amplifies. Now, obviously, even if you perform a surgery in this particular patient, the texture, the tone, the blemishes, the scars and the quality of the skin will not be addressed with surgery alone, which is why a lot of people are uh, 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 dissatisfied despite undergoing surgery. And that's something I think is very critical to add into our skills and armamentarium. Now, uh, we, uh, uh, over the years, have developed this nomenclature, which is related to landscaping. In my opinion, teaching is, has to be all about simplifying things. And if we can describe things according to nomenclature, which everyone understands, then it becomes easy to teach our juniors as well as demonstrate to our colleagues results for each condition. Now, for instance, if we call them troughs, tunnels, valleys, and mountains, each one of us knows what that means on, a, uh, 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 on land, and therefore it becomes easy to demonstrate it on the face. When we talk about troughs, we mean the theater of deformity. When we talk about tunnels, we talk about the hypertrophic orbicularis oculi. Valleys and mountains are something that we are aware of as well. And comparing this with landscaping allows us to understand the problems. For instance, you know, it's very important to understand the type of people that we are dealing with. Now, when this sort of a patient comes in, we understand that the theater of deformity in this 28-year-old is being caused by the reasons that I described earlier. The hollowness is going to worsen as they age. And as the hollowness worsens, the theater of deformity is going to look uh, worse. Of course, we can also see that there is a small mountain above the valley, but that mountain is more a, a relic of the way volume has disappeared out here. And therefore, treating this with fillers is the way to go forward. And the moment you treat it with fillers, you can see the lid cheek junction has actually shortened, which is the lower lid appears fuller. It appears much more uh, youthful. And that is what we are trying to create in that sense. Similar for this patient as well, young patient, really surgery, there's no role to play. And if you know how to use your Hylocross or your Y-Cross fillers, you'll be able to go ahead and treat these patients very easily. 15-minute procedure, they are out, they are happy. The results typically last about 18 months or so. And uh, who says surgery lasts a lifetime? So therefore, in these sort of patients, when, I, we, uh, when we see patients being treated with fat uh, restoration or fat surgery, uh, we think it's an overkill because A, fat surgery involves a surgery where you're removing fat from different parts of the body. And B, fat can be very unpredictable in the sense that they can, it can disappear, it can form lumps, and uh, you need to remove it. So in today's day and age, with the predictability and the longevity of the fillers, I think that it's uh, uh, not justified. It's the return on investment is not justified in performing surgery in these patients. Now, this is a slide from one of my closest friends, Dr. Milind, and uh, this is someone that everyone from LV Prasad will recognize. And uh, when she used to smile, she used to have these uh, uh, eyelid uh, uh, rolls which develop the hypertrophic orbicularis oculi rolls. And using, uh, in, in, in uh, photograph B, using the uh, 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 Botox in the hypertrophic orbicularis oculi roll actually flattens it and causes the eye to open up during smiling, which leads to a good feeling of youth. This is not how we inject the Botox, but uh, the results are very similar in the way we do it as well. Now, 
if you look at certain people who come into us so this lady came into us and she wanted to know if we could fix her squinting as she called it but when you look at the light reflex it's clear that there is no squinting as such but what there is is orbital dystopia you can see that the right side of the face looks very different from the left side of the face there's inferior scleral show in the right eye which is not there in the left eye even the configuration of the eyes is very different the right brow is also higher and when people like this end up smiling then you see that the hypertrophy the orbicularis oculi roll on the left side actually makes the eye look even smaller when they are smiling and when you put this into perspective with the fact that this particular lady is a model you can see why she is so distressed now in in conditions like this basically using botox and fillers can give results like these and this is the before and the after and you can see despite her smiling now the under eye area is flatter and the eyes look much more symmetrical it's not perfect but it's definitely a lot better and this was accomplished by using botox and fillers and you can do that without necessarily performing surgery which can be uh, a little uh, unpredictable in these patient there are also patients who will come in with eyelid bags she's 34 years old and the question that i always ask for the proponents of blepharoplasty is that even if you performed a transconjunctival blepharoplasty now given the fact that her eyelid tissues are weak and there is a protrusion of fat uh, which can be seen in the under eye area how many times can you perform blepharoplasty so therefore using fillers in these cases and this is immediately post the fillers you can see the injection marks you can actually camouflage the mountain by injecting the filler below the valley and by doing this in an appropriate manner 15 days later you can actually convert her to a situation where you can't even tell that she's had a procedure facial thread lifts are very critical and important for us and this is a non surgical treatment which is performed so the facial threads are basically like uh, row stems which have a lot of uh, uh, thorns in them and they engage the uh, uh, um, superficial subcutaneous fat pads and pull the face up thereby making the under eyes look much better these are our workhorse lasers which are very important as well the carbon dioxide laser being utilized for facial rejuvenation and the q switched ndag laser being used for the pigmentation which a lot of indians have or the dermal pigmentation which is seen in under eye dark circles these are some of the results which can be caused by combination sorry i'm i'm going a little fast but i in the interest of time don't have that much time available now so as a result of which using peels as well as using laser can make the under eyes look a lot better so you fill with the fillers you use the uh, that reduces the shadowing makes the under eye look better and then the use of peels and lasers makes the entire eye look much more natural and the skin merge better with the mid face now in patients who come like this many people would do surgery but you can also do non surgical stuff you can do fillers you can do carbon dioxide laser and uh, even though this is a slightly washed out photograph fact of the matter is that you can actually cause the skin to become tighter you can camouflage uh, uh, the uh, fat bags and therefore make people look younger even non surgically and of course combination treatment is the way forwards you can see crepey skin needs carbon dioxide laser you need to also go ahead and use the botulinum toxin and the fillers one person can have multiple problems and therefore combining the treatments leads to a very very good result and uh, of course there are roles for surgeries as well and patients like these there's no point in doing fillers doing a actual skin removal uh, doing a blepharoplasty making sure that the eyelid crease is created well making sure that the mid face lift has been done so that the uh, uh, mid face also which is a continuum of the lower eyelid looks much younger and using carbon dioxide laser can make people look much younger and that's the same type of procedure which has been done in this sort of patient as well now uh, uh in combination therapy when you see these sort of folds uh, sometimes you can also go ahead and do blepharoplasty but in blepharoplasty especially a subciliary route the one thing that should not be done is an excessive removal of skin because that can lead to a lower eyelid ectropion and lead to many problems in the future and therefore uh, removing skin conservatively and then using laser so laser in this case causes collagen formation laser also causes some shrinking of the skin on the face every millimeter is an inch and therefore utilizing each uh, uh, thing appropriately to reduce the risk and provide the best results becomes critically important okay, uh, Devan, are... could you please con conclude please we are already over time yes of course so all in all uh, i just wanted to say that is very important to uh, 
understand that there are multiple mechanisms of treatment and if we can diagnose patients appropriately and treat the under eye issues in a synergistic manner it really helps and obviously having a wide armamentarium will mean that we don't have only a hammer in our tool as one of my teachers used to say if a hammer is all you have everyone will start looking like a nail uh, thank you all for your kind attention and a very patient hearing thank you debraj for having brought out that perspective of the non surgical interventions in the management of lower lid aesthetics lower lid aesthetics as we know is much more challenging and uh, it's a part of a, a continuum of the mid face as well so having an overall perspective is vital and we will have the surgical part dealt with next and maybe then we can have some more questions from the audience and discussion let's have the uh, next talk then uh good morning is my screen visible yes yes okay uh, yes, thank you to bio uh, and the organizing team for this opportunity and the platform to speak on lower eyelid blepharoplasty uh, i think dr debraj has made my job much easier because he's explained the technicalities of uh, who is a you know what are the different options available so uh, an overview of what i'll be talking about is the assessment of a patient with uh, who, are, who who is a possible candidate for blepharoplasty uh, and then the different routes some complications and adjuvant or adjunct procedures so the point of uh, a thorough assessment of of a blepharoplasty patient is to know who is a good candidate and who is not and if a patient is a, a candidate for a blepharoplasty what is the ideal surgery and what additional things can be done uh, four things that are important to know is to identify the lower lid fat prolapse which is the most common reason patients typically come to us the excess skin on the uh, lower eyelid can also form what is what are called festoons and lower lid dermatocolitis and to differentiate that from the fluid bag seen on the upper cheek area which are the malar mounds and also to be able to to be able to uh, rule out thyroid eye disease so when a patient typically requesting requiring a blepharoplasty comes to you this is what they are usually looking like they are, you know in the middle aged and have lower lid fat bags one thing that i always do to understand what is the best route for them is to make them look up and typically the lower eyelid bags or the fat prolapse worsens on up gaze and when they look down as the uh, inferior rectus and the capsulopalpebral fascia tightens if fat gets pushed back in and you see that the lower lid fat bags improves on down gaze now this is typically in younger patients whereas in older patients you can see that uh, when they look up it definitely worsens but when they look down it doesn't completely go away and you still have excess skin lying there on the lower eyelid so here this excess skin that you see probably would require transcutaneous correction as opposed to transconjunctival which would have helped in the first phase also you can see that the lower eyelid position is lower you there is an inferior scleral show so suggesting that the lid is lagging there is lid laxity and possibly a lateral canthan uh, tightening procedure may help in this case uh, other thing like i mentioned earlier is to differentiate malar mounds and to identify where there is fluid as you can see in this patient multiple issues there is brow ptosis there is uh, unilateral ptosis uni bilateral dermatocolitis lower lid fat prolapse and malar mound so this is the whole works and to be you, one must identify what is what and offer the treatment accordingly uh, one size doesn't fit all uh, like dr debrat said often times patients come to us having been recommended a filler injection elsewhere or seeking an opinion for a filler injection Uh, these are two similar uh, patients who came with lower lid you know bags or bulges now if you see if i draw a, a, a imaginary mid pupillary line lateral to the mid pupillary line on the lower lid there is this fullness which is essentially the fat bag prolapse on the patient in the left whereas the younger patient on the right it is more of a focal bulge that is seen medially like uh, you know the hills and valleys So, uh, it's analogous to the hills and valleys so in a patient who has this lower lid fat prolapse extending across the entire lid it may not be a good idea to uh, offer a filler 
as you can see when she looks up it worsens and accentuates so using that to help to figure out which patient requires which procedure the patient on the left underwent a lower lid blepharoplasty transconjunctivally and the patient on the right had a tear trough filler which helped smoothen her lower lid fat uh, you know lower lid and tear trough deformity as well as the bulging so i'll speak a quickly about transconjunctival blepharoplasty even better i'll show a short video uh, assessment is important like i said uh, there are surface landmarks which are easily identifiable typically we see three bulges on the lower lid each of them correspond to a fat bag of a fat pad there is the medial the middle and the lateral fat pad the medial or the central and the lateral fat pad and between the medial and the central lies the inferior oblique muscle which is extremely important for us to identify during the surgery okay. local anesthesia is infraorbital and then i give uh, infiltration over the in the inferior fornix 4 mm below the tarsus is where the incision is made through the conjunctiva and the lower lid retractors and directly you have access to the fat pads now here you have to be very very gentle in opening up the fat pads they tend to be vascular and you tease them out and then excise them or transpose them depending on your comfort level i prefer excision rather than transposition or repositioning you open up the septa the fat pads tend to be a little painful so i always inject a little bit of anesthetic into it and then cut and finally when you excise them at the stock there could be a bleeder so it's a good idea to cauterize it as it goes on and finally the same thing for the uh, the the medial fat pad as well which is usually uh, extremely prominent in indians so they also appear as a largest fat pad the same procedure of injecting before excising and finally the same for the lateral fat pad as well again like i said we need to be careful between the central and the medial to avoid damage to the inferior oblique muscle three interrupted conjunctival sutures of sixo vicral are taken you can see immediately post op there's an excessive hollowing which usually fills up over time uh, it gives very very good reproduc reproducible results uh, transconjunctival blepharoplasty and patients are usually happy uh, even if patients who might otherwise work with uh, fillers blepharoplasty uh, offers a longer duration of effect and therefore uh, i prefer that in patients uh, rather than getting injected every 12 to 15 months transcutaneous blepharoplasty has very select indications and i'll quickly run through that uh, typically in older patients with skin excess as you can see in this gentleman uh, who came specifically surprisingly for a blepharoplasty it's important to know how much of skin to excise the minimum amount of skin that is pinched without altering the position of the lower lid as you can see now the lower lid is not going down is what you need to excise to make sure that there is no post operative lower lid retraction or ectropion a local infiltration then i take traction sutures always put in a corneal protector and over years i've shifted from a rf cautery to make the skin incision for lower lid blepharoplasty to a 11 number blade once that is done the skin a small strip of skin and orbicularis can be excised with the rf cautery you directly have access to the septum and the fat pads gradual dissection and like as you can see here the medial the central and the lateral fat pad are very well delineated again be conscious of the inferior oblique muscle that stays there uh conservative excision of the fat pads is important you can always bulge a little bit uh, press a little bit on the globe to see how much more bul the fat bulges out that is serving as a guideline to know when to stop removing fat meticulous closure is extremely important vicral or any other absorbable sutures for the orbicularis and then the skin wound is closed after appropriately redraping this also is the a surgical wound can give you access for lateral canthal fixation as well again uh, this also gives very very good and reproducible results if done well without causing lower lid retraction <coughs> there is a faint scar which is unavoidable in transcutaneous which remains a drawback for this route complications we need to be conscious about lower lid hematomas uh, indians tend to have ugly subciliary scars if especially if they are taken with an rf cautery so blade over rf meticulous closure can help in preventing scarring and if you see lid retraction occurring prevent it by being i mean the best way is to prevent it but immediate 
uh, use of 5-FU or steroids, or if needed, corrective surgery should be done early so as to not com uh, you know, compromise on functional outcomes later on. And finally, adjunct procedures. Uh, sometimes, like uh, was mentioned earlier, it, a, a blepharoplasty alone or a filler alone or Botox alone may not help, and you need to add multiple things to it. This is a lady with lower lid uh, fat prolapse. She said her eyes looked tired and had bulges under the eye. Uh, I offered her a transcutaneous, uh, trans uh, conjunctival blepharoplasty, and she was thrilled. But you can see that there is a slight skeletonization from bulging. Now she's come to having a slight theater of deformity. And uh, like Dr. Milinayak has mentioned in his article, this is a patient who has a valley, a, 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 a hill, and then again a valley. So this then can be smoothened out by smoothening the lid cheek junction with hyaluronic acid. And the eventual effect between the, the outcome from the before and after is, is very, very uh, acceptable. So to summarize, uh, it, we need to be a little careful in, in, hand, in choosing these patients and counseling them and letting them know what is a realistic expression, uh, expectation. Postoperatively, it's important to identify who is a dissatisfied patient versus who is a difficult patient. And preoperatively, you have to give full disclosure about risks and surgeries and show them multiple pre-post photos of different patients so that they understand what they are getting into. Uh, and as you can see in, from my presentation, the best way to always explain what you have done is to have photo documentation at every visit, which saves a lot of headache for you. Uh, so one size doesn't fit all. Counseling realistic expectations uh, before the surgery, thorough assessment before the surgery and knowing what works for which patient will help you uh, get great outcomes with lower lid blepharoplasty. If there are any questions, uh, I think we can take them at the end of the session. I will stop sharing my screen now. Thank you, Akshay. That was a wonderful talk and um, covered all the aspects very well. Maybe um, a question now uh, and then we can go on to the next one. Um, sure, sir. How often do you use the lower lid tightening along with a transconjunctival technique or the transcutaneous technique? So that's often an integral part. Yeah. So uh, in, in younger patients, they tend to require are more often treatment. the transconjunctival ones. Yes. So typically I end up using lateral canthal tightening through the transcutaneous route. Uh, the A, it gives better access and B, also the older age group is the demographics who have lower lid uh, laxity and sagging that needs uh, uh, that correction. Uh, I am myself not very comfortable with lower lid tightening transconjunctively. So even if there's a patient who has got a, who possibly is a good candidate for trans uh, conjunctival, if they need lower lid tightening, I end up doing a transcutaneous one. And what about uh, the choice of fat reposition? Would you do it in some cases? I, I oh, now I'm trying to shift, you know, I'm moving towards fat repositioning uh, as I see more patients who, you know, come back with a little hollowing, uh, possibly because of aggressive fat excision uh, during surgery. So fat uh, repositioning is a good option, but I just don't know about, uh, you know, fat like Dr. Debra said is a little unpredictable. So I don't know about the long-term outcomes. Uh, so I'm a little on the fence there. The only other thing that I'll re-emphasize, which you have already done, is the conservative excision of skin. And um, the problems arise and a number of cases that we see are basically because the assessment is being done in a lying down position, which is different from sitting up position. So any excision should be more conservative than you think, and it should have been decided in a sitting tall position. So I think those two things will save us a lot of difficulty. Right. Thank you, Thank you, Akshay. Wonderful presentation. We now go on to Kasturi for her talk on the upper eyelid blepharoplasty, which will complete the spectrum of the blepharoplasties. Uh, very good morning to all of you. Good morning, Grover, sir. Bikaria, Welcome, sir. Kasturi. Kasturi Thank has established herself as the drawn of aesthetic of the Thank you, sir. So, Dr. Sumit and all members of BOA, I congratulate you for having this Sunday session on oculoplasty and covering all the topics with so good, uh, I mean, speakers. So, I'll be making this topic very simple. Basically, I feel that this is a very common surgery which can be done by any other general ophthalmologist. 
But one thing I like to insist that besides having an aesthetic indication, this also has got a function indication. And this is a surgery which usually involves the eyelid skin, the muscle and the fat. And these are either excised or they are being redraped or they have been sculpted. So basically this word has come blepharoplasty. We know it is the eyelid and the plasticose means mold. So what Akshay was showing very beautifully he has shown. So we need to mold. We need to mold the, either the upper lid or lower lid. And the molding can be either in the forms of your repositioning or a customized excision. And today this blepharoplasty happens to be the second next common procedure next to cataract. Like I, I know that most of the surgeons are doing this and it has become a very common surgery for all the oculoplastic surgeons because of its both functional and a aesthetic indication. But when I talk about blepharoplasty, one should always remember basically globally, we have only two types, types of eyelid. One is a Caucasian and one is the Asian. And when you look to the eyelids, there's cross difference between the two. Like you can see the difference in the tassel height, the difference in the thickness, the difference in the thick, uh, I mean, the positioning of the crease. So we need to titrate, we need to customize whether we are doing a blepharoplasty in someone having more of a Caucasian orientation as for someone to having more of an Asian orientation. So as I have already shown, I think many of the lectures I have shown this, this is a very simple surgery but the most important, you need to have a good marking. The only challenge when you do an Asian eyelid is number one, there can be asymmetry of the crease. And number two, the crease usually comes out after two to three years. So the challenge is that you have to do the surgery where you can give them a permanent crease, number one. And along with it, you might have to uh, overcome many of the adjunct, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, aesthetic concerns and may require some aesthetics, uh, I mean, procedures extra. So the first you as usually remove the skin, then you remove the muscle, and then you uh, it's from going a little fast, then you need to expose the medial and the central fat bed, and you customize. It depends. If you have a full thickness skin like this, you need to excise the muscle. But in case you have a hollowness, I don't think anyone will excise the muscle. So the best way is you just customize and excise some of the central fat, and this medial fat, you can transpose it. Like many a times, I think in future, I can show you some of my videos. What I do, the medial fat, I transpose it and I detain it when I see an elevation. So like in my experience, what I have done, like initially all of us are very aggressive in, I mean, accessing the fat. But now one very important consideration, we need to see that there should not be a delayed post-operative heal, I mean, hollowing, usually seen after five to six years or the lateral hollowing or the lateral fullness that needs to be detained. So the end point of the surgery, which I already show is the slight eversion of the eyelashes. As you can see, this is a non-operated eye, eyelashes are straight and other being the operated eye, you can see the slight eversion of the eyelashes. So this is what, what I have already mentioned, the one of the most common, especially in Northeast India or in the North, very North of India, we, one of the most important indication is the eyelid crease. So the formation of the eyelid crease is very important because you need to give them a permanent crease and the crease should be seen even in the lateral case. You should not have something uh, overlapping out here and the crease is not being seen well. And many a times it is difficult to maintain a small crease as compared to a bigger crease. So the crease both in the front view and in the lateral view giving a very good tassel plate show is what is the important requirement. But many times what we see, like in this lady out here, you can see she has a single crease and she doesn't have the crease on the other side. So these are more challenging because now it should be very symmetrical and you need to touch both the eyelids in order to make a more symmetrical, like how in Marcus Gunn, we need to touch both the eyelids. In such situation, when you have an asymmetrical uh, lid crease, it is always better to touch both the eyelids and to have a very symmetrical lid following the surgery. So this is another patient with the asymmetrical lid crease that can be seen here. And another very important indication is the lash doses because they have the overhanging of the skin here and which pushes the lash touching the cornea. So you need to do a surgery, you need to lift the lashes so that this also has got a function indication. This is another one, uh, one boy, you can see there's so much of the eyelashes touching and this is the same patient you can see immediate. This you can still see the suture here approximately a week following the surgery where what I now I feel that every case of upper lip blepharoplasty, especially when you do an Asian upper lip blepharoplasty, you need to put the braces suture, which I'll be showing you. 
So the another important indication which has both uh, got both a functional and a cosmetic is when you see a very prominent gland, uh, gland lacrimal gland, and you can see the gland has been prolapsed. So as usual, you do the different steps of the blepharoplasty, and this is a lacrimal gland. You, you can see the gland is totally prolapsed. You, by looking at the color, you can make the difference. The fat is little yellowish, and the gland is little white, and you need to push it inside, and you need to put a different type of suture. Initially, I used to proline, but I feel the polydeck is a good material and I usually put a um, one or two metric suture you take the first bite through the capsule and the pericapsular tissue and the second bite what you do you pass it to the periosteum so once you pass this suture this is usually a metric suture you can see the gland remains push inside and once it is pushed I ha hardly have seen any recurrence usually you can give an additional two to three sutures so with this metric suture which is passed through the capsule of the gland and the second suture through this periosteum, you can reposition uh, reposition the gland. So likewise, along with it, you can give another two or three sets of suture. And here in this case, only you can customize and titrate some, you excise some amount of fat. But as because she already has got a beautiful crease, you don't need to form any lead crease. And this is how at the end of the surgery, very customer, you do not excise more because you don't want her to have a skeletonization, which Asha has shown so well. So this is the girl, the same girl, this is before and after the operation. And you can see that aesthetically and also the volume has already stood. We have not excised much. And so you can see the lateral is still there and especially in elderly people like her when you want to retain you want to retain the lateral fullness and this is what I have seen if you excess too much of fat this gets lost in in uh, in the subsequent years so what we do we usually use the braces suture like braces suture is something very simple but if you want you you usually need to pass the suture through the lower end of the orbicularis and then the upper end of the orbicularis and pass it through the arcus marginalis. So two to three switches like this, it really helps to retain the fullness. Why it retains the fullness? Two ways. What it does, number one, it leaves the lateral eyebrow and the roof, which is just above it, it makes a barrier for the roof to come down. So that fullness, the sub fullness remains re uh, retained if you give an additional brazier suture. As you can see here, even like in most of my surgeries, along with a routine blepharoplasty, I usually give the brazier suture to retain this sub fullness, which is usually evident. So, and sometimes these are real challenging cases. These are the cases which there's so much of loss of skin elasticity and this usually occurs. Sorry, I think I have misplaced it. Okay, uh, it's fine. Uh, can you see my slide? I think it got disconnected, right? Mm. It's okay. We cannot see your slide at present. I don't know what happened. Something has happened. Okay, let me see. This only the last slide. Ignore. But it is okay, uh, even if it is not opening. And uh, so these are some of the challenging situation uh, that can happen. And if so, like uh, when we have an extend, uh, like situation like this with a droopy hood, we need to do a very, very extended blepharoplasty. And in such situation, what, can you see my slides now? No, we can't. Stop sharing. Then, okay, I will not waste time. So there is something known as extended blepharoplasty where normally, you can at least see me. Sir, yes. Can you see me? Okay, yes. normally when we do a blepharoplasty, we need to have an incision just a little medial to the lateral canthus. But when we do an extended blepharoplasty, the lateral end must be at the lowest point of the lateral hooding. So the first point as usual, the 10 millimeter, which we give the, for the crease, but the point, the lateral point should not end at the lateral canthus. It should end at the lateral point or the lowest point of the hooding. And we need to form an obtuse angle, approximately a 15 degree and do the rest of the procedure. Along with it, we always need to do a LPS plication because LPS plication helps along because these are the patients who will have some amount of ptosis. So along since we we are already doing an anterior approach. If we do a uh, anterior spication, it helps also to overcome the little amount of doses. So these are some of the different ways of surgical adjuncts along with the internal broke vaccine. But the main difficulty, especially what I see that sometimes there can be an asymmetry of the lead crease number one, the lead crease may not be permanent that which we usually see in many of the situation. And number three, I have seen like, uh, especially I have seen many uh, the new people starting doing, they have some 
uh, even I could see some amount of lead retraction following a blepharoplasty. So if we know the anatomy and if we respect the tissue, we should not overdo, better to underdo. And I think that gives a more better long-term result. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kasturi. That was a wonderful exposition. A lot of your experience brought in. And uh, of course, we need to understand the differences that exist in the management of so-called Asian, which we should probably call Oriental if we consider ourselves also as Asians. <laughs> so that blepharoplasty and the blepharoplasty in the rest of the um, Indian population, because um, maybe the central part of fat does not need to be excised in most people. The lacrimal gland needs to be handled only largely in cases of dermatocalysis with uh, uh, lacrimal gland laxity and so on and the lid crease formation is not needed in most cases of blepharoplasties which are being done for non-orientalized but a wonderful exposition she gave all her experience all the important finer points in the management the older patients are really a challenge and you really need to make sure that you don't make them look 16 right so <laughs> Thank you. And uh, we'll go on to the next talk then by Dr. Milin Naik. Milin um, will talk to us on medical and surgical management of facial spas. Milin is mm -hmm. again a pioneer and a teacher for a whole generation of oculoplastic surgeons and a wonderful teacher and speaker at that. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Dr. Betheria, Dr. Grover, and my uh, colleagues. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, Dr. T.P. Lahane, sir, uh, Ragini, madam, and even Sumit for putting up this great program along with Dr. Honav. So uh, I would be talking about management. And uh, just to respect the time allotted, I will focus on three aspects. One is how to identify the spasm, second is the injections, and third is a little bit about my team. So for identification of spasm, I always suggest and teach the fellows to follow this simple quadrantic algorithm. So if you assume nose as the center of your face, you can divide the face into four quadrants. And if your spasm is just within one quadrant that to a single eyelid, then that is more likely to be a myopenia. If you have the upper two quadrants involved, that is benign essential blepharospasm. If you have either side of the face involved, like a upper and a lower quadrant, then that's hemifacial spasm. And if you have a BEB along with lower facial dystonia, then that would be called as a Meek syndrome. So you pretty much can fit all the facial spasms into this. Here is a, a short video and a slide of uh, botulinum toxin being used for a patient of benign essential blepharospasm. Here, your site of injections might vary based on your training and speciality, but usually we have a couple of eyelid spots and the brow spots, and the lower facial can be added if the patient also has meat syndrome. So two to three millimeters above the punctum and below the punctum. I'm sorry to three millimeters above the canthus and below the canthus, another point, a centimeter lateral to the lateral canthus is what I usually follow, these five spots for the eyelid. And brow would be depending upon how much is the brow protraction in a particular patient. On similar lines, uh, hemifacial spasm affects only one half of the face. In these patients, you have to do imaging to rule out a vascular group syndrome. But this is a lady who was treated with botulinum toxin. And you can see the reduced spasm although it doesn't disappear fully, but the twitching definitely reduce, reduces a week or two after the injection. So the sites which we talk about in hemifacial spasm, apart from the uh, eyelid and the brow indication uh, areas, would also be your zygomaticus major and minor at its upper end, and the levator labi, which is usually injected in medial to the nasolabial fold. And mentalism platysma can be injected based on what the patient wants. Just to touch upon a fact that here you have option in the upper eyelid of injecting either pretarsal or preceptor. 
And we recently concluded a split phase study where we did pre-tarsal on one side and pre-sectal on the other. And we found that the pre-tarsal is the one which gives a longer effect. The patient is happier with this and it has low incidence of ptosis, but it has higher incidence of lag of thalamus, which is short-lived after the injection. One second. Here is a case of apraxia of yeah. lid opening where you can see that there's a lag between when you ask him to open the eye and when he's actually able to do that. Yeah. So there's a confusion between the levator and the orbicularis. And this can be life-threatening for the patient. And the botulinum toxin injections for these patients have to be slightly different. You have to kill the entire pretarsal muscle right up to the lateral campus. So here I'm injecting three spots instead of two in the upper eyelid, a medial, a central, and a lateral. And one more additional is given at the lateral campus. So the closer you are to the lashes, uh, the better is the benefit in apraxia. Sometimes apraxia is unmasked after a treatment of BEB. And if these patients still complain of not being able to open the eye, then you can just give them a central eyelid injection at two weeks and that takes care of it. See that one so you can see the reduction in that lag he had. He's not absolutely normal, but he's far better than what we started off with. Similarly, post-facial palsy patients who have reduction in palpable aperture can be treated with Botox. Finally, coming to orbicularis myectomy, which could be limited or extended, you basically have to separate the orbicularis muscle from the skin, carefully preserving the dermal plexus of vessels and the septum and remove the entire muscle. And here I'll share a new concept that we are trying at the Institute. We have just initiated a study which is a nerve integrity monitor being used to do fine peripheral neurectomies while you are doing a myectomy. So now, what is the standard analysis of So we first mark the frontal nerve, and then we go on searching for the terminal branches of the nerve while we are doing the myectomy. So we have initiated a study where we would be doing the split phase of traditional myectomy on one side, and a NIM assisted myectomy on the other side, and we'll be looking at the results. So, just to summarize, uh, we talked about the quadrantic algorithm to identify spasms. Uh, toxin pretarsal is better based on the study we conducted in house. And myectomy, we have NIM assisted version to look forward to. Thank you. Thank you, Milan. Beautiful classification covered very succinctly and with all points covered well. Any, any questions from any panelists, any of the uh, any uh, moderators with any questions from the audience for any of the previous questions? Otherwise, and we can proceed on to the next talk. Yes, sir. We can move to the next talk. Yes. Okay. So the next talk is by Dr. Girish Nehete who will give us an overview of ptosis simplified. Thank you, sir. My screen visible? Yes. Uh, yes, Girish, yes, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, BOA and uh, MOS, for giving me the opportunity. I'm a little nervous to present myself uh, as I got slot in stalwarts uh, of the oculoplasty. Uh, I will be talking about ptosis in a simplified manner. Ptosis is a used topic, so I will try to cover it uh, as my best. Uh, it is grossly can be uh, divided into the congenital and acquired variety. In congenital ptosis, uh, it can be simple or with sin kinetic movement, Marcus Gunn, John Wigton, Phenomenon, and with the hypo, uh, hypotropia. It is also called double elevator palsy. In uh, case of acquired ptosis, uh, there are different varieties like uh, myogenic, neurogenic, caponeurotic, mechanical, and traumatic. 
detailed history of the patient is uh, important to arrive at the diagnosis whole photographs are also important uh, thorough examination uh, is uh, important to uh, arrive at the diagnosis and uh, perform the surgery to get the optimum results i will not go to into the details of the examination uh, i will show uh, some of the tosis gallery uh, cancer has been taken from uh, patients this patient a uh, 3 year old patient come uh, with a, a chin elevation and drooping of the both lips this is a congenital ptosis frontal slim surgery was done to correct uh, it posture also get corrected post operatively uh, this is a young lady comes with both eye ptosis uh, on looking down uh, there is a, a conspicuous lid lag so uh, lid lag is also a sign of congenital ptosis another case of uh, uh, congenital ptosis presenting uh, a whole family blepharophimosis syndrome uh, this consists of blepharophimosis uh, severe ptosis telecancer epicanthus inversus and sometimes lower lid ectopia uh, surgery was carried out uh, uh, double z plasty and uh, frontal sling surgery was done to correct the ptosis and patient was also having a high, high hypermetopia is given uh, was given spectacle another case of blepharophimosis which i encountered in the opd so we have done a uh, study is yb plasty and uh, frontal sling surgery in one step surgery only so we could put, uh, we could get a good result this was the case uh, of the acquired phimosis uh, the patient was from tribal area uh he, uh, he was he was having a trauma by the uh, wild animal so we have divided the upper and uh, lower lid and uh, tried to form the palpable aperture lower lid uh, tendal flap was done and we could get this result another case of uh, uh, severe ptosis uh, boggy swelling over the upper lid and multiple capillary spots so just uh, neurofibroma of the upper lip in case of uh, this patients debulking and uh, sling surgery can be carried out but uh, most of the time it recurs uh, young uh, boy come with the ptosis with irritable eye and reversion of the lid uh, reveals the diagnosis there was a giant papillae cobblestone papillae of the palpable conjunctiva After giving conservative line of treatment, uh, to see get corrected. Uh, very old uh, lady, uh, almost uh, 85 year old lady, come with the severe ptosis and uh, boggy swelling, cystic swelling over the upper lid. So, palpation uh, and uh, CT scan of the orbit reveal there is a cystic mass uh, inside uh, the orbit. We have carried out the surgery to take out the uh, mass, and she had. underwent uh, retinal detachment surgery 25 years back so it, in the cyst uh, it is a uh, scleral buccal and 40 suture was there inside so after excising the cyst and uh, attaching reattaching the levator aponeurosis you could get this result young lady presenting with the mechanical ptosis uh, swelling over the purplish black swelling over the upper lid Uh, excision and uh, tendal flap technique uh, gives good result old age man presenting with boggy swelling over the upper lid uh, palpation and eversion of the lid uh, leads to the diagnosis of the pinkish uh, mass inside the uh, eyeball uh, it, it was a lymphoma of the young lady uh, presenting with the boggy swelling or the upper lid and somewhat hypoglobus so uh, eversion again eversion uh, leads to the diagnosis some uh, purplish cystic mass was there inside so we have advised a ct scan of the orbit there was a cyst uh, cystic uh, mass along the roof of the orbit so two injection of the injection trimethylone acetate was given and we can make out the supratarsal sulcus uh, post Uh, injection old man presenting with the moderate uh, ptosis uh, 
within a, a no six month period and inversion of the uh, upper lid again reveal the diagnosis uh, we have sent a mass for uh, biopsy it was a squamous cell carcinoma the patient uh, actually lost for follow up but again came after uh, few months yeah, the excentration was done by uh, onco surgeon a middle aged person presenting with the severe ptosis in the opd so simple bedside test like uh, ice pack test can uh, be carried out to reveal the diagnosis so it was a myasthenic uh, uh, myogenic ptosis so in case of that ptosis can be unilateral and defective convergence is the early feature another case of uh, myasthenia gravis uh, treatment is conservative oral anticholinesterase inhibitors and oral short course of steroid can be given the young boy presenting with the severe ptosis the uh, covering the normal fixating eye reveals the diagnosis of pseudotosis nowadays many of the patient uh, presenting in the opd post uh, covid uh, because of third nerve palsy so this is one of the case of third nerve palsy process the lady came with the ptosis uh, with acute onset uh, nothing much significant uh, find out uh, in, in uh, uh, examination and investigation so we have tried a, a short course of oral steroids and uh, within a few weeks uh, our ptosis uh, was corrected old man presenting bilateral ptosis was basically by brow ptosis we have carried out brow plastic and blepharoplasty to correct the ptosis so one can easily make out uh, looking at the photograph uh, in this patient there is ptosis and uh, eyebrow is on lower side uh, actually in case of ptosis uh, the eyebrow should be on the higher side so it was a clear case of hysterical ptosis after some uh, or counseling patients uh, was ready to open both eyes so to conclude uh, management of the congenital uh, ptosis is surgical uh, at the earliest possible to 2 uh, years or 3 years and uh, in case of acquired ptosis uh, always evaluate always feel free to palpate and evert the upper lid and uh, necessary investigations can be carried out for the treatment of the cause and surgical management surgical options include uh, mild ptosis uh, with uh, good levator function excellent levator function uh, facinella servet is carried out in case of moderate ptosis good levator function levator resection can be carried out and in case of severe ptosis with poor levator function frontal sling surgery so uh, uh, to conclude as my documenter dr nitin trivedi is used to say Uh, the best results will be obtained by fitting the operation to the patient and not the patient to the operation thank you thank you doctor thank you dr girish that was a very nice collection of cases some very nice results including the man particularly with the telecanthus traumatic telecanthus was very beautifully done and you need not be nervous we all have a long way to go in learning and you are better than what i was at your age <laughs> we'll go on to uh, dr shubhra goel who, who has a vast experience in oculoplastic and aesthetic surgery and we always look forward to her and very nice talks so she talks to us on management of ptosis by a small incision thank you very much uh, sir for your introduction and at the outset uh, thank you dr lane sir dr ragini somit and dr honawar for putting up such a wonderful show and having me on board amongst all the esteemed speakers colleagues and friends um so my talk has been uh, i will be sharing some thoughts on small incision ptosis uh these are my disclosures and before we jump into any procedure uh, and it holds true for ptosis as well that we need to understand whether it is really ptosis 
and should we really be operating and if yes how so i think we all have our shares of uh, experiences and cases where we have diagnosed it uh, something else and we land up doing something else so it is very important to understand what are we dealing with so i'll just touch upon in view of uh, blepharoptosis is that for example this is the patient who was sent uh, for blepharoplasty or brow lift surgery but actually uh, sorry for for ptosis surgery and what she actually had is brow ptosis and her mrds were equal and she didn't need a ptosis surgery another patient who walked in into the clinic saying that her left eyelid is drooping but what she had was a uh, retraction in the other eye and she was a case of um, thyroid eye disease when was examined in detail so i'll just focus my discussion on what has been simplified in terms of dealing with ptosis surgeries amongst various techniques and te you know methods which have been there in the in the arena of surgical uh, you know discussions uh, it started way back in 1992 where the aponeurotic ptosis surgery was tried to made very simple with a simple tuck suture and then in 1999 where the wisconsin group came up with a small incision external levator repair surgery and uh, you know validated the results uh, why it is more uh, you know it's better than the routine or the conventional ptosis surgeries uh, because it gives us a better height contour and the recovery and the post operative edema is lesser as compared to the conventional procedure now it may vary in surgical hands but in general the small incision surgery has better recovery and faster recovery and lesser edema and when it was compared uh, with the uh, the small incision was compared with the traditional approach what was noted is that the high effectivity or the contour was uh, the high effectivity was equal versus the contour was superior and it was much quicker procedure by the same surgeon who did uh, who did a control study on the same patient with bilateral ptosis one with conventional and one with small incision surgery now uh, the this kind of a procedure works best when you're dealing with involutional ptosis or anophthalmic sockets who have aponeurotic ptosis deep superior sulcus uh, where you don't want to have too much of excision of the skin or dealing with the orbicularis muscle and definitely in younger patients even in resection cases i've tried few cases and it works wonderfully so this is a short video which i'll be sharing uh, so if the incision can be smaller than what i have taken here it depends on case to case so you can titrate the incision size based on the case we are dealing with usually if patient has a heavy dermatoculosis it's better to take a little longer incision because uh, you know you have a better exposure and the steps remain the same where you expose the tarsus go and expose the aponeurosis uh you know uh, lead to the preaponeurotic fat uh isolate it look at the junction and just take the adjusting sutures usually a single tuck sutures does wonders but if there is too much of dehiscence of the aponeurosis even you know two tuck sutures can be taken but the small incision surgery is usually beneficial with a single tuck sutures so this is the result at the end of the procedure on table and you can combine it with or without extra excision of the skin if it may require for the bilateral adjustments and if a patient has an extra uh, dermatoculosis so these are few of the examples where uh, you know the procedure was carried out this was a simple case of uh, by you know the uh, mild aponeurotic ptosis with the brow ptosis mm -hmm. and this is how patient was on day 3 after the procedure so you can see the amount of post uh, operative edema the uh, recovery is is much faster or much better as compared to the conventional full thickness of full incisions which we take another individual very old with bilateral ptosis with severe brow ptosis and this is what we had done for him again a very very uh, i think at the incision was not more than 2.5 to 3 mm to per se and i was just chasing to the epineurotic just single tuck and that's all we did for the patient because he was also on anticoagulants and it was a pretty helpful procedure another patient post glaucoma surgery had a blep so we had to do minimal for him and just did a single, single tuck a uh, small incision procedure patient with blepharocalysis also can be dealt in a similar manner if there is not a large amount of fat prolapse or lacrimal gland prolapse the surgery can work wonders where you can have a minimal excision of the skin along with the uh, you know uh, 
uh, without the skin excision for it in, in this case. So these are some of the articles which were published or chapters which were there, which I had the privilege to write on and one can go through. This is more for the uh, benefit of the postgrad students. So some of the tips in the small incision dosis surgery is that we have to walk up to the epidurals and reach the superior ligament. Slightly placing the suture medially always gives a better contour whenever you're doing a single stuck suture. And do not consider lit crease as a very important factor in such cases because we are just going, a, going to give a small cut and we really are not disturbing the lit crease in such cases. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you so much, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, that was really simplified and small incision that really works well. Ma'am, just a quick question. Uh, how, in, in case you need to, you know, if there's a slight undercorrection for revision, do you still prefer to go in with a small incision or then do you make it a larger? Uh, no, if there is an undercorrection, you will know it on, you will know it on the second or third post-operative day and within the one week period is where you will just go back and titrate your sutures and it's exactly the same same incision and the same site because these are the cases where just there is a dehiscence so it's all about titrating your sutures and I haven't done the adjustable sutures in a small incision tosis surgery because it doesn't make sense uh, but yeah I, I don't and in my hands uh, probably if I have done let's say 10 surgeries uh, the the percentage of revisions would be one or two cases because it's pretty pretty accurate on table because you're just doing a single duck suture. Okay, thank you, ma'am. And I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Professor A. K. Grover, who's been a teacher of generations and literally a teacher of teachers. Uh, he is, of course, at Sir Gangaram Hospital and Vision Eye Centers in Delhi, and he'll be telling talking to us on uh, hard palate grafting for malpositions. Thank, Thank you, Akshay, for your kind words. I hope you can see my PPD. Yes, sir. So I'll be moving out of line with what has been presented so far, tosis and uh, aesthetics. I'm talking about the use of hard palate drafting for eyelid malpositions, which I found quite useful. I only started using it during the last four to five years and have done about five cases so far and I'm enjoying using it. So the hard palate graft is indicated for cases which have a middle lamina or a posterior lamina shrinkage causing eyelid retraction or entropion. This is particularly true for the lower lid. And the cases include the inflammatory eyelid retractions as in trauma or in previous surgical cases, previously operated cases which have not worked out. Thyroid eye disease is another common indication where lower eyelid retraction can be troublesome. And some of the blepharoclasty cases where anterior lamina is not the problem, but the middle or posterior lamella is. It is also useful in eyelid and socket reconstruction, but we are going to use it, we are going to talk about the entropion and eyelid retraction cases today. So what are the options when we judge there to be a middle or posterior lamina shortage and we need to replace them. We often use spacers such as the spheral grafts, ear cartilage and materials such as allodum, all of which have their own shortcomings. And we use for the reconstruction, both of the mucosa as well as for the uh, support, the nasal mucocartilage or a tarso conjunctival flap or a graft or a hard palate graft. All of them have their own merits and demerits. The hard palate graft has some advantages. It provides us both the mucosal lining as well as the stiffness required that obviates the need for a support like tarsus. It's easy to harvest and you get enough amount that you need. It is autologous, so problems associated with a graft taken from uh, somebody else with the viral issues and so on and so forth uh, are taken care of. It takes up well, very well and uh, shrinking is very minimal. So you don't need to use too much excess and complications are rare. So what you need to assess is that there is a shortage. There is an inability to stretch it, especially if you stretch it upwards, you will notice that you can't stretch the lid and you differentiate it 
from those with a shrinkage in the anterior lamina. And then you know that it is possibly a posterior lamina that needs replacement. You also need for, to look for eyelid laxity, which also needs to be addressed at the same time. Let's look at the surgical technique. The hard palate graft harvesting is the first critical step. And the location where you take it from is medially, just short of the mid middle raffe, anteriorly up to where the soft part of the rugi start, laterally, right up to the part where the curvature changes for the uh, teeth, and posteriorly up to the junction of the hard palate and the soft palate. So there is a considerably large part that you can take for, and if you need bilateral, you can do it bilaterally. That is the advantage. And you start by marking an incision, which is a couple of millimeters below the tarsal border. And I use a traction suture to rotate the eye upwards. Then you carry out a dissection. Now this dissection is carried out between the orbicularis oculi and the septum and the retractors. And you, then you also need to make sure that your retractors are free. You can give lateral incisions to take care of the horns or lateral or medial supports of the lower lid retractors. Make sure that this is free. Look at the defect that is present and then thin out your graft on your fingertips. Make sure that you remove the glandular and the fat tissue on the undersurface and size it about a millimeter larger or millimeter or two larger than your requirement of the width and the length. Make sure that you have enough to go medially, adequately medially, because a shortage on the medial side is often a bad result. And uh, make sure you have enough of it. So you give your incisions from somewhere near the punctum to right up to the lateral canthus. And then you place your graft in, usually with some 6-0 white fill sutures, you can use combination of interrupted and continuous. I've used interrupted here. Let's look at this short video. So this is a lower lid retraction that you can see due to previous trauma, scarring, failed case earlier, use traction sutures and passed in, covered the cornea to protect it and past attraction feature. Now this is the marking, which you'll see extends from near the punctum up to the lateral canthus, and you open up with an RF or a knife. We've used some xylogain with the dindolin, given it some time to get, in order to get good hemostasis. And then a dissection is important. It is important to lyse all additions. So you go right up to the inferior orbital margin to make sure that you've freed the retractor, you've freed all the additions and given the lid all the freedom to move. And now we are thinning down the graft so that it takes a well. You leave behind just about a millimeter and a half of thickness, but it has enough firmness. And you measure the size and choose the size that you would need and you place it in position and then anchor it well. Make sure that you are maybe a millimeter or two higher than the uh, inferior limbus when it is positioned rather than much higher because you don't get too much shrinkage in these cases. So you can put in the sutures as you would anywhere and that completes the technique. You have to guard against infections, very rare, but a hematoma does take place sometimes in this area. So you have to achieve a good hemostasis at the end of the procedure and post-operatively make sure that they avoid hot things or things with um, salt so that they are comfortable. Graft necrosis is rare, pain can be common and they can be over or under correction. So those have to be particularly guarded against. So this was a patient who had had multiple surgeries before and had a bad lower lip retraction. There was a restricted upward motility as well. First, a squint surgery was done and then a graft was placed and we could get a good position um, as required. And it has, it has really transformed her life. So she's very happy with her, her present appearance. This is another illustration of a patient who's again had multiple, multiple surgeries following a trauma, 
including for telecancers, including for ptosis, including for multiple procedures for entropion, which was not getting corrected. She still had entropion and it was a downward displaced cancer. So we realized she needed more filling up of the inferior conjunctival area with replacement. We repositioned the lateral canthus by breaking up all previous attachments, making new attachments, and making all the additions a long, long procedure and combined it with a, a graft heart palate, large heart palate graft, which gave us a much better position and corrected her entropy, and it was otherwise in, incorrigible. So heart palate graft is a valuable tool in the armamentarium of us for correction of eyelid malpositions in appropriate cases. Of course, you can use it for reconstructions more often in the lower rather than in the upper lid, but for several other situations, it is a valuable tool and we should have it as a part of our armament data. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, that was really enlightening. Uh, I have the pleasure of uh, inviting the next speaker, uh, a very senior oculoplastic surgeon in Mumbai and a close friend of ours, Dr. Rupali Sinha, who will be speaking on predictable outcomes in LPS resection surgery. Dr. Rupali, your, uh, we, we are seeing the speaker view. I'm sorry. We are seeing you, which is most welcome. <laughs> Thank you, sir. No, unfortunately, Geo is just confusing. It's okay. I think even if speaker presenter view is happening, at least we'll see something. Yes, no, the share screen is just not happening. Excellent. Has it, has it come in now? Yes, now we can see it. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, so good morning, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Lahane sir, Dr. Ragni Man, Dr. Munawar sir, and uh, Sumit for giving me this opportunity. I'm going to talk about uh, predictable outcomes in LPS resection surgery. Thanks to... Uh, Dr. Shubra and um, thanks to Dr. Shubra and Dr. Girish and Dr. Pasturi, we've already covered most of courses. So I'm going to just talk about uh, how to improve the outcomes in the aponeurotic surgery. First is the lid crease. We will mark the lid crease um, with matching it with the other eyelid. And then going on to the surgery, once the lid crease is marked and we've taken a, we've given a local block, we take a skin incision and we uh, will dissect out the orbicularis muscle. Then finding the LPS aponeurosis after opening up the orbital septum, the LPS aponeurosis is then dissected out from the tarsal plate and the underlying Muller's muscle. An appropriate suture at an appropriate level, we take a suture with a 6 of proline, the central suture taken first. Care should be taken that we don't take it through the entire thickness of the tarsal plate and we attach it in the middle one third of the anterior surface of the tarsus and we'll check for the lid contour. If uh, the lid contour looks acceptable, then we take the medial and the lateral sutures with the same 6 of proline. This is a monocryl with which the lid crease is being formed, taking the orbicularis and the levator, and then the orbicularis again. And the skin can be closed with proline, either interrupted or continuous sutures. Now, the ideal result of a surgery would be, let me not only in the palpebral aperture height, but also with a good contour of the lid and with symmetry between the eyelids, the eyebrows and the eyelashes with good blinking. So for this soft tissue, which should look synchronous, which should look symmetrical, we should take care of 
pre-operative valuation and seeing the position of the brow, as we can see in the left eye, the brow on the right side is elevated, probably because of overuse of the frontalis. Also, the important me measurements that we should consider are the brow fat span, the tarsal platform show, of course, the MRD1 and the palpable aperture height. And take care to look at the position of the lashes in case there is lash torsos. This is the post-operative, uh, this is uh, the result after the surgery where we can see more or less the eyebrows come back to the same level. And not only is the palpable aperture height better, but the brow fat span and the tarsal platform show are also somewhat equal, giving it a much better result. We should also take care to look, show to the patient that they have inferior scleral show if they have it preoperatively. So this is the pre and the post of the same girl who underwent a left aponeuroticosis surgery. A similar patient with uh, aesthetic results, not just because of the palpable aperture height, but by taking in view all the other aspects of uh, the soft tissue as well. Now, what does one do with overcorrection? For overcorrection, we can uh, manage either just by massage, by warm compressors if it's useful, if it's a small amount of overcorrection, or by doing lid tugs while the patient is looking down to teach the patient how to tug at the lid and make the sutures on the aponeurosis a little loose. Sometimes we even need to operate such patients and uh, especially a temporal suture in case we're doing a smaller, smaller surgery or lesser correction, we may even not take the temporal suture if there is appropriate correction just by taking the cent central and the medial or the nasal suture. If there's a patient who has multiple lip creases because of prior surgeries or lash doses, or both, like in this lady, then we can take out a small sliver of the skin where these multiple lip creases are, if there is excess skin, and then make an appropriate lip crease. For the lash doses, uh, just like Dr. Kasturi had shown in her wonderful video, we take an incision through, we take a suture through the lid crease incision, which is closer to the lash line, right? and then we will attach it at a higher level onto the aponeurosis, NPS aponeurosis, and look for eversion of the eyelid margin so that we correct the lip lash doses. For a better result in a herring's uh, low positive process, in the sitting position, we can mark the palpable aperture height of the non-totic lip and keep that as the correction endpoint when the patient is on table. And this, of course, should be demonstrated to the patient along preferably with the patient's own video, that this is what is happening when we are elevating your lid, your normal eye is coming down a little. And that's the result that we are going to achieve. So this could be an important part of the documentation in Herring's Law. I think if we take care of all of these factors, then we can get very good results, very predictable results in cases. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rupali, and thank you for the social distancing message also. Uh, our uh, last speaker, but definitely not the least, is Professor Betharia, who is the uh, president of incoming president for the uh, Oculoplasty Association of India and has been a teacher for generations. Uh, and he'll be giving us his wisdom on 10 pearls in ptosis surgery. Professor Vitharia. Sir, unmute yourself. Am I audible now? Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Ashok, Dr. Akshay Nair, and all the office bearers of the Bombay Ophthalmic Association for having me with all of you. Most of the points are covered in TOSI surgery, but I would like to emphasize uh, some my 10 pearls. So 
in different parts of the tosis surgery like facinella servet i'll give you some pulls then uh, levator surgery mm -hmm. then sling surgery and then excision of the levator mm -hmm. when you want to abolish the marcus gun phenomena so coming to the facinella servet operation as you know uh, lps action very good 10 mm and 1 to 2 mm of tosis i think our uh, method which we devised right back in the year 1983 which was published in bjo and was an outstanding article and also published in yearbook of ophthalmology 1984 works very well the important point here is me and ashok and late dr karl ravel the authors of this paper and here what we have done is we have used instead of putterman's clamp or the artery clamps we have used two sets of sutures the advantage of using the two sets of sutures is the posterior set of sutures is useful for holding when you are suturing and you can excise 4 mm of the tarsal plate very nicely from one end to another which gives rise to minimum notching and you are able to get a good contour and we have given a subconjunctal suturing so that to avoid the corneal abrasion because the central tenting and the corneal abrasion these these were the two problems of the original facinella servet operation so i think this uh, operation works very well for small amount of tosis 1 to 2 mm with 10 mm of lps action now coming to the levator surgery you see the main problem of levator surgery is under correction under correction is a rule and over correction is an exception so i think to get rid of this problem of under correction what we should do is we should plan for over correction in all cases of congenital ptosis wherein you find the levator action is usually say 5 mm 6 mm 7 mm this is these are the levator actions in most of our cases of congenital ptosis so and other important thing here is how will we increase the amount of correction that means we have to go to the superior transverse ligament of vitnal identify the superior transverse ligament of vitnal cut the horns generously and mobilize the muscle because once we cut the horns and mobilize the muscle that will reduce our leg lag and then we can pass the sutures somewhere near the superior transverse ligament vitnal so that we are able to give a good correction of the of these cases of ptosis i think there is some dis there is some disruption uh, in this there is some disruption in my talk am i am i audible now yes sir you are audible okay okay so what we have to do is the main thing in case of congenital ptosis is the adjustment of the eyelid onto the limbus so we have to adjust our eyelid at the finish of the surgery and if we are doing it under anesthesia we have to also adjust the position of the globe and all that but the main point which i am stressing is that we must not put the eyelid on to the limbus covering the limbus our position of final positioning of the eyelid should be always at the limbus or or shade above the limbus if the levator action is poor so this is very important point which i am making that we should plan for little over correction and should not go for under correction because the levator action is usually poor in these cases now regarding the sling surgery when you have a bilateral ptosis with poor lps action just like in blepharophimosis syndrome etc that will be very important to do a sling surgery or the levator action is just 3 4 mm you you can do sling surgery but bilaterality is uh, a good thing once you have a bilateral ptosis you can certainly plan a sling surgery 
regarding whether you want to have a facial atta or whether you want to have whether you want to have a facial atta or you want to have a silicone it is up to because both methods are good as far as the material is concerned both materials are good so the important point in the sling surgery will be the position of the sling the placement of the sling should be beneath the orbicularis oculus in the loose areolar tissue plane in that plane so that the sling should the thread should not be visible through the skin and then when you go to the superior transverse ligament of vitreal there you have to go a little deeper and when you come out at the upper incision above the brow you have to make good pockets on both sides and bury the knot very nicely this burying of the knots is extremely important because whatever we are saying that sling has failed and it has got infected and all that that is not because whether we have used facial lata or a silicon it is because of the faulty burying of the knot so the knot has to be nicely buried and again the position of the lid margin should be shed above above the limbus so that you know if you are just burying the knots at that time you will find that suddenly the lid margin has gone to the limbus and after later on it will go another 2 mm down in all sort of slings so you have to plan your position of the lid margin in case of sling at least on the limbus and not below the limbus i think this will be very important at the same time we must explain the lid lag which is so very difficult when the patient is looking down eating reading book etc so all the time we are looking down so that point has to be very nicely explained to the patient that we are going to give you a good correction in the primary position but once you are looking down there will be certainly a very bad lid lag which uh, which will happen when in looking down position at the same time we have to explain that there will be some amount of lag of thalamus and we must check the bells etc so that we should not cause any functional problem any corneal problem in any case of process surgery regarding the marcus gun phenomena to prevent the abolish the complete marcus gun phenomena we have to expose the levator excise the levator aponeurosis in toto and then excise some portion of the muscle and cauterize it and let it go into the orbit so that it never comes back and also a generous excision at the horns should be there otherwise you see the horns the levator is attached to lateral horn medial horn so some fibers which are there if you do not do the generous excision at the horns then some flicker movements will be continued even if you do the levator excision and later on followed by the sling so these are some of the important points in case of marcus gun phenomena uh, there are individual choices of surgery whether you want to do unit surgery bilateral surgery whether you want to do a bilateral sling without doing excision on the other side so we have to nicely uh, explain to the patient take the photographs explain to the patient so that later on once you do the surgery there should be no problem medical legal problems because ptosis is one area in which there is nothing like 100% the lead lag will be there lag of thalamus will be there because the god has given you a poor lps once the lps action is poor you are a gone case you can't do anything much our idea is to give a good uh, look in the primary position minimum lead lag minimum lag of thalamus minimum functional problems minimum corneal problems i think uh, that is what i want to give you the tips of uh, my pulse of tosis surgery thank you very much thank you sir uh, it is once again a privilege to have all the benefit of your experience from my teacher thank you again and with that i think uh, we have uh, finished our time we would like to thank bombay of thalamic association
Dr. Lahane, thank you. We have enjoyed the session. Nice thank to you. Have yes, I enjoyed session. the session. Thank you, Bhattaraya, sir. Thank you, uh, thank you Lord, Lord, sir. Lord. Thank you very much. All the speakers, I, I enjoyed the session. Thank you yeah, very yeah. much. Thank you for uh, coming, sir. Thank you. Last, last time I met was in Ambez Ogai with Dr. Wangikar Sahib. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Dr. Lahane. Great pleasure. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Bhattaraya, sir. Thank you, Sumit. Thank you, Akshay. Thank you, Santosh and Ragini. Hand over to uh, Akshay and uh, uh, Sumit for the final word, and then we hand over to the next session. Yeah, I think I just need to thank everybody for taking their time out on a Sunday. And uh, Dr. Uh, Lani, sir, Dr. Sumit, Dr. Ragini, and Dr. Santosh Runawar for curating uh, uh, such a wonderful program. And uh, we, I think I'll be stuck to my screen the whole day because there's so many interesting talks in the oculoplastic session. So I think we can uh, give the, the hall to the next session. Thank you everybody for your time and for your sharing the knowledge. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you everyone for the wonderful session. Thank you, Bataria sir, Grover sir, Akshay sir, and all the panelists and all the speakers. We will start the next session. Uh, and uh, I hand over to the moderator, Dr. Uh, Hasnain, sir. Hasnain, sir, are you there? Yeah. Hi, good morning, everyone. Yeah. Well, good afternoon. Uh, yes, we can begin the session. Yes. So I'd, uh, I'd like to invite our first speaker, Dr. Central Nathan. Is he there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I would All like right, to uh, announce the chairpersons of the uh, session, sir, uh, with all your due permission. The session yes, will please. be chaired by Dr. Lakshmi Mahesh, ma'am. She needs no introduction. And madam is uh, head of the department in the Manipal uh, Hospital, Bangalore. Right, uh, Co-chairman is Dr. Neeta Madam is... Hello. Uh, welcome, Lakshmi, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Neeta Shanbag, ma'am, ma'am is head of the department, DY Patel Medical College. Convener is Dr. Rahul Deshpande, sir. Sir is a uh, HV Desai AI Hospital Director and Oculoplastic Surgeon. And co convener is Dr. Uh, Javed Ali, sir. Uh, he is head of the Lacrimal uh, and Dacryology Department at the LV Prasada Institute. Over to you, Hasnain, sir, and Lakshmi, ma'am, yeah. to start the session. Few words from the Lakshmi, ma'am, before we start the session. Uh, Lakshmi, ma'am. Uh, Neeta, ma'am, can you just uh, start the session? With few yeah, welcome, words, everybody. Uh, it's a great opportunity for all of us to have this academic feast over here. And uh, very nicely programmed and structured. I will definitely appreciate uh, Dr. Sumit on this platform for all the hard work that he has put in. And uh, without much uh, wastage of any time, let's begin the session because the academic feast is waiting for us. So I hand over the session to the moderator. Thank you, madam. Uh, we will start with our talk with uh, by Dr. Central Nathan. Please, can you share your screen, sir? Yeah, thank you. Can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. Yeah, thank you, madam. Uh, at the outset, I'd like to thank Dr. Sumit and the Bombay Ophthalmic Association for giving me an opportunity to speak to you all. And today I'm going to speak about uh, tackling canalicular injuries. Yeah. Um, so as we all know, the canonical injuries can be two types. One is the direct injury to the canaliculus, and the second one is the indirect avulsion type injuries. And uh, coming to the direct injuries, uh, it could be uh, because of fist injuries, road traffic accidents, injuries with sharp objects. And very commonly in a country, we can have the blouse hook injuries, which happens while breastfeeding and dog bites. 
coming to the indirect type of injuries is a more common in um, the elderly uh, following a fall or injury to the lateral canthus and it's more of avulsion type injury where the medial canthus is completely avulsed and this can happen with road tra traffic accidents falls fist fights and usually these are more distal type injuries where the tear is very medial and this is basically about the anatomy of the canalic um, the whole um, canaliculus as we can see you have a vertical canaliculus uh, which is 2 mm and then you have a long horizontal canaliculus which is 8 mm long which is followed by the common canaliculus and uh, coming to the diagnosis first we need to ask for history of uh, any isolated trauma or if it's a complex injury and uh, if it's a penetrating injury with any sharp objects and we have to always ask for history of any foreign bodies organic material matter which has fallen to the eye and if you're suspecting a foreign body we'll have to order for a ct or mri to pick up the foreign body and in cases of dog bites we have to ask for history of uh, a tetanus toxoid injection and also we might need to plan for anti rabies vaccine for the patient always ask for history of allergies before you take up the patient and coming to the examination first we need to see the general status of the patient and the globe integrity which is most important and if it's a complex injury with multiple involvement then we need to repair the globe first and salvage the vision before we go ahead to um, repair the canaliculus if it's a isolated canalicular injury what we have to do is first we have to examine the eye and high magnification either with a slit lamp or a loop to detect uh, any damage to the canaliculus sometimes the damage may be very subtle and you may miss it very easily if you have any doubt you have to dilate and probe the canaliculus with a bowman's probe and see if there's a occult or canalicular injury and uh, one uh, common question is do we repair monoclinical injuries what do we do if it's isolated upper canalicular tear So, if it's a lower limb canalicular tear, try to repair all the tears. If it's isolated small upper canalicular tear, and if the patient is a, a very young patient, pediatric patient, where you need to do general anesthesia, then you can observe in certain situations as it might not lead to epiphora. But if it's a bicanalicular tear, always try to repair both the lower and the upper canaliculars uh, whenever you are uh, operating. and what is the timing the best time to intervene is 2 to 3 days 48 to 72 hours and up to 5 days you will get good results beyond 5 days usually there is fibrosis of the canaliculus and will become more difficult to insert a stent and coming to the surgical management the basic principles are you have to do a routine antibiotic prophylaxis and clean the area come thoroughly you have to identify the cut ends which is the most important step of the surgery then we'll have to place the stent of a choice then we'll have to do a pericanalicular suturing once you place the stent and then we have to do a lid margin repair so identifying the distal cut end of the canaliculus is the single most important step where uh, most of us encounter problems so how do we do this first try to avoid too much local anesthetic which will make the area very boggy try to give regional blocks and don't uh, uh, inflate the whole area with anesthetic and you have to carefully look out for the white pearly cut end of the canaliculus within the pink orbicularis tissue this is the single most important step and you can also apply few drops of topical phenylephrine to blanch the uh, remaining uh, tissue so that you can identify the white cut end always use a microscope with high magnification to make your life easy if you have any difficulty another technique is you can inject air through the intact uh, canaliculus upper canaliculus in case of lower lip tear and after compressing the sac and you just put a, a, a pool of water in that area and look for bubbles which come out through the cut end and this is called the morrison's technique you can also inject fluorescent stain viscoelastic to the intact canaliculus and see it coming through the cut end very rarely you can use a pigtail probe which i don't have much experience with because you can damage the intact canaliculus if you are not very careful choice of stents you have the monocanalicular stents which is the mini monoca the oro stent and also you can use a 24 gauge iv cannula if you don't have access to the ready made monocanalicular stents and this is a mini monoca stent which is a um, uh, which is a monocanalicular stent and uh, this is an excellent option in our country which is the oro stent uh, which is as good as the mini monoca if not better and um, uh, very economical as well 
And you can see the stent has got three parts. It's got a head and it's got a collar and it's got a long um, um, uh, stem. And this is how it sits uh, in the punctum once the surgery is done. And you can also use a 24 gauge Venflon uh, cannula if you don't have access. And uh, Dr. Grover has um, um, uh, demonstrated some beautiful uh, his original techniques uh, regarding uh, use of this cannula. And you can always refer to that. And this is also a very good technique. Uh, bicanonicular stenting, sometimes uh, rarely you can use a bicanonicular stent, but this uh, uh, entails uh, intubating the intact canaliculars and retrieving through the nose. It's a little bit more cumbersome, but very rarely you might need to use it. And coming to the um, surgical video. Like I said, you'll have to examine the uh, cut area very carefully. Initially, it might look like the canaliculus is intact, but you have to gently uh, uh, examine the cut area. You might need to pry open the cut ends and uh, check out for the uh, canalicular tab. Like you can see this patient, uh, which presented two to three days after injury, initially it looks like it's intact. But once you, when you gently um, uh, dissect that area, you can see indeed he's got a cut uh, canaliculus. And once we have confirmed that the canaliculus is cut, we need to dilate the punctum and um, uh, gently probe the area to see the, the medial and the lateral cut ends of the canaliculus. Now, once you have probed the punctum, this is the most important step to see the distal cut end. Like I was telling you, look for the pearly white tissue. You can see the pearly white canaliculus there. And this is hard to miss once you have, uh, uh, you have good magnification with the microscope. You can see that's the pink orbicularis. And within that, you can see the white ring of the canaliculus. And once you uh, pass a probe, it should go smoothly inside without any resistance. And if it's the orbicularis, you will have a lot of resistance for passage of the Bowman's probe. Once you identify the cut ends, you can pass the monoclonal stent, uh, oral stent in this case. And you need to dilate the punctum um, uh, quite nicely so that the, the uh, stent can pass through the punctum. And gently you can pass the uh, stent through the uh, uh, proximal part of the canaliculus. And once you have done that, you have to insert the remaining um, uh, stent into the distal cut end. And before you do this, it's very important for you to trim the uh, stent because the stent usually is a very long stent. But as we know uh, from the anatomy, the horizontal canaliculus is around eight millimeters long. And if you add another two or three millimeters for the common canaliculus, you don't need more than uh, 12 millimeters of the stent to be there. So you need to trim the remaining part of the stem before you insert it. So once you've trimmed the stent, you'll have to insert the stent into the distal cut end. So trimming this is very important so that it doesn't kink uh, within the uh, sutured area. So once you have trimmed the stent, you'll have to again identify the cut end and you'll have to pass it into that. If you are in the right plane, the stent should pass very smoothly. There should be no resistance, there should be no kinking. And there should be smooth passage of the canaliculus, uh, of the stent into the canaliculus. And like you can see in this video, it's passing very smoothly. It is resting uh, right into the canaliculus and that shows you're on the right plane. And once you have done that, the next step is pericanalicular suturing for which you can use seven or eight zero vicryl. So once the stent is in place, you can see the cut ends of the canaliculus, the medial and the lateral cut ends. And uh, you can see the uh, the stent is in a good position in the punctum, then you use 7-0 white fill and take two or three pericanalicular bites to oppose the cut ends. So again, it's very important to use a good uh, microscopic magnification to do this. And once you take bites of the cut ends of the canaliculars, you will see there's very good approximation. So you can place uh, two to three bites so that uh, the cut ends come together. After which you can proceed to suture the orbicularis.
So once you switch to the orbicularis, you can do a routine uh, lid margin repair. And that's how it looks at the end of the surgery. You can see the center is well placed. In. And how long do we retain the stents? Usually, if we put a monoclonal stent, it has to be retained for four to six weeks. And if it's a biclinical, you wait for two to three months before you remove the stent. Complications, you can have premature stent extrusion, especially if you don't trim the stent properly or if the collar of the stent is not into the punctum properly. You can have a stent extrusion. You can have cheese wiring of the punctum. You can have pyogenic granuloma, epistaxis if you have put a, a biclinical stent. You can also have corneal complications if the stent is not well placed in the punctum and is rubbing the cornea. And in some cases, despite all your best efforts, you can have a late onset canonical stenosis after the removal of the stent. And uh, usually you have very good results, 80% success rate, where the patient does not have any epiphoror and as the duct is patent on syringing. And in conclusion, you try to repair all canonicular tears, have a high index of suspicion, examine the area very carefully to detect occult tears, intervene within two to three days. And if you do a, a careful um, a surgery, most patients do extremely well. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for that wonderful talk. Very nice like to... talk, Sandin. Hello? Yes, madam, we can hear you. Thank you, uh, ma'am. Thank two you. Two to three months, you said bicanalicular uh, stent removal. Is this from your uh, personal experience? I would like to know. No, ma'am, I never because... put a bicanalicular stent in a uh, canalicular tap. <laughs> I have never, uh, I have never put a bicanalicular stent. I have used only monoclonal stents. This is only for okay. um, and groups, the yeah. monoclonal stents. You said one month, right? Four to six weeks. Yeah, but, but in my experience, I found right? no, no, no. In my experience, I found you don't actually need to keep it for one month. Also, if you keep it for at least two weeks, it's more than enough. Uh, you don't need to uh, retain it for four weeks. Actually, this is all what is given in the papers and textbooks. But in my experience, so, I see if you if it's there for two weeks, it's more than enough. You can remove it after two or three weeks. So as long as you have done a very meticulous repair yeah. and you feel that the healing is good, yeah. And with the stent in place, have you ever attempted uh, syringing? Not the monocanine bicanalic. Have you attempted syringing? With no, but. I've not attempted surging. Uh, if I put a bicanalical stent, not for the canalical tear, for a DCR or some cases, I just do a nasal endoscopic examination and just to see the uh, stent. Yeah. I don't do a surging do a usually. Nasal endoscopic evaluation, and you can do your tear sign, right? You just yeah. press and see whether you're just put the some fluorescent stain drops and see if it's coming and to the nose. And you don't have an endoscope, you could still attempt it very carefully. Yeah. 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 Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with uh, all due permission from the chair, I have a small announce announcement to make. In today's session, uh, Dr. Anita Sethi, ma'am, and Dr. Uh, Vasani, sir, will not be able to present because of certain uh, relatives uh, in critical health. And uh, uh, they have conveyed their regards and uh, their uh, absentee uh, in the session. Thank you. Can go ahead with the second. Thank you, Sumit. Uh, I would like to now invite uh, Dr. Ruchi Goel, madam, to talk about um, her approach in uh, proximal canalicular blocks. So thanks a lot. Um, I will just share my screen. So, uh, is it visible now? No, ma'am, not yet. Not yet? Okay. Yes. Okay. So, I think we are, we are all in Delhi, we are all in a state of shock. Lots of our relatives have already, you know, lost their lives. But I think, yes, uh, we really need to get deviated from what we are preoccupied the entire day nowadays. So I shall be speaking on my way of managing the proximal and mid canalicular obstruction. And uh, I think we would all agree that unlike, uh, you know, the nasal lacrimal duct obstruction, where we are very confident and when the patient walks in, we tell, yes, you're going to be fine and you're going to walk out absolutely 
with success over 100%. So here we have like, depending on where the obstruction is, you are always like, you can always say that, yeah, we may need to do another intervention and more so for proximal blocks because uh, it has been, uh, you know, hypothesized that uh, maybe the change in the angle of the canaliculus may be the cause of uh, difficulty in giving very good uh, in therapeutic intervention results. So let us uh, uh, start my presentation. So the causes of acquired canalicular obstruction, why I'm talking about acquired is that uh, in congenital canalicular obstruction, many a times uh, there would be a situation where there is no canalicular, uh, you know, canalization at all. So uh, there the options are very much limited to maybe congenital or DCR in uh, many of the cases. But quiet canalicular obstructions, which may be post-inflammatory, traumatic, post drug iatrogenic and systemic disease, and many a times idiopathic also, uh, there would be some part of canaliculus which may still be patent. We can possibly utilize this part of canaliculus. And uh, if we go by uh, the classification, uh, can you mute the other people? There's a lot of disturbance. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, if you go by the anatomical classification, this is the classification by Dr. Javed Ali, the, you know, the, let's call him the father of lacrimal surgery. And uh, I also like to follow this and anything. Uh, Start on a few seconds. Uh, can you, it's very disturbing to have somebody talking all the time. Dr. Das's uh, microphone is on. Maybe you can put it off. So uh, the proximal up to three millimeter of punctum uh, is, uh, is classified as the proximal, and then the mid level. So for till the mid level, uh, you know, it's usually very difficult. For distal, the uh, canalicular DCR works pretty much well, and people have uh, reported very good results. So. So these are the management strategies which are being practiced by uh, the different lacrimal surgeons and uh, the canalicular trephination with intubation. I think all of us uh, mostly follow this to begin with. And when it fails, uh, maybe, and we can give, some people would like to give another trial, but when it fails, then we have to resort to other maneuvers. And uh, others are, of course, uh, these are the different uh, techniques which we, different authors have cited. Now, uh, there is also um, a reference of retrograde intubation with dacrocystorhinostomy with uh, many uh, articles. and But there are not uh, very large studies except for uh, one or two studies where they have uh, used this with uh, success rates. Uh, over 70% they have reported. And uh, of course, CDCR happens to be the gold standard in all these uh, uh, blocks. Now, one initially when the patient comes, one has to differentiate whether it's a stenosis or a block per se, because stenosis has a good success when you treat and it usually tends to open up. But when once the obstruction is, uh, you know, if there's a lot of fibrosis and the obstruction is not opening and you need to do a trephination, then maybe after you remove the tube, there is a chance that it may again go back to uh, closure. So this is the technique which uh, you know I've been talking about, and uh, of course there are more reports uh, of uh, uh, the study being uh, this technique being used, and uh, I'll just show you uh, how we did the cases. And um, so uh, it's a routine uh, DCR uh, surgery uh, incision that is being practiced. The only difference is one has to be careful when you open up the sac. I like to open it. Uh, vertically so that you can identify the canaliculus internal ostium. So this is the internal ostium. After that, it was the, um, you know, the same Bowman's probe which we use, we bent it at about 80 to 90 degree and we pass it in the reverse direction. Mind you, the uh, canaliculus near the punctum, it is quite superficial. So we have to be very gentle in passing in as soon as it uh, exits at the conjunctival end, you make a small nick and uh, you create a pseudopunctum. Now, similar thing is repeated in the lower tract also, and then the intubation is performed. And uh, in rest of the procedure is more or less similar to what you do in a DCR with intubation. The only difference that I did was that uh, I uh, like to suture the, um, you know, the pseudopunctum, the 
opening with the adjacent conjunctiva so so that uh, it's something like uh, when you do a little cantholysis and you go back and suture so it did work well of course it was just i thought that uh, people have done it without it also so this is the last bit of suturing i use ato vicrin for this and uh, just to keep the pseudo punctum in uh, open up so i intubated for about 6 weeks and um, so uh, these are the patients we have done some uh, study also which is actually under peer review so i cannot share the results but uh, if you see this this is the original punctum and this is the pseudo punctum which is created medial to the true punctum so this is the pseudo punctum now um, we did nta segment oct of these pseudo puncta and uh, they were uh, you know again the uh, morphology of these pseudo puncta it is uh, we have published in igo case report so if anybody is interested they can go and look so these are slightly larger in size and a slightly you know they have a um, broader kind of a entry vis a vis the true punctum and uh, in our study like uh, if you if we found that if we are able to intubate these patients without much intervention uh, this uh, this is extremely important because the more trauma you are going to cause to the canalicular lining you, the more chances are that there would be a fibrosis subsequently so you have to be very gentle and if you are able to do it easily then the success rates were very good however uh, we did have a couple of problems with these patients like conjunctival granuloma occurred in one patient but otherwise by and large these patients did well now uh, the other uh, main um, surgical procedure i think most of us uh, follow it uh, is the conjunctival dcr and of course it uh, you know it's been uh, so many decades that people have been successfully practicing the problem is the tube related complications which uh, really mar uh, these conjunctival dcr and uh, unfortunately the tube extrusions malpositions and the tube related we had reported some syndromes the infections and um, all these things are uh, uh, still they continue to occur despite you know the best of the experience hands working on it there have been modifications from pyrex to stop uh, pyrex tube to you know the the material being changed to um, celiastic uh, material so that the uh, it's difficult to anchor them then there were problems with the biofilm creation so you know in a nutshell there have been lot of problems and uh, the last uh, publication with mirror tuck technique i still follow that it is working well still with you know um, uh, in in a glass tube which i am using with no eyelets on the cuff so it does work well i'll just show you a short video with the external um, conjunctival dcr so so again um, the usual thing the periosteal uh, uh, flap being created and this the only difference here is that we create a smaller uh, osteotomy so uh, a smaller osteotomy is done uh, why is it not running it's going so slow so um, yeah so i think the internet is uh, so we we create a flap and the the size of the osteotomy is small and after you have done that uh, i do a partial excision of the caruncle and uh, i create a track initially it was described with a von grafis knife nowadays it is actually difficult to acquire a von grafis knife so you can also use a mvr blade to create a track from the conjunctiva into the uh, nasal uh, mucosa and uh, from there uh, the you know this uh, a straight uh, tube it is fixed and i use the mirror tuck technique to fix this tube and uh, i have had uh, good results i think there is something wrong with the internet because the video was pretty much okay so anyway the this is a cross uh, the sexo proline being used and uh, uh, network is created on top of it and after this network like you uh, you know so put a mirror on a a uh, cloth it's a similar way the tube is uh, fixed on to the the cuff is fixed on to the um, place and uh, on table one must assess that uh, the fluid is draining properly because uh, if you don't have the fluid draining properly on the table then uh, basically it the uh, the reason may be that there is a um, the position of the tube may not be correct so that has to be assessed on the table 
so that is what i uh, do uh, that is my usual this is on table only i put some fluid and check that the fluid is draining well so initial apprehension of uh, you know this uh, being uh, the cisco proline being uh, very cumbersome and uh, it may cause irritation so we did uh, uh, the studies and we found that uh, the patient the patient tends to tolerate it and in the long run uh, you do have very good results with this technique so to conclude uh, if we i have a patient with a canalicular obstruction which is just 6 mm from the uh, true punctum i would initially check whether using a you know a small the a thinner um, moments probe let's say about uh, 00 or uh, 0000 and then i would first assess whether it is a block or it is just a stenosis if it is just a stenosis you will just by probing you can just intubate it if it is an obstruction which is not opening i would go for trephination and i would rather use mini monoca stents even uh, i use it even if it is bilateral i like to use it for upper and lower both if that doesn't work and i need to go for a second procedure before jumping on to ctcr i would go for dcr with retrograde intubation and uh, the advantage as has already said that uh, it obviates the need for the lacrimal bypass tube insertion and of course the related complications if this fails on table or if there is a failure at a later stage when you feel that this is not going to work you can always go for a ctcr so i keep ctcr at as a later resort only in patients where there has been suppose there is a uh, you know a road traffic accident and there is extensive canalicular damage in those cases i would directly go for ctcr so thank you so much thank you ruchi for uh, extensively covering in your in the two in these difficult times totally empathize with each and every one of us and especially you um last slide says dcr with retrograde intubation and the next line says um it obviates the need for intubation can you just uh, oh, maybe uh, explain on that ruchi the last slide of yours it obviates in retrograde intubation you do intubate right no 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 remember it obviates the need for lacrimal bypass the canalicular bypass that's what i meant oh canalicular bypass right. because dcr is also a bypass right yeah yeah i meant ah. the jones tube per se let's put it uh, the jones tube okay fine because the problems are more with the retention of uh, the tube the glass or pyrex whatever you use there are problems i think nobody no i agree with person. you yeah so that is and when I mean. you do your dcr with pyrex tube or jones tube or your any of those improvised tubes also how often do you you need to assess the patient endoscopically because from outside if we just flush so how often you tend to do that ma'am uh, i usually on table i assess first that the tube is pro properly placed i have not shown a endoscopic uh, purposely but uh, i always i actually do a laser uh, conjunctival dcr also so i have an endoscope oh. already there so on table i assess and then maybe at the last follow up or the patient suppose there is a patient who would start uh, complaining of obstruction which we are not able to because uh, i had a patient where you we put in the tube and what happened was the uh, the irritation due to the tube though it was not touching the nasal septum the the patient had a tension then it can cause granulomas not only that the perforations the how long you have to keep this tube the, there was nasal polyposis and the polyp actually grew through the tube so eventually i, I had to explant the tube so for these kind of patients especially i would go for endoscopic examination but by and large most of the time i don't do endoscopic examination on every visit okay how long do you keep the jones tube quickly we think we'll have to i, 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 I don't remove the jones tube if it doesn't come out i just leave it there if it so you it leave it as long as yeah. you can yes yes okay thank you very much Though we are uh, short of two speakers, I think uh, we'll have to buck up because we can uh, have a good discussion. Where is Javed? I'm here, ma'am. Ah, Javed, please expert yeah. comments. 
Shruti has given uh, your um, <laughs> Ruchi has given you a very good title, and I think you truly, truly deserve it. So I'm not. The, I thought you. I couldn't see you around. So you please give your comments for both these talks, Sandils and uh, Ruchi's. No, uh, it's broad topic. You can uh, ask me something specific. I can. I can tell you that. But but both of the talks were uh, you know very comprehensive, and I think they covered. Yeah. Yes, I don't think there are many doubts, but in the mid mid level blocks, what would you like to do? In as far as Ruchi's talk is concerned, at this point of time, mid level obstructions, I do uh, endoscopic guided canalicular trephination, and uh, what I have found is that uh, a lot of them uh, tend to have associated nasolacrimal duct uh, obstructions also, and quite a bit of them. Even if there is no obstruction, there is a good amount of stenosis. So what I've done uh, is. Uh -huh. all those mid level obstructions i combine it with a dcr and i do a trephine uh -huh. so that at one go we give a very good chance to, for uh, the lacrimal drainage to be salvaged uh, so, but after you trephine then you leave in the stent right by canalicular stent yes yes okay and but it do, you don't generally resort to a cdcr unless it's a desperate case where it's completely stable. yeah like like dr ruchi was telling cdcr should be at least uh, you know for me it is like uh, blepharophimosis you know so b before and after the difference is that there will be some scar so for me uh, you know uh, cdcr is something that my patients are usually not very happy with so i would like to resort keep it to thing. yeah okay. the last resort Thank you, Javed. I think you please take over the discussion for the next few talks. Um, we'll go to the next talk. I'd like Thank to invite you, Dr. Rahul Deshpande, sir, to um, give his talk on tackling re-external DCR. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I I'd like to thank uh, give thankful to Lahane, sir, Ragini, madam, Santosh Vanawar, sir, and mainly uh, Sumit Lahane for arranging this conference and. Uh, taking all the talks in a very precise manner now today's talk is about the tackling uh, re dcr or uh, after doing a dcr when we would like to do a re dcr surgery so we'll be discussing in the today's talk the first external dcr was done in 1940 uh, by toti uh, that was for relief of lacrimal obstruction uh, dcr is the commonest oculoplastic surgery performed these are the common indications of dcr is the congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction primary acquired nasolacrimal duct obstruction and secondary acquired nasolacrimal duct obstruction then these are the photographs showing the external versus the endoscopic dcr in the external dcr uh, the merits are the success rate is 90 to 95% less equipments are required uh, at a low cost it can be uh, done merits of the endonasal dcr again success rates are good 85 to 90% no cutaneous scarring less bleeding time of the surgery uh, lesser time of the surgery the ep4 post uh, uh, for the uh, post diaphragmatic rhinostomy is the eyelid and punctal malformation punctal stenosis canalicular obstruction reflex tearing and associated uh, comorbidities like affecting nasal mucosa the conditions like sarcoidosis vaginal granulomatosis where again the chances of failure or the post operative symptoms are more following dcr the anatomical failure of the surgical procedure is the inadequate bony osteotomy misplaced bony osteotomy incomplete opening of the lacrimal sac some syndrome opening into the ethmoid sinus and impending uh, middle terminate adhesions in the nasal cavity mucosal fibrosis across the ostium causing stenosis and closure then the management depends upon whether post operatively after doing dcr if the patient is having symptoms like watering and discharge and so so whether it is a functional obstruction or it is a anatomical obstruction first you have to rule out so we have to very specific about it otherwise in all cases where there is a watering or discharge you should not subject the patient for re dcr so functional or physiological obstructions are lacrimal pump dysfunction Uh, where the eyelid may be a problem that the uh, lateral ectropion or horizontal lid tightening simple procedures can correct the defect that you don't have to again go for a re dcr surgery then the punctal of the punctum is the problem where there is a punctal stenosis or canalicular stenosis then the separate surgeries have to be done and the uh, the uh, obstruction has to be taken care of rather than doing a re dcr in these cases 
Now, whenever there is an anatomical obstruction, the revision of the surgery or the re-DCR should be considered. So, this slide is very important. One has to definitely see which type of surgery is required when patient had undergone a DCR and comes with the symptoms. Then the uh, OPD evaluation is done for the lacrimal apparatus, like the eyelid position is very important post-operatively see whether that is the cause for the EP4R, then the, how are the puncta, then the canalicular status by doing probing, syringing or doing the fluorescent uh, dye disappearance test. Then the nasal endoscopy is also very important. So if the patient is not having any of the uh, punctum problem or eyelid problem and having symptoms post of, uh, after doing DCR, you have to do an ENT examination. So if, whether that primary ENT examination was missed in the first setting where the bony ostium patency, bony mucosa, then the nasal uh, cavity, some adhesions are there or other nasal pathologies which must have been missed uh, in the first setting. So all this has to be taken care of before doing or subjecting the patient for the second re-DCR. Then in certain cases where again, in order to diagnose this some syndrome or drainage into the ethmoid, a CT scan is to be done and one has to clear cut, have a clear cut guidelines that what the problem has occurred after doing a primary DCR. Now the, if you consider now you want to do a re-DCR in the cases where you, uh, the uh, eyelid problems and other problem, functional, the functional problems have been ruled out, then the appropriate size and the site of the incision you have to mark. The incision preferably you have to take on the same incision site to avoid the scarring and other problems. Cosmetically also that wound has to be better in second surgery. Careful dissection has to be made. Lot of bleeding will come because already the patient has been subjected to surgery where a lot of adhesions, fibrosis must have taken place. So again, you are doing the re-DCR. So while dissecting the sac, you will have a lot of bleeding. That has to be, you have to taken care of. Then the ostium size adequate. Now, once you explore the uh, uh, the, the, the sac and the, nether, the the lacrimal fossa, you try to see how is the condition of the sac, whether the sac is open properly or not in the first surgery, or there are some adhesions, or there are some loculi, or what could be the cause, or in some cases the sac is not open completely. So whether we are facing with some syndrome or that sort of a complication. Then see the, uh, whether the first time ostium, how it is, whether there is occlusion of the ostium or whether the ostium was not, not made at all, or there is a, some fibrotic element that has overcome the, of, of the, of the ostium and giving rise to the occlusion. So you have to make again, if the, the, with the punch, you make a big ostium, and these are the markings superior in the posterior side for the uh, making of the application of the mitomycin C. Adjuvants like mitomycin C is an anti neoplastic antibiotic which we can use in order to prevent fibrosis. It has the anti fibrotic activity. So it can be applied with the sponge in the concentration of 0.2 to 0.4 ml per ml. Uh, and it is to be applied over the ostium for two to four minutes and then it has to be washed copiously. And the use of mitomycin is it will prevent the fibrosis and prevent the occlusion of the, of the, of the ostium. Then the silicon tube intubation again in the re-DCR or, or the failed DCR when you are doing a second surgery, always use the silicon tube to maintain the anastomosis. So common canalicular scarring or stenosis, patients with a small contracted scarred lacrimal sac suboptimal lacrimal sac, nasal mucosal flap, anastomosis. Now, the duration of the intubation, you have to keep the intubation for three to six months. Normally, we keep it for more than two months. Certain complications which can arise of putting the uh, intubation is that the conjunctiva or the nasal granuloma around the ostium can occur, extrusion of the tube can occur, and infection at the site can occur. So these are the complications of putting the intubation. You have to anticipate and you have to treat accordingly. The anterior flaps of any remaining nasal mucosa and lacrimal sac are then sutured to each other in the way that the anastomosis remains taut and the mu mucosa over the sac anastomosis should be done over the uh, silicon tube intubation. So the take home message is that an external DCR still remains a gold standard surgical intervention with high success rate. So in some cases, if it fails, first identify what is the cause of the failure, a systematic approach to the patient with EP4R after DCR is to identify the etiology of the primary lacrimal surgery failure. 
see whether it is a functional failure or it is an anatomical failure or it is having the problem because of the malposition of eyelids or punctal problem then nasal endoscopy is a very useful tool to look at the nasal aspect of the ostium before any surgery is to be undertaken adjuvants like mitomycin c and silicon tube intubation can be used to improve the outcome in the repeated surgery so that's all thank you and special thanks to dr sonal and dr harshita for helping me in doing this presentation thank you rahul for a very nice presentation nicely covered let's ask javed for his expert comments for a read ecr yeah thank you so javed what is uh, before that i'll just ask you what's the percentage of endo versus external you do external uh, once or twice a year for uh, that to for training the fellows because i feel that fellows should be trained with that uh, before they embark on endoscopic so the voice is not clear sorry is it clear now it's breaking uh, that's am i audible now better but uh, yeah yeah i don't know something uh, wrong yeah so so uh, i i hardly do external dcrs nowadays uh, But but it doesn't mean that I'm against external DCR by any stretch of imagination. It's a fantastic surgery. We know that we know that, but uh, we just know, curious and, and, uh, to know your percentage. Yeah, so, so percentage maybe ninety nine point five versus zero point five. Ninety five. Ninety nine point five will be endo, and zero point five will be external. Oh, okay. So, would you want to comment anything about Rahul's? Uh, because he has meticulously described all the points which you have to look into in a failed dcr okay. uh, so in your failed what endo dcr so which is which will be i am sure will be very very less but nevertheless what is the first thing you look for 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 me for any, any failed dcr the causes of failure is uh, very important can you be a little loud javed i think there's some issues with your audio is it let me just check once more uh am i just just let me know if i am audible better audible right now you are right now you are okay okay good so so are you able to hear me now well yeah can you be a little louder please yeah, i think i'm i'm actually shouting <laughs> okay yeah yeah so uh what what i feel is that uh uh it's important to ascertain the causes of uh, failure i think that is the most critical step doing the surgery you know i think all of us are quite uh, adept at doing a good revision surgery but the problem that happens is where we miss the causes in of in endoscopy because it's almost almost 100% like yeah. right? you said 99.5 so what is yeah. your number one cause if at all you have your failure Uh, for me the number one cause if at all i have uh, failure is a cicatricial closure complete cicatricial closure of, of the ostium that is the common cause for me the other causes roughly you, what's the percentage may i ask you uh if, if uh, on an average like uh, in a year i usually have at least four or five failures and out of those four or five failures i would say three are cicatricial closure and uh, the remaining are usually stenosed ostiums okay do you believe in a routine ent evaluation before any form of dcr surgery i i think it's if you are not confident about uh, endoscopy then i think it's a good idea to get a opinion it it makes sense because uh, See, even though you go with an endoscope it's very difficult on the table to know what is the status of the posterior ethmoid or the maxillary unless there is some pus coming out from the hiatus you will not be sure so would you like to have a preliminary x ray at least so that i'm sure because you work with bomold you can take care of some of the ent aspects of sinusitis before you do the surgery but would you at least advise a routine x ray uh yes it it can like like if javed you... your i don't your frozen uh am i not audible to everyone actually because i'm well i can hear you well you can hear you well right yeah. I, i i think there's something something there because my net is quite speed it's really really well 
So I don't think there's a problem. Otherwise, is the problem only for Madam? Your voice. Ah, uh, we can hear you well. We can yeah. hear you well. Okay, Doctor Javi, we can hear you. Good. Ji, can you see him? Yeah, yeah. We, um, ma'am, we, I can see him also and oh. hear him well also. Madam, can I just ask one question to Javed, Madam? Madam, can I just ask one question to Doctor Javed? Yes, sir. Yeah, Javed, I just want to ask one question. Do you perform all your endo DCRs under GA? Question number one. And if under GA, when do you discharge them? Same day or next day? So on an average, uh, I, I, yeah, I do most of uh, my endo under GA, and then uh, I depends on the situation. But most of the time, I discharge them the next morning. Next morning. Yeah, I just want to be a little. And you keep the nasal pack for uh, post-op nasal pack for forty-eight hours, Javed. Twenty-four hours, ma'am. Twenty-four hours. Yes. And the earlier question which I asked you, uh, ENT evaluation that is a routine X-ray. Do you get it done before? The, I the I usually don't get a routine X-ray, ma'am. But uh, if there is any suspicion that you have a suspicion about, say, sinusitis or any other nasal issue, then it makes sense to go ahead and get that done. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. We'll move on to the next talk. I think it's Javed. Yeah, So our next talk is by Dr. Jayant Kumar Das, and so we'll be talking on canalicular membrane, the hidden culprit for poor outcome in DCR. Thank you. Yeah, am I audible? Yeah. Hello. Yes, sir. Now, okay, fine. So I just choose on my according to my previous speaker, they explain this in every point. So my idea was to choose those point because that. canalicular membrane the hidden culprit it may be one of the hidden culprit i label it as a hidden because in most of the time that membrane may rupture uh, most of the time that membrane may rupture during the time of operation without knowing but if we do the surgery under the microscope and dr javed nicely demonstrated he is doing all in a very with a good illumination good illumination is good illumination and proper viewing proper zoom are the the factor for a successful in few cases there may be some issues like if we are unable to un identify the membrane over the canalicular junction is one of the leading cause of phlebitis expert hand after a good even after a good decreases to rhinostomy in spite of adequate bony osteotomy good flap everything if we are unable because some membranes are are very very thick so that's i want and dr rusi and dr deshpande explain each and every point lakshmi ma'am also explain discussed and dr javed all but sometimes because if you are doing all Normal cases of NLDO, then chances of those membranes you may not face. But those surgeons are doing in a because as you do that due to COVID era and due to the some uh, un, uh, poor poor systemic growth, there may be a multiple attack or cellulitis in most of the cases. In such cases, chances of membrane is very very high. Next slide, please. in routine preoperative assessment with syringing of course and diagnostic probing if it is healed but in sometimes in subacute cases and there may be repeated attack in such cases of course the choice is endoscopic i am not talking about that which are the cases for endoscopic which are not by external as dr javed already told he is in 99.5 percent is endoscopic but in our hand it is reverse in our case endoscopic is less and the maximum we are doing to external because of the some financial and other purposes the most of the time clear foot regurgitation is the one of the cause then we can think if it is a sufficiently clear foot regurgitated so we may think but the last step is the diagnostic probing to assess the membrane obstruction next slide please is the, for in all cases it may be what you heard that history proper there may be a cellulitis how many times and what are the preoperative pictures and histories periocular lead reclaimal 
assessment and endoscopic examination for even for the external so i recommend endoscopic examination for each and every patients at least radiological examination in uh, selected cases as lakshmi mem says to if to rule out the sinusitis and some other cases and even in case of some uh, we unable to do a endoscope then at least we can go for a x ray along with that ent consent syringing of course and diagnostic probing the other steps next slide please i am just the this is the our tools for diagnostic very very easy we need a one plain forcep punctum dilated probe and a small plastic ruler no need for any decal cystography or any other things previous slide please yes most of the time we can assess if that there is a stop stop and around 10 Rossi Goel already mentioned that we she is talking about them mainly for a proximal okay times, but if it is a distal annular obstruction at around nine to ten mm, and there is a soft stop most of the time, and our diagnosis maybe the we can think there is a membrane obstruction. Sometimes it is very very easy and it is ruptured most of the time with the probing, but if we We should not properly remove, like in like a PR surgeons they are doing a uh, in a macular bowl surgery. Others they are doing a um, ILM peeling like that. We can remove moment we remove that our success rates are in a difficult case. Also, is most almost equal to the normal external anesthesia. So, what is the management protocol actually? Next slide, please. In that management, I want to. Uh, Plain few points. After it is like a standard. If you are doing a, of course that once there is a membrane, just head can tell all those points. Proper previous slide please. Uh, in if there is a membrane, uh, next next next. Yeah yeah please okay. In case of external, it is little difficult to do. You can identify the membrane and then. to remove this is the one of the advantages in few cases for external discharge of course there is a lots of advantages in endoscopic discharge but there is some advantages in so in a routinely we can perform the surgery is less any other things we can we can then then next moment we just finish that uh, <coughs> that our bony opening and of course in those cases are always it is a huge sac because there is a multiple attacks earlier so there is a huge sac this is a, one of the cases is a huge sac moment just after bony osteotomy we can open up either you can choose a single flap or double flap but i prefer always in a huge sac to we can excise as much as possible the posterior flap or we make that posterior flap little smaller for more potency at the end so in such cases <clears throat> if we are doing so generally we observe we can if you that's a my probe if you look carefully that my probe there is a its membrane okay please go ahead with the video that is a membrane is here one there is a membrane here and that membrane is <clears throat> uh okay is not okay please uh, keep on going that video that membrane we can remove <coughs> yes yeah there is some okay you can just uh, uh, just uh, share the slide please hello if there is some issues on the videos you can just share the slide please Doctor, just a minute. We are playing. Okay, okay, fine. No issue. So that membrane we can, and that we just like a, we can identify membrane. First step is to identify membrane with the probe. If we introduce the probe, then there is a membrane which is just a uh, from the inner lining. It's maybe separated, and then that from like a in a. that head surgeons are doing in macular bowl surgery that same thing we are doing uh, so we just remove with the uh, 
preferably I use a titanium force. I generally use a titanium force. Please play. Fast forward, please. Hello. Yeah. From the mid section. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry for the inconvenience. The, there are some issues. Mm -hmm. Okay. No issue. No issue. Okay. So. Doctor, should I start playing the video? Of scar tissue? Should I start playing the video, Doctor? Yeah, you'll have to fast forward it because there are three more talks after this. Either you can take it to the last part of this. This has uh, already been shown. Jain Kumar, sir, can you hear us? So I think we've lost Sir's connection. Yeah, we lost his connection. Um, Ma'am, can we go ahead and come back uh, in the end to his uh, presentation if possible? Okay, he's back. So you need to unmute yourself, Dr. Jayanta Kumar Das, please. Okay, 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 plus, yes, yes. So then moment we remove that membrane. Am I audible right now? Yes, sir. Hello? Yes, okay, sir. Yes, sir. fine. Yes, sir. Sorry for that, yeah. <clears throat> so moment we remove the membrane, then the two options in our hand then as my previous speaker nicely mentioned, so and Dr. <coughs> Day. So, in such cases, if we can go for a silastic intubation or in some cases we can go for a mitomycin C also, my results are not as equal as, as Dr. Despande nicely mentioned that in, okay, 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 you can go to the slide please, please. okay, next, next slide please. So, in case of a silastic intubation, yeah, in case of a silastic intubations, so results are uh, more uh, good as compared to that. So, what is actually common as already Zabir and lots of other our peoples are mentioned that those are the common factors generally in describing the books. So, there's a problem with the fashioning of the small bony osteum incomplete opening of the lacrimal sac, poor inspection of the lacrimal orifice and failure of the Schussard flaps. So that's the third point is very crucial, poor inspection of lacrimal orifice. So if we are not able to see the properly, the architecture and the proper anatomy of that, and you can think and can suspect, some remnants are very thin and it may be ruptured during probing. So in such cases also, or if it is a very fibrous band, then we, uh, fibrosis is there, membrane, then we may think it is a um, distal canalicular obstruction. But it is not exactly, epithelosis is not exactly on the canaliculars. It is in the sac canalicular junction. A membranous block of distal canaliculars may compromise the outcome of this year. It was published in 2004 initially, and then lots of issues. Fibrous condition of the firm adherence of this thin membrane to the sac mucosa due to the chronic infection, especially after a lots of subacute attack, or there may be an attack, they have definite history of acute attack. The possible pathological mechanism for this condensation, we have found history of cellulitis in. 90, more than 95 of the patients, who is probably the underlying cause of membrane formation in our series. Next. Next, please. Though the role of, okay, previous, please. Though the, uh, previous, uh, though the in the role of silicon is rule out that there is a no such advantages in normal standard discharge. Yes, I agree. But next, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. 
Okay, in, in my hand or in my study that if we use with a proper membrane removal also, if we use the silastic inhibition, success is at almost 95%, but if only mitomycin C, so there may be some again reformation of membrane or in a due course of time in, inflammation may persist for long, probably another cause. So in my hand, it is less than almost approximately 85%. Next slide, please. So here there is some view. We can go for a silastic intubation in the slit lamp view. This is the endoscopic view at the end, end of three weeks. Next. Next slide, please. Yeah, so this is the comparison of uh, my results. So in I just compare with uh, in membranes in 19 a long study, but uh, here with a silastic definitely the failures are less, but in mitomycin more cases are failed. So it is in percentage wise it is significant, but it is a short it is a less number of cases, so it is not so, so significant, but still I prefer intubation in such cases. Next slide, please. Next, please. Yes, so my take home message for distal cranicular membrane obstruction, it is an anatomic obstruction. It is not exactly as I already mentioned, it is not exactly in the canalicular, it is in the junction. Silastic intubation following proper membranectomy made success rate as equal as conventional external this year. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank you so much, Jayanta, for meticulously covering this, except for this video glitch. I think it was very well done. And you have explained about this membrane. The organizers want us to go with the next, next talk and have discussions later if we have time. So we'll go. Okay, ma'am. Talk. Thank you, Javed. Please go ahead. Yes. Dr. Javed needs to unmute himself. So thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lakshmi, uh, Sumit, and uh, BOA for giving me this opportunity to be uh, speaking on this topic. Uh, since the time is only eight minutes, uh, I'll just give you a brief overview without actually going into a lot of uh, technical aspects uh, of coronary angioplasty catheters. These are my financial disclosures. So the current uh, BDCP catheters that were being used are, uh, you know, either OptoCath or LacriCath, which comes in two and three millimeter variants. These are examples of that. And they also come with an inflation device, uh, which has uh, a power to inflate things up to 18 atmospheres. And this is an example of a traditional balloon catheter uh, for dacryoplasty in an uninflated and an inflated state. So way back in 2014, we looked at uh, its utility in uh, not only in congenital nasal acromal duct obstruction, but also in for revising uh, failed DCRs in those cases where there is internal osteum stenosis. But why do we need coronary angioplasty catheters? That is the most important question to answer here. So number one, is that the traditional dacryoplasty balloons that we use are approximately around $390 at this point uh, at a discounted rate that I get. So approximately I would say around $400, uh, which uh, from our country standards is a little expensive. The second thing with the current dacryoplasty catheters is that there is a restriction of the size and diameter, like, like you will only get at two millimeter, three millimeter and rarely five millimeter. Uh, there are restrictions with regards to the type of the catheters. You only get non-compliant with the traditional balloon dacryoplasty catheters, whereas the coronary ones are compliant and also semi-compliant variants. The, the current ones that we use do not have guide wires as against the coronary ones which have guide wires and there are advantages of that. 
And the most important question is, when Bruce Becker developed this, he developed it as two millimeter and three millimeter variants. But what is the evidence to say that it's, you should use only two millimeters or three millimeters? So these, these are not sacrosanct. It does not have any evidence-based uh, approach for using only or two or three millimeters. It's just that Bruce Becker thought that that might be good. So he went ahead and used it. So the advantages of coronary catheters is that you can get any range between 1.5 to 20 millimeters in diameter and at a difference of quarter millimeter diameter. So it's like huge range that you can select based on uh, what you need. These are examples of the coronary BDCP. I'll just share a probably a one minute video uh, if it plays well. Is this video playing? Yes. Yeah, okay. So now if you see this one, the difference uh, as against the traditional ones, you would see that it also comes with a lot of measurements for this specific balloon. And then it comes in a very coiled condensed pack. And the length is usually a meter, uh, obviously because people use it to go through the femoral into the coronary vessels. So that's the reason it's long. Uh, but from here, you can see an additional guide wire here. And it's this segment, which is important. This, this segment that you see, this is important for our purpose. And that's an additional guide wire that you have here through which you can go front and back, right? See, this is the guide wire that's coming. And the orange one that you see actually protects the balloon segment. The pink one that you see is the balloon segment. This is a 2.5 millimeter diameter and a 10 millimeter length balloon. So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm retrieving the guide wire to an extent that it just extends a little beyond the balloon segment, the pink segment there you see, right? And that's simple. The other parts are almost same. You have a lower lock mechanisms to use that with the inflation device. And uh, you can now see that that's an inflation device. Now the advantage of, I'll just skip this one now, yeah. So if you look at Lacry Cat, Opta Cat, and a coronary balloon, I just took up one of this companies, Spalno, which is made in Haryana. And the reason of using Spalno is that it is com comparatively much, much cheaper than all other variants. So it's only about the cost that uh, I use that one. I have no financial interest in that. So now if you look at these balloons, 2.2 and 3 millimeters, the regular ones, but here look at this variations, right? The lengths are only 13 and 15 millimeters. Look at the length variations that you can get here, right? Other than the guide wire and the rate busted pressures, which are quite high. The rate busted pressures for coronary are around 24 atmospheres. And we use only eight atmospheres. That means the safety level is up to three times. Even if I go beyond, the balloon is not going to burst, right? And then look at the cost. This is the most important aspect for me. Why I... <laughs> Somebody has to mute the mic, I think it's, yeah. So if you look at this cost, right? We have reduced the cost of this procedure by almost one fourth. And I think that's the, the most important thing. Now this is just examples of using it in uh, uh, congenital nasolacrimal duct obstructions. We have uh, published it, its utility in uh, failed DCRs uh, where we do a balloon revisions. Like this is a very typical example of that. And we have also started using these balloons for punctal stenosis. The reason behind that is, well, now with, with a monoka, with a simple dilatation, even without punctoplasty, we, you know, previously we used to do punctoplasty. Now we don't do punctoplasties because that those tissues are very sacrosanct and ideally you should not cut them. So now we went minimally invasive uh, by just simple dilatation and monoka that was also doing very well. But can we avoid stents after all in punctal stenosis. That is where I'm looking at it. So this is an example of, uh, uh, you know, this is just a proof of principle kind of a case where we have dilated and look at that beautiful dilatation at the end of it. And we have also found that this dilatation for punctal stenosis is uh, also very useful for chemotherapy induced punctal and canalicular stenosis uh, that you see in this pictures over there. Uh, so, so overall, as of now, they have indications in CNLDO, in revision DCRs, in punctal stenosis, and canaliculostenosis. 
For the punctal and canalicular stenosis, I would advise caution that uh, we are still in an experimental stage. Um, so it's good idea to just hold on your reins till we get some more data on this particular uh, issue, whether it's really helpful or not, or is it causing some problem which we are not aware of as of now. So, uh, but for CNLDO and revision DCRs, uh, you know, one can go ahead and use them. I won't go into those techniques of how to go about uh, using them, obviously for the want of time. So in conclusion, I would say that all these procedures needs further validation of how good or how bad it is uh, in long run. And uh, it has a potential for developing countries like ours. Uh, there is a training uh, that needs uh, for these particular things. And there is a learning curve. Uh, but I, I think, you know, um, if anybody wants to learn, I would be more than uh, willing to come to your place and help you learn these techniques. It's something uh, simple and you can learn uh, it easily. Thank you very much. Thank you, Javed, for beautifully illustrating this novel technique. I think uh, that you're doing away with punctoplasty and resorting to this is a very uh, welcome aspect and a novel idea. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I'll, uh, I'll go ahead with my talk. Yes, ma'am, please. Not yet. Can you see it now? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So periorbital swelling. I think now we are in the COVID uh, crisis where we are seeing, hearing and seeing so many of this mucomycosis. I thought this will be apt, but um, my talk is mainly uh, not just muca, but all the other aspects. Now, if you think of orbital and periorbital swelling, the etiology again comes under these seven categories, inflammation, infection, Vascular or hemorrhagic, vascular will be covered by Roshmi. Neoplastic, which we will have subsequently. Metastatic, congenital and traumatic. Every, almost every orbital or periorbital pathology has to fit into one of these. Inflammatory, the commonest we know and the, is cellulitis. And when there is infection, associated infection, and the other is, which we are going to see more and more, even before the COVID, almost 46 million Indians had thyroid issues. And many of them had thyroid eye issues. So now, now we are going to, with this COVID problem and the crisis, we are going to see more and more of thyroid eye disease. Then, of course, the granulomatous, non-granulomatous etiology, inflammatory, other inflammatory pseudotumors. So um, pseudotumor is one word I really detest because everybody just likes to use it left, right, and center, especially the radiologists. But we as oculoplastic surgeons, orbit surgeons, have a very important responsibility to brand each and every case and try to come up with a diagnosis. Now, cellulitis is very common. The child usually or adult has uh, sinusitis, fever, listlessness, sudden onset of orbital swelling. Main aspect is we should make sure they don't develop corneal complications or they don't go for optic neuritis, infective optic neuritis. So it is mandatory to admit the severe cases. The oral antibiotics is of no use. We have to give them IV antibiotics and day two, we can even start steroids, which I do very often to decrease the morbidity to the optic nerve, to decrease the optic neuritis, because that is mainly because of in inflammation due to the infection. Now, mucosal is, can suddenly spring up uh, the, with a periorbital puffiness, red swollen eyelid. So there again here, it's very important that we have to start the treatment and then resort to surgery subsequently. It's not like cellulitis where it completely subsides sometimes without surgery. Here we have to open the sinus passages and create a nice opening ostium and allow the drainage. Earlier we were using corrugated drains with endoscope and 
but many a time these javed also will agree with me they don't stay in place so it's important to open and widen the sinus recess now preseptal abscesses even an external or internal hodium in a very severely diabetic can cause periorbital swelling or puffiness and it that is generally it follows the medial uh, canthal ligament so anything below the ligament is most often a preseptal abscess due to acute dacrocystitis or acute on chronic dacrocystitis it can even present in the young where a dacrocele can get inflamed when in the congenital cases so we have to watch out and immediately uh, once again in such severe inflammation and infection and swelling we will have to give iv antibiotics and then subsequently take up the patient for dcr surgery once all the external swelling and inflammation is under control even for endoscopic surgery uh, it's good for the inflammation to be under control but the advantage of endoscopy is there is no external cut so if you have to drain the pus you can beautifully take the patient under ga uh, with an endoscope and drain out all the pus but sometimes dcr may be a little difficult you may have to go in subsequently and widen the ostium fungal infections i just don't want to talk about it now but because it's crisis many tell me even akshay many of these raguru all of them tell me that they are doing excentrations right left and center it's really alarming and after all this subsides we're just going to be we don't know how we are going to face the patients with the mutilated faces um all the the earlier cases where fungal infections were severe uncontrolled diabetics immunocompromised those with renal transplants as in this patient but now we are seeing even young healthy individuals especially in this wave of covid in the third decade going in for fungal uh, especially the mucormycosis infection fungus can also be chronic and lingering and can act like a real masquerade so sometimes you may wonder if there is some chronic long standing tumor or an or a, again a fibrosis where you will want to diagnose it and then it can, surprisingly it will be so hard and it can come out as fungus here again it's very difficult to demonstrate because they it's it they won't be so much of infection at that time you won't have so much fungal uh, particle uh, uh, elements there uh, culture is also long drawn but nevertheless there are telltale signs and you have to closely be associated with your microbiologist and pathologist pathologist for this diagnosis now very severe dry eyes again uh, they can present they may not here you can see again the patient has a bad sinusitis but the lacrimal swelling had subsided by the time she came but she had a very severe dry eye and later on because of dryness and constant you know uh, um, filament filamentary keratitis she had she even developed a ptosis i've still not operated her and just managed her with the help of a rheumatologist she needed treatment for about 3 to 4 years subsequently she came out of it had successful cataract surgeries also so these are all the long term sequelae because we can't jump and put in patients for immunosuppressives and steroids as well more so in this covid crisis a sarcoid has telltale diagnosis ac levels are raised there may be uh, lesions in the chest on chest ct scan or even x ray the widened mediastinal area so you can straight away start on treatment you don't need a biopsy and they do respond very well after viral infections you that is a routine viral infections or sinusitis you can have a reactive lymphoid hyperplasia where there can be swollen muscles swollen lacrimal gland sometimes it can mimic a lymphoma so if it is not subsiding with a course of steroid treatment you will have to take up the patient for a biopsy to rule out a lymphoma so here in the previous case it was almost bilateral lacrimal gland and lateral rectus involved in this case it is more or less unilateral though there is some amount of preseptal puffiness or periorbital puffiness in on the left side as well and you see this uh, the preseptal inflammation on the scan and the grossly thickened muscles so you have to differentiate this from thyroid eye disease it's very important and they may have swollen neck nodes Uh, cervical lymph nodes preauricular lymph nodes axillary lymph nodes so this again indicates it's a reactive lymphoid hyperplasia rlh 
they do very well with steroids only when they don't respond to the course of initial course of antibiotics and the later course of uh, antibiotics and steroids then we have to take up the patient for a biopsy to rule out a lymphoma so again thyroid eye disease can now is behaving like a masquerade i would say there are so many varied presentations but then again you have a specific muscle thickening generally it is bilateral though we have unilateral disease but the muscle thickening is generally bilateral though the proptosis may be more severe on one side sinus involvement can be there in bangalore i see a lot of patients with when they have an acute bout of sinusitis the thyroid eye disease which they may have a very minimal state will aggravate and they come with typical proptosis and a swollen eye tb again um it was when i was practicing in chennai for many years it was quite rampant but again orbital tuberculosis luckily is rare but nowadays i'm seeing it uh, in bangalore also so this common things common so orbital cellulitis infection tb we we'll keep all this in mind before we think of the more uh, connective tissue disorders like sjogren's and the sarcoid and then before we finally think of a tumor okay so typically you have to do your mantle test gene expert is very helpful it can be a cold abscess even there is a bone erosion you start worrying especially in a child whether we are having a histiocytosis we will have to do this or but then the typical abscess when it comes out on the table don't wait for only the zeal nielsen of course you have to do that and you have to do the culture but it's very important to do the gene expert take the tissues immediately within 48 hours you can get the results and start the treatment you have to remember that uh, orbital tb may need a little longer treatment you have to rule out lung infection in these cases and in this case it was not a cold abscess it was more of fibrosis you can see the displacement of the eyeball the bone erosion intromedially which causes the mass to become fibrous and start pushing the eyeball up and out typical lung signs so again uh, if you loss of appetite loss of weight evening rise of temperature so don't forget all what you studied in mbbs it's very very important you know we don't have to only have exotic diagnosis and periorbital inflammation now in thyroid as i told you that's behaving like a masquerade these days here there is periorbital inflammation but you can see but not much of proptosis at all but you see the swollen muscles there on the scan so here it is important to rule out do and this thyroid optic neuropathy and then decide whether you're giving the patient steroids or not or straight away referring to an endocrinologist or if they are already uh, seen by an endocrinologist whether their thyroid condition is under control and they are being treated well many of them need block replacement therapy they may need a combination of hypo and hyper treatment and in very many indian patients i will i will boldly say that when you give them oral steroids their eye disease worsens so please be careful in giving oral steroids iv steroids they do much better and when they are in the hyperthyroid status they hardly develop this thyroid problems they have acute inflammation and etc but when they suddenly become hypo after the treatment with when they are undergoing treatment for hypo that is hyper that is when when they become start becoming hypo that their eye signs worsen the periorbital inflammation starts they start experiencing decreased vision and in worst cases they have corneal issues and that was the state in this case she was hypothyroid to begin with and then she developed became hypo she also had pcod associated polycystic ovarian disease and she had something like a fleeting myositis it was not that you see the lateral rectus next time the superior oblique was involved so like that so that's why i'm telling you thyroid is becoming a masquerade tolosa again this lingering inflammation now with the covid crisis many are asking whether this is tola haza aren't in posting it because there is a minimal inflammation only at the apex the as adjacent ethmoid may not show much sign unless you do a very careful mri adjacent sphenoid may have a little bit of infection but again it's muca but in tolosa and typical you have the cox through dilatation of vessels you have all those tell sale signs and that is not present in now in the covid issue it's it's diagnosed wrongly as tolosa hunt please remember it's muca muca and only muca uh igg4 related inflammation vaginas micrilids are all these fancy diagnoses luckily about 10 15 years back this igg4 we started uh, re reading more about it so when you can't uh, diagnose anything we can 
it's but it's please realize this is you need the help of a very good pathologist to identify this and start treatment because if these patients not just steroids they may need immunosuppressives as well now uh, this was a case i saw about 2 months back a cute onset of proctosis just 15 days fox to dilatation of vessels were also there to mislead but then it was secondary to the orbit and she was having sarcoid for the last 20 years she has been under immunosuppressives she has been being treated by a rheumatologist for sarcoidosis but then this was not looking like sarcoid it's just a 15 day history in the orbit it turned out to be a, a leiomyosarcoma with extensive metastasis and chest uh, chest metastasis now why i am again explaining here is this this was lesion was presenting like a typical vascular lesion and she had other issues she had a pacemaker and she was not getting uh, clearance for ga but then they decided okay we can give her ga with risk and when she had the x ray routine x ray for the ga done there was a massive lesion there so in addition to the sarcoid lesion she had a secondary in the orbit and finally she needed a pet scan to find out where this leiomyosarcoma was coming from because it uh, the biopsy was only a sarcoma the, uh, the chest i'm sorry to interrupt there. but uh, we oh, reach no, time okay, very fast oh, okay uh, so this this uh, metastasis again can present as inflammation sometimes after dental extractions you can have lesions such as pseudo tumor but again please remember it is just chronic in it is in infection becoming fibrous there and settling down so uh, as again lesions like this patient was high, had thyroid issues had hormonal fluctuations she had um, she had pcod and she was wrongly biopsied so there was no need at all it was she needed a course of steroids with immuno suppressive so in traumatic cases very rarely we don't want to see this there can be a massive periorbital swelling this has subsided up to some extent by the time she came and she had an npl when she presented so though with ivmp she did not improve so sometimes the history can be misleading we really don't know what caused this massive periorbital inflammation immunosuppressives are an addiction we have to be very careful before we start it because patients generally cannot be just weaned off by it and patience is the key in young children again it's cellulitis which can become fibrosis you go unnecessarily and if you are not very sure just do a biopsy be very careful before you using power instruments because it can cause severe scarring she is around 16 today and still has corneal issues lag of thalamus so pay, so be very careful when you think oh just a sodotoma let me just do it by a bi biopsy be very careful before you put in the scalpel so whatever i have said i have just i have summarized here preserve vision function cosmesis every tumor must have a diagnosis evaluate the paranasal sinuses very carefully most of this periorbital inflammation come from the paranasal sinuses thank you very much thank you so much madam uh, i'd now request dr roshmi gupta to please uh, start sharing her screen for the final talk am i audible yes ma'am yeah good afternoon all i thank the chair and uh, boa for this opportunity to be with you here today we'll be talking about the vascular anomalies of the orbit which is a very complex subject in fact the guidelines have been changing from 2002 to 2014 initially the first classification was depending on the hemodynamic status the no flow venous flow or low flow and arterial flow that is high flow lesions there was also a classification which depended on the location a superficial one a deep one or a combined one the latest classification which is the international society for study of vascular anomalies classification modified combines all of this so it combines the flow uh, characteristics along with the tissue of origin and we'll start off with the vasoproliferative lesions 
And among them, the most common benign vasoproliferative lesion is the infantile hemangioma, which is also previously called capillary hemangioma. It's ubiquitous. It's one of the commonest things that happen in children in an oculoplasty clinic. You, it'll usually present around the third month of life. It starts off then, and it, in, it reaches its maximum level by fifth or sixth month. And that is when most children present. And now the current standard of care is oral propranolol. But we, of course, have to observe for adverse effects. So we need to give the medication for a prolonged duration. But we also have to make sure that any refractive error and any amblyopia therapy as needed is given. Intralesion steroid injection has also been used, which is usually used in 0.1 ml aliquots, and we give slow injection without excess pressure, and we monitor the central retinal artery. And this is pretty effective, but in Indian skin, it can cause hypopigmentation. Congenital hemangioma has to be differentiated from infantile hemangioma. Congenital hemangioma is present since birth. And, and it does not respond to propranolol or steroid injections. And you can see a high flow evidence with a lot of uh, contrast enhancement and the treatment would be surgical. And this is GLUT1 negative, whereas infantile hemangioma is GLUT1 positive. Among vasoproliferative lesions, the acquired benign lesion, the commonest one is a pyogenic granuloma. Conventionally, it has been treated by excision, but now topical timolol malleate for an extended period of time has been seen to be useful. The malignant one would be an angiosarcoma, which has a poor prognosis and would be treated by a combination modality of treatment, excentration and radiation. The next one that we come to is the lymphatic malformations. They were previously known as lymphangioma and will often present with sudden onset proptosis, sometimes associated with upper respiratory tract infection. They may be microcystic as here or macrocystic. It can be microcystic or macrocystic with fluid levels seen. These are no flow lesions, so they're not going to enhance with contrast. Surgical drainage works very fast. However, now the trend is using bleomycin as clerocent. You can aspirate the blood and then inject bleomycin. The next one in the list are the venous malformations, which may be distensible or non-distensible. If it's a distensible lesion, a valsalva maneuver or a dependent head position will show you the lesion. Generally, this does not need treatment. It's asymptomatic, but there may be enophthalmus due to loss of orbital fat. Uh, there may be pain on exercise or bending down. A sudden proptosis and pain might indicate that a thrombosis has occurred within the venous varics, which is the previous name for distensible venous malformation. A non-distensible venous malformation, the example is the cavernous venous malformation, earlier called the cavernous hemangioma. Now, this is a low flow lesion. There's a slow flow and it's a slow growth, circumscribed growth. It might compress the optic nerve. It might cause gaze evoked amaurosis, and there will be enhancement with contrast at a later phase in the venous phase. The treatment is surgical and it responds very well to treatment, which can be done through a minimal incision. The combined lesions would be a combined venolymphatic malformation. These would be mostly low flow lesions and they will show a rapid growth in contrast to the pure venous malformations. They will show partly enhancement with contrast and they can also show the flebolids. In contrast to uh, the pure venous malformations, the venous malformation, the cavernous venous malformation will be more round. This will be more elongated. And this will respond well to sclerosin therapy. 
this patient has been treated with bleomycin. A combination of venolymphatic malformation might need combination therapies, such as injecting cyanacrylate glue and debulking, then the next stage with bleomycin injection and repeat bleomycin injection. You know that you cannot excise the whole thing because it is so diffuse. And this is the final outcome. The arteriovenous malformations are high flow lesions. You may be able to see the pulsatile proptosis on the slit lamp and you'll see the dilated vessels on the surface and you may even hear the brewing. You can see the dilated episcleral vessels and have uh, a secondary glaucoma. These are mostly treated by interventional radiology. So you need to know that an artery of venous malformation is a high flow lesion and there can be a pulsatile mass. There's a feeder from the ophthalmic artery and it keeps increasing, the nidus keeps increasing. So you have to coil the feeder vessel and then excise the nidus. Arteriovenous fistula, on the other hand, will show these flow voids and you will see a dilated and prominent superior ophthalmic vein. And it can lead to proptosis, swelling, limitation of movement and responds very well to coiling. Syndromic ISV lesions would include uh, Sturge Weber syndrome, which it shows capillary hemangioma over the face and the eye, but this does not blanch and this does not involute. Now let's see how we apply these learnings to cases. This looks like a small vascular lesion. However, when you do a valsalva, you can see the vessels prominent all around the eye or, and even on the temple. And you see that the Contrast shows up the vascularity all around the face and deep in the orbit. So this is a distensible venous malformation and it is best left alone unless the patient is severely symptomatic. This patient presented with a rapid onset proptosis and you can see the fluid fluid levels. And this is a venolymphatic malformation and with pretty close to the surface. So simply by aspiration and injection of bleomycin, she's responded excellently. This is a five month follow-up with complete recovery of ocular movement. This in contrast, child came to us three months after the first onset of proptosis. Even with contrast, it is not enhancing and you can see an area of fibolith. So this is a venolymphatic malformation. However, because of the long duration, uh, thrombosis has formed and which has started organizing. We tried an aspiration which did not yield any aspirate and so finally the child had to undergo a surgical treatment. So overall for appropriate management of a vascular lesion we need to look at the history. Is it quick onset or a slow onset? The dynamic evaluation is very important looking at pulsatility and distensibility. When we are selecting imaging we need to look at the contrast enhancement and which phase the contrast starts off and thereafter only select the management strategy. And we have a varied treatment for varied lesions. Thank you. Beautiful talk, Roshmi, wonderful. Thank you. I think with this, we come to the end of the session, right? Yes, yes ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Sumit. You have put in a very nice program. Congratulations. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for you and being there. Thankful to BOA for this wonderful program and sessions on oculoplasty. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, all the speakers and the panelists and Hasnain sir for conducting it very beautifully with a lot of discussion. And uh, I be, uh, thank all of you on behalf of BOA and MOS organizing committee. And uh, we'll continue after the break, uh, lunch break at 2.15 in the same hall, starting the fourth session of the oculoplasty. Thank you, everyone, once again. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.
Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Hello, Dr. Nupur. Hi, Dr. Meera. Good afternoon. Can we check our screen share once and keep? Yeah, yeah, you can, you can, definitely. Hi, Sumit. Sorry, I thought it's, you sounded like Dr. Meera. Sorry. No, no, no. no, no. I think the screen yeah. share is, yeah, you'll have to. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Hello, good afternoon, Dr. Andy Patel. Hello, good afternoon, sir. Right. Very good afternoon, sir. Okay. Uh, Dr. Nupur, you can check your uh, screen sharing. There is no problem. No, so uh, there is one screen share which is already going on the, uh, the mini oh. concert cutting that will need to be uh, paused. That may be in the lunch session. They, they will Achha. take out by 2 o'clock, I suppose. Okay, we'll we can check go it. in between two, two, two. Sure, sure. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hi, Hello, ma'am. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, good to see you all. Hello, good, good afternoon, Dr. Andy Patel. Yeah. I'm Hello. Hello. Wo YouTube, yes, ka, I think uh, it's uh, back play or I shall. YouTube, ka play. Huh. Achha, ek minute. Uh, you shall join to call Jyoti Kamu. It's okay now. Hello. Yes, it's, yes, sir. It's fine. It's fine now. Yeah. It's fine. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Am I visible or I shall share? I have to share my screen or what? I think you'll have to share your screen, but Abhi now that uh, okay. Okay. thing right. is already being shared now. We'll have to wait for them to. Uh, sir, you'll have to start your video once we start the session 215. It's. Uh, yeah. Yeah, on your left hand side, uh, near your voice thing, sir, you just have to start the video, nothing else. You don't have to share yes. the screen, sir. Right, right, right. Yes, sir. Yes.
So good afternoon, everyone. Hi, Dr. Sumit. Hi, Dr. Anuradha. Hi, Yush. You can hear me clearly? Uh, I can hear you clearly. So, uh, have you checked your slides, whether the uh, screen share is working fine? Yeah, I'll do that. Okay, I think someone else is sharing the screen, so it's not allowing me to share the screen. Uh, we can ask technical team, uh, 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 Sai or anyone, a uh, few presenters wanted to check their presentation. Is it possible to share the screen? Technical team here. Yeah. I yeah, think we can I share can. the screen now. Is that okay? Yes, ma'am. Any video, anything? No. Okay. Should I keep it as it is or should I stop sharing? Ma'am, uh, stop sharing. Yeah, even I would like to just check it once. Can I try? Yes, yes, ma'am, please. Just a minute. Is it visible? No, ma'am, not. No, now it is visible. Just a minute. Huh? I'll try to make it a slide show. I hope this is good now. Yes, ma'am. Running well. Yeah. Stop sharing. Can I check once? Yes, ma'am, please. It's, it's coming now, yeah. Uh, first lady, yeah. Fine, right? Well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to all the speakers and moderators, we have to stick to the time because after this we have two more sessions, otherwise it will keep on extending. So uh, I request moderator to uh, uh, 
tell the speaker at the end of the seven minutes that there is only one minute left. And uh, in case the talk is extending too much, then the uh, chairperson, panelist, uh, Patil sir or Jyotika ma'am can uh, interrupt and uh, tell the presenter accordingly that we can conclude and go ahead with the discussion. Just to, cause we have all the speakers, eight, eight speakers in the session and uh, none of them is absent. So uh, it would be better that if we stick to our time. Is that okay, Narendra sir? Patil sir? Yeah, yeah, please. Okay. Yes. yes. So we'll yeah. exactly start in 2.15, sir, to add right. and to 2.13. Yeah. So basically, the moderator will introduce the panel and after that, uh, the panelists can go ahead with the uh, one by one uh, talks. We have the schedule with everyone of us. Yes. Yes. Thank uh, you. Sumit, so uh, I have one doubt. Is yes, the introduction uh, also included in the timing of the talk? Uh, no, ma'am. The introduction will be like hardly a line till you are loading your presentation. Got it, got it. So once you start sharing, the, that time will start the time. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. We have a 10 minute, 15 minutes buffer, ma'am, between okay. two sessions. So there is there was no problem uh, in last three sessions. So nothing else. But there were like two one speaker absent in each and every uh, session. But here we have all the eight speakers present. Hi, Sumit. Hello, ma'am. Hello. Hi, everyone. Good Hello, afternoon, ma'am. Ma hey, ma'am. Do you have your lunch? No. <laughs> I did not. I don't know about it. <laughs> but it's a really very good feast academic fees going on since morning all the speakers and all the talks are excellent and the topics are excellent i tried to visit all the halls it's going excellent it's a wonderful program set piyush good to see you in plastics piyush bansal Good to see you, Oculoplasty man. <laughs> Hi, Aditi. Hello, Adam. How are you? Fine. How are you? Good, good. How's your patient? Much better. <laughs> Anuradha, hi. Good hi, ma'am. On uh, FB, yeah. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> we know each other through LBO rather than ophthalmology. Yeah. I think Nupur is also there. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Hi. Nice to see you all here. Same, same. Yes. Hi, Neera. Oh, I think he disappeared. You're muted, Neera. Yeah, nice to see all of you. Hi. Hi. Can I just check my screen share once? Yeah, yeah please do, please do. Yes. My screen visible? Yes, yes, it is very much visible, Doctor. All of you can have the background uh, which has been sent. If uh, I suppose they are sent on the mail and I uh, put it on the group as well. Now the background doesn't seem to work. <laughs> then it's okay. <laughs> because it, it kind of no, like no, no. My... yeah, no, I got it. It needs uh, that plain uh, white wall kind of a thing. It's okay. Hi, Namrata. Hello, hi, hello, hello, everyone. Sorry, hello, I'm just got in. Um, is it okay if I check my presentation? Yes, please.
It's running well, ma'am. Yeah, I think it's fine. Thank you. Uh, Piyush sir, we can start now. I think all our panelists and the speakers are there and the introduction will take 2-3 minutes. It's 2.13 already. Piyush sir? We can't hear you. I think Piyush, you are on mute. There's some problem with your audio. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I take immense pleasure in uh, welcoming everyone to this uh, fantastic session of Oculoplasty Potpourri. And uh, we have uh, an eminent uh, panel of speakers, uh, chair, co-chair, convener. Uh, and co-convener. Uh, to begin with, I would like to introduce uh, the, uh, the chair, uh, Dr. N.D. Patil, sir, who is a very senior ophthalmic surgeon practicing in Nagpur. He is an RPC alumni and uh, trained under Dr. S.M. Bateria. Uh, we have co-chair uh, Dr. Jyotika Mishri Kotkar. Madam is the professor and head of department of the MGM Medical College. Madam is extremely active academically and has uh, raised the bar of uh, residency programs. Uh, next, we have the convener, uh, Dr. Namrata Abulkar, who is a fellow of a fellow uh, uh, practitioner in Pune. We are very lucky to have her in Pune. Uh, she uh, is a fellow of uh, Arvinda Institute, where she trained in oculoplasty. And uh, followed by that, that, she has trained extensively in uh, British Columbia and uh, USA as well. Uh, we have co-convener, Dr. Aditi Watwe, who is uh, my co-fellow uh, from, uh, she is my fellow from, my co -fellow from uh, El Prasad Eye Institute, an extremely talented uh, oculoplasty surgeon who did her residency in Arvind and uh, fellowship in uh, El Prasad Eye Institute. All by this, uh, she is has a very thriving and uh, a very uh, unique practice in uh, Kolhapur. So with this, uh, May I request uh, Dr. Namrata Adulkar and Dr. Aditi Watu to please uh, carry on, carry for the program. Yeah. The uh, future, your voice is uh, coming low. Your voice is little less, uh, not very much audible. Uh, it's okay. The, uh, the Dr. Okay. Andy uh, Patil, sir, now, now you are audible, sir. Dr. Yeah, Andy Patil, yeah. sir, can we have a few words from you and Jyotika, ma'am, before we start the session and then we'll begin with the first uh, speaker itself. Yeah. Um, yeah, so Bit, am I have to start? Uh, sir, just uh, two, three lines of uh, about the session and the whole program. So we can, of introduction, so then we can start the session, sir. Okay. Shall I say something? Yes, sir, please. Yeah. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, I'm listening right from morning, this uh, oculoplasty, and let's have the potpourri of whatever the topics discussed till date, uh, uh, till this time. And I hope um, uh, almost uh, all these speakers are uh, really excellent and highly experienced people to present their, um, their salient points uh, uh, in their uh, respective topics. And this is um, uh, one more, uh, uh, just a suggestion that please stick to your time of eight minutes. Is that okay? And thank you very much. Yes, sir. Uh, really sorry, Namrata ma'am, but uh, Anuradha ma'am's uh, presentation being first. It, had she joined, Dr. Anuradha ma'am? Uh, yeah, I'm here. And uh, again, I need to be allowed to share my screen. Yes, yes. Now yes. I can Uh, Can you hear me now? Is this better? Yeah, this is a better picture. Yeah, so. Okay, perfect. Uh, when may I begin? You can start, ma'am. 
A very good afternoon to everyone. A big thank you to Lahari sir, Sumit, Ragini ma'am for having this wonderful program and since morning the talks have been great. I have been asked to present uh, something on lumps and bumps. So I thought I'll divide the topic on a case-based scenario and talk about how uh, in lumps and bumps we always have something to cut, that is some sort of a surgery. We have something to treat which means a non-surgical intervention and of course situations wherein we can observe or use supportive measures for the same. So the first patient is that of a 25 year old girl who came to me with a 1.5 year of a swelling on her upper eyelid. So now clinically this definitely was a cyst of mole. She gave a history of needle puncture elsewhere which was done three times and each time the lesion recurred in two to four weeks. The lid margin was involved and bulged out and the lashes were few in that area. So in case one, I decided to go ahead and cut it, but I had to use a slightly different approach. So this was her at the final picture, which was three months follow up. So what was done initially in the second picture that you can see is I went ahead surgically and made an incision at the superior aspect of the lesion. I drained all the fluid. I used alcohol in order to de-epithelialize the secretory epithelium there and uh, cut off the excess skin and put in tight sutures. After a week, the sutures were removed and following which the lesser lashes, I decided to use a prostaglandin analog which was mixed every night with some amount of lubricant gel and applied exactly topically on that area. And this was her after three months, the existing few eyelashes that were there, they thickened and lengthened and definitely did not look like a cosmetic blemish. Uh, I have a two year follow up of this patient and she's doing well with absolutely no recurrence. Now case two was interesting. Uh, this lady came to me with a rapidly growing uh, painless mass uh, since uh, this is actually 1.5 uh, uh, months actually. 1.5 year ago, she underwent a collision in that area, but the swelling more or less sort of remained the same and it suddenly grew in size in a month and a half. She was six months pregnant, which again made me think. So clinically, I diagnosed this as an arteriovenous malformation. post collision it's quite common in certain situations to have an AVM, and especially considering that the pregnancy hormones would have exacerbated the growth of an AVM. I decided to go ahead and uh, cut this lesion quite early on. So here is the post-operative picture. One year later, she did quite well, and uh, histopathology confirmed the diagnosis of AVM. So this is her final picture with an year of follow-up. The third case is an old patient of mine and uh, she presented with this uh, left, right, uh, left eyelid swelling since a month and a half. Over two or three years, she kept coming to me for recurrent collisions for which I have done incision and curettage at different locations on all four eyelids. Uh, she has acne rosacea, which whenever she has an intermittent or moderate flare-up, she tends to present with a certain degree of squamous pleuritis, for which she keeps coming for treatment on and off. So here, she did not want to undergo surgery again. So I decided to inject triamcinolone astronide, uh, 0.1 to 0.2 ml intralesionary. And in a month of follow-up, the entire lesion had disappeared. I put her on a course of doxycycline following which, again, her squamous blepharitis uh, with eyelid hygiene as well as with doxy, the acne rosacea also had reduced. Now, this patient was referred to me in 2017 for an excision of an subbrow cyst. Now, she presented with the swelling under the eyebrow since two months. There was mild tenderness the local temperature was slightly raised, it was cystic in nature and adherent to the skin. So clinically, I diagnosed it as in Paramkal. So what was done is I took her off the uh, antibiotic course that she was on, which was extremely prolonged, and just advised her warm compresses. And three weeks later, a surgical patient comes back absolutely looking fine without a single incision. Now, this patient came to me in February this year. 11-month-old child referred by a pediatrician and a pediatric ophthalmologist. The child had multiple chalasia, which were of one month duration. It started off with the right upper lid, then uh, progressed to the left one as well. So the child had already been on three courses of oral antibiotics. So on examination, there was small to moderate sized multiple chalasia on all four eyelids and one dissolving cordiolum internum in the right lower eyelid. 
the anterior segment examination otherwise was fine, no blepharitis, no congestion, there were no known allergies, and the parents did not notice any eye rubbing in the child. I decided to further prod into the history and plan observation. So on further prodding of the history, I discovered that the mother had gestational diabetes and she had not checked her blood sugars. She was still feeding the child. And um, on again asking her in detail, she did complain of mild watering in both eyes every now and then. So I investigated the child and mother both with their CBC and sugar levels and found them to be normal. I again had to go back into the history and speak to the other relatives and I found that um, there were a lot of relatives coming to the house during this period and uh, to see the child and quite often they would have a lot of interaction with the child with pulling their cheeks etc. A new maid was in the house and she would clean the whole house before giving the child a bath. So some of those things were changed. The maid was asked to uh, bathe the child before cleaning the house. All the relatives were asked not to touch the face of the child. And uh, a mild course of topical steroids I started because I suspected some sort of subtle underlying allergy in view of the mild watering and uh, warm compressors twice a day. Following which in three weeks, the left upper and lower eyelid had completely normalized. The right medial calasin had disappeared, lateral one had significantly reduced and the hordeolum was also on the verge of disappearing. So every time we see a lump and bump in the clinic, which is one of the most ocular, common oculoplastic conditions that uh, general ophthalmologists would come across in the OPD, you always try to think whether this is something I need to cut, whether this is something that can be treated, like a simple pyogenic granuloma, smaller in size, especially in pediatric children. It can always be treated with an antibiotic steroid ointment. Whether it is something to observe, like a small capillary hemangioma, a nevus, which is in growing. Further, there are certain life-saving pointers as a general practitioner you can do whenever you see an eyelid lesion, simply evert the eyelid. You never know which one, which lesion is a hidden underlying cancer. Do not be fooled by the age of the patient. You can have a young patient running around from one doctor to the other, getting treated as an lid abscess or infection, which could actually be an underlying sebaceous gland carcinoma, as Dr. Aditi will further explain in her talk. Uh, any lesion which has some underlying ulceration, which is present since very long, is basal cell carcinoma. And uh, we have one more brilliant talk coming in regarding basal cell carcinoma right ahead. So to summarize, I would say that in eyelid lumps and bumps, you cut whenever there is a precancerous or cancerous lesion, fast growing masses, large cyst, unusual off looking lesion, a tissue for biopsy when you need to obtain a foreign body granuloma. You treat with conservative measures, small to medium calasians, or with steroid injections, hordeolums, and small pyogenic granuloma. You observe stationary benign lesions and cysts and small calasians and paruncles. So a detailed assessment of history, systemic illness, clinical factors, local parameters, and lifestyle changes. Anticipate rare presentations of common lesions as also remember the common presentations of uncommon lesions. And the most important thing that you could do, especially with the good camera phones that you have, if you do not have a DSLR, is photographic documentation at each visit because patient memory tends to be very short. And you also can learn from your previous cases and have enough documentation of all patients. Uh, thank you so much. I hope that helped. Thank you very much. That was very nice presentation, ma'am. Bang on time. Thank you. Uh, uh, we'll move ahead with the second presentation. Uh, are there any uh, questions from the panelists themselves? Okay, ma'am. One question from my side, another, ma'am. That you showed the small AVM that was excised. So, uh, what investigation of the choice that you do for such a smaller uh, eyelid AVM that we have? like uh, 1.5 to 2 centimeters. Uh, you mean the AVM that I showed in the pregnant woman? Yes, yes, yes. So the pregnant woman, I didn't investigate her further. Of course, I mean, I had done her blood workup, uh, but knowing the fact that she underwent a calasian, 
prior to the development of this, a Calaisian is a perfect ground for formation of ADMs whenever it is incompletely removed. You have the venules, you have the capillaries and arterioles open. So then again, the hormones of pregnancy just allow it to mushroom up, you know, to the level that it did. So I did not uh, feel the need for any further investigation as I was quite certain of the clinical diagnosis. And histopathology again confirmed it. And uh, she's doing absolutely fine. I did ask her about any petechiae, etc., on the skin, any bleeding tendencies, and she had none. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Now we'll uh, go ahead with the second talk by Dr. Aditi Vatwe on the sebaceous gland carcinoma. Be aware of the massacre. Over to you, ma'am. Yes, thank you. Uh, am I audible and is the screen visible? Very much. Yes, thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, all the office bearers of uh, BOA and MOS, as well as the coordinators of this symposium for giving me the opportunity. Uh, we'll be discussing about sebaceous gland carcinoma, which is the most common uh, eyelid malignancy in Asian Indian population. It is considered among the most lethal because of its aggressive local behavior and tendency for local re uh, local regional metastasis and to the distant organs. It is generally considered a disease of elderly, but prior irradiation definitely has increased risk of this uh, condition. So common clinical features with which this actually presents are solitary eyelid nodule. It has specific, uh, the cells have specific affinity for the inflammatory cells. So diffuse pseudo-inflammatory disease is another feature. Otherwise, it can present as pedunculated lesion, carancular mass, or extensive disease when the disease is not treated in time. These are different clinical uh, differential diagnosis. We'll come to most of these as we discuss few cases. So, in general, when do we actually suspect presence of sebaceous gland carcinoma? I'll be addressing it as SGC. So, uh, in any uh, lid mass, first is rounding of lid margins. Another is loss of lashes, telangiectasia, and effacement of mebomen gland orifices. These are four uh, important features which are generally present in most of the sebaceous gland carcinoma cases. It can present as a lid mass, which is the most common presentation. Uh, even the lid mass can have different morphologies. Sometimes, like in this patient, this patient had actually presented just as irritation of right eye on a specific ocular examination and on eversion, this was the lesion which was actually noticed with rounding of lid margins, effacement of meibomian gland orifices. There was not much of loss of lashes, but rest of the things were pointing it towards SGC. So the patient underwent surgery and the histopathologically it was confirmed. If the disease is actually diagnosed in this at this point of time, even a minimally uh, extensive surgery can have a very good cosmetic outcome and the chances of metastasis uh, is like really low. Uh, it is very important to note as Dr. Anuradha has mentioned, in any case of lid mass, it is very important to evert the eyelid which will actually give clue to the actual extent of the lesion. Many a times in upper eyelid or even for that matter lower eyelid because the lesion is there, uh, arises from the tarsus the conjunctival side shows much larger mass than actually external appearance. Uh, many times uh, patients actually present as a case of calesion. Many times they give history of recurrent calesion at the same site, which is uh, like repeatedly uh, done curated. But again, suspicion, high degree of suspicion and Eversion of the eyelid will surely give a clue towards the uh, actual diagnosis. These larger lesions, which generally extend beyond the tarsal height, we should suspect SGC because very rarely calesia will extend uh, beyond the tarsal height. A similar lesion, which is beyond the tarsal height, addition, additionally, we can actually see the dilated feeder vessels and obviously the Eversion is giving a clue uh, towards the malignant cause. So this lady actually had come with history of incision and curettage recently. We can actually see the loss of lashes in that part as well as the recent uh, 
the incision uh, site where the curata from where the curatage was done another uh, presentation is unilateral uh, blepharitis which is not resolving with uh, treatment uh, like in months time again incision biopsy was done the sgc was confirmed and she underwent excision biopsy with lead reconstruction this was interesting case where this patient was referred as a case of entropion she had undergone multiple laser uh, uh, treatments for laser lash removal because she had corneal issues because of the misdirected lashes but on examination the tarsus and lid margin was not looking healthy so we did incision biopsy confirmed the diagnosis of sgc and she underwent a definitive surgery uh, in any uh, case with lid mass along with unilateral blepharoconjunctivitis it is very important uh, to rule out extensive fagetoid spread of the disease so uh, in this case map biopsy has a role where we take uh, small biopsies from 17 different places which includes three from each uh, tarsal conjunctiva three from each pornicial conjunct uh, conjunctiva four from the bulbar conjunctiva and one from the carunculus side extensive disease can be there which can extend in the orbit uh, we need to confirm the diagnosis and go uh, like decide the treatment plan so what are the treatment options in general surgery new adjuvant chemo adjuvant radiation topical and cryo so the role of new adjuvant systemic chemotherapy has been explained in different case series and different uh, papers which makes the lesion uh, less extensive and uh, less morbid or less extensive surgeries can be chosen to treat the disease so what are the surgical options once we go to the surg uh, surgery uh, as a treatment option excision biopsy or incision biopsy in case of doubt map biopsy to uh, delineate the extent of the disease excentration and selective or radical neck dissection in case of regional lymph node metastasis it is very important to plan the reconstruction plan when you are planning a uh, uh, eyelid uh, excision biopsy with reconstruction so what are the main considerations re examine on table because many of the times there is a gap between posting the surgery and actually patient coming in ot so we need to see if the disease extent is the same or we need to change our reconstruction or surgical plan marking another minute tanu aditi yeah, i'm almost done uh, 4 mm clinically clear uh, margin should be marked uh, considering the maximum extent of the disease prosen section for margin clearance needs to be done if we don't have any facility of prosen section Uh, we can take slightly like 5 mm of margin with uh, cryo to the rest of the uh, eyelid margin uh, in case you are in doubt and uh, pre op consent and marking of the presumed donor site other than the same eye is also important uh, before actually planning for the surgery it is very important to communicate with the pathologist keep a suture for orientation send separate margins when necessary and we need clearance from both uh, skin and as well as um, conjunctival site outcomes mainly depend on the uh, stage of the disease and the size of the lesion in smaller lesions like this the post op hardly any uh, scars or anything is seen even uh, on uh, closed eyelids in these kind of patients even local flaps can give a very good result slightly bigger lesions will need some lid sharing procedures like cutler beard flap or hoop flap in this case extensive disease may warrant excentration these are few prognostic factors which have been uh, described from histopathology point of view so what is the take home message early diagnosis is the key in this disease keep masquerades in mind which will give uh, which will help in early diagnosing the case anticipate the defect and keep the reconstruction plan ready and how can we actually avoid uh, delay in diagnosis high index of clinical suspicion send calesion for histopathology if you are suspecting something solid mass or it is a calesion recurrent at the same site keep a threshold for biopsy low do map biopsy when needed communication with pathologist for margin clearance and specifications while sending the specimen is equally important as clinical as well as surgical uh, treatment of the disease thank you
thank you dr aditya for this wonderful presentation uh, we we want to the next talk by dr uh, shubha gavas uh, on basal cell carcinoma of the eye madam can you uh, share your slides please Is it seen? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. It's yeah, seen, but you'll have to go into. Like to uh, thank uh, Team BOA, um, Dr. Lane Sir, Ragini Ma'am, and thank you, Sumit, for inviting me for this wonderful meeting. Well, I'll be talking on uh, basal cell carcinoma eyelid. Mm. So we keep on seeing such lesions of the lower lid or uh, lids in the OPD very frequently. Why? Because. Uh, uh 90 uh, this basal cell carcinoma constitutes almost 90% of all malignant eyelid tumors elderly patients are seen the risk factors are mainly exposure to a harsh sunlight uvb light that's why it is um, uh, seen more in the equatorial latitudes um well the site most most commonly is the lower lid followed by the medial canthus the upper lid and the lateral canthus this is a low growing a uh, slow growing and locally invasive uh, non metastasizing um, uh, tumor orbital invasion is uh, uh, orbital invasion is very uncommon the incidence reported is just uh, 1.6 to 2.5% uh, but there is a, there is a greater risk of recurrence with worse prognosis hence needs aggressive treatment early diagnosis and surgery uh, well uh, like aditi just now said if you see a suspicious le uh, lesion on the lower lid uh, what should you look for so you should look for an ulceration a lack of tenderness uh, and duration irregular borders destruction of a uh, lid margin architecture or loss of vellus hair these are the signs for um, malignancy so clinical types of basal cell carcinoma are uh, nodular type which is a superficial uh, type of thing and uh, uh, which shows of a uh, shiny form pearly nodule with small dilated vessels on its surface it grows just 0.5 cm in 1 to 2 years and then uh, you have the more commoner presentation of a nodulo ulcerative rodent ulcer wherein you see a central ulceration a pearly raised uh, uh, rolled edges and dilated and irregular vessels and this typically erodes then you have the sclerosing bcc uh, morphy form uh, uh, type which infiltrates uh, laterally beneath the epidermis as an indurated plaque margins are difficult to delineate this is uh, more aggressive and larger risk of recurrence and metastasis is uh, seen here uh, so this is the typical rodent ulcer that i was discussing and this is the more aggressive morphy form type now histopathology as we know it grows from the basal layer of epidermis proliferates downwards and palisading is seen around it investigations if there is an orbital invasion you should go for mri for better visualization of uh, uh, soft tissue changes and perineural invasion and uh, these days confocal microscopy uh, has shown promising high sensitivity so management treatment is individualized to the patient situation tumor characteristics and histological subtype the management outlines a biopsy surgical excision radiotherapy and neuro neuro modalities biopsy can be done by a punch biopsy or a shave excision in case of a shallow tumor while as surgical excision that is the wide local excision it aims to remove the tumor along with a clear 5 mm margin well a standard frozen section is important wherein you consider the margins to be tumor free and then go ahead with the eyelid reconstruction or else mousse micrographic surgery which is a laid excision of tumor which uh, uh, is used for tumor growing diffusely this maximizes total tumor removal and minimizes healthy tissue sacrifice uh, so this is a laid excision done and has been proven to be the uh, the treatment of choice for periocular basal cell carcinoma radiotherapy can act as an adjuvant to surgical excision and can be used uh, in palliative cases where surgery is not suitable 
Now, eyelid reconstruction, this should be carefully considered as both function and aesthetic outcome in patients are important after clear excision of tumors. This depends on the extent of tissue removal, site, and the size of the mass. Small defects can be closed directly or cantholysis can be used to mobilize the tissue. Moderate defects up to half of the lid will need tensile flap. Larger defects over half of the lid will need a huge starso conjunctival flap or a cutler beard bridge flap and mustardi's cheek rotation flap in cases where there is more tissue loss. So, so follow-up is important, has to be extended in case of infiltrative morphe form found, uh, forms. Orbital invasion is uncommon, but excentration is considered in case of extensive orbital invasion and high-risk aggressive infiltrative type of tumors. Now, this was a case which showed a very uh, large mass going on since 10 years involving the upper lid, the medial canthus and the lower lid. And the eyeball was fixed here with no PL vision. So we went ahead with an excentration for such a case. Now, new, newer modalities available are Vismodegib and Imiqui mode. Now, Vismodegib is a, a hedgehog pathway inhibitor used to treat basal cell nevus syndrome and locally advanced or metastatic basal cell carcinomas or in relapses to reduce the size of the tumor. Imiqui mode shows uh, promising results in lesions less than 10 millimeters, wherein uh, this immunomodulator. 5% cream is used for nodular BCCs and my skin uh, colleagues have been using with good results. Now this case, as I told you, we went ahead with the surgery, wide local excision with five millimeters margins were excised and a tensile flap was raised for this lower lid reconstruction, which, was, uh, which gave good results. Another case with a, a bit of a larger uh, lesion with a very typical rolled out edges and a central ulceration. Uh, so once uh, this was near the lateral margin of the low lid and once this uh, tumor was removed, we saw that more than half of the lid was sacrificed. And so we went ahead with a cheek rotation flap with very good results. Another difficult case at a site at uh, the tumor at a difficult site that is near the lateral canthus wherein we raised some temporal rotation flaps uh, and then uh, she was treated. Uh, another larger lesion, this was also growing on since eight years near the lateral canthus and um, um, quite a, a big thing, three by three centimeters triangular thing again. This was removed uh, with a wide local excision and we went in for a mustardi uh, cheek rotation flap with uh, a quite good uh, result. Uh, this is another very large mass. Now, this uh, was uh, since 10 years involving the upper and lower lids, the lateral parts, the lateral canthus, and the inferior phonix. Again, this, uh, she had good vision. So she had almost 660 vision here. So we saved her by doing a mastardi cheek rotation flap, and uh, she went on well. And I never knew such patients can, uh, you know, treat their posture because once she came with that lesion, she was all bent 90 degrees and with the first follow-up, she was just erect. Uh, minute, this is, uh, another uh, very large mass, you know, and uh, you could see all uh, the upper lid, lower lid, inferior phonics. Again, she had a, a vision of 660. And so we went ahead with a very uh, big, you know, um, uh, cheek rotation flap and a glabular flap to treat. And uh, the whole uh, like um, uh, lid was reconstructed nicely, but we lost this patient um, uh, for her kidney ailment uh, almost two months later. So as I tell you, the cure rate is almost 95%, hence early diagnosis and a very well-designed surgery will save you. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. That was really wonderful presentation. And in last three talks, we have covered the uh, major massacres of the eyelids from the benign to malignant to basal cell to the sebaceous gland carcinoma. Now we'll come to more benign lesions. And the next talk is by to, uh, is stosis evaluation by Dr. Sneha Shinde. Uh, Ma'am, you are here? Yes, sir. Uh, can you please uh, share your screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So is my screen seen? Uh, no, not yet. Now, now it is very much visible. Visible, sir? Yeah. Okay. 
the screen is it visible yes yes yeah a very very good afternoon to one one and all and thank you so much for giving me this opportunity actually i was not at all aware till last yesterday and yesterday night i have just done this preparation i'm extremely sorry if at all it is not up to the mark so i'll just go ahead with it uh tosis evaluation this is basically tosis made simple for even a first your resident if he comes across a case of tosis how he should evaluate it and what should be done for it is what was there in my mind when i did this presentation uh tosis actually comes from a greek word which means falling I, and it when it comes to any part of the body whichever is drooping related to that if you put tosis that is what actually the word actually means but in case of eye when it comes to the upper lid uh, blepharoptosis means drooping of the upper lid so the upper lid actually covers 2 mm of the cornea tosis as such can be divided into true and pseudotosis what is the pseudotosis pseudotosis is actually not true tosis but it is because of any uh, ocular pathology that could have lead to uh, pseudotosis like decrease intra orbital volume superior sulcus abnormalities uh, hypotropia eyelid contractions or any case of dermatocalysis or blepharocalysis also and then how do we classify tosis tosis can basically be classified into congenital and acquired congenital tosis is further classified into simple and complicated and acquired is further categorized into neurogenic myogenic aponeurotic mechanical and traumatic complicated ptosis is when uh, a congenital simple ptosis uh, is associated with other ocular motility anomalies or it can be associated with blepharophimosis syndrome can be associated with marcus ginn jaw winking or uh, misdirected third nerve ptosis also then uh, the main thing as we all know clinicians history taking is of utmost importance in a case of ptosis half of your things are ruled out here itself the age of onset of the ptosis is very much important whether it is congenital or acquired whether it is present at birth or it was seen later duration since how long it is there whether it is unilateral or bilateral any uh, aggravating or relieving factors any family history of ptosis every point that we ask here has a relevance like family history of ptosis because we are concerned with blepharophimosis syndrome whether there is any increasing decreasing or constant uh, this thing ptosis is there from the time it has been manifested any fatigability variability diurnal variation in ptosis if is it associated with jaw movements abnormal ocular movements abnormal head posture head injury other history what is to be taken is trauma previous surgery any history of poisoning any use of steroids any reaction to anesthesia history of diplopia or defective vision and even squinting your previous photograph which the patient has is of great help to us and also any other systemic abnormalities associated with it uh then that is about the history then we come to the examination part basically we will cover it as the uh, uh examination what we do in all the other cases and ptosis specific examination so when it comes to the general examination definitely vision uh vision is of most importance uh, best corrected visual acuity to rule out amblyopia because if the ptosis is in the visually act uh, pupil this thing visual axis definitely after the correction also you should have explained to the patient that the vision might not be good because the patient already had amblyopia so better explain to the patients before you take up any ptosis correction abnormal head posture chin elevation then cover test to rule out any squint again extraocular movements very important uh, to rule out any vertical strabismus if present a pupillary reaction to rule out corners and also pupil involving third nerve palsy corneal sensation and complete dry eye evaluation is important um uh, this uh, any case of severe dry eye is better to avoid any ptosis surgery which can cause further damage to it and then definitely fundus examination then coming to ptosis evaluation proper the these we will discuss in the future further points but how it is 
seen is first what you will have to see is palpable fissure height mrd 1 2 3 lps function leg crease distance bell's phenomenon marcus jaw phenomenon lag of thalamus fatigability variability ice pack test any kogan twits uh sign he herring's effect phenylephrine test and traction test so basically the first important measurement that we do before that we have to uh, ask the patient to sit and see in primary gaze and also we have to be at the same level as that of the patient and uh, only then start the examination patient should uh, we should have a transparent scale with millimeter marking on it and if possible you yourself can shine the torch or you can ask the assistant to assist you to shine the torch so the first one prime uh, palpable fissure height this is seen in primary gaze up gaze as well as down gaze um, this is the measurement actually from the central of the palpable fissure height measured in primary gaze when the patient is looking straight and when the frontalis is blocked this is uh, normally about 9 to 11 mm vertically and 28 to 38 mm horizontally this is the measurement from the highest point on the upper lid margin pupillary axis and the lower lid and this is at the height the measurement is more in any case of congenital ptosis so the amount of ptosis will be the difference in palpable aperture in unilateral ptosis or the difference from normal in bilateral ptosis then coming to uh, the totic lid as i already said in congenital ptosis this measurement you will definitely find more and in case of acquired ptosis especially in uh, senile aponeurotic ptosis the uh, distance the palpable fissure height will have become less then coming to the next important measurement that is mar marginal reflex distance mrd1 this is the distance between the center of the upper lid margin and the pupillary light reflex on the cornea with eye in primary gaze this no normally it is 4 to 5 mm and this measurement is much more important than even uh, palpable fissure height why i'll tell you about it later difference in palpable aperture height between the two how do you am the amount of ptosis how do we calculate is the difference in mrd1 between the two eyes and in case both i have ptosis normal amount normal mrd is measured to be 4 mm so 4 minus whatever amount you get is your uh, uh, this thing amount of ptosis one minute sir yeah. hello yeah you have uh, one minute. Uh, Please carry on with the presentation. Your time is almost up, so you might maybe uh, go a little faster. So can I go ahead? Neha, you yes, please, 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 please go ahead. Yeah. Okay. 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 Uh, MRD one is positive if the light reflex is uh, if the margin is above the light reflex and MRD. Uh, Two is MRD one is negative if the margin is below the corneal reflex. So, how is this calculated? Is if if is it is at the level of the pupillary ref reflex, then it is zero. Then if how much ever lid you have to elevate to measure it is the negative MRD that you get. So in this case, this is. a negative mrd because you have to elevate this amount of lid to get the pupillary reflex so how do we grade this is mild moderate and severe ptosis is mild ptosis is 2 mm 3 mm and 4 mm and more then as i said uh, mrd 1 is much more important than palpable fissure height because in patients with uh, inferior scleral show the palpable fissure height can be the same but when you measure mrd then the you will make out the difference there is also one more method called beers method on this is based on the upper lid in relation to to the pupil if upper border of the pupil is seen it is mild if it is middle then it is moderate and in severe the lower border of the pupil is seen Then MRD two is nothing but the uh, from uh, the. Doctor Sneha, you'll have to wind up, Doctor Sneha. We've overshot by one minute. 
Okay. Yeah, I support Puri and I would request you to brief and the salient features to be told so that we can save that. That's it. This is the request. Okay, 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 okay. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Uh, the most important test would definitely be LPS uh, action, which is seen with three methods, Burke's method, Putterman's method, and in child, how do we assess is, it is a totally different thing. LPS action is excellent. Uh, Sneha, yes, ma'am. Uh, Sneha, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but our time is up. So can you just uh, mention if most of the time we see congenital and aponeuritic ptosis, can you just tell the audience three points by which you can decide which surgery is to be done and which is congenital, which is aponeurotic. If you just have to take three measurements. Yeah, firstly, the history. Basically, uh, history-wise, if it is present since birth, definitely it has to be congenital and acquired. Next would be palpable fissure height in uh, primary gaze and down gaze. And uh, then you have to see the lid crease also if it is present or absent. Based on these three, you definitely you will make out if it is acquired or uh, congenital. Good see. Thank you so much. And levator action, I would add there. Okay. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. Yeah, levator action. Definitely. Yeah, we can go to the next talk. Dr. Milish, Dr. Milish Changoli, uh, are you there, sir? Hello. Yes. Can we have Dr. Milish Changoli on? Uh, he'll be speaking on mucomycosis and how to go about it. Uh, hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, am I with, uh, audible? You're audible, but we are yet to see your slides. Can you start your yeah. screen share? Uh, Dr. Sina, can you end your screen no. share? Yes, we can see it, but you'll have to go into full screen mode. Yeah, it's yes. full screen yes, mode. Yes, please do. Uh, okay, uh, let's talk about uh, the story of four people which come across nowadays in each and every hospital which has at least 10 bed of COVID. Either uh, one of the hero is having complete loss of vision, one with a complete loss of vision with a proptosis, with a complete loss of vision with ophthalmoplegia with proptosis or proptosis, ophthalmoplegia but no loss of vision. So they... Uh, they all are either infectious CRAO or orbital cellulitis, orbital apex syndrome, or uh, periorbital cellulitis, which presenting as a uh, orbital cellulitis. So what is common in all these cases are they are post-COVID or they are affected by COVID. They all are recently diagnosed diabetic. And CT MRI, they showed the paranasal sinus involvement in the form of sinusitis or mucosal thickening. So, three months before, everyone was in worry. Now, everyone knows that it's nothing but the mucormycosis. So, this is the checkpoint uh, I follow. The, uh, I examine for visual acuity, ocular movement, pupillary reaction, proptosis, retropulsion test. That is, we push the globe behind and see for the resistance. And most important is the corneal sensation, which indirectly tells you about the disease extent in the posterior part of the orbit. Then systemic, all are affected by uh, uh, hyperglycemia. Uh, so one should know the diabetic status. Uh, and most important is COVID status, CT score, amount of O2 requirement and D-dimer level. Other uh, systemic problem like uh, kidney disease and liver disease so that we can uh, targeted our treatment and decreased the side effects. So uh, diagnosis straightforward and we always go ahead with the sinus debridement so that we get a tissue diagnosis and confirm our uh, suspicious as we are in endemic. Uh, this is not that important, but yeah, so, uh, for a documentation and further management, you require a tissue diagnosis and sinus debridement itself decreases the tissue uh, infectious load over the body. Then uh, we have to start uh, amphotericin B liposomal. We can start empirically also. It's uh, either monotherapy or post, uh, combination with the posaconazole. Of course, everyone is suffered with the uh, COVID. So they have uh, their financial breakdown and 
this treatment itself costs a lot and the availability is always a question as everyone is suffering for uh, most of the more of the people are suffering from the mucor macrophages so surgical debridement uh, remains the mainstay as uh, there are so many <coughs> drawbacks for the medical treatment so question arise kya kya nikale so we can remove the sinus which is affected we have some if the eye blo uh, globe is involved then we have to do exenteration depending upon that but it's okay uh, maxillectomy and sinus debridement or heart palate removal is not the area of concern so what is area of concern for me is the exenteration where we remove the irid adnexia and uh, <clears throat> eyeball so how should we uh, select which case require a uh, exenteration or not we can select it by doing imaging or we can decide pre operatively uh, intraoperatively uh, during sinus debridement and of course we have to see the uh, systemic condition also so most important uh, indication is significant orbital involvement but uh, it can be uh, <coughs> it can be done in different type of scenario like if only the infectious crao present and orbital affect disease is present and not responding to the uh, amphotericin b even after the sinus debridement and this is show the progression the exenteration is required otherwise periorbital amphotericin also works though i am not used that much but uh, uh, reported are there like this case where there is a significant <clears throat> proptosis and retropulsion is positive generally lead pairing exenteration nowadays is a treatment of choice is if the skin is not involved like this fellow uh, the fourth one where there is a six now palsy along with a seven now palsy with mild proptosis though the vision was good the disease was extensive in a uh, in a form of extend from anterior to the skin to the post uh, infratemporal fossa and terrible place uh, area so and the infraorbital and medial wall is also get affected with periorbital involvement so vision itself is not a criteria for the uh, exenteration so uh, there is for me as a working practitioner uh, in a private practice there is a trouble that uh, there is no fixed team as this mucor require a fixed team approach there is no fixed setup different strategies or different type of protocol and too many egos to handle but being uh, this is a blessing in discuss that we can help different people for <coughs> to line up uh, the same protocol help out other who do not have or do not manage the mucor do something extra to help other and make an awareness among the Staff wherever you operate, so that we can pick up the early disease. So, uh, in my learning uh, in the institute, uh, we used to do only a uh, exenteration or lead pairing exenteration that we take out the uh, <coughs> orbital content and leave the peri uh, bone behind it and don't enter into the uh, either nasal cavity or maxillary sinus, but. Uh, and this lead pairing exenteration we used to do but now what i am started doing is in private practice that i am doing extended exenteration with without uh, transfer blepharoplasty that is extended exenteration we remove the med floor and the medial wall it helps not only helps to de uh, <coughs> decrease the disease load it also helps to see the disease entirely local debridement including suction can be done bedside less need of imaging and less need of general anesthesia as all these cases are already uh, <clears throat> very high risk for the general anesthesia so last 2 to 3 minutes doctor yeah. uh, sir 28 uh, i did 28 exenteration of uh, five patient i have to deny surgery because of their ex excessive in involvement uh after exenteration five patient uh, went up into the stroke and seven patient i lost so it's very dreaded situation 
but yeah at the end oh, the smile is important this patient always says that i am alive so we can change or as we don't if we don't wait to i get involved that every ophthalmologist who want, who is a part of a team should assess the sinus surgery and look for the early involvement and guide the ent people for a better debridement so that the eye won't get involved so this is what i follow it's an excellent article by dr honawar so uh, to some of it is a team a team work but ophthalmologist plays an important role uh, not only to cure the disease but also to prevent the disease thank you thank you dr melin that was a very yeah, nice can i ask a question to dr melin or to anyone any one of you any patient who is coming to us with red eye post covid so how often uh, we are supposed to follow him up or how frequently we are supposed to tell him that we, he is supposed to uh, uh, show um, uh, to ent surgeon uh, can i answer yeah yeah uh we have to see the risk factor the amount of uh, steroid patient has been exposed and amount of uh, the severity of covid and look for any tenderness along the periorbital regia or cheek area look for any loose teeth look for a nasal bleed if any this time we found out it is better to get an imaging done on the baseline level and we can get Uh, if the baseline imaging is normal then we can ask the patient to uh, uh, relax and if the baseline shows some amount of mucosal thickening better to undergo a sinus biopsy and subsequent sinus debridement this is what uh, uh, nowadays uh, bet better in the endemic where we don't want to lose the eye or lose the person Uh, my opinion, like in these cases, uh, generally a simple nasal swab for KOH examination will also do uh, the thing because it is uh, relatively cheap, easily available, and you can even do it in your clinic if the facility is not available nearby. Baseline imaging will definitely be of help, and other thing, even if the patient is non-diabetic, not having any uh, history of diabetes or steroid use. the wave 2 has definitely uh, shown that even non diabetic young patients are getting mucus so even checking hba1c or random sugar might give some clue because these patients are uh, without any previous history they are still showing some increase in the sugar level when they actually come to us i agree with you aditi i would just like to add in uh, all covid patients post covid patients with complain of headache or deep seated pain or retroocular pain mucormycosis should be one differential and we should image all these patients because we are seeing uh, very commonly patients with 66 n6 vision with uh, sinus involvement or progressive involvement which go yes so it's very important to have a high suspicion in all these cases uh, another uh, one suggestion that uh, sometimes the imaging uh, fails to see the early disease so even uh, if uh, we suspect we can ask our ent people to have a just endoscopic look that is uh, though it takes some time but it gives you fair idea about the disease itself even we can pick up the early non invasive phase of the mucus before the mucosal thickening or is it possible to uh, tell all the treating in, uh, physicians uh, the patient before discharge their uh, nasal swab has to be taken and uh, to see if there is mucus so or keep following every week nasal swab is sometimes gives you false impression that there is nothing yeah uh, or before yeah. discharge at least uh, one uh, ent uh, check yeah, yeah. if high risk cases one can do a screening from ent or a baseline imaging yeah those those who are in icu and on uh, ventilator they are already very high risk uh, people and i think this has to be emphasized again and again to almost all the people who are handling these cases or maintaining uh, hospitals with icu right this is my opinion right if uh, there are no more questions can we move on to the next talk yes sir Thank you.
uh, uh, doctor can you please end your screen sharing so that uh, we can invite the next speaker so from uh, this extremely important and life testing uh, talk about mucormycosis we now go on to another important talk about facial rejuvenation with botulinum toxin and uh, dr namrata adulkar can you please share? yes yes a very good afternoon everyone at the outset i would like to thank the organizers for this wonderful symposium and giving me this opportunity to speak about uh, periocular rejuvenation with botulinum toxin after some intense talks about oncology and uh, life threatening mucormycosis i think this is going to be a light breezy uh, talk for everyone so um, i have no financial disclosures here although i would like to mention that during the talk i may use uh, the word botox which refers to the molecule rather than the brand so when a, a patient uh, namrata one second uh, uh, the non speakers can you please put hey, yourself on mute program mute kar diya tha dr milan dr swati please go on namrata yeah so when a patient with cosmetic concerns uh, enters my clinic uh it is important to evaluate the patient as a whole right it's not just the problem areas that the patient is pointing uh, to me i would like to evaluate a, i would like to go through a comprehensive aesthetic evaluation of the patient which includes the quality of skin uh signs of pigmentation fine lines uh, volume loss fat prolapse mid facial uh, sagging or drooping and so on and so forth always a good idea to check for history of prior treatments it helps us to identify patients who have an appetite for cosmetic procedures understand what they are expecting out of the treatments and helps better planning the procedure for us always look for history of bruising a lot of our patients are uh, in their 60s and are all in invariably on certain antiplatelet drugs like aspirin clopidogrel or sometimes even warfarin uh, especially it helps them to plan their social calendar better like if they are having a wedding or an important meeting to attend the next day today is not a good idea for cosmetic procedure okay so having a detailed conversation about uh, patient expectations is very important this not only helps us plan the goals of our treatment but also goes a long way in establishing the patient physician bond and as we know in cosmetic patients can be our lifelong clients i always make it a point to explain the difference between static and dynamic wrinkles when patient uh, show me their lines and writers it's important to also tell them that this is a temporary procedure as in the effect of uh, botox will kick in in 3 to 5 days but it will last only for about 3 to 4 months and if you're lucky maybe up to 6 months as we all know beauty is ongoing and ongoing uh, effort not just with botox but multiple other treatment so really need to find out what the patient is expecting coming straight to the procedure informed consent is mandatory in all patients uh, we always use a topical anesthetic cream which is uh, a combination of prelocane and lidocaine available as prelox or top lap supplied for at least 20 minutes prior to the injection in some patients who are more prone to bruising i like to give eyes application which helps with vasoconstriction and minimizes bruising post procedure while making the markings ask the patient to animate and reanimate and exactly point out their concerns so that we are able to uh, um, treat them better toxin reconstitution was already discussed in early part of the day uh, so we will go straight to the injection documentation both uh, maintaining a medical record as well as photographic uh, documentation is extremely important in these patients so these are some injection site record forms which are some, which are provided by a lot of companies allergan here so here we can maintain a record of the treatment date the site of injection the amount that we have injected which helps us uh, keep tabs on how much was given and how we can improve the treatment on the follow up variety of toxins are available in the market understand before injecting understanding the uh, thorough understanding of the anatomy of the face extremely crucial we all know that uh, facial expression is a delicate interplay of multitude of factors actions of many muscles broadly speaking the elevators and depressors so when we are weakening one muscle with the botulinum toxin the other muscle inadvertently is strengthened this can change facial expressions and a little small one unit dose of botox can really cause a great change in the uh, expectation and the outcome 
so we are discussing main the three main indications that most patients come to eye specialists with so first one is the crow's feet these are also called as lateral rightids and are seen as uh, crow feet like wrinkles at the lateral canthus the target muscle here is the orbital part of orbicularis oculi consensus guideline recommends three point injection at the lateral canthus about a centimeter outside the orbital rim injection is done in a subdermal plane and the needle is directed away from the eyeball generally we inject 2 to 4 units per side 2 to 5 units per side with a total of about 8 to 12 units on each side a word of caution here sometimes there may be a little spread of botox to the zygomaticus minor muscle which may cause upper lip ptosis in a few patients although this is extremely rare it has to be kept in mind while injecting bruising is quite common i mean compared to the other sites of botox injections when you're injecting with crow's feet so these are certain uh, patients which uh, i have treated um although we have a three point module of injection there is no one rule that fits all like in any surgery same goes with cosmetic surgeries we can always customize treatments depending on what the patient complains another common uh, complaint here, uh, which patients come with are forehead lines forehead lines are horizontal lines seen by contraction of the frontalis muscle frontalis as we all know is a vertical strong elevator of the forehead and the eyebrow so when the muscle contracts it gives rise to horizontal horizontal lines something like this uh when we're injecting the forehead the target muscle is frontalis the level of injection is intradermal and we give small doses in the like 1 to 1.5 unit per side uh, as shown in this a uh, figure always stay about 2 cm above the eyebrow to prevent brow ptosis post procedure also important not to forget the lateral part of the forehead while injecting so that we don't end up with a spock deformity always start with smaller doses slower injections to help uh, you know get a rejuvenated forehead rather than a frozen forehead trust me no patient likes a frozen expressionless face so this is an some uh, this is one patient that i had injected about 8 units although he had pretty strong rightids on his forehead and as we see in the post procedure pic there are some static lines which uh, which the patient is not complaining so had i made the forehead completely frozen i'm sure he wouldn't have liked it coming to the next glabular lines these are vertical lines which are seen between the eyebrows the target muscle here is the procerus and the corrugator uh, generally it's injected in in the v pattern that is shown in the figure and four and three to five sides are injected depending on the the strength of the muscle contraction as well as the intensity of the lines half a minute uh, generally we in, inject two to four units per side with a total of about 16 to 20 units again if you inject too fast large bolus it can spread to the levator and cause ptosis here are some of the examples another indication is mild ptosis sometimes patients with mild ptosis are scared of surgery they don't want to go ahead with surgery and need a stop gap arrangement this patient had a family up, function uh, to uh, attend and i just injected one unit each at two small points on the upper eyelid and that was the result she was extremely pleased with another one here is lower lid wrinkles which can again be treated with small two unit bolus in the lower eyelid post procedure avoid another touching the face yes and i'm i'm coming i'm coming to it no facial massage or facials post procedure again like we discussed the spock deformity was which was initially uh, called a complication is now becoming a beauty trend so really curtail your treatment plans as per the patient needs and remember nobody likes an expressionless face thank you thank you namrita uh, we move on next Uh, due to shortage of time, let's not take any questions right now. Uh, we we'll move on to the next presentation of orbital dermoids by Dr. Nirav Raichura. Dr. Nirav, uh, can you share your screen, please? Yes, is my screen visible? Yes, it's visible. Please do go ahead. All right. Uh, a very good afternoon to all my friends, colleagues, seniors, and mentors. Uh, i thank the organizers and boa and mos for giving me the opportunity to speak here today uh, i would be speaking on the topic of uh, varied presentations of orbital dermoids and uh, their management i have no financial interest to disclose 
Orbital dermoids are benign choristomas that arise from sequestration of uh, the ectoderm, uh, which sequestrates into the mesodermal lining that eventually forms the bones. Thus, uh, they are uh, normally present near the bony suture lines. These are amongst the most common orbital tumors of childhood. Uh, broadly speaking, uh, uh, orbital dermoids can be classified into superficial and deep lesions. Superficial uh, dermoids are present anterior to the orbital septum and present early in life. They present as firm non-tender mass tethered to the underlying periosteum. They do not cause ocular motility restriction or proptosis. Deep dermoids are present, uh, deep dermoids present relatively late and are present posterior to the orbital septum. They may or may not be palpable externally. They cause restriction of motility, proptosis and dystopia. Uh, dermoids can be further classified uh, based on their anatomical location into juxtasutural, sutural, soft tissue and intradiploid dermoids. Juxtasutural dermoids are uh, present uh, near the sutural lines of the bones. Sorry, juxtasutural dermoids are present uh, near the sutural uh, lines of the uh, bones uh, and they may, not, may or may not be uh, firmly adherent to the underlying bone. Sutural dermoids are firmly adherent to the underlying bone and have extensions into the sutural uh, lines of the bones. Uh, the typical, uh, uh, the typical uh, dumbbell-shaped dermoid is a sutural dermoid which extends on both sides of the lateral orbital rim. Soft tissue dermoids are uh, present deep in the orbit uh, and away from the bone and occasionally they may present as intraconal uh, lesions. Intradiploid dermoids are not true dermoids. As, uh, but they are actually epidermoids as they lack the dermal appendages of dermoid and histopathology. The sutural and juxtasutural dermoids that are most common are the frontozygomatic uh, area dermoids, followed by the maxillofrontal and less commonly the sphenozygomatic area dermoids. Uh, further, depending on the associated presenting features, dermoids can be classified as simple or complex. Complex dermoids are the ones that present with a sinus or fistula on the skin, or those that are inflamed or secondarily infected. Uh, CT scan is the preferred choice of uh, imaging modality in dermoids. On CT scan, dermoids uh, appear as well-defined cystic uh, lesions uh, that, are, uh, that have heterogeneous contents containing uh, fat, fluid, and very occasionally they may contain calcification. Uh, also, dermoids are uh, generally uh, long uh, they, they have a long presentation, hence they may cause uh, re remodeling of the bones uh, adjacent to the dermoid. When MRI imaging, dermoids appear as uh, hyperintense on T2 images and may be homogeneous or heterogeneous depending on the contents of the uh, lesion. The surgical approach to a dermoid depends on its anatomical location, uh, on complicating factors like inflammation, infection, or sinus tract, and the size of the lesion. Let us take a few typical and atypical examples of dermoids here. Uh, this young child has a typical internal angular dermoid uh, and this adult on the left has a, a typical external angular dermoid. Both these lesions can be easily approached via a, a upper lid skin crease incision, upper lid crease incision. Uh, it is very important here to note that most of these patients present to us because of the cosmetic blemish. So it is important to have a camouflaged incision at the lid crease rather than having such unsightly incisions. Uh, having said that, it is very important to be careful not to damage the surrounding structures. As you can see in this uh, internal angular dermoid, uh, there was inadvertent injury uh, during dissection which caused uh, damage to the uh, upper canaliculus which had to be repaired using a mini monocast stent. Now, this uh, was a very atypical case. This 46-year-old gentleman presented to me with, uh, uh, with a long-lasting proptosis that was progressing over the years. He had proptosis since the age of 18 years. Uh, on examination, he had a 6-millimeter proptosis with an inferior dystopia of the left eye. He had uh, seen several doctors over the years, all of whom had suggested him surgical approach via, a new sur uh, via a neurosurgical approach. So I uh, advised imaging uh, on MRI imaging, uh, we could see a well-defined uh, irregular uh, soft tissue lesion at, uh, in, at the posterolateral and superior aspect of the orbit. 
uh, the lesion seem to be arising from the intradiploic space of the posterior lateral orbital wall uh, and it seemed to have in uh, uh, thinned out the uh, bony orbital rim uh, such that it was abutting the uh, dura mater on the uh, superior and the posterior aspect and it was abutting the uh, orbital structures on the inferior aspect we decide i decided to take up the patient uh, uh, via the orbital uh, approach under uh, uh, neurosurgical uh, backup so we took a couple of skin, skin crease incision that was extended all, along the orbi lateral orbital rim the uh, mass was reached uh, via uh, a periosteal incision that uh, allowed us to raise the periosteum and reach the, the uh, orbital mass uh, on reach the mass posteriorly at its junction with the zygomatic or frontal suture there was inadvertent rupture of the lesion uh, from the uh, ruptured lesion uh, the fluid and the contents were aspirated most of it was uh, fluid and fat content and the cyst wall was uh, dissected all along the uh, bone Uh, remnant bone and the uh, orbital structures uh, superiorly we could see the dura uh, on table so superiorly we did not disturb the uh, cyst wall to take care of that part of the cyst wall we uh, uh, play uh, we uh, reconstructed bleomycin and placed uh, uh, bleomycin uh, into the cavity for about 10 to 15 minutes uh, during the surgery after which the incision was closed bleomycin would uh, act as a screen and avoid recurrence pardon me one minute yeah i'll wind up sir. so bleomycin would act as a sclerosant and uh, would uh, prevent uh, recurrence the uh, you can see the uh, effect here uh, on table this is the immediate post operative picture on table you can see that the proptosis is corrected uh, this is the same patient 3 months post op we can see that there is good cosmetic improvement and the patient's vision was also normal 66 and 6 so this is again a rare a tumor uh, a rare uh, presentation of orbital dermoid that presented to us uh, with ptosis and monocular elevation deficit post surgery the patient had relief in all the symptoms again this is an uh, uh, atypical presentation with an infected uh, dermoid cyst uh, that had also caused erosion of the zygomatic bone to conclude orbital dermoids can have varied presentation the surgical approach depends on the anatomical location but upper lid skin crease incision suffices for most of these uh, lesions uh, complete surgical excision is the treatment of choice sclerosants can act as adjuvants or alternatives in uh, unresectable cases i acknowledge my friends and mentors thank you thank you very much dr nirav for this fantastic uh, talk we move on quickly to the next and last talk uh, by the talented dr nupur goel who will be telling us uh, giving us 10 pointers of thyroid eye disease So, uh, uh, Dr. Nupur. Yes. Can you um, see my screen? It's, yes, you can see your screen. If you can. Yeah, it's only slide screen, show. Yeah. yeah, I'll try to wrap it up at, as quickly as possible. So at the Thank outset, you. yeah, uh, at the outset, a very, uh, very heartfelt thanks to all the BOA, MOS, uh, office bearers. Uh, Dr. Sumit uh, Ragini, Ma'am Lahane, Sir, Dr. Swapnesh, Dr. Pritham for giving me the opportunity to speak. So after beautiful potpourri of all these sessions, I now come to a very commonly encountered uh, condition, thyroid eye disease, which we all uh, encounter very commonly in the clinic. I will try to um, go through the entire disease as ten pointers. I'll be quick in that. So pointer number one: Graves' disease is an autoimmune disease. it is a it is a uh, disease which uh, is basically due to loss of immunological to uh, tolerance of tsh receptors and it has myriad of presentations so one of the uh, out of all the myriad of presentations thyroid eye disease also known by various names uh, is the most common manifestation extra thyroid manifestation however the point to note is that not all patients of graves of thermopathy have graves hyperthyroidism and vice versa So, uh, uh, thyroid eye disease can be associated with hyperthyroidism, euthyroid, and as well as hyperthyroid status. The next point uh, uh, is the pathogenesis, which we all are quite aware of. There is basically uh, uh, adipogenesis, uh, uh, increased deposition of uh, glyco or uh, glycosamine glycans. This leads to increase in the orbital soft tissue volume with high pressure within the inexpandable bony cavity and various clinical manifestations. As you can see in this, there is increase in the muscle volume, the fat content, there is thickening. So there is proptosis, which leads to all the congestive orbitopathy. So the clinical symptoms and signs I will not elaborate. The fourth point of we all know lid retraction, the typical staring gaze, lateral flare, lateral flare. 
the uh, main pointer that I would like everyone to take across is that always in your clinic, keep a lookout for eyelid retraction in routine checkups. If you come up uh, with a patient with eyelid retraction, check for lid lag and down gaze, check for the extraocular movements because that will be the only presentation of uh, thyroid eye disease and do advise, uh, do request for a free T3, T4, TSH um, uh, investigation that you may actually, you know, detect a thyroid eye disease or a underlying Graves hyperthyroidism in such patients. That may be the only presentation. So supporting this is a, uh, is a very good publication by Dr. Millen and Dr. Varshita, wherein 70% of the cases have been silent presenters. So coming to the sixth pointer, that uh, every visit, the uh, uh, these following invest the uh, examinations have to be done and have to be documented, which includes visual acuity, color vision, extraocular movements, pupil. Uh, so these are basically uh, checking for the optic nerve function because we know that one of the uh, side threatening complications of a thyroid eye disease is a dystyroid optic neuropathy, and that will change your management completely. Do a fundus evaluation, intraocular pressure checkup every visit. Also, photographic evaluation every this visit would help in the um, proper documentation and evaluation of the disease. A point which I've not mentioned here is also always do a corneal staining because we know that exposure keratopathy again is a, a side threatening uh, complication of thyroid eye disease. So uh, coming to the seventh point, uh, this I will elaborate. So your thyroid eye disease, whenever you write the diagnosis, you have to document the activity and the severity. Now the activity can be timeline-wise activity and clinical activity, and both have to be documented. So this is the typical Rundle's curve that we all are aware of. The initial uh, six to 24 months is the active phase followed by the inactive phase. So, um, so you ask the patient since when the patient has been noticing the typical features of proptosis or eyelid retraction, accordingly you document your timeline-wise activity. If it's less than a year, the patient is timeline active. And if it's more than a year, then you can label it as timeline inactive. Clinically, you have this Moritz score. You can just uh, take a snapshot of this for the uh, thing. And then uh, the clinical activity score, if it's more than uh, four, then it's clinically active. This is important. We'll come to the but once we come to the management, I'll tell you, I'll elaborate on that. Also, document the severity with respect to mild, moderate, or severe. Uh, the mild is again any clinical activity score less than four is mild or the inactive thyroid eye disease clinically. Uh, moderate to severe um, are these parameters. And if there's any associated side threatening complications, the most important being this thyroid optic neuropathy or corneal exposure. So the point in number eight is that typically for a mild thyroid eye disease where the clinical activity score is less than four, the follow-up can be uh, the first time the patient comes for a visit. You can call the patient six weeks after your first visit. And then every three months thereafter, uh, keeping a watch of all the uh, parameters that I've uh, discussed uh, above, uh, documenting them at each and every visit. So uh, coming to the, uh, the ninth pointer, uh, once you are sure that this is a thyroid eye disease, it's good to have a baseline imaging uh, documented. And in this, uh, the CT is the imaging of choice because it shows the uh, enlarged extraocular muscles. Also, it gives a better delineation of the bony orbit. So you request for coronal and axial uh, cuts, both with two mm cuts. So as you can see that on this um, axial cut, you can see there is a fat uh, enlargement. There's increased black space and the typical um, tendon sparing muscle enlargement. So coming to the last pointer, the treatment. So the general treatment, which remains um, same, uh, is that uh, we know that smoking is the most important factor for a thyroid eye disease. So the first and foremost thing is that you counsel the patient if the patient is a smoker, a cessation of smoking. Maintaining the euthyroid status is important. And I've just tabulated this uh, treatment plan. So uh, conservative treatment, so this is basically, uh, you've documented whether the disease is inactive, uh, is active or inactive, and also whether mild, moderate, severe. So uh, conservative treatment means symptomatic treatment in the form of lubricants. So if it's a mild thyroid eye disease, meaning that it's a, it is timeline-wise active, but clinically it is inactive, then you just manage the patient with lubricants and uh, symptomatic treatment. Moderate to severe, again, uh, this is something that uh, you would, uh, I would generally go for a conservative treatment, but however you keep a watch, if the disease is worsening, then you start the patient on steroids. If the patient has any side threatening uh, uh, complications like exposure keratopathy or uh, this thyroid optic neuropathy, then yes, you have to uh, definitely start the patient on steroid uh, to uh, bring about a medical compression, decompression, sorry. And if the medical decompression is not, uh, is not working, that is the time you would go in for a surgical intervention. And um, if the, uh, um, uh, which could be in a form of a posterior medial decompression, orbital decompression, and the main aim of the surgical intervention, uh, 
either a, a lead retraction surgery or a, a orbital decompression, the main thing comes in an inactive disease, which is uh, inactive both timeline-wise and clinical-wise. And this is primarily to restore the function and the appearance of the patient. So um, with this, uh, I just summarize these 10 pointers literally, literally at your fingertips. Um, you, you want, you can just, you know, if you just remember these 10 pointers, you know your thyroid eye disease very thoroughly and you can almost, um, um, you know, you know when to probably start a steroid, when to uh, request for an investigation. So with this, I um, thank you and a very, very happy Mother's Day to everyone. And thank you so much. So I hope I was not too fast also. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Nupur. No, you did a fantastic job. You gave us one minute uh, uh, for questions, perhaps, uh, in case if Sumit or uh, the chair uh, thinks that we have the time to take further questions. And if there is no session after this, then probably we can uh, utilize that one minute. Yes. Any questions from any panelists? Uh, yeah. Uh, Neera, I had a question. Uh, Neera, you went ahead yes, for yes, an MRI uh, instead of a CT scan. I would like to know why. No, uh, I, secondly, we, actually, we actually did both. It okay. was like a screening CT and an MRI. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, like uh, because of cost factors, the films were not given to the patient for the CT scan. Okay, okay, perfect. And the other thing is, uh, any preference of a bleomycin over sodium tetradrachyl or something uh, like that? No, frankly, I don't have much experience of uh, sclerosins in dermoid cysts. Okay. I've been using bleomycin for lymphangiomas. So I just extrapolated that and used bleomycin. I have never used uh, otherwise any sclerosins for dermoids. Very interesting cases. That was the only reason, yeah. And the other reason probably was that, you know, Dura was exposed. We didn't want to use something uh, very harsh or something that was a lot of inflammation. Bleomycin is considered a little colder than the other sclerosins. So that was one of the reasons. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have one question for Namrata. Can I ask? Um, Namrata, uh, how often have you come across body dysmorphic disorder in your aesthetic practice? And do you do anything in particular to recognize these personality types? Because in the short OPD time that we have, it's hard to know. They can hide it. Well, don't yes, I, I completely agree with you on this one. So, uh, uh, Counseling and the more time you spend in the office with these patients, the more you understand their expectations or uh, rather their own perceptions of uh, beauty or their own perceptions about their own body, you see the red flags. And when you see those red flags, that they're obsessed, uh, they kind of try to manipulate you into getting what they want out of you. More often I say no, than I actually go ahead with the treatment. So recognizing these red flags is very, very important and crucial because, the, uh, I mean, there have been a couple of times I've burnt my fingers injecting Botox into a patient and then constantly facing the nagging time and again. And, you know, these patients get your contact number and then they don't stop calling you. <laughs> I mean, so, yes, you need to recognize them. Uh, but you do once in a while you do see these patients and uh, better to say no right at the outset. Uh, lovely numbers. We're very lucky that uh, Professor Lahane sir has uh, is also there along with us right now. Uh, okay, good, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Good, good afternoon. afternoon. I was listening to your uh, discussion, and I'm very happy that uh, you all young youngsters are doing very good oculoplastic uh, surgery in ophthalmology. And uh, really, I'm happy that I was uh, hearing near about three four presentation I heard. So very good it is and. Uh, I, Sumit is doing the same aculoplastic. So previously I was doing uh, arbiter tummies and uh, ptosis and everything. So now from I think two years, I have not uh, seen a single patient also. Whenever patient comes, I only think only one thing I do, refer to Sumit. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very, very, all the speakers and all the... So all, the all, all the speakers would want to uh, turn on their video. We can maybe take a screenshot with sir. <laughs> we can take a picture with sir. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much. Please. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, thank you, I think, uh, coming and presenting your presentation here. I think uh, BOA and MOS is thankful to you both. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You, sir. Thank, you. Thank, thank you so you. much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, thank sir. You. Okay. Thank you, sir. Bye. Thank you, sir.
I thank you, moderator, panelists, and all the speakers for uh, having this session. Thank you so much. We are right on time, Dr. Piyush. Thank you. So I hope the uh, speakers for the next. Thank you, everyone. Join. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Shubham, ma'am. Thank you, Anurag, ma'am. Thank, thank you, Nupur, ma'am. Thank you, Sneha, ma'am. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sumit. Thank you, Sumit. So without. Uh, thank you. Hello, ma'am. So yeah, without yeah. much delay, we will be uh, starting the next session as. Uh, all our panelists are here and join so i welcome you to the ocular oncology session today's session and uh, to uh, on the panel we have chairman dr mahesh and muganan sir sir doesn't need any introduction sir is a head of vitreo retina and ocular oncology services in shankar eye hospital bangalore and he is a authority in the world for intraocular tumors uh, very welcome sir and you are the chair for the session for the co-chairman, we have Dr. Nandan Chetty, sir. Nandan Chetty, sir, uh, is, uh, is ocular oncologist, uh, specifically treating retinoblastoma in the city of Mumbai and the Tata uh, uh, Research Center, which is one of the biggest and the high volume center in, in the country. Uh, very welcome, sir. You will be the co-chairman for the session. We have a convener as Dr. Chinmay. Uh, welcome, ma'am. Ma'am is an oculoplastic surgeon and uh, uh, she is a consultant at Minto High Hospital, Bangalore, and a very student-friendly teacher to have. Very welcome, ma'am. You are the convener for the session. And uh, as a co-convener, we have Dr. Fairuz, ma'am. Ma'am has done her oculoplasty, ocular oncology uh, fellowship from LV Prasad Eye Hospital, followed by training at uh, Wills Eye Hospital uh, with the Jerry Shields and the Carol Shields. And then she has done her oculoplasty fellowship with Dr. Don Gitawa. Ma'am is here as a co-convener for the session. Very warm welcome, ma'am. Uh, uh, as a moderator of the session, I just uh, have to do a gentle request to all the speakers and the panelists that we need to stick to the time of the eight minutes. And uh, we do have a window of uh, 15 to 20 minutes. But uh, after this, there is one more session lined up. So we will try to stick to our time of eight minutes. I will remind everyone with all due respects once the seven minutes are done uh, that the one minute is remaining. Uh, so, with the permission of Chair, uh, I would like to uh, say dot, uh, Dr. Mahesh Chanmugan, sir. Sir, can you please say a few words before starting the session, sir? Yeah, thank you uh, for this invitation and looks like a great program you've put together. And I see all kudos in the message group. Thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, this looks like a very interesting program as well. Let's get on with it. Thank you. So, our first speaker for today is Dr. Marian Pauli. Ma'am, uh, Will you be sharing your slides, please? I hope it is visible. Is it visible? Yes, yes, ma'am, it is. Yeah. Okay. Um, at the outset, let me thank BOA and MYS for giving me this opportunity. In this eight minutes time, I've tried to uh, Few. I will try to go through few of the aspirates in the periocular area. This is a case-based presentation. So my first case is uh, a 56-year-old female who presented with a lit mass of five months duration. On examination, you can see uh, an yellowish mass with focal madrosis and closed mabobing gland orifices, but the skin is smooth and mobile. On reverting the eyelid, that is, it has got extension to the tarsal surface. So. Here, the diagnosis is more or less certain because it's a case of sebaceous gland carcinoma. The second case, is it a chalation? Is it a molluscus or is it a mollusca? So now, look at the external clinical features. Maybe when gland orifices are closed, there is a focal madrosis and there is an extension beyond the posterior lid margin. So this is no, clear no. It's a case of sebaceous gland carcinoma. So my take-home message is a nodule that initially simulates a chalation, but later causes loss of lashes and destruction of mabomin gland orifices warrants biopsy. So in short, a chalation also needs a follow-up, especially in age group more than 40 years. 
So coming to my next case, 61 year old female with the litmus in the left eye of one year, status post INC presented to us for a second opinion. Now you can see a focal thickening in the posterior, uh, posterior lit margin, but there is no obvious loss of lashes. Now again, going more posterior and inverting the lid, you can see a huge sebaceous plant carcinoma. Similarly, always avoid the eyelid whenever we see a lid mass and uh, see the tarsal surface and dry INC always warrants the biopsy. Coming to the next case, she is a 47 year old female presented to us with chronic irritation since six months. So on examination, there is an aponeurotosis, mainly aponeurotic ptosis in the left eye. And if you look very carefully, minimal congestion in the left eye. So on averting the eyelid, I'm sorry for the quality of the photographs. On averting the left eyelid, you can see that the conjunctival architecture is totally lost. This is the normal tarsus and this is the abnormal lid. Looking at the lid margin, you can see blepharitis like picture. She also needs a biopsy to rule out a pagetoid variant. Similarly, another case, an elderly female with a chronic discharge. Again, there is uh, loss of cedia and diffuse tarsal thickening. It's a case of pagetoid sebaceous plant carcinoma. So it is suspected when a middle-aged or elderly unilateral blepharitis is not responding to standard therapy. We need more biopsy to determine the management and further treatment. So coming to the next case, it's a 54-year-old male presented with a mass in the left eye since three months following an insect bite. Now look at the lid architecture. There is a mild ectropion, and on close examination, you can see telangiectatic vessels and dark nodules, but the tarsus is more or less look normal. This was a case of skin uh, appendage tumor, that is a sped gland, mucinous adenocarcinoma of the eyelid. Another case is a 68 year old with three months history diagnosed as sebaceous cyst. So, on close examination, you can see loss of fibro lashes. Then, uh, so on the surface, chalky white nodules, still injectatic vessels. This also is an appendage tumor that is pilomatous carcinoma of fibro, which we have published in OPRS, and she underwent reconstruction with H plastic. So this is the fifth scenario, 70 year old diabetic, 15 years with six months history. So uh, she had treated with multiple doses of antibiotics. Is it fungal dermatitis? No, look at the lid architecture, look at the margins, look at the surface. It's a case of morphia form basis of carcinoma. Now, another patient, 68 year old male, presented with the watering and discharge and swelling since one year, have presented to us for a uh, DCR surgery. So on examination, you can see there is a mass, but it is extending beyond the middle candle tangent. The globe is displaced up, periocular fullness, and there is proctosis. So this was a case of lacrimal sac carcinoma with the orbital extension. Even though it is uncommon, it can be easily, easily mistaken for benign processes like NLEO. So always look for unusual findings when you do DCR, especially thickened sac, and do biopsy if needed. Imaging in suspected cases. She is a 47-year-old female teacher presented with chronic discharge in six months. She has got a sensory isotropia due to a macular lesion right from childhood, and she is ROPLAS positive in the left eye. So this is her external picture. On close examination, when I'm asking her to look down and out, you can see a small mass in the middle corners. And MRI showed a mass arising from the lacrimal sac. This turned out to be lacrimal sac lymphoma. This is very, this is a 61 year old male present with the watering in the right eye. On examination, roblas is negative, syringing shows, common canalicular block. And if you look very carefully, there is a superior sulcus defect, mild proptosis. And if you look at the whole examination of the face, you can see a fullness in the right maxillary region, which we never looked routinely. So imaging showed, um, Maxillary sinus carcinoma with the early orbital involvement. So, what are the indications for imaging in watering and a patient presents with watering? One is proptosis, then two for telecanthus, and if any palpable loss. The patient was uh, treated and he is alive and he is uh, underwent with cataract surgery uh, recently. So, this is another patient, 43 year old female with the drooping, treated as Horner syndrome by the neurologist and jacular adenitis elsewhere. So on examination, there is a mild ptosis. And the MRI showed um, enlargement of the right lacrimal gland with diffuse infiltration of the surrounding structures. So we, and when we again asked the history, she gave a history of 
CA breast treated 20 years back. Now she is 43 years and treated at the age of 23. So incisional biopsy was planned. Um, it turned out to be metastatic adenocarcinoma. Even though she underwent the treatment, she died after five years of diagnosis. So acquired unilateral ptosis needs imaging. So this is my 10 case, uh, 55 year old, present with the puppy lids in the right eye, lid edema on and off, was on steroids on and off. Uh, he underwent imaging, which showed a mass lesion. So the take home message is persistent lid edema, not responding to routine management, always look for proptosis and needs imaging. This is another similar case, treated as unilateral lid edema in a 55 year old. Uh, if you look very carefully, there is a downward displacement of the globe. So imaging showed a pleomorphic adenoma and she underwent surgery later. This is my final case. She, he is a 53-year-old male, diabetic, had a history of facial palsy for four years with exposure keratopathy. He had panophthalmitis, treated with intramitral antibiotics since eight months, but not responding. So this is her exter his external eye examination picture. Now it's a panophthalmitis. But when we asked the history, he was treated for chronic lymphatic leukemia three years by. So he's in remission now. Since it was a painful blind time, he, we went ahead with evisceration from the local anesthesia. And histopathology showed a diffuse large basal lymphoma transformation. It's called Richter syndrome. Even though it's a rare complication of CLL, the early diagnosis is very, very important. The patient expired after three months. So to conclude, periocular region is a window to the human body. You can have a myriad of clinical conditions and various atypical presentations. History taking is very, very important, and diffuse torchlight examination is also very, very important to detect masquerades in the periocular area. Needs regular follow up and imaging, biopsy in suspicious lesions. It will help in avoiding the delay in diagnosis and it will save vision and save life. Thank you so much. That was very nice and excellent uh, compilation of all the cases, Dr. Marian, ma'am. It Thank was you. very nice to see. Any Thank questions you. from the panelists do we have here? I would request uh, Dr. Seema Das, ma'am, to load a presentation. Share the screen. If there are any questions, Marian, ma'am, again, we'll take at the end of the session and we'll get back to you. Yes, ma'am, your screen is visible. Ma'am, you are not audible. See, ma'am. Ma Dr. Yeah. Is it okay now? Yeah. Oh, yeah, but your voice is very low, ma'am. Is it better? Yeah, it is much better. So Sumit, thanks to you and thanks to BOA and MOS for this opportunity and for organizing this uh, very nice meeting. So I would just like to emphasize uh, on few important points what we must know about the recent advances on the management of the ILD tumors. Um, so I'll be talking about few points of sebaceous gland carcinoma, BCCs, squamous cell carcinoma, uh, essentially the malignant ILD tumors. And SDC is something which we see very often and uh, in our uh, practice. And we all now know that there is a new AGCC classification, the eighth edition of AGCC, which has come up for uh, staging the um, eyelid, malignant eyelid tumors, and which sort of is an improvisation over the seventh edition, which we've been using earlier. So just a few important points uh, we need to know while we're using this staging system is, uh, one is the size criteria between the T1 and the T2 staging, where uh, in T1 earlier, where less than five millimeter were included, now in the new staging system, it's, it takes the cutoff of 10 millimeter as the new criteria. So size does not seem to be uh, matter too much um, between five to 10, as far as the prognosis is concerned. And that's probably why this change has been made. Another important change which has been made is in the T3 and T4, where uh, the criteria for including tumors in the T3 were the resectability of the tumor, which was very subjective criteria that has been made much more objective in the T in the eighth edition. Uh, so the bottom line here is that the eighth edition actually helps us in predicting the local recurrence and the lymph node mats better, whereas the seventh edition probably helps in predicting the survival better. 
So that's what we need to know while you are using the staging system. So uh, for us clinically, what it implies down that while we are seeing any patient of SDC in our clinic, we must know to include or measure the size of the tumor. We must look for the lid margin involvement, the involvement of the tarsus, the orbit bones, and the paranasal sinus, and document them so that we are able to stage the tumor later on as per the TNM staging. For any tumor, the management goal includes complete resection, uh, which should include a tumor-free margin so that there is no reference and ensure that there is no metastasis if that has not happened earlier. So normally, this is how we um, sort of go about excising malignant eyelid tumors. We tend to take margins from all the different sites of the tumor and then send them for histopathological examination to ensure that you know, there are clear margins. In a small localized tumor like that, it might be easier to take the margins and demarcate the margins per se. But a tumor like this, where there is a lot of congestion of the surrounding conjunctiva, sometimes it becomes difficult to uh, pinpoint the area which, is, which should be your margin of excision. In those situations, we tend to resort to the frozen section margin control and intraoperative to guide us in the decision making. Now, we don't know what is the concordance of frozen and permanent section because there has been variable reports. And recently, there are some papers now which have come up, uh, both from, uh, in fact, this initial, the large two papers, both are from India. Uh, what important here is to understand that both the papers talk about the sensitivity and the specificity of the intraoperative frozen uh, for various eyelid tumors. So as we can see here, the sensitivity is 89%, whereas the specificity as well as the accuracy of intraoperative diagnosis by frozen is 99 to 98%, almost 100%. Uh, the same from the other paper, which talks about sensitivity as well as the specificity. And this talks a little bit more about the different types of tumor for BCC as well as for SGC. So what's um, important to understand here that though for BCC, the sensitivity and specificity both seems to be very high. But for SGC, the sensitivity is around 83% or so, whereas the specificity is 100%. So what it means in a simpler term is that we know sensitivity low means there are more chances of getting a false negative. So intraoperative frozen sometimes can give false negative specifically for SGC. So our major decision if we want to take is better to take based on the permanent section rather than on the frozen section. Uh, there is now a recent paper from the Shields group, which talks about a posterior lamellar resection, a complete resection of the posterior lamella, uh, because they found that the new tumors which have come up uh, in patients who were initially margin negative has come from a different area of the eyelid, not from the edges of the previous excision. So that's a rationale for excising the whole of the tarsus, even if a small part of the tarsus is initially involved in the main tumor. Uh, so skip lesions are common in SGC. There can be multicentric lesion, and that's the rationale for uh, kind of taking this approach of a complete posterior laminar excision. Uh, the pegetoid spread is something, again, which we see uh, quite commonly presenting as a persistent unilateral blepharoconjunctivitis in our patient. And in these patients, we routinely resort to something known as the map biops, uh, where small bits of conjunctiva are taken from multiple sites as far as protocol, and these are then seen under the microscope to, to see if there is any intraoperative, uh, intraconjunctival tumor spread, intraepithelial tumor spread. Now, is MAP biopsy required in all patients? Because we know that the procedure of doing a MAP biopsy is quite tedious. The histopathology is quite tedious because these are very small, minute bits of tissue which needs to be seen individually under microscope. And there are reports where there are a lot of non-diagnostic MAP biopsies uh, from the tissues which are uh, taken. In fact, in this study, almost 57% of all the MAP biopsies are non-diagnostic because of crush artifacts and other issues with the processing of the specimens. Now, how does a MAP biopsy correlate with the clinical suspicion? If we see this paper, what it says that uh, they have actually taken patients who had a recurrent sebaceous gland carcinoma, and what they have found that four out of the five patients where there was a tumor recurrence, uh, uh, where conjunctival MAP biopsy was done, in those patients, actually, the initial MAP biopsy was negative. So the site from where the tumor has arising, the new tumor, was not from the site where the MAP biopsy gave us an indication. So probably it might not be very useful routinely in all patients. And what we can predict that in some patients, like a localized tumor like this, where we find an absolutely healthy, normal-looking conjunctiva, no congestion, uh, MAP biopsy might not have some uh, much of role. Whereas in a diffuse tumor like this, where we can't pinpoint the exact extent of the tumor, my biopsy definitely has a role. So in selected group of patients, yes, it is indicated and it is useful, but it might not be mandatory for all to do a my biopsy in all SGC.
Now, what about locally advanced SGC? Now, again, there are a few papers which have come up, which kind of consolidates the role of new adjuvant chemo for these uh, locally advanced non-resectable tumors where um, mutilating surgery like exenteration might be required if you have to control uh, or treat this tumor. Now, uh, 5-FU and uh, cisplatin-based chemo has shown very good results in sort of uh, debulking the tumor uh, by the use of chemotherapy so that a surgical resection becomes much less extensive and in many, many a case, it can avoid the need for exenteration in um, some patients. It can also be used in patients where the tumor has already gone out of the orbit, there is local lymph node extension, and use of neoadjuvant chemo has shown to be beneficial in those patients also. One minute left, ma'am. Yes. So just a little bit about the uh, newer developments in the um, uh, new treatment modalities for uh, SGC. A uh, few studies have found the expression, overexpression of cancer stem cell marker in patients of SGC who has shown metastasis. So this could be one of the potential therapeutic tar target, target as well as prognostic target to show the bad prognosis cases and also to develop some uh, future therapeutic targets in those directions. Um, uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor, the antagonist to them, there are uh, important role of the antibodies and there are, these are now commercially available for use in various other tumors and probably even for eyelid tumors soon, they will have uh, an important role. Cost is a factor, but over a period of time, probably um, you know, once we start using them more often and they're much more readily available, uh, that should be beneficial in a selected group of patients. BCC, we all know the role of Vismodagi uh, or Arivage. Again, cost here is a factor, but in selected group of patients like this, the sclerosing variant where the surgical ex excision might be difficult or in extensive tumor like this, this can help in debulking the tumor. Another role of uh, this drug is in patients of the basal cell nevus syndrome who keeps on getting recurrent BCC, multiple BCC, where surgical excision might not be feasible. And this drug can be used if it's available and if the patient can afford to kind of cause good tumor control. So when you suspect a basal cell uh, nevus syndrome, we know that multiple BCC, especially in young patients, um, because about 20% of BCC in patients younger than 20 years will be harboring this syndrome. And there are many other cancers which can happen in this syndrome, not in BCC. It's important to know about all the other tumors which can also be present in this patient. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think I'll stop here. Uh, just to conclude that TNM is something we need to know about uh, while we kind of stage our eyelid tumors. My biopsy, we need to know clearly which patients, where it is indicated and how to interpret. And of course, there is a role of newer prognostic and targeted therapy in eyelid tumors. Thank you so much. That was a really nice presentation, ma'am, with uh, a lot of recent advances included. I have one question for you and yes, Fairuz, ma'am, uh, regarding the chemotherapy for the sebaceous gland carcinoma. So we give a new adjuvant chemotherapy and followed by that uh, excision. So in your experience, in how many such cases, uh, post-chemotherapy uh, resection, you have got a recurrence in that, those cases? Like especially like you showed a case where there was a uh, mid part of the orbit involved and then the chemotherapy and then the resection. So in how many, like in your experience, how many cases you got a recurrence? Fairuz ma'am also had experience in this. She had presented a paper in AO on the scene. Yeah, so I had uh, done a, a retrospective study of Dr. Santosh Unava. We had 13 cases, in fact. So we had uh, two recurrence in that. One of the recurrence was because the patient deferred a radiotherapy which was adv advised to her. Uh, so she didn't complete the treatment. Uh, other case was a very focal uh, recurrence, not an extensive one. So completing a protocol, uh, if it is involving the orbit, you know, that's when uh, you go ahead with the new adjuvant chemotherapy, including the new adjuvant chemotherapy, uh, surgical excision with a margin-free clearance and radiotherapy, the recurrence rate is uh, quite low. Yeah. Dr. Okay. Seema. Yeah, I agree totally, Fedus. Yeah, so again, not too much of experience in terms of number. I think I have three patients. One was an old uh, gentleman, the one whom I showed the picture, orbital involvement, uh, who needed exenteration. The second patient, was, we started on neoadjuvant, but uh, after the neoadjuvant patient got lost to follow up, got the surgery done elsewhere. And subsequently, I think about two years down the line, we saw her back with a metastasis into the lung. So uh, I'm not sure whether that, that has something to do with the completion of the protocol per se, but there was no local recurrence. It was a distance metastasis. So the patient who didn't take radiotherapy, she had a local recurrence as well as a systemic lung meds also, yeah. 
Thank you, ma'am. And now we'll go ahead with the next presentation. It's by Dr. Chinmay, ma'am, on carangular tumors. Uh, please share your screen, ma'am. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, am I audible? Yes, ma'am, you're audible. Voice is little low, but you're audible. Okay. Uh, now, <laughs> yeah, we can uh, see your slides, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, at the outset, uh, thank you, Sumit, uh, for this, and uh, thanks to BOA and MOS. So, my topic for today is uh, the tumors of the carankle. Yeah, uh, 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 greetings from Bangalore, which is battered by COVID. Uh, here, uh, what we are seeing is a normal person. And as we know, the current is sometimes seen and sometimes it is not. Sorry to interrupt. The voice is uh, not clear, ma'am. If you can come a little near your computer, the voice might uh, become better. Okay. Now this is fine, ma'am. Yeah, this is fine. Okay. So, uh, people with carankular problems many times do not take treatment unless it is large. Uh, as we can see, uh, some because it gets hidden sometimes. And histopathologically, it consists of non keratinized squamous epithelium. There are a lot of other additional tissues also because it's a derivative of the skin. So, we have hair follicles, we have the accessory lacrimal glands, the sweat glands sebaceous glands, and of course, we have blood vessels and nerves. So from this small area, there are a lot of tissues uh, from which a lot of different types of tumors can arise. So the patient comes to us when the lesion is large, and here we can see that there is a quite a vascular looking uh, lesion and uh, if on looking closely we can see the fine uh, varicated lesion and uh, since it is closer to the conjunctiva most of the lesions share the characteristics of the tumors of the conjunctiva and because of its classical appearance uh, so a clinical diagnosis of a papilloma was made and uh, I'll be sharing the histopathological uh, pictures. And uh, here we can see the non-keratinized squamous epithelium. And we can see a lot of papillomatosis, acanthosis, and this is the fibrovascular core here. So this confirms with our diagnosis of a squamous uh, papilloma. Moving on to the other picture, sometimes these papillomas can get keratinized here. So you can see a lot of... Uh, uh, brown tissue. So it's a keratinized uh, papilloma again. And uh, treatment is a simple excision. Uh, sometimes in younger patients, particularly the, in the ones who are uh, immunocompromised, we can get papillomas, extensive ones here, like uh, this is a recurrent papilloma, although it was excised once it recurred back. And uh, we can see the growth here and extending onto the upper phonics as well. So in these situations, I put these patients on topical mitomycin C to prevent the recurrence and of course, uh, thorough check for the uh, cause for immunosuppression. Moving on to the pigmented lesions in the caruncle, uh, just like how nevus is common in the conjunctiva, we also have nevus arising on the caruncle and most patients take come in for the cosmetic blemish. And here again, uh, we have excised the tumor completely, and this is the post-operative appearance. And in the histopathological slide, we can see nests of this uh, nevus uh, cells. So these are all the nevus cells. And uh, in the slide, um, we can also see some of these goblet cells over here. Uh, so these are filled with mucin and uh, some amount of infiltration with uh, lymphocytes. So these are the other, like a flat nevus on this side. Uh, this is a really young patient with a nevus. Most of these again come in for cosmetic and uh, we just tell them to either follow or excise if there are any uh, danger signs. And coming to the vascular lesions. So following a small injury, this is the patient who has come to us. And as you can see, it's quite vascular. 
and uh, a clinical diagnosis of pyogenic granuloma was made. And on the histopathology, you can see a very, very vascular slide and uh, you, we can see the lobular pattern uh, here. And uh, we also noted here is the extensive lot of lymphocytes. Everywhere there are a lot of lymphocytes. So this was a case of pyogenic uh, granuloma. And sometimes we also see the uh, vascular malformations like this. Uh, extending uh, into the phonesis. So this was also excised and here we are seeing blood vessels of varying uh, sizes, so like small vessels, large vessels, and uh, also the uh, you can see this very large blood vessel here. So this was a vascular malformation. And as I told you earlier, since there are sebaceous glands in the caruncle, we, we can have some lesions coming from the sebaceous glands. And here, this was a very, very long-standing lesion and uh, like a retention cyst was thought, but on histopathology, um, uh, there was a lot of uh, histocytes also and the histopathological report came as a steer to cytoma. Similar to the previous case, a yellow-looking lesion, but look at the, it's conforming to the angle of the caruncle. So here, the histopathology here was more of a very, very regular arrangement. So similar to a regular gland, sebaceous gland, it was a very regular arrangement, just that there was hyperplasia. So this is a case of sebaceous hyperplasia. Moving on to the other types of uh, lesions, uh, we can also get squamous lesions, like uh, squamous dysplasia or a frank carcinoma. The moment we see whitish, uh, areas on a lesion. So that definitely suggests that it is keratin and uh, it puts a caution for us. And uh, here again, the lesion was excised in total. And uh, following that, with the histopathological report of a dysplasia, he was also started on uh, mitomycin C postoperatively, did not have any recurrence. One unusual case, again, uh, never thought that the report would come as a malignancy. It was like a very, very well defined. Um, um, think the only thing is that this person is an elderly female. So there was a bit of uh, doubt that it could be a sebaceous cell carcinoma. And on uh, complete excision with a small two millimeter uh, margin, whatever was there, this was the histopathological report. Again, you can see a lot of sebaceous cells and uh, the tumor cells with a uh, central uh, area. So this was a diagnosis of sebaceous cell carcinoma. The clinical differentiation becomes very difficult in the sebaceous hyperplasia versus a sebaceous cell carcinoma. Of course, these lesions are very, very rare, but I just thought that um, to highlight the importance of getting malignant lesions in this small area. And uh, as you can see in this data, the commonest lesion was papilloma and then the nevus. Pyogenic granuloma, of course, is common and uh, like just uh, one case of dysplasia and sebaceous cell carcinoma, uh, some of the other studies. So in conclusion, the carincular lesions, although they are very rare, we have to know that uh, benign tumors are accounting for majority of the cases. And among them, the papilloma and nevus are the bulk of the lesions. And between the pre-malignant and malignant uh, cases, the clinical diagnosis becomes difficult and the histopathology is very much required. And there was only one case of sebaceous cell carcinoma in this series. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, ma'am. That was right on time and that was a huge collection of carangular tumors, more than we can see in any of the atlas at a time. Uh, very nice presentation, ma'am. Uh, any, any questions from any of the panelists? All good. Nice series of cases. Uh, then uh, we will go ahead with our next presentation by Dr. Fairuz, ma'am, on massacres in ocular surface. Uh, ma'am, can you please share your screen? Yes. So, just in the history, massacres was the word first time used in the ophthalmology to describe a congenital tumors only in 1955. And today we have ocular surface lesion massacred topic. Ma'am, you can go ahead. Thank you, Sumit, and uh, greetings to all, and I hope everyone is doing fine. 
thanks to BOA, MOS, and especially uh, Dr. Sumit for this kind invitation and uh, a fantastic scientific treat. So I'm going to take you through this masquerades and ocular surface lesion, a little bit of it in the limited time available, and I have no financial disclosures or interest. So as Sumit has rightly said that ocular malignancies often share, you know, similar kind of sign, symptoms and signs uh, when, you know, you compare to the most common benign and inflammatory lesions. And conjunctival tumors and ocular surface tumors, although they are visible, and very easy to examine still holds, uh, you know, there are certain challenges in diagnosing these cases. And today what I'm going to do is uh, take you through some cases, take the mask and look inside what are the possibilities of, you know, uh, identifying malignant lesions most importantly. So first and foremost, a treatment resistant chronic conjunctivitis. I'll take you through a few cases to understand it better. So this is an 18 year old teenager with redness and watering in the right eye for the past four months. And she was diagnosed as a case of keratitis being on topical treatment medications and it has not been uh, you know, resolving. So as you can see here closely, the entire cornea diffusely, you can see this fleshy you know, uh, lesion which is covering the cornea, slightly grayish in appearance. There is superficial vascularization. In fact, there are deeper vascularization which is not visible in this picture. And that is probably why the anterior segment, uh, you know, specialist thought it could be a keratitis. But there are a few subtle signs which actually tells you that it could be something more. So as you can see here, there is limbal thickening, there is conjunctival thickening, and specks of keratin, which is scattered all around near the limbus, uh, you know, overlying the cornea. And this was a case of uh, cornea and uh, conjunctival diffuse OSSN, and she was immunocompromised. So uh, this is what you see after the only thing that we did was interferon alpha 2B eye drops, and it resolved in five months after topical medications, and she has been, you know, there is no recurrence for the past three years. Yet another lady, a 56-year-old lady with redness and irritation, in both the eyes, in fact, uh, for the past one year. And she has been on chronic medication, including lubricants, uh, steroids, on and off redness. And if you see this picture over here, there is definitely, you know, red congested eye. But on a closer look, so this is how her right eye looks. Uh, the temporal bulba conjunctiva, the nasal bulba conjunctiva has these reddish lesions, as well as in the left eye, both temporal and na nasal bulba conjunctiva, typical of these large corkscrew vessels, subconjunctival lesion, almost orangish, and the uh, clinical diagnosis was a lymphoproliferative lesion and to rule out lymphoma, and it came out to be a MOLT lymphoma, bilateral and multifocal, which was in fact masquerading as a chronic conjunctivitis in this patient without any systemic involvement. And surgical excision was all that I did in bilateral, uh, you know, bilaterally in this case. A very typical presentation in a 64 year old lady with redness, discharge and irritation for the past one year, more than a chronic conjunctivitis here, she has blepharoconjunctivitis. Even the eyelid is involved, as you can see, here, the posterior lid margin is thickened, entire mebumin gland orifices, and the structure is altered over here. There is loss of lashes. And this is a very typical presentation of a sebaceous gland carcinoma, the intraepithelial or the pagetoid variant, which has to be kept in mind. Treatment resistance scleritis. So yet another case, this patient was treated as a case of scleritis, on and off steroids, the lesion goes away, then it comes back again, but very, very typical, you should always look for these corkscrew vessels, anything which is having a dilated vessel over it, it may be a malignancy and it has to be ruled out. And Something else that is very evident over here is the inferior fornicial lesion, which is adjacent to the main lesion over here. So a lymphoproliferative lesion was again uh, kept as a differential diagnosis in this case, and it came out as an extra marginal zone lymphoma, multifocal presenting and treated as a case of scleritis. Uh, I'm sure most of us know who practice ocular oncology that conjunctival squamous cell carcinoma can present as necrotizing scleritis with 
the invasive variant. And what you need to actually look for is again keratin over the surface of the sclera. As you can see here, it's just not the scleral melt. It is a lot of keratin, a heap of keratin, which is lying over the cornea, over the conjunctiva, which gave uh, the diagnosis away and the patient underwent extended enucleation. Now, the most important thing when you know an anterior segment uh, specialist uh, sends you to rule out is pterygium versus OSS. And yes, there is a lot of similarity between both these lesions. And it has been uh, reported that OSSM can also coexist with pterygium in 2% of the cases. Now, there are certain very classical characteristic features which we all know in order to differentiate OSSM from pterygium. As you can see here, pterygium, it usually has linear vessels and it's more thinner. Whereas in OSSM, it's more thicker, it's more tortuous, it will be slightly more fleshy and more you know, elevated. And there will be definitely some specks of keratin over the surface until and unless it's a papillary variant, which obviously doesn't look like a pterygium. So uh, there has been a study where they also identified that uh, a pterygium specimen, which was submitted for pathology, OSSN was detected in 10% of the cases. So it's always good to uh, send the pterygium specimen that you have for histopathological evaluation so that you don't miss an OSSN. But most of the time, they are in the severe dysplasia or C and not mostly an SEC or an invasive squamous cell carcinoma, subconjunctival hemorrhage. So now this is a 35-year-old lady presenting with subconjunctival hemorrhage in the left eye for the past two months referred to me in order to rule out a vascular malformation, but more than a vascular malformation over here, as obviously you can see the vessels are normal, it has some pinkish orangish appearance, which is subconjunctival over here. So what was kept in mind with the subconjunctival hemorrhage in the conjunctiva presenting with the lesion was amyloidosis. And it was proven to be primary localized amyloidosis and a secondary involvement and the systemic involvement has to be definitely ruled out because it can be life-threatening sometimes. Although amyloidosis involves eyelid mainly, but it can involve the conjunctiva as well. Yet another case initially diagnosed as OSSN referred tortuous vessels, but well, this eyelid lesion, you know, the tarsal uh, conjunctival involvement with this yellowish pinkish appearance was not really suiting into OSSN. And this also came out as amyloidosis presenting as a nodular conjunctival lesion. Now, fleshy conjunctival mass, yes, there can be confusion sometimes. A 65-year-old lady with reddish mass in the right eye, six months. Conjunctival lymphoma, yes, of course, it has got all the characteristic features of a conjunctival lymphoma. Tortuous vessel, salmon colorish, subconjunctival, elevated, sitting like glaring at you in the conjunctiva. But well, there is more to it. I'm taking the mask out here again. So a CT scan was done because anything which is in and around the carincle, I almost make sure that an imaging is done in order to rule out any orbital anterior orbital extension. And this is what we found, that it was a muscle lymphoma rather than a conjunctival lymphoma arising from the medial rectus muscle. It was extra marginal zone, no systemic involvement. Patient underwent ultra low dose radiotherapy, the boom boom therapy, and she's doing fine without any recurrence past four years. Another 72-year-old gentleman was referred in order to rule out lymphoma, lots of vessels over the surface, but it's not too fleshy. It was more of a transparent appearance, and this gave away the diagnosis. It was a conjunctival inclusion cyst, although it was vascular. So what is the diagnosis here? Is it a lymphoma, a squamous cell carcinoma, or others? Well, it is something else. So what you need to see here is it is fleshy, lots of vessels. Of course, it's a malignancy and the speck of pigmentation from where it is arising. This is a case of a conjunctival melanoma, a melanotic secondary to PAM. So conjunctival pigmentation has to be kept and seriously looked into because it can turn into a lethal conjunctival melanoma. This is a very common, you know, uh, appearing uh, lesion that is a racial uh, complexion associated racial melanosis. But whenever there is, uh, you know, more darker in color, it is asymmetric, more thicker, then you have to always rule out conjunctival melanoma. A very interesting case here, young patient, extensive lesion over sitting in the conjunctiva involving the eyelid margin, the tarsal conjunctiva involving almost the upper eyelid, the lower fornix, the caruncle. So if you want to give me the diagnosis quickly, and there are these white specks over it, you can see these white spots, papilloma, OSSN, 
Anyone? Uh, Sebaceous gland carcinoma. Or? Young patient, a uh, 30 year old male. All right. You know what the diagnosis was? It was rhinosporidiosis. So even sometimes, you know, infection can present as, you know, aggressive as a malignancy. And uh, this was from a village in Kerala. So excision was done and he's doing fine. Finally, last two slides on conjunctival malignant tumors in children. It's rare, but you have to be very, very careful in these children. A child presenting with this reddish mass in the left eye one year. Elsewhere, it was diagnosed as neurofibroma. So the differential diagnosis that we should keep in mind in children with fleshy lesions in conjunctiva is rhabdomyosarcoma, leukemia, and lymphoma. But you know what? This came out to be a liposarcoma. Yet another case, underwent conjunctival excision elsewhere, histopathology not available. Sometimes the story is like this, and it was redone, re-excised, and it came out to be an alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma. So to conclude, conjunctival tumors have a wide clinical spectrum. A meticulous clinical assessment is very, very important, and definitely you will get some clinical clues, either from the uh, you know, history, symptoms, or signs to differentiate these masquerading uh, lesions from the malignant ones. And if at doubt, always revisit the clinical diagnosis. Thank you very much for your question this evening. That was that was beautiful compilation of all the cases, ma'am. It Thank was you. a feast to see. And of course, we do uh, face a lot of this massacre, and unless we do a proper imaging and the history, we might miss a diagnosis most of the times. Thank you so much, ma'am. And uh, in the interest of time, we'll move ahead with the next talk. Uh, we have Dr. Sonal Zaugule with us. Uh, can you please share your slide? She has done her fellowship at Center for Sight uh, with Dr. Sandosh Onawa and also with Dr. Paul Finger. And now she is working at HV Desai Hospital as an oculoplastic consultant. Over to you, Sonal. Thank you, Sumit, for the uh, introduction. All right, so after knowing about the eyelid tumors as well as the surface tumors, let's shift our sails and move on towards the intraocular tumors. Uh, diagnosing intraocular tumors uh, can be a very interesting as well as a daunting journey. Uh, in this limited time, I will uh, take you all through some of the key features of uh, commonly encountered intraocular tumors. More often than not, uh, patients who present with intraocular tumors may complain of mundane uh, complaints, for example, diminution of vision, gradual or sudden, uh, flashes or noticing flashes of floaters, or simply an, an intraocular tumor might be diagnosed during the, their uh, routine fundus examination. Indirect ophthalmoscopy remains the uh, very, very important essential tool in the uh, toolbox of an ophthalmologist and ocular oncologist in diagnosing uh, these tumors. Uh, the surface configuration, surface contour, color, location, size, site, everything can be documented by, uh, via a thorough indirect ophthalmoscopy. Ancillary testings like ultrasound, B-scan, fundus photography, uh, fundus autofluorescence imaging, microimaging, for example, OCT uh, uh, or OCTA in the newer imaging, and macro imaging, for example, CT scan or MRI, as, as well as PET CT scan, whole body PET CT scan, can give you the important diagnostic clues while uh, coming to a confirmed diagnosis. Let's go through some of the uh, common tumors. Starting with the choroidal melanoma, the most common primary intraocular tumor we encounter in adults. Choroidal melanomas can be both pigmented, that is melanotic or, or a melanotic. Uh, commonly uh, found to be more than two millimeter in thickness. The orange pigment uh, on the top of the melanoma are characteristic because of the liposuction deposition. And uh, they are accompanied with subret uh, subretinal fluid or if extensive retinal detachment. This fundus picture highlights the presence of the or orange pigment. This is because of the metabolic products of highly met uh, metabolizing uh, cells, the liposuction, which is also highlighted on the fundus autofluorescence. When you go uh, do a fundus fluorescent angiography in these tumors, you can see the classical double circulation. What we mean by that is the lighting up of retinal vessels as well as the intrinsic tumor vascularity. Double circulation has been very pathognomically described for choroidal melanomas. On ultrasound, uh, they uh, are seen as moderate to low reflectile allegiance owing to their homogeneous architecture. They can be dome-shaped or a mushroom configuration or diffuse. The twinkling that we just were uh, seeing on dynamic ultrasound can be a characteristic because of intrinsic vascularity. Right. Right. 
this just shows an uh, ultrasonographic documentation of the classically described mushroom configuration of the growing choroidal melanoma because of the break in bruchus membrane it causes to grow into the uh, retinal cavity on oct they generally appear as a dome shaped or uh, irregular yep. choroidal uh, lesions accompanied with subretinal fluids as well as shaggy photoreceptors telling you about the uh, incidence of, oh, sorry, the uh, duration of the subretinal fluid. Newer OCT angiography can help uh, uh, show the uh, reduced capillary density at the macula in tumors which involve the fovea as well as macula. Sometimes the pigmented scleral or episcleral lesion with a dilated sentinel vessel can be a presenting sign of the anterior located choroidal melanoma with an extrascleral extension. A close differential of uh, this tumor, that is the choroidal melanoma, can also be choroidal hemorrhage. A large choroidal yeah. hemorrhage can sometimes simulate a condition similar to choroidal melanoma. A fundus fluorescent angiography will clear the confusion up by showing a blocked fluorescence. And also on dynamic ultrasound, what you can see is the classic after movement, which we can only see in choroidal hemorrhage and not in the melanoma. This just gives uh, goes on to highlighting the importance of dynamic ultrasound. Instead of just viewing the 2D uh, printed pages, it's uh, essential to uh, go through the videos of the ultrasound to see the exact composition of the tumor. Moving on to the benign variety we often encounter, the choroidal hemangioma. So choroidal hemangiomas are generally orange to red in color. They can be diffuse or circumscribed. Diffuse when in association with systemic syndromes, for example, sturge weber syndrome. They are often accompanied with subretinal fluid and or retinal detachment, the occurrence of which are important to note because those are the factors which are going to cause visual symptoms and those are the factors which are going to dictate your morality of treatment. On ultrasonography, because of the vascular uh, nature of these tumors, high internal reflectivity is found. So the uh, A-scan spikes are important to note here, along with the Doppler imaging if you have available. For fundus fluorescent angiography, early hyperfluorescence of the choroidal vessels, coarse fluorescence and diffuse pattern fluorescence in late phase is characteristics of the choroidal hemangioma. OCT again will go on to show you a smoother appearance of the uh, tumor with large dilated choriocapillaries as well as choroidal vessels, presence of subretinal fluid here in this case foveal detachment and shaggy photoreceptors uh, can also be seen. Moving on to the next variety of choroidal uh, tumors that we also encounter, choroidal metastasis. These are uh, the tumors which can be, can, uh, be diagnosed at the time of a known primary uh, malignancy as well as can precede the diagnosis of a primary malignancy. So these tumors can be unilateral, single unilateral, or multifocal and bilateral. They can be accompanied with clear or turbid subretinal fluid or uh, exudative retinal detachment. They are known to show rapid growth. Uh, the more commonly or not, they are yellowish in color, except some of the classic metastases, for example, from renal cell carcinoma or thyroid carcinoma can be orangish red in color. So they can be easily confused with a case of uh, melanotic choroidal melanomas, but what will give you a clue to diagnose is all, uh, presence of retinal spicules or on uh, fundus autofluorescence, as well as the ultrasound imaging, which will uh, show you a variable internal reflect with reflectivity as against the role reflectivity of the choroidal melanoma. The primary sources can be lung, breast, uh, prostate, colon, or kidney, which can give out a choroidal metastasis. On fundus fluorescence angiography, because of the multiple uh, newer uh, microaneurysms formed in the lesion, the starry sky pattern is classically described. Sometimes in advanced cases, they might present to you uh, like this with a secondary glaucoma, secondary neovascular glaucoma, which after ultrasound B scan, you can uh, see the presence of an intraocular mass. And at this time, the macroimaging in the form of whole body PET CT scan comes in handy to diagnose uh, unknown primary, which in this case was a renal cell carcinoma. So this turned out to be a case of secondary glaucoma, secondary to metastasis from a renal cell carcinoma. Another important uh, choroidal tumor specifically uh, suspected in a young individual uh, is a choroidal granuloma or tubercular choroidal granuloma more commonly in our population. They tend to show irregular uh, surface uh, accompanying soft exudates or vasculitis uh, as well as retinal hemorrhages. 
the inflammatory signs are more pronounced on the FFA and which are a clues for apart, apart from the systemic investigations. Choroidal mm -hmm. osteomas are the two, uh, lesions which are uh, seen with yeah, yellowish tinge or scalloping edges. They also may have intrinsic vascularity. However, the classic ultrasound high internal with high internal reflectivity and a significant orbital shadowing in uh, behind the lesions can uh, help you make a final diagnosis of osteomas. Fundus fluorescence angiography will show you a slow filling in early phase and a persistent staining because of the high presence of calcium in these lesions. Moving on to mature retinal tumors. Retinoblastoma, the most common intraocular malignancy we found, uh, see in children, can be in, uh, endophytic, exophytic, or a diffuse pattern enlargement of these tumors. Uh, leukocoria or the white reflex being the most common uh, presenting symptom. The intraocular calcification can be uh, confirmed on ultrasound as well as uh, CT scan imaging, which is quite pathognomic. Something which can be uh, confused with advanced series of retinoblastoma or advanced series of coarse disease, specifically talking about the stage four and stage five year. Uh, so coarse disease is a telangiectic neovascular disease of the retina, has to be kept in mind while uh, examining a child uh, with unilateral uh, leukocoria or xanthocoria, which is the yellowish reflex which coarse disease can give. Another group of uh, uh, vitroretinal tumors are uh, primary intraocular lymphomas or vitroretinal lymphomas. The examination findings may mimic presence of a chronic posterior uveitis. The vitreous cells can also give aurora borealis effect. Leopard spot or collection of subretinal pigmented lesions as seen over here can be uh, diagnostic. Less often they are associated with exudative RD, a visible mass or even an optic nerve head swelling. So vitroretinal lymphoma are basically a subset of primary CNS lymphomas. They may coexist or precede the development of CNS lymphoma. So a CNS screening is mandatory uh, while di after diagnosing of a vitroretinal lymphoma. That's only Moving, time yeah. Moving on to uh, the smaller subset of retinal pigment epithelial tumors. These are uh, choppy as we is, uh, commonly know them, uh, are um, more often than not incidentally diagnosed. What we have to look out for are the multiple or the typical choppies, which can be associated with familial adeno uh, adenomatous polyposis, uh, so as to uh, dictate a systemic screening. Uh, we can diagnose them because of the block fluorescence they provide on fundus uh, angiography. Another variety is an RP adenocarcinoma, which can mimic choroidal uh, melanomas, but a blocked fluorescence again on angiography can clear that right up. A uh, little bit about optic nerve head tumors, optic nerve head melanocytoma, again with a classical uh, OCT picture of uh, shadowing and uh, hypo, uh, hypofluorescence on angiography can help diagnosing this condition. These uh, patients can present with uh, uh, change visual fields. Optic nerve head astrocytomas are paler looking uh, lesions, which can be in association with tuberous sclerosis or other phacomatosis. So with that uh, review, uh, I'll acknowledge my mentors and uh, their immense contribution in uh, making me able to diagnose all these intraocular conditions. And I would also like uh, to take a second to uh, uh, remind everyone that this today is the commencement of the retinoblastoma awareness week. So do your bit and identify the white as well as fight the white. Thank you. Thank you, Sumit. And thank you, the organizers for of BOA as well as MOS for this great opportunity. And this has been a wonderful experience. Thank you, Sonan. That was really a nice collection of all the pictures and all the cases. And uh, uh, you tried covering a lot in this uh, few minutes, which was really enlightening for us, especially the use of that dynamic ultrasound to differentiate between choroidal hemorrhage and tumors. It was very nice. So in interest of time, we'll move ahead with the next talk. It is by Dr. Mahesh Anmuganan, sir, about the surgical management of intraocular tumors. May I request you to share the screen, sir? Thank you, Dr. Sumit. Yes. Give me and you can see my slides, right? Yes, sir. we can see it. Thanks to Professor Lahani, uh, Sumit, the BOA and the MOS for this opportunity to meet you all virtually. All of us, I'm sure, are uh, dying to meet each other in person, and I hope that like we'll be able to get to that very, very soon. So I'm going to talk about surgeries for posterior segment tumors in the next eight minutes. So these are not surgeries which are destructive. 
So I'm going to talk about surgery, which are other than enucleation. Dr. Sonal did a great job of showing all the different types of tumors in about eight minutes time. So when would we have to intervene in these patients for like, uh, surgical options other than enucleation? One could be diagnostic. So the diagnosis can be an FNAB or using vitreoretinal techniques. So we may have to remove the vitreous or piece of the tumor for diagnosis, diagnostic purposes. Or it could be therapeutic, therapeutic to treat the tumor or to treat the associated complications because of the tumor. So the most common indication for vitreous biopsy is the primary intraocular lymphoma. So if you had to do a biopsy, we have to stop the steroids two weeks before and use a low cut of the vitreous cutter so that the cells don't get macerated, remove all the cells and send for immunohistochemistry as well as cytology. Next one is FNAB. Most often I do an FNAB with the indirect ophthalmoscope. Indirect ophthalmoscope. Here I'm doing a vitrectomy and then doing an FNAB. You can see the needle plunging into the mast lesion. This was a metastasis without a known primary. So we did the biopsy for following which we were able to get a diagnosis. So the, leash, the, the tissue which we get is what is in the tip of the needle and it's aspirated into the syringe with the BSS and then sent for analysis. In certain cases, we may have to do an incisional biopsy. This was a young gentleman with a pigmented lesion arising from the ciliary body. I thought it was a melanocytoma of the ciliary body and not a melanoma because melanocytoma, in which case you can try to save the eye. So we went ahead with the biopsy. So here we have raised the partial thickness scleral flap and a very thin area of the sclera is left behind. And that bit of the sclera along with the tumor is excised. As you can see, the tumor is dark in color, not brown in color or gray in color. This is suggestive of melanocytoma. So this child who did have melanocytoma, which was treated with the brachytherapy and we managed to save the eye. Moving on to the next uh, series of surgeries, a therapeutic surgery for saving the eye. This was a young gentleman who had a mast lesion on the nasal side. It was a suprachoroidal tumor and we did a biopsy to find out that it was indeed a schwannoma actually of the arising from the, uh, the ciliary body, uh, the ciliary body region. So this is a non-malignant lesion. So we went ahead and tried resecting this lesion. So here we create a full thickness scleral flap. So this is the area where I had done a biopsy, the incisional biopsy. So the sclera is separated from the choroid very, very gently. We didn't want to rupture the choroid and have a vitreous loss in the retinal attachment. So what we see here, this is the schwannoma, which is sitting on the surface of the choroid. The, the, the choroid can be seen beautifully, the uvea, the name uvea comes from the appearance of a grape. So that's how it looks like. And this lesion, the schwannoma is excised, is gently peeled off from the choroid and the ciliary body. And I'm using an endocryo probe to hold on to the tumor and remove it. So fortunately, we didn't rupture the choroid and we didn't have vitreous loss. And this is the scleral patch crap, with the scleral crap being closed. This was the site where I had done an incisional biopsy and that had opened up in the meantime. A little bit of tumor tissue which was sticking around it was removed and the eye was closed. This is the post-op appearance. The lesion is not there and he continues to enjoy six, six vision. So such resections can rarely be done for anterior malignant tumors. This is a patient with an iridociliary melanoma, what we see here. So we did a big fake emulsification and uh, endocapsular ring because once I remove the tumor, that area of the capsular support will not be there. So we put an endocapsular ring. Again, we have made a partial thickness scleral flap. And this is the iris part of the lesion, which is being removed by doing a peripheral iridectomy using the intraocular micro scissors. So this way, I wanted to avoid doing a sectoral iridectomy. So once again, a deep penetrating diether to the bed, entry into the anterior chamber. We have to remove the iris, the ciliary body, and part of this sclera. So this lesion is being removed completely. And the vitreous, which is prolapsing, is being removed with the vitreous cutter. You can see the mass lesion in the excised specimen. Let's see, close the eye. Another, another treatment which we do often is brachytherapy. So this is again a sight saving and the eye saving treatment. Most often it is done for medium sized melanomas, select retinoblastomas and vascular tumors, particularly coronal hemangiomas or retinal angiomas, which are too large for local treatment can be treated with brachytherapy. What we see here is the ruthenium plaque, which is being, which is being placed episclerally overlying the tumor. And until the dosage of the radiation is delivered, the, the, the plaque is left in place and then removed. 
Moving on to third part, there is therapeutic surgery managing associated complications which come with the tumor treatment or tumor itself. This is a peripapillary angioma with an exudative retinal detachment. It was very difficult to treat the way it was. So we wanted to drain the subretinal fluid. So here I'm draining the subretinal fluid transclerally. What you see here is the, the transclerial needle going under the retina and draining the exudative retinal detachment. Because the retina was lifted up so much that we were not able to treat the tumor, we wanted to drain the subretinal fluid, reattach the retina, and then go ahead doing laser photocoagulation for the tumor. It was a long-standing uh, tumor, so the visual prognosis was a little poor, so I didn't opt for a photodynamic therapy. Instead, did laser photocoagulation. Traction retinal detachment is often associated with vascular tumors, particularly retinal angiomas. So what we see here is a treated retinal angioma, the scarring because of laser photocoagulation and cryo. So it forms a dense scar. You can see the macula is pulled up, and that's the scar tissue which is causing the traction of traction after macula and traction retinal detachment. Very gently, the scar tissue on the posterior hyoid is removed, taking care not to create a retinal break. The bridging traction is removed. So the key is not to have a break because once we have a break, it will be very difficult to attach to it. A laser photocoagulation for the tumor is done. This is the pre and post appearance. You can see the blood vessels have regressed and the macula has gone back to its normal place. Regmatogen retinal detachment can complicate tumors rarely. And this is one such patient with angiomatosis retinae familial. So I've placed a buckle over the tumor and doing a vitrectomy. This patient had a macula hole which was the reason for the regular retinal detachment. So we're draining the fluid from the macular hole and had this peripheral tumor, extremely peripheral tumor. So induced the posterior detachment and the, doing a vitrectomy. And this macular hole has to be tackled. So put a bubble of perfluorocarbon, stain it with the BBG and do an ILM peeling and stuff it into the hole. Then I thought that uh, supporting the tumor with the buckle would be adequate, but then the scarring was so so dense it wouldn't it wouldn't attach so we went ahead resecting the tumor i don't usually resect angiomas large angiomas because that can result in severe scarring but this is a small angioma a small area so we went ahead resecting the tumor as well as the scar tissue associated with it reattached the retina with laser photocoagulation and you can see the break is sitting on the buckle nicely and we use silicon oil for tamponade otherwise i usually do brachytherapy for large angiomas and treat it with treated with a limited vitrectomy. Now, very rarely we are doing vitrectomy in active retinoblastomas, particularly in one-eyed children where the eye may be lost otherwise. So here you see one such. The other eye had been removed and this child has been treated elsewhere, came with the retinal attachment with severe PVR. Leaving it alone, this eye would have been lost. So we did a very careful vitrectomy, then reattached the retina and all these special precautions would have to be taken. The special precautions are techniques to avoid spillage of cells, melphalan or topotecan in the infusion to kill the cells, distal water once again kills retinoblastoma cells. And all this is done under intravenous chemotherapy cover. And uh, I'm a little bit more liberal with these patients with the external beam radiation therapy to kill the cells which may have spilled onto the, onto the orbit or in the subcanical space. So to summarize, intraocular surgery for intraocular tumors, various reasons are there. The, commonest is biopsy, which could be just a fine needle aspiration biopsy or a vitrectomy. Benign lesions, we may have to do an excision biopsy. Therapy, therapeutic could be to treat the tumor or associated complications. And then malignant tumors, resection can be done for anterior tumors, bracket therapy for posterior malignant lesions. And vitrectomy can be used to manage complications such as attraction detachment, regular genital detachment. And in malignant lesions, if you were to intervene, particularly those with retinoblastoma, all kinds of care has to be taken to make sure that we are not resulting in extra plus bit of the tumor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. That was, uh, those are really wonderful surgical videos and wonderful collection of the cases. Uh, any questions from the panelists for the sir, anyone? Yes, yes, Fairus, yes. Hi, sir. Uh, Dr. Fairus. Hi, sir. Huh? So I have two questions for you, sir. Uh, the excision of ciliary body melanoma that you showed do you have any, you know, size-wise, any indication of, you know, uh, this particular size can be excised or beyond that it could be, uh, you know, radiated? Is there any uh, particular thing that you would take into consideration? Around one-third to one-fourth of the ciliary body can be excised because we need to give a clearance as well. So including the clearance about one-third to one, one-fourth would be the ideal one. One-third, yeah, we can just push the margins a little bit and then uh, do it. 
So one third, sometimes what I do is to, to resect it and put a plaque overlying that as well. So these can be resected safely without the eye going in for a crisis and decrease risk of complications. So you don't put a plaque always? Not all the time. If the margins are adequate enough, I don't put the plaque all the time. Okay, sir. So another question of, obviously you have seen so many intraocular tumors. What is your experience about leomyoma, uh, ciliary body and, you know, extending into a choroid? Leomyoma, I have come across, but unfortunately, I have managed them with enucleation rather than resection. So that is one such patient, one such tumor which can be resected because of the location and the and the. It's not malignant in that sense of the word, but I will come across one where I have managed to resect. So it's a little bit. Another thing is it's a little bit posteriorly located. So posterior lesions to resect becomes a little bit difficult as well. So I have come across, but I have not uh, in, like resected any of them so far. Okay, so it's usually inside the choroid, not outside the choroid. So then it might become difficult to excise it also, no? no we can remove it along with the choroid also. Only thing it becomes a, a little bit larger defect, like a UVL melanoma also we can resect by creating a flap and doing it. But once it extends posterior, it becomes a bit difficult to do such a large excision. So if it's okay. anterior depressed, yes, we can do it. Okay, okay, all right. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. And then we will go ahead with the next talk by Dr. Nandan Shetty, sir, on advances in the retinoblastoma. Sir, please share your screen. So, uh, thank you, Sumit. And uh, I take this opportunity to thank Professor Lahane, Team BOA, and Maharashtra Doctrinic Society for this kind invitation. I will be speaking today on the current trends in the management of advanced intraocular retinoblastoma. We are aware that retinoblastoma is a malignant tumor affecting ch uh, young children. And the global burden of this disease lies in the lesser developed nations. And India sees a large number of cases. Uh, it is estimated that uh, India sees about 1,500 to 2,000 new cases of retinoblastoma every year. The treatment of retinoblastoma has evolved over the last century, starting with the era of enucleation, followed by the era of external beam radiation, which was followed by intravenous chemotherapy from the 1990s. And of late, in the last one decade, we are seeing more and more of targeted chemotherapy, namely intra-arterial and intravitreal chemotherapy. So what exactly is advanced retinoblastoma? The clinical spectrum could be an advanced intraocular retinoblastoma, like you see in the top right picture here, or you could see an orbital retinoblastoma and metastatic retinoblastoma, the last two being extraocular disease. The international classification classifies intraocular intra retinoblastoma from A to E. And what we'll be focusing today are the groups D and E, which see a higher disease load within the eye. This compare with the TNM classification as CT2 and CT3. So this is an example of a group D retinoblastoma on the left side of the slide. You can see the disc very hazily because the vitreous is filled with vitreous seeds. Whereas on the right side, you see a large exophytic tumor with little detachment. These are both examples of advanced intraocular retinoblastoma. You should always remember that the primary aim of treatment is to save life, with the secondary goals being to save eye or vision if possible. So when we treat a patient with advanced unilateral retinoblastoma, the preferred treatment options in our center now remain intraarterial chemotherapy with or without intravitreal chemotherapy at a later stage. In cases where eye salvage is not, not possible, enucleation does remain a very valid treatment option for unilateral cases. For bilateral retinoblastoma, we generally start with systemic chemotherapy with the aim of chemoreducing the tumor followed by focal therapy and periocular chemotherapy in, as a initial treatment. Chemotherapy is generally given in six cycles of three drugs. And then up from cycle two or three onwards, you will start to see, as we see in this example here, with chemotherapy started, the tumor regresses and it moves, it shrinks and it moves away towards the source of its blood supply. And at this stage now, you start applying focal therapy. Periocular chemotherapy is, is injection of the chemotherapeutic agent around the globe in the deep posterior subclinal space. Drugs commonly used earlier were carboplatin, but nowadays we have shifted towards copotegan because of its better safety profile. A paper in 2005 by Dr. Honava's group showed a nearly 70% eye salvage in cases with diffuse vitreous seeds. 
In bilateral lateral blastoma, intraarterial chemotherapy can be considered if there is an inadequate response to the conventional intravenous chemotherapy. So, what is targeted therapy? The advantages of targeted therapy is basically you are uh, having a higher drug concentration at a tumor location with minimal to nil side effects, systemic side effects. The efficacy of treatment is much better, and your treatment goals are better achieved with this treatment. So intraarterial chemotherapy goes by a lot of other names. It is also known as super selective intraarterial chemotherapy or ophthalmic artery chemo infusion or chemo surgery. So what is done is through a transfemoral approach, uh, a very fine microcatheter is inserted and you go right up in the internal carotid artery and in the ostium of the ophthalmic artery, you insert the microcatheter. This is done under fluoroscopic guidance and the drug is injected in a pulsatile fashion over half, a, half an hour. The drugs commonly used are melphalan, topotecan, and carboplatin, or you can use combination of these drugs. So tumor response of the intraarterial chemotherapy is quite dramatic. In generally two or three sessions, you see a very dramatic response. As you see in this picture here, on the left was the pre-treatment and on the right is the post-treatment foot picture. Another example shows a group D lateral blastoma, which after three sessions of IAC shows a very dramatic response. So the next targeted chemotherapy is intravitreal chemotherapy, in which the drug is directly injected into the vitreous cavity by a very uh, specialized safety enhanced technique. This was once considered to be a forbidden technique to, to uh, inject anything in the eye with an active tumor because of fear of extra ocular spread. However, with the proper technique, this has been shown to be very safe. There was a landmark paper in 2012 by Professor Munir, and this has revolutionized the treatment of vitreous seeds. So here you see in the picture on the right, you have a tumor with seeds next to the tumor and within the vitreous space. These tips, uh, seeds are typically unresponsive to standard therapy because the, the concentration of the chemotherapeutic drug by systemic chemotherapy is generally poor. So, if the tree seeds are not responding to standard therapy or you have recurrent seeds, intravital chemotherapy is considered. The drugs which are commonly used are melphalan and topotecan. Melphalan is the most, act, most effective drug. However, it's also the most toxic drug. The therapeutic window for melphalan is very narrow. If you go below the recommended dose, you will have no effect. And if you go more than the recommended dose, you may have thysis. So the window is very tight from 20 to 30 micrograms. However, in the Indian eyes, we are seeing more uh, inflammatory reaction with melphalan and topotecan has found to be equally effective and much safer. So nowadays, topotecan is generally preferred in our population. So the technique here is a safety enhanced technique where you select a quadrant without the tumor and uh, you inject in the pass plana. And while you are exiting, uh, after giving the injection, you have to apply cryotherapy to the injection tract so as to sterilize any extra visiting cells. Here you see uh, after intravital chemotherapy on the left side, there's a large number of vitreous uh, seeds, some clouds. It's, uh, it's a significant vitreous disease, but after about two or three injections, you can see a dramatic response and the seeds have all melted away. So, Intravital chemotherapy is a safe and effective uh, technique and with the proper technique, there is no documented case of any extraocular spread with this technique. So which chemotherapy to use when? If you are starting primary therapy in a bilateral case, it's best to start with intra intravenous chemotherapy along with periocular chemotherapy if you have vitreous seeds. However, in unilateral cases, if the child is more than six months, you can consider intraarterial to be a first line of treatment. For secondary or recurrent retinal blastoma, intraarterial chemotherapy plays a much bigger role. And for vitreous seeding, intravitreal chemotherapy is having a near 100% success rate. Now, enucleation remains a very important treatment option in the retinal blastoma management. And it is to be employed in a very refined technique using a gentle and safe operating technique. We have to look for the high risk pathological features after enucleation to decide on the need for possible adjuvant treatment. A mention about a new targeted chemotherapy called intracameral chemotherapy, which is indicated for aqueous seeding, that is, a tumor cells entering the anterior chamber. It is contraindicated if there are 
uh, there's invasion of the Schlems canal, which is seen on the UBM. So the takeaway points from my lecture as retinoblastoma management has changed dramatically over the past 10 years with increasing use of intraarterial chemotherapy and intravitreal chemotherapy. And the enucleation rates have dropped significantly over the past 10 years with intravitreal chemotherapy changing the management of vitreous disease with a near 100% response in many case series. And all this without compromising on, any, on the patient survival rates. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. That was uh, a quite uh, uh, extensive talk and the lucid presentation on the management of advanced retinoblastoma. You must be getting a lot of it uh, at the center place where you are where you're working. Uh, we have left with the last but not the least talk of the session. It's by Dr. Santosh Unava, sir, on uh, moving to the orbit now from intraocular tumors. Orbital biopsy, how deep is deep? Uh, Dr. Santosh, uh, sir, are you there? Yeah, I'm there. Thank you. Uh, and then can you unshare your slide? Dr. Santosh sir does not need any introduction. The half of the people in the this session itself are mentored by him, and uh, he is uh, one of the person who you, uh, we should credit for uh, crafting this beautiful program. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for being with us. Thanks so much for all the hard work and for the kind invitation. I'll be speaking about uh, institutional biopsy in orbital tumors. Did you know that eight to twenty percent of orbital biopsies recur in result in non-specific or misleading? wrong diagnosis thus affecting the management and outcome and that's possibly because of unrepresentative sample where the sample is taken from an area where the tumor may be atypical or may not be present or non-uniform pathology in particular lesions such as lymphoproliferative lesions can have a component of benign and reactive lymphoid hyperplasia and also lymphoma sometimes because of inflammatory element which is associated with a necrotic tumor you might uh, biopsy the tissue response or tissue reaction, which is in the more superficial uh, layer around the tumor. So by protocol, we do multi-layered biopsy in all orbital tumors, at least three layers, and go beyond the tumor epicenter. What I mean by tumor epicenter is this. On radiology, if you assess that this is a particular tumor, just doing a biopsy from a superficial portion is not enough. Going to the mid center is also not enough, but going beyond the center to the epicenter and beyond to the other side, crossing over to the other side is very important. So you do a superficial, mid-zonal and a deep biopsy and all that is sent to the pathologist. That will help you pick up the diagnosis in nearly 100% of patients. For example, this is a patient, young child with a superior orbital mass. As uh, you see excuse now. me, sir. Uh, sorry to interrupt. The slides are not moving. Lights are not moving. No, sir. We are just seeing that orbital by, uh, yes. So really, I'll, I'll again share it. It's moving on my laptop. Is it moving? No, sir. Now it's, uh, uh, we can't see the screen at present. Yeah, now we can see the screen. Okay. Can you see the screen? Uh, it's not full screen yet, sir. Now we can see a histopathological sign. You know why is that happening? Uh, sir, no. Let me check it. I'll share again. Let me yes, sorry sir. for the technical. No, 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 Is that seen now? Mm, yes, so now we can see the whole presentation. All right. So I was talking about uh, epicenter of a tumor. So I was trying to draw it up. Probably you didn't see at all. So this this is the tumor, and if this is the epicenter, this is a superficial biopsy. This is mid zonal, and this large deeper biopsy will go past the epicenter, and that is how deep you must go. Example I was showing was this child with rhabdomyosarcoma, uh, superior orbital mass. Now let's see what all we got. In the superficial biopsy, we got only inflammation and fibrosis. And that was the superficial biopsy. There we got only inflammation and fibrosis. That was the tissue reaction. And as we went deeper, we got embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma, which was very typical on histopathology and also immunohistochemistry. 
This was a 55-year-old male who presented with a right orbital mass. You can see a mass in the superior orbit there, which is along the superior rectus LPS complex, resulting in ptosis and also an anterior orbital mass. When we did a superficial biopsy, we got, uh, of course, a diagnosis that was lymphoproliferative lesion, benign reactive lymphoid hyperplasia. The same patient showed polyclonality on immunohistochemistry. When the deep biopsy was analyzed, it was confirmed that it was extranodal marginal zone lymphoma and it was monoclonal on immunohistochemistry. Suppose we were to do only superficial biopsy in this patient, we would think that this patient uh, has a benign reactive lymphoid hyperplasia and possibly treat with steroids. Whereas now that lymphoma is con confirmed, he needs external beam radiation. So this is the same patient following EBRT, his lesion is regressed. Now this is a patient who presented with conjunctival chemosis and redness for several weeks. And Sorry to know, interrupt, sir, once again. Mm -hmm. uh, again, the slide has been stuck. Uh, Feroz, ma'am, can you see the slide which sir? No, sir, sir, sir I think, uh, uh, yeah, so the, the previous slides are being seen, sir. Can you just change the slide? Can you just click and see? Is it seen? No, now there is, it's not moving at all. Yeah, on the immunohistochemistry yeah. slide. Ah, it's, now so, it is. The MRI is visible now. Right, I don't know why is that happening. Never had this problem, new problem. There's a lag in, as you speak also. Hmm? There's a lag as you speak also. We are seeing it's not your mouth, your voice and mouth are actually not syncing in a way. Maybe you can uh, you can stop your video, like your video, and just speak. Probably sometimes yeah. it helps yeah. with Zoom. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. yeah. Or is it your fancy marker? No, 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 no. I use it all the time. I, I have so many Zoom meetings. Okay. This is the first experience of this sort. Anyway, let me share again. Maybe you can keep your video. Uh... It's okay. It doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll put off my video. Let me see. Otherwise, we'll skip this talk and we can move on to the next lecture. Is it seen now? Yes. Yes, sir. Is it moving? It is. Okay. So this was the young, uh, I mean, elderly patient that I was talking about, 42-year-old male who presented with conjunctival congestion and chemosis. And which was not responding to antibiotics, he was thought to have an orbital abscess. And that is the cavity that you see in the deep orbit. Superficial biopsy showed minimum inflammation and fibrosis. When we went deep, we could get xanthogranulomatous inflammation and necrobiosis. So when we went further deep, we found that it was orbital actinomycosis. So we could have missed the diagnosis if we were to be just superficial and midzonal in this patient. In the same patient, after having been treated with uh, antibiotics, that is benzyl penicillin, he completely recovered over a period of time. Now this was a young adult with uh, bilateral uh, displacement of the eyeball laterally. So basically, he has developed an acquired telecanthus because of a midline lesion, which is asymmetrical more on the left side and less on the right side. You can see the extensiveness of the lesion. He is immunocompetent and is absolutely asymptomatic except for the displacement and recently has developed a slight deterioration of vision on the left side because of optic nerve compression. So here, superficial biopsy showed inflammation and fibrosis. Are we seeing the slides now moving well? Yes, sir, they are moving well. Deep biopsy showed granulomatous inflammation and multinucleate giant cells. And on specific stain on histopathology, that is GMS stain, we could uh, see fungal elements. And it was confirmed a case of fungal granuloma in an immunocompetent individual and the same patient after being treated with antifungals. So we could have again missed the diagnosis and thought it was uh, nonspecific orbital inflammation if you were to only do a superficial biopsy. This is a patient with a medial orbital lesion along the medial rectus muscle. You can see that it is an isodense lesion relatively so. Superficial biopsy showed dense fibrosis with minimal inflammation. Deep biopsy showed perivascular granuloma, which was suggestive of vaginal granulomatosis. So this patient had a specific cause for her orbital inflammation. So summarizing all the uh, 
experience that we have had over several years, I would say that pediatric or adult round cell tumors, peripheral biopsy shows only inflammation with fibrosis, and intermediate zone actually shows the tumor, and the deep zone shows necrosis because round cell tumors have a typical pre preponderance to undergo tumor necrosis. So it is the intermediate zone, that's red zone, that shows the tumor. And in any case, we have to do multi-layered biopsy and you'll pick up all the layers. In case of lymphoma, the deep zone shows the tumor. Intermediate zone can also a tumor, show a tumor, but the peripheral zone, the yellow zone, shows benign or atypical lymphoid hyperplasia if it is a lymphoma in evolution. In granulomatous inflammation of non-infective etiology, Peripheral zone often shows only fibrosis. Intermediate zone shows non-specific inflammation, whereas the deep zone shows classic characteristics of specific, specific etiology, such as uh, vaginal granulomatosis. Fungus in an immunocompetent individual, only the deep zone shows the fungus, whereas the superficial shows peripheral uh, fibrosis and the intermediate zone shows inflammation. In orbital tuberculosis, again, it is the intermediate zone that shows the pathology, whereas deep zone shows necrosis and the periphery shows fibrosis. So, uh, in uh, several patients, I would say about 15 to 20% of patients, the various layered biopsy is the one which clinches the diagnosis and just the superficial biopsy or a mid-zonal biopsy will not help. So in conclusion, I would say that in orbital biopsy, layered approach is very important superficial, intermediate, and deep beyond the epicenter. And the estimation of depth is based on imaging, CT or MRI, which would have done preoperatively, will tell you how deep you must go in a given case. And we must always con uh, collect a sample for microbiology and specific tests for histopathology and keep a sample reserve for PCR in case it is required based on the histopathology findings. And if you're worried that you may not have the right tissue plane or the right tissue and you have to close the case because of its bleeding, etc. then it's a good idea to get an intraoperative frozen section or imprint of uh, or squash uh, cytology to know whether you have reached the tissue of interest. This could be done intraoperatively. So if the diagnosis is very critical. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. That was a really wonderful uh, presentation and actually uh, insightful to know about the orbital biopsy. Uh, Dr. Lani sir has joined here in the presentation. Santosh. Santosh. Uh, yes, sir. Thank Good you day, very sir. much for uh, excellent scientific piece, uh, calling everybody, coordinating, and uh, such a, uh, organizing such a nice session. Thank, thank you, you very much, Santosh. And I, uh, I was uh, listening to you. Uh, it was a very, very, I think, uh, good talk. And uh, thank you very much, Santosh. Thank you, sir. And thank you for all the participants and all the faculty and uh, moderators, co-moderators and chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Go you. ahead. Uh, any, any questions from the panelists for the Santosh sir or any other talk before so, we sir, wind up? Yeah. I have a question mainly for the uh, listeners in the audience. So most of the time the question arises is what is the role of FNAB in orbital uh, tumors? Uh, would you want to tell us? FNAB has a very, very limited role. Only if you cannot do a biopsy for a specific reason, if its surgery is contraindicated or whatever, mm -hmm. then you have a role for FNAC because pathologists generally won't get much of tissue to be able to do immunohistochemistry reliably or look at the architecture of the tumor. In tumor, there are two components which are important, not just the cells, but the architecture in which these cells are located and the surrounding uh, reaction. So if you want to get all of that, then an open biopsy is mandated. So, and now regarding uh, the approach of biopsy, like, you know, I have learned from you, especially from, you know, lacrimal gland adenoid cystic carcinoma, where now we, you know, uh, we use the uh, multimodal treatment protocol where you go and actually take an incision biopsy. Right. So uh, in order to prevent the spillage of the tumor, you know, recurrence, what is the extra precaution that you take in such situation? Any patient where you plan to perform chemotherapy and radiation are addition, as additional treatment, adjuvant treatment, you have to have a 
uniplanar biopsy. Uniplanar incision is the one where you make your incision directly on the area where you're going to take biopsy from. For example, if there is a lacrimal gland tumor and you go with a lid crease incision with the only purpose of debulking or doing an incisional biopsy that is detrimental to the patient because then you would have seeded the tumor in the subcutaneous plane, suborbicularis plane, the septum, everything. So it is impossible for a radiation oncologist to plan to give radiation in such a patient. And these patients do recur in various tissue planes. So it is always a good idea to make an incision right on top of the tumor. That is subpro incision or a lateral subpro incision for a lacrimal gland tumor to reach the area of interest directly without passing through multiple tissue layers. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, that was a really nice session. Uh, thank you, the panelists. Thank you, Mayesh, sir. Uh, thank you, Vairuz, ma'am. Thank you, uh, Chinmay, ma'am, everyone. And uh, with this, we will move on to the last session in the uh, Oculoplasty Symposium today. And uh, I will call the panelists. Uh, the moderator for the session is Dr. Swati Zawad. Welcome, ma'am. Yes, I am there. Ma'am, over to you, ma'am, for the present. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everybody. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah. yeah, we are starting with the last session of uh, today's symposium on oculoplasty, uh, which is on orbit. The chairman for this session is Dr. Usha Kim, who needs no introduction. She is the head of the oculoplasty department at uh, Swati, ma'am, you, you need to unmute yourself. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Usha Kim, who is heading the department of oculoplasty in Arvindaya Hospital. Then the Dr. Dave, she is the convener for this session, who is the head of the orbit services at LB Prasad Eye Hospital. And Dr. Savari Desai, who is the co-convener, who is heading the department of plastic in PD Hindu Eye Hospital. We regret to say that Pramila Mohan, uh, who is the co-chairman for this, this session, is not joining because of demise of his mother. And our condolences are with him. I request Dr. Kim to say a few words and take over the session. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a wonderful meeting and so well organized with all the areas of interest put in place. So thank you, BOA and Dr. Sumit and Santosh in particular. Both of you have done an excellent work in putting together all these uh, topics. And I think it's of great relevance today. And uh, all of you stay safe. Everybody is being attacked left, right and center. Let's all be healthy and stay safe. Prayers for everybody and wishes to all. So let's start off the session. Over to you. So the first speaker for today is uh, Dr. Raksha Rao and she will be talking on orbital imaging, how and what to request in this orbit section. Dr. Raksha Rao has done her fellowship uh, with uh, Dr. Santosh now at Center for Sight, then uh, at the Wilsa Institute and then at present, she's working in Nara Netral as consultant. Over to you, ma'am. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Sumit. Uh, so I'll be starting on orbital imaging, how and what to request. So of all the imaging modalities that is currently available for imaging orbit, the utility of radiography is very limited. While CT scan is the most widely used diagnostic modality, the usefulness of MRI, DSA, and ultrasonography for the identification, diagnosis, and monitoring of an orbital lesion is very, very important. Uh, in certain situations, there is no gray area as to what modality will you prefer. For example, in this patient with a history of cylinder blast injury where you are expecting an intraorbital uh, metallic foreign body, an MRI is absolutely contraindicated. A CT scan will not only confirm the diagnosis of uh, a metallic foreign body, but an actual coronal and a sagittal section will determine the exact location of the foreign body. And that is exactly how you order for a CT scan, an actual coronal two millimeter cuts with a sagittal reconstruction. In cases of traumatic optic neuropathy, you would prefer asking the radiologist for one millimeter cuts because you need to see any bony fragment or soft tissue impingement in the orbital apex that is compressing on the optic nerve. 
While you deal with cases of orbital fracture, along with this regular CT cuts, you also ask for a bony window, which highlights the bony details, and also for a 3D reconstruction, which provides an overview of the bony pathology that can simulate an intra-op finding. A 3D reconstruction is also useful in uh, studying shallow orbit and its implication on the orbital tissues. For example, in developmental anomalies, as in this case of craniosynostosis. However, in such cases, you also request for an MRI to study the health of the optic nerve. CT orbit is also useful in determination of all sorts of, uh, all cases of shallow orbit. Uh, for example, this case of osteopetrosis, where the CT orbit shows increased orbital uh, uh, bony mass. Um, in all cases of uh, orbital masses, a CT orbit is requested along with CT, uh, along with contrast. For example, this elderly lady who presented with periorbital edema, the CT orbit is an irregular mass within the orbit. On contrast, there is appearance of dilated superior ophthalmic wing, which, uh, with which we can conclude the diagnosis that this particular orbital lesion is in arteriovenous malformation and a sudden thrombosis within this orbital mass has led to the current picture. So while CT is the workhorse of the orbit, an MRI is a problem-solving technique. This young lady who presented with mild periorbital edema, the CT scan showed a punched out uh, lesion within the bone and a surrounding uh, inflammation as is seen by this fat stranding. Uh, Provisional diagnosis of a ruptured dermoid was made. However, due to atypical presentation, an MRI was ordered, and uh, an MRI on T2 showed the lesion to be hypo, uh, hypo intense, which is not consistent with how a fat containing dermoid lesion would look. So the lesion was guessed, second guessed to be an eosinophilic granuloma, which was later confirmed on histopathology. On, uh, an MRI is also very useful in evaluating any orbital lesion which is multispatial and irregular, like a lymphangioma, where a CT orbit shows a very irregular mass lesion, and an MRI characterizes the lesion very well with this fluid-fluid level, which is pathognomic of an uh, orbital lymphangioma. MRI orbit is very useful in thyroid eye disease because it not only shows enlarged extraocular muscles with the typical tendon sparing, but it also shows hyperintense edematous muscle in an active disease, which is very useful in disease monitoring and treatment. MRI orbit is the uh, um, diagnosis of diagnostic modality of choice in ocular and orbital retinoblastoma because it can uh, diagnose uh, subtle uh, NVI, subtle in optic nerve uh, involvement, the sleral breach and orbital extension, extensive optic nerve involvement that can include the, and extend into the chiasma, causing a supracellar cisternal mass. Now we see in COVID times, the mucormycosis has really, really become very rampant and uh, an MRI along with MRA is the diagnosis modality of choice because it not only shows all the uh, tissue changes, in, uh, including involvement of extraocular muscles, but NMRA can also exactly say into which vessel has uh, the mucor invaded. For example, this patient who presented with a CRO picture on MRA turned to have not only central retinal artery obstruction, but also an ophthalmic artery occlusion. MRI with DSA is the modality of choice for all arteriovenous malformation, which not only shows dilated superior ophthalmic vein, but the DSA also confirms this into exactly where the arteriovenous malformation is located. So when you ask for an MRI, uh, with the radiologist, you need not mention what sequences exactly you, you're looking for because a radiologist can definitely provide you the sequences based on the study and how the lesion is. Okay, so sorry about that. Yeah, so um, so and a communication with the radiologist is very important because you need to tell what you're expecting from the image so that it can be translated into the uh, a report that can help you narrow the differential diagnosis, prognosticate before biopsy, and help in counseling the patient.
Lastly, ultrasound of the orbit, although not very useful in diagnosing an orbital mass, but it is definitely valuable for intraocular pathology. For um, the for ultrasound, the main uh, uh, utility in orbital uh, imaging is for probably cysticercosis for monitoring the treatment. Here, as you see, the ultrasound shows a scolex with a well-defined uh, wall, and on treatment, the scolex has disappeared, and then sequentially uh, the wall has collapsed, and finally the entire lesion has gone. So, of uh, in summary, imaging how and what to request. It basically depends on the anatomy of interest, the orbital pathology that you're lo looking at and are expecting the region to be turned out to be. And finally, also it also depends on how familiar you are with that particular diagnostic modality. In summary, you can say that for all orbital uh, masses, a CT with or without contrast is adequate in most of the lesions. MRI is used as a problem-solving technique for lesion of uncertain tissue of origin and those which have an atypical appearance on CT scan. So that's all for now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raksha, ma'am. That was a really nice talk summarizing all the uh, imaging modalities and their indication. I have one small question for you. Uh, in case of uh, you have a uh, suspected small AV malformations in the okay. eye, uh, okay. what do you prefer as an imaging modality? Is it MRI, uh, angio you go ahead with or uh, you suspect uh, uh, or you directly go ahead with the DSA or CT contrast? What What is the modality that you prefer? Uh, no. So for any arteriovenous malformation, like I already mentioned, an MRA is the most useful technique. And because some of these lesions are not just limited in the eyelid, but can they also extend into the orbit? And when you're treating an AV uh, malformation, you must make sure that all the feeding arteries are closed. So if you just treat the eyelid lesion, that would not be sufficient. It would lead to recurrence of the lesion in case there is an orbital component. So definitely an MRA for such patients. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, any, que any questions from the panelists? Okay. Uh, Ucha, ma'am, can we move ahead? Sorry. Uh, ma'am, can we go ahead with the second talk? Yes, please. Yes, please. I think that was an excellent overview. So we can move on to the next talk. Yeah, please. Next talk is by Dr. Ramesh Murthy, sir, on orbital infections. Uh, sir, can you please share your screen? Uh, Raksha, ma'am, you want to stop sharing. Uh, technical team, can you help stop sharing uh, the ongoing screen? Technical team. Uh, Ramesh Murthy sir, are you able to share the screen? Uh, uh, yeah, now I'll be able to share the screen. Yes. Yeah. Um, Ramesh Murthy sir, are you able to share the screen? Ramesh is a prolific oculoplasty and uh, uh, squint surgeon. Uh, and uh, he goes all over from district to district, from Pune to Ahmednagar, covering more than half of the Maharashtra. Uh, he will be talking about orbital infections today. Sir, we are not able to see the screen yet. Yeah, now we can. Sir. One moment. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Sumit, uh, Dr. Honavar, sir, and uh, the entire organizing team of BOA for organizing such a wonderful conference and giving us the opportunity to talk. So I'll be talking about orbital infections, tips to diagnosis. So first of all, the pathogenesis. Uh, am I audible and is the screen clear? Very much. So first of all, talking about the pathogenesis, so this could happen by direct inoculation. So trauma, surgery, or orbital foreign bodies. Hematogenous spread because of sepsis or bacterial endocarditis. And again, through the facial venous system because it has many anastomoses and it is valveless. It could also be because of extension from adjacent structures like preceptal cellulitis, pharynx, middle ear, facial skin, nose, lacrimal gland, or the teeth. 
So here you can see in brief the various bones that uh, make up the orbital walls and how it is very well connected to the uh, region of the nose uh, and behind through the inferior and the superior orbital fissures and the optic canal. So these are all potential sources of infection which can enter the orbit. So when a patient presents like this, uh, we want to first classify the patient into a specific category so that we can do an effective treatment for the patient. So our classification is group one preceptal cellulitis where the infection is very anterior, group two where it involves the orbit, that is uh, orbital cellulitis, and group three is uh, superior slapses, group four is an orbital abscess, and group five is the worst uh, case scenario that is a cavernous sinus thrombosis. So in preceptal cellulitis, there is definitely edema of the lids, there's inflammation, and sometimes preceptal cellulitis can become an orbital cellulitis. So when a child presents like this, we first want to look inside and make sure that there is no proptosis, the ocular movements are full, there's no pupillary involvement, the vision is maintained. So this is a classic case of preceptal cellulitis. Again, one more patient who presents with a more severe kind of presentation, but again, when you look inside, everything is good. He just has a preceptal cellulitis, which can be treated on an outpatient basis. But when a patient develops orbital cellulitis, he has other problems like visual loss, chemosis, limited ocular motility, and he's more systemically toxic. So this lady you can see here uh, has uh, chemosis, there is proptosis, there is ophthalmoplegia. You can see on the, uh, on the uh, scan that there is uh, inflammation behind the orbit. Again, one more patient who presents with severe orbital infection as well as a presence of corneal involvement infection inside the eye as well as so panophthalmitis. So how do we differentiate between preceptal versus orbital? Preceptal has got lid edema. There are no orbital signs. But in orbital cellulitis, we have got possible involvement of the various cranial nerves. There could be proptosis, visual impairment. Patient will have fever and other problems like leukocytosis. Sometimes you have this kind of presentation of a subperiosteal abscess where there is pus collection between the orbital bony wall and the periosteum. Here there is limitation of ocular motility and there is a directional proptosis. So in the picture, you can see the ethmoid sinus and a small subperiosteal collection which is extending into the orbit. This patient has got a superior subperiosteal abscess which can be very clearly seen on the MRI scan. So we go ahead and just make an incision and you can see the pus coming out and he recovers beautifully with oral antibiotics. So orbital abscess has a more severe presentation as compared to a subperiosteal abscess. There is ptosis, proptosis, visual loss, internal and external osteoplasia, and forehead anesthesia. So this gentleman had an abscess on the temporal side of the orbit. And you can see it on the CT scan very clearly and there's limitation of abduction in the left eye. And then we drain this abscess and he recovers beautifully with the oral antibiotics. So we need to differentiate between a subperiosteal versus an orbital abscess. A subperiosteal abscess is much more slower in progression. There is a limitation of ocular motility, usually directional proptosis, may or may not have chemosis, not much visual impairment, but the orbital abscess got severe proptosis, systemic toxicity, there could be ophthalmoplegia, and the patient may have an orbital apex syndrome where there is not only uh, involvement of the cranial nerves, but also the vision can get affected. The most important thing that we need to recognize is the cavernous sinus thrombosis, which affects about 1% of cases of orbital cellulitis, which has a high mortality. The reason you can see here that the cavernous sinus is just right behind the orbit and all the major veins are communicating with the cavernous sinus. So when a patient has cavernous sinus thrombosis, he presents with headache, high fever, he's toxic. There is periorbital edema, proptosis, chemosis, paralysis of eye movements, and it could be bilateral. The pathognomonic feature is the presence of cranial nerve four or sixth involvement. So the sequence is usually orbital cellulitis, which goes on to develop into cavernous sinus thrombosis. And these are the patients who actually need a lot of anticoagulation therapy. So here you can see this patient who has severe sinusitis, infection in the sinuses, and he has developed a cavernous sinus thrombosis with a severely toxic state who needs a hospital admission. So these kind of infections of the orbit are more common in males and more common in adults. So when we are confronted with such a case, our approach should be to find what is the source of infection, try to find out the risk factors and try to find out where exactly is the infection. If there is loss of eyesight, we think of the orbit, the cavernous sinus or the cranial uh, central nervous system. If this forehead paresthesia, we think of the cavernous sinus or the posterior orbit. If it's bilateral, we think of the cavernous sinus or a more posterior involvement like the brain is involved. And vision loss could be because of various causes like corneal damage, raised intraocular pressure, thrombophlebitis, CRAO, or optic neuritis. Risk factors include, if there's slow onset, it could be a 
fungal kind of infection, syphilis or tuberculosis. In HIV patients, cryptococcosis and toxoplasmosis are more common. The diabetes mellitus patients generally end up with having a more severe kind of disease like a mucormycosis. Travel could also be a reason which could give rise to different kinds of parasitic infections. And patients who have leukemia, lymphoma, renal transplant or who are on deferoxamine therapy can develop conditions like mucormycosis or aspergillosis. So we need to identify what is the source of infection, the sinuses, the teeth, or it is a dacrocystitis, or it is surgeries, foreign body, animal bites. So once we know what is the source of infection, we want to know whether it is preceptal, it is orbital, or it is retroorbital. We want to look at the nasal and the oral mucosa. We look at, look at the vital signs of the patient, also do a cardiac examination to rule out endocarditis. So there are various causes like Staphylococcus aureus, Streptococcus, MRSA, or Haemophilus influenzae, which can give rise to infection. The systemic investigations would include a complete blood count with differential and blood cultures if needed. CT is useful because we can look at the bone, but more useful is an MRI scan, which is better soft tissue visualization. A contrast enhanced MRI is always better. We can look at the cavernous sinus, look for cavernous sinus thrombosis. We can also do a diffusion weighted imaging to differentiate from tumors, hematoma, ischemia, and infarction. A nasopharyngeal endoscopy is especially useful if you are looking for mucormycosis and series of analysis for looking for various kinds of infections of the brain. The management differs between preceptal and orbital uh, infections. Preceptal we can manage with oral antibiotics, anti-inflammatories, steroids to prevent an inflammation. And usually we manage it with a combination of amoxicillin 500 milligrams with clavulanic acid 125 milligrams. Orbital cellulitis needs IV antibiotics. And with newer antibiotics like linozolid, uh, this responds better. Children also need to be treated in consult with a pediatrician. So we give IV medication till there is good improvement or the eye appears normal and then we switch over to oral medication for a longer period. We give nasal decongestants if necessary and if you feel that there is an abscess then surgical drainage is the treatment of choice. For cavernous sinus thrombosis apart from the antibiotics we also need to give anticoagulants and possibly steroids. So the prognosis is quite bad when there is severe orbital cellulitis or cavernous sinus thrombosis because that carries nearly 50% mortality. Vision loss could be because of neurotrophic keratitis, glaucoma, optic neuritis, or central retinal artery occlusion. Mucormycosis will be covered by one of our speakers. So two words about parasitic infections. Cystisocosis luckily has become very uh, less frequent now. So in this, uh, it is a tinea solium larval form, which actually affects the various uh, parts of the eye. Uh, usually it affects the conjunctiva, the eyelids, the muscles, and we want to look for the larval form of the scolex on the ultrasound or on the CT scan. It can affect the extraocular muscles to a great extent and it responds beautifully to oral medication. Here you can see the ultrasound B scan which shows the scolex of the cyst uh, inside the, uh, behind the eye. So treatment is albendazole and if along with oral steroids and if there is neurocystic psychosis, possibly praziquantel and if it's lying in the vitreous, then a vitrectomy. Echinococcosis or hydrate disease, again in humans are the intermediate host. Here also patient could present with proptosis, exposure keratitis, optic atrophy or blindness. And it could be monocystic or it could be multicystic. Again, diagnosis based on uh, ultrasound, CT and MRI. And therapy is surgical removal and giving the patient albendazole or mebendazole. Dr. Again, a, yes, I'm just last slide. Rhinospirid is again a rare condition. And it, it's a mucocutaneous disease. Sometimes we, we do encounter this in the orbit as polypoidal growth. So in summary, in any case of orbital infection, it is very important to differentiate between the milder preceptal variety and the more severe orbital variety. We need to find out what is the cause of infection or what is the source of infection or where it has actually spread from. And you have to give the appropriate management for these cases to get a good outcome. Thank you once again. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Kimman would you like to have any remarks? Yeah, I think that it, this was an excellent overview and summarizing all the important and relevant points and the tips to manage. But one thing I'd like to emphasize is there are a lot of times that people uh, pump in antibiotics in cases of abscess, which is something very wrong for the patient. It forms an antibioma, becomes very difficult to manage later. That is one aspect that we need to definitely emphasize. When you do an imaging and you see an abscess, it has to be drained and not treated just with antibiotics. The other thing is the role of steroids. 
Steroids is very important in cellulitis and it is important that we start simultaneously or a day after the antibiotics is uh, started in order to minimize the post, uh, the sequelae of the fibrosis and other aspects. So it's very, very important that we do that. And again, the parasitic infestations, it is based on the geographic area. We have, uh, we still have a lot of cysticercosis to deal with and rhinosporidiosis, especially in Kerala the belt, there is a lot of rhinosporidiosis. Again, it's geographic. So we, I think it's a great uh, presentation sharing all the aspects. And I think we learned from a lot from this. Thanks, uh, Dr. Ramesh. Thank you, madam. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Sunil Morekar, who will be giving uh, his experience of mucormycosis, which has created a havoc nowadays of post-COVID. So over to uh, Dr. Sunil Morekar. Sunil Morekar, sir, are you there? Yeah. I'll just uh, start my presentation. Is it showing? Yes, yes, it is. I thank the organizers, uh, especially Dr. Uh, Lahane, Sumit, and uh, Agni Madam for uh, giving me this opportunity to share my experience uh, across eight hospitals in two cities. Uh, I have been working as a diabetic eye care committee member for uh, quite some time, and we've been talking about uh, issues with uh, uh, diabetic eye beyond uh, uh, retinopathy. And mucormycosis is definitely uh, something that we've been talking about. Uh, as a fallout of uh, COVID, yes, uh, uh, a lot of people have been talking about this. There have been a lot of uh, news reports and uh, people have been talking about it as if uh, there is a next uh, pandemic coming in. I'd be more worried about uh, uh, Candida auris uh, as, as the next pandemic rather than uh, mucormycosis. The preparedness in many aspects of COVID, uh, uh, there are uh, roughly around 1,000 uh, ACCM accredited, accredited CME credit hours which I have uh, accrued around uh, in the last one and a half years. There's one uh, international COVID conference. There's another Stanford COVID conference which is coming in if, in case anybody is interested. Because when you treat something like mucormycosis, you want to know all aspects of the uh, uh, COVID uh, in terms of uh, what all it can affect in uh, uh, the body and how it helps mucormycosis and how uh, mucormycosis is synergistic with it. Uh, so uh, as uh, uh, I, I would stand right next to uh, uh, Dr. V.K. Paul, uh, I have met him and we've discussed a couple of things. Uh, as he says, there's no big outbreak. I would agree to it. The mucormycosis incidence has definitely increased, but it's, it's marginal compared to the number of cases of COVID which we're seeing. There's no big outbreak, but statistically, uh, it is uh, uh, more than what it was last year, but not uh, very high. Uh, so I'm showing uh, my experience across eight hospitals across Mumbai and now in Mumbai. Uh, what, what we've been uh, keeping in mind is that uh, most of the times what you really want to see is that you want to follow evidence-based medicine and not go into eminence-based, uh, vehemence-based or eloquence-based uh, or, or diffidence or confidence or nervousness or uh, um, defensive medicine and trying to deal with the patient. Uh, it is evidence and what you apply that evidence in the real world. So the real world data is what is important. So it's, here's my real world data. So what are the lessons learned? I have selected uh, 15 points. There are a lot of cases which you've had over 31, over 13 months, eight corporate hospitals. Almost all the patients were male, two females. The mean age is 61. The mean sugar as expected. All patients had ketoacidosis. One had a CRAO bilaterally, one Garson syndrome. Uh, Retrobulbar amphotericin was used by us. And four plus posaconazole and in select cases, uh, evasoconazole was used. Two exentrations so far. So this is, this is something that is important. All except three, three patients who died are presently, all of them are alive except those three. But two are still more critical, so you might have a, a, a death rate of 5 out of uh, 31, which is uh, pretty high. Uh, one is lost to follow up after one month, but uh, what I gather is, is he's doing uh, well at another place. What we need to keep in mind is uh, the concept of uh, microbiome. So we talk about microbiome, but uh, we now probably need to look at microbiomes and uh, viromes in our body. So uh, they, they would probably be there with us all the time, and the minute our immunity goes down, the viromes would uh, uh, have an upper hand or the mycobiomes would have an upper hand. Uh, so as uh, Nicholas Money stated, uh, the spores are everywhere. By the time I finish the statement, uh, maybe you inhaled a lot of them. So what are the uh, uh, lessons that we have learned? Uh, the lessons we have learned is that the grading and scoring is important before we rush into uh, uh, exentration because I get a lot of calls saying that mucomycosis, please come and exentrate. So uh, that's that's not the be-all and the end-all of it. There, there are multiple things involved. You have to grade the mucomycosis and score it. And uh, this is a scoring system we use, which has been developed by uh, Dr. Renuka Brado from uh, Sion Hospital. So uh, you have uh, vision, pupil, ocular, uh, ocular motility, proptosis, and intracranial spread. And you grade that from 0, 2, and 3. 
and uh, based on whether it is normal or there's decreased vision of blindness, RAPD or fixed pupils, uh, extraocular muscles or completely fixed eyeball. And then you look at fundus changes and you look at imaging changes. And you give a score to each one of this. And based on the scoring system, patients who cross a score of 23 are definitely eligible for uh, orbital excentration. Uh, but uh, the uh, ENT and the ophthalmologist, at least two ophthalmologists have to agree to it. Lesson number two we learned was that uh, it's not necessary that if you have mucormycosis, you won't have anything else. We have had a patient who has mucor plus aspergillus in the same patient in the sinus. Sometimes you might have mucormycosis in the eye and you might have uh, candida oris in the uh, urinary tract. You might have aspergillus in the lungs. So you've got to be careful about what you do. So you have to look at multiple modalities which you will look at. One of the things that helps you is uh, galactomannan and uh, BD glucan. So, uh, galactomannan is a polysaccharide component of aspergillus, which is released into the body, and uh, serum uh, uh, galactomannan assay has been used for supervising early detection and timely diagnosis in patients who are neutropenic. So, uh, this is something that you look at. You also look at beta uh, uh, D glucan, and uh, this, when this is high, uh, it's usually uh, aspergillus and not mucor, but definitely when this is uh, high, and then people come and tell me, Sunil, this is aspergillus, this is not mucor. And I said that not necessarily, it's just that the cell wall of aspergillus is there, you may have a coexisting uh, infection at all. So a positive does not rule out mucormycosis, but a positive definitely tells you that there is aspergillus there in that case. Lesson number three, early endoscopy and biopsy is a must, 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 must. Because there are cases in which uh, we missed it on a, a swab and then when we look at the biopsy and the biopsy sent to the histopathologist shows you the mucor and the swab and the culture has not showed it. So you might catch it much earlier if you've taken a small biopsy and picked up and seen. Also, what you see at that point that when you take the biopsy and it does not bleed, that tells you at that point of time that this is probably mucromycosis. Uh, the endoscopy is extremely important. This is this is something that we've done the endoscopically uh, excentration and we looked at the uh, surface. So ENT and ophthalm together makes a lot of sense. Uh, uh, we, we have to keep our egos aside and work together. We don't have to keep our uh, uh, specialties demarcated. We've all got to get together, get the neurologist involved, get the neurosurgeon involved, get the microbiologist, uh, the pathologist, the uh, radiologist, everybody involved, and then uh, you uh, work together with the critical care person, trying to figure out whether you can up the antifungal and prevent an excentration or down the antifungal, go ahead and straight do an excentration. The uh, lesson number four that we learned was amphotericin B retro orbital is something that works. Uh, in, in this case here, you would see that there is a cannula which has been put into the nose, into the uh, orbital cavity. So from this, this is Dr. Milin Naulake who has done this. That's an excellent idea he's done that you put in a cannula there. So instead of giving a BD injection of retroorbital amphotericin B, you just flush it with the uh, amphotericin B twice a day for five days. And then you realize that you don't even need to do an excentration. So uh, in a lot of cases that he has treated, he has ended up doing only one excentration. So most of the patients he's been able to save uh, without any excentration. Uh, lesson number four is that when you see something like this, a fixed dilated pupil and a proptosis, you have to understand that the prognostication is bad. There are some cases in which the prognosis is so bad that you know that even after you do an excentration, the patient is not going to be alive. So you need to tell this to the patient's relative because they think that you did an eyeball. They are told that you remove the eyeball and the patient will be saved. You tell them the eyeball we are trying to take out and this patient is not going to live anyways because the prognostication says that even the excentration will not help. patient may decide not to do an excentration. Uh, the other co-infections that we have seen in this uh, uh, pandemic era is that there is mucor and uh, tuberculosis co-infection. So we've seen a patient with uh, something like this, and uh, uh, this is this is a patient without an excentration has got better with the tuberculosis as well as uh, mucor infection, and uh, uh, this is done with uh, uh, rigorous uh, debridement and uh, a lot of retroorbital uh, amphotericin. So uh, retroorbital amphotericin B does not give you the uh, problems which uh, you have with. Uh, uh, corona gives you an AKI or an acute kidney injury and uh, there you are uh, stuck with not giving uh, systemic medications because you don't want to spoil the kidney. Uh, here you would see that uh, you see all scans, you see that uh, there is a little uh, uh, cranial lesion there and when you look at it, uh, the cranial lesion is huge uh, and, and that is a tuberculoma and not a mucormycosis. And uh, you need to get all the uh, sections, you need uh, sagittal, coronal and the same and look at it uh, at, uh, from uh, a 3D view even for the imaging. Uh, uh, the prognosis is good, even if the mucormycosis is combined with tuberculosis, this is something that we know, but uh, we need not uh, quote this to the patient because with COVID, with tuberculosis, with mucormycosis, we know that the results may be bad, though one patient of ours has uh, survived and done uh, very well. What we also want to see is most of the time people send me a picture like this and uh, from the COVID ward and say, okay, sir, uh, this is it and opine. I, I would like to open the eye, I, I would have to look, the, look at the fundus and you can't tell me to opine on a... Uh, uh, 
a particular case without uh, opening up the eye. So there are times when they open up the eye. Here you see that the patient himself is opening up the eye and you will see that there is paranoia and there is fungal infection even in his nails. So uh, the lesson number six that we learned was uh, neurotrophic ulcer occurs uh, if there is trigeminal uh, involvement or uh, ciliary ganglion involvement with the uh, fungus itself and the frozen group or while you are trying to do an endoscopic clearance, you might end up injuring the uh, ganglion and you might get a neurotrophic ulcer. Lesson number seven, retrobulbar works. Retrobulbar works extremely well. You see the patient has got a lot of proptosis and uh, post retrobulbar vision saved and the patient is gone. Retrobulbar endoscopically works still better. So that is a dose, one ml of 3.5 milligrams per ml after retrobulbar injection of anesthetic. You expect a lot of inflammation after this and a yellow chemosis for one, one week, but you will see the patient's GC improving and the patient getting much better. There are multiple case reports and uh, uh, series there. Uh, ours is a case series of roughly around uh, 10 patients who have uh, uh, done very well with retrobulbar injection. This is something that we have presented uh, before the uh, uh, this thing at uh, ESOPUS, where we are talking about uh, orbital uh, uh, mucormycosis without uh, excentration. Endoscopic retrobulbar is, is, this is the way you give it, you open up the ethmoid or you open up the area where uh, you handle mucormycosis, you take a bend needle and you inject it with there or you do the way Dr. Milin Navlake does, is he puts in a cannula. Uh, you have to be careful, you have to be extremely uh, well covered if you are going to do this uh, because uh, uh, you are uh, trying to uh, create a situation where there will be aerosols. Sometimes you might have bilateral involvement and those are the cases where you are going to do extremely bad even after you do anything for this patient. So you have to keep the relatives informed and tell them that this is something which is not uh, amenable to treatment. This is a patient from Koinur Hospital who has done extremely well with uh, retrobulbar uh, injections. There are other therapies available, there is cytokine therapy, but here you already have a cytokine th storm, so you can't give that. There are granulocyte transfusions. Sir, uh, will you please sum up, sir? Yeah, Sorry to interrupt. So, uh, lesson number nine is uh, evaconazole. Uh, isavaconazole, uh, the vital study has shown that uh, it works. In our cases, also it has worked. The role of iron, uh, you know that uh, serum, uh, so we noted the serum ferritin uh, when it precipitately falls, that is when on the 15th or the 20th day the patient gets the uh, access. Lesson number 11 is role of statins. You give the patient statins, these are the persons, the statins somehow also ends up being uh, uh, mucor uh, uh, destroying and there are lots of uh, uh, evidences and we have also found it. You know there are polymicrobial infections possible. One of our cases are hyperviscal mucus clepsiola pneumonia which is multidrug resistant. Uh, you always see the palate and you might see uh, viral infections also. The spread may be hemato hematogenous and not contiguous. So doing an excentration, take it out, take it out and the patient is saying, no, there might be spread even with the hematogenous. And that's Garson syndrome which we have seen where the mycelium grows along the cranial nerves or invasion of the leptomeninges. This is our case of uh, uh, Garson syndrome. It is spreading along the leptomeninges. So uh, uh, what we've seen, uh, it correlates with published literature, uh, especially Sumit's uh, paper and uh, uh, also uh, Dr. Gokhale's son. And uh, the, the limitation we have is there is missing data because patients are referred to us from rural data. So eventually, finally, what you know that the modern medical team has got a lot of things. You have, there are a lot of limitations. Uh, they, they manage much more better. I tell them if they go to JJ or to a municipal hospital because in private, there's a number of things involved are uh, huge. Uh, so that's, uh, that's about uh, what my experience is. Thank you. And that's my email address and uh, phone number in case anybody wants to get in touch. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for enlightening us on this uh burning topic for this uh, post-COVID. Uh, any comments from the uh, panelist, Dr. Saudi? would you like to add something? Madam? Yeah, um, uh, Sunil, I was excellently covered. So I think we've uh, all been seeing this and uh, being in a multi-speciality hospital, the first and the foremost thing I would say is your last line holds the most importance. It is a team effort to have a win-win situation. Otherwise, it really does not work. Um, having said that, I would probably concur with most of the lines of management you have spoken. Um, that yes, you need to do uh, you know uh, concurrent treatment. Fes is the first uh, you know way of debriding it. If you catch it early and you do fes, then I think it saves a lot of problems. If there's early orbital involvement and that's the message to mid orbit. You do not need to exenterate. Sometimes only systemic antifungals work. Even a tram is not required. Uh, but yes, in cases where we found where it's mid-orbit to approaching orbital apex, where systemic and uh, ampho lamb is not working, especially liposomal, or with combination of posoconazole, then in those cases you could, could and should definitely, and we have also started uh, giving, but we do choose our cases with caution for the uh, retroamphotericin B because, like you rightly said, we have to protect ourselves. 
and uh, it's not always a win-win situation to explain to the patients but uh, we are also tending to do less exenterations we are not keen on jumping into it but that's not the situation outside and i think what sunil said awareness is probably the way to go but in a team way thank you thank you ma'am our next speaker is dr mangesh who will be talking on bilateral orbital blowout fractures dr mangesh yeah My screen is visible. Yes, yes, it is visible. Am I audible? Yeah. So at the outside, I would like to thank organizers, uh, Dr. Lahani sir and the team for this wonderful session, and uh, thank you for giving me an opportunity to be part of this uh, amazing meeting. So I would like to speak on the white-eyed blood fracture. This is an easily overlooked entity. So we'll be discussing this topic uh, on this heading. What is this specifically? How is it different from the other orbital fracture? How does it get overlooked easily? What happens if it gets overlooked? When to operate? What is the surgical technique? Which implant to be used? What are the common complications? And what's the conclusion at the end? So what is this? So if you look at the orbital fractures as a whole, you can divide it into pure orbital fractures and the impure ones. Pure means it is the internal fractures not involving the rim and other associated fractures, but the impure involves all. So if you go even for the pure orbital fractures, then you will have uh, open trapdoor fractures and the closed trapdoor fractures. So open trapdoor fractures are specifically, these are the large floor fractures commonly found in adults. And the closed trapdoor fractures, these are basically the white eyed blood fractures. These are the linear or the minimally displaced fractures. So we have to closed trapdoor fractures. So what are the, what happens in these closed trapdoor fractures? These are commonly found in the pediatric group. There is no, actually even in spite of the history of the significant trauma, there will be no or minimal periorbital edema, subconjunct and hemorrhoid. So essentially there will be no signs of the orbital inflammation or no ocular signs at all. How is it different from the other orbital fractures? The fractures that commonly happen in the adults, that is the open trapdoor fractures. Here, the bones are actually mature, brittle, and less flexible. So it leads to the large floor fractures with a more herniation of the soft tissue than the entrapment. And there is a no muscle compartment syndrome, no associated edema, and there, are, there is associated edema and the hemorrhage. But what happens in the web of that is a white head blood fracture? It is commonly found in the pediatric population. Bones are relatively so far more flexible, and these stiffer fractures, there are the minimally displaced fractures with the flexible bones, they spring back into position, entrapping soft tissue and seconds. And so it causes muscle entrapment syndrome, and these are not associated with associated, uh, these are not associated with the edema, hemorrhage, subcutaneous and hemorrhage, periorbital edema. So, what are the clinical features? There is a significant mobility restriction due to the muscle entrapment associated with the diplopia, can have oculocardiac reflex, uh, causing a bradycardia and arrhythmia, nausea, omitting, syncopal attacks, and even a lethal result is, uh, leading to death in some of the cases. Why actually does it get easily overlooked initially? Because of the white eyes, no ocular signs, nausea, omitting, diplopia, and all these signs are most of the times they are ascribed to the head injury. How not to miss it? Simply by the full ophthalmic examination in all cases of the maxillofacial trauma, especially extraocular movements. These are often overlooked. If you take a look at this 23 years clerk, she had sustained injury at the age of six years. She was diagnosed to have a head injury, and the primary imaging, that is the CT brain, was normal and no evidence for the fracture. Similarly, this is a bus, bus conductor at the age of 33 years, injury at the age of 8 years. He has this diplopia, work difficulty, and the same scenario. Even if you okay, look at the clinical feature, this is a, a boy who has sustained blunt trauma five days back. There is a primary case, no problem, but there is a restriction of the elevation on the left side. Shell cuts, no orbital fractures, but the coronal cut shows a very minimal fracture in the floor causing infiltrators entrapment. It can have to the medial orbital wall also, this patient with the right face turn, and you can see there is uh, uh, no causes, no down and out actually, patient has left exotropia and limitation in adduction only. Abduction is normal. 
So this patient was diagnosed with a partial third nerve palsy, and on the axial closure cuts, you can see that there is an entrapment of the medial rectus muscle. So these fractures can occur in the medial wall as well as the floor fracture. What it gets overlooked, it can lead to the muscle compartment syndrome, leading to the ischemic injury and the muscle fibrosis, which can lead to the permanent dysfunction and ectopia even after the best possible intervention. So this has to be operated as early as possible, preferably within eight hours, because the late presentation can have a suboptimal outcome even of the best efforts. For the floor fractures, transcontinental chronic is incision with the lateral canthotomy. For the medial ones, trans these incisions are the direct, easy, hidden, and the cosmetically good one. So these are the transcontinental incisions. So you will open up into the and go and dissect into the retro uh, suborbicularis area and the preceptal plane. And in some of the cases, you will have to enlarge the fracture also to release the entire tissue. Use the silicone, these are the old photos. So I will also share the newer methods of uh, contoured silicone sheet. So FDT is done. And at the end, you will see there is only one suture at the lateral panthers, and patients can have a gratifying patient can show gratifying results if done timely. So this is the post transcontinental orbital flow fractures. There is a good restoration of the extraocular movements. Even in the medial one, this patient was accessed to the transcontinental approach, and the patient's screen also improved very well. And not only skin uh, and eruption or extraocular movements, but the patient had got his face turn also improved. <clears throat> so which implant basically used? No implant actually, their entire tissue gets released by just bending the flexible bones. It's in the early cases, that is by opening the trap door, you can release the all entire tissue. So no implant is required in those specific cases. But implant is required where fractures had, had to be enlarged to release the entire tissue and the chances of re-entrapment and the herniation are there. Variety of implant material is available like uh, Porous polyethylene, titanium, metcore plus titanium, nylon points, and the uh, novel bioresearchable uh, polycaprolactone that is osteomage. But my preferred choice is 1 mm silicon sheet because of its simplicity, fixity, low cost, and the minimal implant tissues. Now, this is the uh, contouring, or, or the, you can say how to make a template. This is a 1 mm silicon sheet. You have to make a turn of this. And if you uh, consider that this is the or fracture, then you have to intervene and this tongue has to oppose to the orbital rim so that it does not move and it gets fixed well to the orbital floor. So I have got uh, no, practically no implant issues with this particular type of the silicone sheets. So what are the complications? All other complications like uh, for orbital floor fracture repair are there, but just to find out, uh, this is not a complication basically, but the post-op early hypertrophy will always be there along with the periorbital edema, which will get resolved over a week or so. The important complication you can see is the suboptimal outcome, which is actually and most of the times is because of the late presentation and the local ischemic injury to the muscle. Now you can see in this case on the right side there is no evidence of the inferior rectus. Inferior rectus is not seen, it is there in the trap door and it's uh, totally uh, entrapped over there. This is a missing muscle syndrome. So this patient, if you see there is a missing muscle, then there is a guarded prognosis for the restoration of the extraocular muscle. So we restored and even after restoration patient had had some limitation of the up case and the um, show muscle shows the uh, muscle edema and the lateral vector muscle also shows some edema. So in conclusion, this is an important entity not to be missed at all. You need to have a simple thorough history of the clinical examination, including extraocular movements. You should keep very low threshold for the imaging, even if there is no ocular sign when the patient is presented with a nausea, omitting and the diplopia, especially CT orbits, coronal cuts. Proper preoperative counseling is much for the early surgery, especially because the parents, they are not really willing for the early surgery. And at the same time, they have to explain the consequences of the late surgery, no surgery, and the suboptimal outcomes if you do the delayed surgery. So timely surgery will have a gratifying outcome in most of the cases. Thank you very much for trying this thing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mangesh. It's a very precise and wonderful presentation.
now i would like to call upon dr dave for her for the next presentation dr dave yeah thank you so much for uh, having me here yeah uh, so meet uh, dr lahane sir dr ragini ma'am and dr honavar thank you so much for uh, allowing me me to be a part of uh, boa i'm going to talk to you about uh, secondary volume augmentation in anophthalmic sockets is my screen visible am i audible it is it is there no problem um so i have no financial disclosures to make and you will see full face photographs of some of my uh, patients for which we have the consent obtained um now when we talk of uh, socket surgery there are two prerequisites one is an ideal volume replacement and second is a customized ocular prosthesis and when both of these have been done right you can have a excellent outcome of socket surgery as you see in this gentleman who has a right prosthetic eye um when we are talking about volumetrics it's always good to get the volume right in the primary setting itself where actually when you are performing either your evisceration or enucleation uh, you sought for surgical strategies that allow you to place a relatively larger implant so that you do not end up with a sulcus deformity post operatively so if you look at these uh, two patients then i'm sorry about that okay so if you look at these two patients this is a lady who has an excellent volume replacement with a sulcus which is nice full symmetric to the other side no eyelid issues no lid retraction um and nothing at all that would suggest uh, you know that the left side is prosthetic versus a gentleman who's had a surgery done with a smaller implant and has uh, a superior sulcus deformity as you see over here with a little bit of uh, retraction of the lower eyelid so uh, this is when you have performed surgery in the primary sitting now what can you do uh, when you already are in a situation where you have some amount of volume deficit this is uh, a scenario where you can um, resort to one of the several surgical options as um, shown here pictorially and i'll take you through these one by one uh, this is a sort of a surgical uh, talk so if you can't see the videos please let me know now the first surgery here is a secondary implant and this is preferred when you do not have any implant in the anophthalmic socket so you'd want to put a ball implant in that situation and what is being done over here is meticulous dissection to raise three flaps the conjunctiva the anterior tenons and finally the posterior tenons and doing this sort of uh, opening up of the socket is extremely important you see the shiny glistening posterior tenons holding the intraconal fat over there once you've identified that cavity you put in your implant and you again repeat your closure in the same three layers which is your posterior tenons then the anterior tenons once you've closed the anterior tenons assess the conjunctiva if there is a surface loss you have the opportunity of augmenting the surface in the same sitting by performing conics formation sutures and harvesting a mucous membrane graft to give back the surface area that is lost um so here you are seeing the measurement being performed on the bed of the socket to raise a mucous membrane graft from the lip area this is a relatively older video and uh, now i've moved on to di dissecting without the use of a radio frequency cautery for socket surgeries and i'm definitely seeing better outcomes post operatively so once you have your mucous membrane graft harvested you can close the lip with an amniotic membrane graft and place in that graft in the bed of the socket to give you back the surface area that is uh, desirous and after this you do a standard closure uh, tying up all your sutures and placing a conformer and this gives you an excellent outcome post operatively as you see over here a patient sans implant and post implant uh, placed in a secondary manner um the mmg is this image is just to show you that they seamlessly take up with the residual conjunctiva and in a socket which has not been operated several times you get an excellent outcome with mucous membrane used as a substrate for surface area now a, a second surgery that can be done in this situation where you do not have an implant is a dermis fat graft and here again the initial steps are very similar This video will just show you the harvesting of the dermis fat graft, which can either be done from the buttock or the abdominal areas. You uh, make your markings based on the defect size that you get. You generally tend to um, oversize by about twenty to thirty percent. You remove the epidermis. You can shave it off with a blade, as you saw over here, or use one of the fancy burrs 
to uh, remove the skin and then harvest your graft which uh, has the dermis as well as the fat component and close the wound. While this does leave the patient with donor site morbidity in terms of a scar, um, uh, but it's very rewarding to operate dermis fat grafts since they tend to take up very nicely in uh, the socket, um, especially sockets that have not been operated uh, several times. Once you've harvested the graft, you anchor it to the surrounding conjunctiva and tenons. If you are in a position where you can get the extraocular muscles and suture it to the edges of the dermis fat graft, nothing like it. Those muscles provide the additional much required vascularity for the graft to take up. So these are the two surgeries that you would use in situations where uh, you have um, absolutely no implant within the socket and you tend to get very good postoperative uh, outcomes. Now, what about situations where you do have an implant, but they are slightly smaller? In such um, uh, situations, one another option is to put a second implant along the floor of the orbit. Uh, and I tend to reserve this uh, technique for those patients who have a smaller implant, which is also slightly uh, migrated inferiorly and is giving you a hypoglobic appearance of the prosthesis. So the surgery is fairly simple since the patient is anophthalmic, there is no globe to worry about. You expose your inferior uh, orbital rim and the floor in a standard fashion like how you do for a fracture surgery. And once you've done that, you can place in any sort of implant that you fancy. What I'm using here is a porex wedge. The wedge sort of tends to give you the additional volume that you want to build up. Um, and if you tend to use barrier sheets here, they sort of give you a little bit of suboptimal outcome. Uh, the porex wedge can be secured with uh, sinoacrylate glue or can be just left in position once you have it just behind the inferior orbital rim. You're seeing glue being used here to secure uh, the wedge. I'm a little old fashioned and I like to keep the porex wedge hugging the orbital floor with the help of glue and it gives you an excellent outcome. So this is a patient who's had absolutely no eyelid surgery, but just the placement of a porex wedge uh, inferiorly. And you can see how beautifully the hypoglobic appearance of the uh, anophthalmic socket has got corrected along with a buildup in the uh, superior sulcus. Another option for patients who have a small implant is to do an autologous fat transfer. Now, again, fat can be harvested from any areas of uh, excess. You could harvest it from the chin and place it in the orbit or from the abdomen or from the buttock or thigh area based on your discussion with the patient. Um, these incisions are very small and are uh, practically insignificant. Um, the technique has a little bit of learning curve and there is some amount of resorption rate of the fat. Um, however, it's, it's uh, very gratifying in patients who need, need minimal improvement in uh, the enophthalmos. So here the fat is being made to separate from the serum component and is finally injected behind the implant using specialized cannula to induce proptosis on table and get an overcorrection of about 30 to 40% with eventually with time settles down to give you a very good uh, correction. So minimal amount of enophthalmos fat transfer is the uh, procedure of choice. Now for patients who do not want any surgical intervention, one quick procedure is just to do a filler injection. This is a child where we are performing a filler injection. This child has congenital clinical anophthalmia and we are doing this instead of doing regular implant exchanges to build up the orbital volume. But this could be done even for any adult patient where uh, the technique of injection is very simple. You could either go transconjunctival or you could even go like your standard vitrobulbar block fashion uh, to inject your filler uh, behind the um, uh, orbital implant. This is one gentleman who's had... Who was Sorry to interrupt, you have to wrap up, please. Yes, wrapping up, just the last slide. Yeah. So here you see a superior sulcus deformity, which has been corrected just by the injection of uh, filler. So in essence, I have spoken to you about the several options available for secondary volume augmentation. I'm going to skip this part in the interest of time. Thank you so much. If there are any questions, I'd uh, be happy to take them. Yeah, uh, I think we will take the questions at the end of the session because we are really short of time. Done. Yeah, thanks for the excellent videos, man. Thank you. Our, thank you. Our next speaker uh, is uh, Dr. Sauri. Dr. Saudi Desai? Yes. Yeah. yeah, please start. Can you see my screen? Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, thank you for the entire BOA and MOS team. Uh, it's been a fantastic program and got every, uh, you know, all the faculties from everywhere, which is a real bonanza. Uh, Sumit, on a personal note, it's uh, been a really good program and I know all the efforts that have gone along with uh, Dr. SH, but still you've done a great job. So uh, I'll be speaking on orbital lymphangioma, the spectrum. Um, okay. So we know that it's a congenital anomaly. Initially, they were known as hematomas, but recently, according to the International Society of Vascular Anomalies, they've been classified as vascular malformations and the Orbital Society also has classified them as vascular malformations of the low-grade type. 75% are seen in the head and neck region and uh, they usually may not be noticeable on birth, uh, uh, maybe very subtly, which is not picked up by the parents, but is picked up more in the first decade or the first two years of life. Uh, commonly, this is seen when the child becomes more active and because of that can present either as a bleed or, or due to upper respiratory tract infections. So uh, they are classified actually based on radiological parameters. So radiologically, they are classified according to um, one is on the sonography and one is on the CTMRI. So they're classified as superficial lesions, which are commonly seen as multiple cystic spaces uh, filled with, uh, you know, which looks like, so this girl has bled also a little bit recently, but light pinkish to dark pinkish lesions, uh, commonly seen in the conjunctival area. Uh, you have, and also maybe involving the lid and the admixa, but primarily the conjunctiva. Then you have deeper lesions involving the orbit. Combined is obviously a mix of both. And complex is involving uh, anywhere outside of the orbit in the head and neck region. And some uh, classifications say that they also involve uh, other parts of the body. Ultrasonographically, which actually is a really a simple tool but works really well, is to know whether they're macrocystic microcystic or mixed. Now here is an example uh, taken from a sonography done by Dr. Deepak Bhatt, which shows macrocystic lesions. And uh, this really is helpful because it helps us plan our diagnosis. Microcystic, you'll see multiple well-defined lesions such as this, which, and as we know, they're all very well interconnected. So what is the goals of management? It's preservation of vision because in cases where there are orbital uh, lesions, you don't want any compression of the nerves. So the primary thing is preservation of vision. It could either be due to compression or causing excessive proptosis, uh, prevention of any amblyopia, and of course, even cosmetic disfigurement because it can affect the child's uh, mental status. Management is, before we go on, uh, they often present in uh, the young, when they start becoming very active, they present with sudden onset proptosis, uh, such as this, and they appear even worse than this, prominent, uh, predominantly with extraocular movement restriction, sometimes a vision drop, pupillary involvement. And in this child, he had had a bleed. He had been coming to me since he was seven, he's nine here. And he also developed something new, which was having pal uh, palatal uh, lesions, which can occur if they are involving the face. And he did have maxillary lesions, but he had a sudden uh, outburst of these and you have to manage it. So some, this is not this child's MRI, but in some patients you'll often see even fluid levels, which is characteristic. One thing you must notice that if you see a feeder vessel, then you have to rethink your diagnosis because you don't commonly see feeder vessels in lymphangiomas. Uh, they are associated with high flow lesions such as hemangiomas. So when there's an acute hemorrhage, you want to treat it, preserve vision, so you need to go in and aspirate it, uh, you know, keep a pressure. And uh, the role of steroids is variable, but I do prefer giving a low dose steroids of 0.5 milligram per kilogram as is based for the child's age uh, for a period of two to four weeks just to decrease the inflammation and to keep the eye quiet. Coming to surgical management, often much before sclerosing therapy was really in vogue, we used to do debulking surgeries. I mean, in my fellowship, that's what I really learned. And uh, as you can see, this girl has a left eye uh, lymphangioma diffuse involving the entire orbit. And you can see there's a light mind. Very constitutional provisions. So, so, so the LOC was supposedly to hold it once again. So, in the globe, you can see that she started getting a vision drop and a vision drop around 612, 624. Wait, but I'm going to hang this one. Hello, hello. 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 H
nine years old and uh, she came with a slight drop in the vision. So even though that they were uh, not classically macrocystic, they were microcystic engulfing the entire orbit, I decided to do a debulking surgery because of involvement of uh, the vision. And we'll, I was very happy with uh, my results. But as you know, you cannot completely excise it. Others, you can damage other tissues. You can only remove what is possible and counsel them that there is a possibility that they will recur as did after she, this is at her at 12 and a half years when she came again with a proptosis and a less, little bit of a conjunctive hemorrhage. And uh, here she's been prepared for a sclerosing therapy. So non-surgical management is intrasclerosing, intralesional sclerosing agents. So what are these and how do they work? They cause irritation of the endothelial lining with inflammation and fibrosis. The first one to be tried many years ago in the 1970s was sodium morioid. And then there was sodium tetradecal sulfate. But the current, uh, you know, uh, 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 agents which are being, uh, being used a lot is bisabinin, which I personally don't use. However, it's known to have good results with lesser inflammation. But I use bleomycin, which I'll be coming to. So bleomycin is an anti-neoplastic antibiotic, which is fermented from streptomyces verticillus, which is a type of fungus. However, the main thing is that it was found when it was being used for pleural effusion that it had this sclerosing property because of which it got an involution and that's how it started being used by head and neck surgeons for lymphangiomas and they saw that they had excellent results. So it's available as a freeze-dried powder. It's 15 international units. Everyone has to have a full workup. Uh, you know, you check their vision, uh, you check document extraocular movements, you please see that they don't have any hypers, uh, you know, allergies or hypersensitivity to other drugs. And basically everyone undergoes a complete ophthalmic and dilated fundus examination. So the recommended dose is, there are enough literature but there is, uh, to provide in the head and neck, but also a lot of good ophthalmic literature, which is now published, especially with uh, uh, Mukherjee et al., uh, you know, Dr. Bipasha has done, Dr. Niravan Bipasha has done, then Dr. Hanavar has done. They've all done a very good job of, you know, publishing this data. So it's available there. So 0.25 to 0.5 international units kilogram body weight. But since it's freeze dyed, you have to reconstitute it with sterile water in equal volumes with lignocaine. We use laryngeal mask anesthesia because it does not take very long, not more than 15 to 20 minutes if you are able to aspirate easily. And you then... 20% of your aspirates, for those who have been doing orbitopalpable cysts, this is something that comes easily. You want to aspirate, you take 20% of that and you calculate the exact volume and then you divide it 50-50 of bleomycin and lignocaine and inject. The advantage is that you can go up to a volume of 5 ml. So even if you aspirate a lot, you can go up. Now, these are primarily recommended for macrocystic lesions. But of course, even macro plus macro, microcystic are now being done along with Admexel as we'll come to. So the procedure involves the uh, identification of the cyst, which is, you know, and they're all interconnected. So once you get the most anterior and the large one, you'll be able to aspirate the entire thing. Keeping the needle in position, you replace it with the amount of bleomycin and inject it. This is a small video clip, but I, I personally was not being able to play it. So I'm going to Actually, uh, one minute remaining, ma'am. Yes, I'll be coming just two, three more slides. So this is the case, second case, which had a significant conjunctival component and a little bit of adnexal. Similarly, uh, we had one macrocystic lesion which aspirated the rest. So these are cases which, you know, are easy to do. You have to monitor the vision postoperatively. We give intravenous antibiotics during the surgery and continue it for two days and then discharge the patient. However, I also give perioperative intravenous steroids. And I continue the patient for two to four weeks on oral steroids in a tapering dose. Uh, our imaging is done at four weeks in the form of MRI. This is the second case where we had a very defined macrocystic lesion and she showed an excellent result, just one, one injection and she did really well. And this is her at three years. So there is a small lesion, but she does not have any significant proptosis. And this is just to show that a patient with a microcystic plus admexin. In admexin, the only difference is you have to inject in multiple places, often like you do intralesional steroids for superficial hemangiomas, away from the actual lesion, but actually injecting them in multiple small doses. And this is the kind of response you get. You can go up to, I have gone maximum four injections at a period of uh, six weeks, but the literature says up to six months. Similarly, this one, finally, they have... 
excellent uh, success rate uh, bleomycin and i almost do not do debulking unless it's really required repeat injections can be done it's quite economical and uh, we had a series of about now uh, 14 to 15 patients uh, with a you know follow off about 3 to 5 years almost and uh, in cases where you cannot do this you have to consider surgical debulking thank you so much thank you dr saudi uh, thank you, ma'am. That was excellent talk. Uh, ma'am, one small question I have is uh, like uh, we all know that uh, sclerosins work very beautifully in this uh, lymphangioma cases. But one case which I saw last month uh, raised a question in my mind. Uh, it was treated somewhere else. Patient had a lymphangioma and there was a proptosis and it was noted that patient has a RAPD also. Though the vision maintained was around 624 to 618. And post injection, uh, uh, proptosis increase or the inflammation, inflammatory reaction increase, and patient lost the whole vision. Like there was already optic neuropathy, but then post injection it increased for certain reason. The inflammation may be more, and patient went uh, PL negative. Now I I want to ask uh, all the panelists on both the backgrounds, medical backgrounds and the medical legal background, that in such a case that where you have a optic neuropathy, color vision defect. RAPD uh, and you know there are chances of loss of vision. So in those cases, the sclerosant is preferable or the surgery or along with the sclerosant, you will prefer doing a lateral canthotomy at the same time. My question is to all the panelists. Savri, you want to take that question? Uh, I'll just add two things which are very important criteria for me. Thanks, Dr. Usha. One is uh, uh, with bleomycin, it's known to cause inflammation. You want to cover with steroids. Uh, we give intraoperatively. But I'm very clear about my indications. Uh, unless it's cosmetically so disfiguring, uh, I'm not going to chase uh, eye which is not looking so cosmetically disfigured if there is not a vision involvement. So if there is vision involvement uh, or pupillary involvement, then that's our first criteria. And having said that, you need to choose your cases with a good imaging or... Uh, and yes, we do counsel the patients that there can be severe inflammation and uh, that there is a small chance of loss of vision. I think my only thing that I want to add last is that though there is a very set criteria and enough literature to prove you can give full dose, I maybe tend to underdose and give it in two to three injections, especially for a slightly younger age group. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. We like that. I think that's a, that's a very good point. I think the bottom line is counseling. One, we are very sure that we're going to take up cases which, with compromised vision. So we also need to understand that there's going to be a lot of inflammation. So we can augment with steroids and then uh, probably do the injections and then eventually explain to the patient. But counseling preoperatively or pre-injection is a mandatory event that we should uh, spend time with the patient explaining the entire scenario and the outcomes as well. I do agree with you, Sabri. Thanks for that. And I think that was a very good compilation of cases and very contextual. So we understand what to do and when to do. Thanks a lot. Just a small addition, if I can make. Uh, so we recently compiled our series and it is now available on uh, PubMed. That is in our uh, 69 eyes uh, bleomycin sclerotherapy. And the complication that you mentioned of loss is something that we've seen in only two patients where they didn't lose complete vision. But in retrospect, these patients had mixed vascular malformations. So pre-operative imaging, like Savri mentioned, is an absolute uh, essential. And I go completely out, I get a Doppler done, I get a CTMR, angio if required done, to make sure that you know there isn't any uh, uh, mixed malformation, especially the CAMS uh, spectrum, where you see cerebrofacial uh, metameric syndrome. You're likely to see multiple vascular malformations. And these are the patients which tend to do poorly with sclerotherapy and have a lot of tense orbit post-surgery. So doing a simultaneous canthotomy in such patients is uh, a good idea. Okay. Thank you so much, ma'am. That was really helpful. Uh, Usha, ma'am, you can go ahead with the overview of our better tumors. Yeah, I think uh, Dr. Ravindra Mohan is not there, so I will yes. take the next uh, topic. It will be the overview of orbital tumors. Very short time to go through the entire uh, range of tumors, but I'll just uh, quickly run through the common tumors that we come across. Dermoid is the most common uh, tumor that we come across, in, uh, especially in pediatric age group. You can see that this is a patient with a proptosis and correspondingly superior, superior laterally, you can see a 
well uh, circumscribed tumor and it is along the suture line so you obviously know here you see a lateral swelling which corresponds to a nicely circumscribed tumor which is the dermoid again here you can see in the medial aspect there is a, pro a prominence and then you can see a corresponding and a well circumscribed tumor so you can have dermoids at any of the locations it could be conspicuous or it could be just buried deep in the orbit as well the next common thing that we come across especially the neuronal tumors is the neurofibroma where you see a nice intraconal lesion but without any contrast enhancement and these are very hard tumors and there is a resistance to retropulsion and then definitely this needs a wider uh, approach wherein you might have to do a lateral orbitotomy in the form of a bony osteotomy to be done and then you can excise these tumors here there is a component of visual compromise as well so you will have to be watchful about the way it progresses and you will have to immediately remove these tumors schwannoma is another condition where we really have a, a difficulty in approaching these tumors but you can access it through the lateral approach and excise the tumor in total unless it's posteriorly located or towards the apex sometimes it's just so cystic it could burst out but you will have to remove the tumor in toto in order to make sure that it doesn't recur and you can always see a prominence with the visual compromise often and these, this is when the patients come to us coming to neurofibromatosis i'll have to mention that glioma is the most common uh, association with neurofibromatosis in a glioma we often uh, have to uh, resort to either managing it surgically if the vision is completely lost without removing the eyeball just excising the tumor it's a fusiform swelling that you see al along the optic nerve but then in this particular scenario there is an absence of the roof and this is a common uh, scenario that we come across and this needs multiple uh, disciplines to be tackled and here is another uh, condition which is a capillary hemangioma here though it is a capillary hemangioma it's a vision threatening situation so it requires immediate management in the form of intralesional steroids or a combination of intralesional oral steroids or uh, any other uh, drugs that would uh, decrease the size sometimes these uh, lesions do not disappear so you may may have to go in for a uh, you might have to go in for a surgical excision coming to the cavernous hemangiomas these are conditions which are very very easy to be removed surgically not often compromising the vision but sometimes occasionally it can cause occasional blurring of vision but there is a definite prominence and these are tumors which can be excised easily through any of the approaches which we'll be discussing in a minute meningiomas uh, is always uh, a, a condition which arises from the optic nerve sheath and it's very typical on the imaging you can either track it down on a ct but mri is mandatory for us to intervene surgically and these sometimes what happens is these conditions cause a visual compromise not to the extent of a complete vision loss but in order to uh, preserve the vision we can sometimes debulk the tumor what i do is i just shave off the tumor debulk it but if the vision is compromised completely then we'll have to go in for an excision this is another case of the optic nerve sheath meningioma now the other malignant tumors which could be arising locally are the sarcomas which we commonly come across in children or adenocarcinomas from the lacrimal gland and then retinoblastomas with extensions into the orbit which are not still very uncommon these days so this is a rhabdomyosarcoma after a biopsy you can uh, treat this these patients with either radiotherapy radiotherapy and chemotherapy and they respond very well adenoid cystic carcinomas are a challenge for us to treat they can uh, start off with the chemotherapy after an excision uh, incisional biopsy and uh, or sometimes you can excise it totally and then uh, subject them to uh, radiation retinoblastoma actually is a big topic to be dealt with but there is an often an extension into the orbit and this is again i mentioned that it's not a very uncommon scenario in our part of the country the uh, there are other malignant tumors surrounding the orbit especially from the sinuses you have frontal ethmoidal maxillary tumors extending into the uh, orbit and then you do have tumors like squamous cell carcinoma basal cell sebaceous gland from the lids entering into the orbit and of course intracranial meningiomas here is a case of a sebaceous gland carcinoma which is extended into the orbit here is a squamous cell carcinoma again infiltrating into the orbit and then you have the sphenoid wing meningioma and you have mucosils which can compress the orbit and cause a visual threat as well so this is a frontal mucosil you can see the proptosis the globe being pushed down here you have the ethmoidal mucosils you can see on either side you have the ethmoidal mucosil 
compressing the orbit and it can cause a visual compromise. Rarely the ethmoidal mucosils cause a visual compromise. It's often the uh, bony tumors which cause a visual compromise, especially this fibrous dysplasia, as you can see in this. There is no evidence of any lesion, but then there is a subtle uh, fullness in this area and this uh, is disproportionate to what you see on the imaging. Then you have the bony tumors like the osteoid osteomas, which again cause a compression on the optic nerve, which requires immediate intervention in the form of a surgical removal. And then you have very subtle tumors like the maxillary antral tumors, which can just cause a hypertropia in this particular scenario. If you can see, it's just causing a hypertropia. But then there is a big tumor in the maxillary uh, sinus, which extends into the orbit and requires a surgical clearance. The other tumors like lymphoma, leukemia, and eosinophilic granuloma are quite common. Lymphomas you see in the form of a salmon patch. It can present as a salmon patch. Or yeah, on imaging, you will see a lesion, which is on palpation, you can see a firm a mass. You can palpate a firm mass. which And on imaging, you can see a lesion that grows along the bony contour, which is very classical of a lymphoma. And uh, this is one scenario which I'd like to place on a record that these are the tumors. Pa patients come to us anemic, pale, but with the proptosis, both eyes. And this just requires a peripheral smear and you'll know that it's a leukemic de deposit. And please do not do any biopsy. The mistake that we used to make earlier is do a biopsy. But then now the recommendation is you just have to do a peripheral smear, send the patient to the hemato-oncologist. Now let's look at what we used to do earlier for an adenoid cystic carcinoma. Because it's an adenoid cystic carcinoma, on imaging, you get to see a bony uh, defect and the patient complains of a pain. This was what we used to do earlier. And even now, I would advocate this uh, surgical removal because you need to remove the tumor in toto and also ensure that the bony part is actually provided for histopathological examination when needed. This is another scenario where you do, a, in, in a case of meningioma, I do a re incision, that is a lattecanthal incision, remove the bone and then excise the tumor. That is, you take out the optic nerve men sheet meningioma and you can see that the tumor can be excised. So it will be probably from behind the globe to the apex, you excise the tumor in total. You can do it in total. Sometimes the tumor is so big that you'll have to excise it piecemeal like as I'm doing it right now. And uh, you'll have to ensure a complete removal to ensure that there is no recurrence. That's one portion and that's the next portion that I'm trying to excise. And you can replace the bone and uh, do the closure. Now this is a very simple uh, approach where you do an external approach to remove the dermoid. And often, uh, you'll have to remove these dermoids in total because dermoids have a tendency to recur and they are more aggressive when they recur. And uh, dermoids definitely require an imaging to make sure that there is no bony erosion or infiltration. So you have to excise it in total. This is another scenario where you see a patient uh, with elevation deficiency. And this is the imaging which shows a lesion in the superior medial aspect where you have to uh, excise uh, through the crease incision and uh, you go in, use blunt instruments to uh, delineate. The surgical plane is very, very important and ensure that you do not traumatize the surrounding structures. And uh, I like to use this lens spatula, which we used to use for the uh, extra capsular cat cataract extraction. I'm sure there are a lot available in the market in the uh, old uh, rooms. So you can use that to dissect out very gently and excise the tumor in total. Uh, that's the lesion which you will, that turned out to be a schwannoma. You can see some yellowish granules which are typical and that can be closed and the lip crease incision can be comfortably closed. I'm very sorry to interrupt, but uh, yeah, time is running. Okay, so that's the inferior orbitotomy where you just have to uh, do a transconjunctival approach. I'm trying to cover uh, Dr. Ravindra Mohan's uh, talk as well, which is a minimally invasive uh, technique. So here you take the transconjunctival approach to excise the uh, cavernous hemangioma. Next one, again, 
a very minimal uh, incision, small incision, lateral canthal. And you can see the large tumor here, just behind the globe, but it just easily slips out uh, and uh, it can be conveniently removed. Again, that's the lesion and uh, it's a very small incision that we have made in the lateral campus. Now, this is another large tumor. Again, it's encroaching, but you can see that again, it can be very easily removed through a canthal approach. This is the last video I'll be stopping after this. Again, it's a very small incision, but you can remove the tumor in total, provided you do a complete, very good dissection and uh, make sure that you so it is like a difficult labor but then uh, these lesions tend to come out very easily so that's the lesion i'm going to just skip the thing so it comes out quite easily and uh, there's a large lesion which is coming out that's in total it comes out and that turned out to be a, a myotherioma. Thank you so much. I think this is all I can cover in this uh, eight minutes, but I must place on record a huge thanks to Dr. Ahini, Dr. Sumit Lahani, Lahani sir, and Dr. Santosh, and all the people who have been behind uh, uh, this, uh, organizing this event. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. It was a really beautiful atlas, I can say, of the various orbital tumors and surgical videos. Yeah, thank you so much. Our next speaker is Dr. Preeti. We'll be talking on orbital decompression. Dr. Preeti is there? Yeah. Uh, good evening to all of you. Uh, can you see my slides here? Yes, yes. They are visible. Yeah. So uh, thank you very much for having me over. At the outset, I'd like to thank uh, Sumit and uh, Dr. Lahane and Ragini ma'am and Santosh sir for having me uh, over and giving me this opportunity. I will be speaking on orbital decompression and what's different in the past few years that we do in this surgery. Now, um, I have no financial disclosures to make. Uh, there are changing trends which we see in indications, the concepts, the surgical tools as well as there is increasing awareness of fat being the first wall for decompression. Basically, the principle is you expand the orbital space by widening the bony orbit and removal of the excess of fat. So indications are different in the active and inactive stage. In the active stage, most common indication is exposure keratopathy and optic neuropathy, whereas we see more patients now with congestive orbitopathy where the eye looks red, but it's not inflamed and the patient has pressure pain because of vascular congestion. The commonest indication that I see in my practice is cosmetically disfiguring proptosis like this patient, and rarely this patient who had globe luxation three episodes before she came to us for decompression. There are some extended indications like craniosynostosis, malar hypoplasia, and some cases where there is unilateral myopia, like in this patient, she had a problem of wearing glasses. The glasses used to rub on the globe, she had ptosis and exotropia because of amblyopia. You can see the huge size of the globe and she was happy just with a small decompression so that she can wear her glasses comfortably. Now, preoperatively, when you see the imaging, you must distinguish between a fat predominant disease and a muscle predominant disease. You can also do that clinically when you press on the globe. Uh, if you have less resistance to retropulsion, you know it is a fat predominant disease, in which case you know that your effect of decompression is better and also you can retract the globe more easily, the surgery is easier, and chances of new onset diplopia is lesser as compared to this kind of a patient with muscle predominant disease. Now, there are several approaches which have been described in the literature, but I would uh, like to just uh, highlight what is commonly used. So we use the skin approach, a superior lift please approach for the, superior, for the lateral wall, the inferior conjunctival approach for the inferior wall, and a transcarancular approach for the medial wall. Now, endoscopic approach I prefer when the orbit is inflamed in the active stage or when the patient has vascular compromise like he's diabetic or a smoker, where you don't want to go transorbitally in order not to have a vascular compromise. Now, there have been various discussions on what wall to decompress and the decision making is difficult. The general dictum is that each wall causes a two millimeter of reduction. 
but i see that it all depends on the patient's anatomy if the patient has a lot of fat then you can have even a 4 or 5 mm decompression just with fat decompression and in some patients if you have a lot of bone on the lateral wall a large diploid space a longer wall you can have even 5 mm to 6 mm decompression with the lateral wall what is generally followed now is when you want a 2 or 3 mm proptosis reduction you can just do fat which is considered as the first wall for decompression and when you need a 3 to 6 mm reduction you can add the lateral wall first then followed by medial wall and then the floor now why we do this is because of the statistics we see that maximum chances of new onset diplopia is in inferomedial decompression where the entire muscle cone shifts inferomedially post operatively and causes new onset diplopia and it is the least with lateral wall as well as fat decompression now this is a, one of my older patients where i used to do this kind of an inferomedial decompression but we used to leave behind this inferomedial strut so that the chances of diplopia are much lesser now this deep lateral wall decompression the con the concept was um, uh, 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 was uh, elaborated in the literature by dr goldberg and that's what i follow he identified three areas of bone in the lateral wall of the orbit which are thick bones and decompressing this bone gives a good um, a decompressive effect so he described them as the lacrimal keyhole the basin of the sphenoid bone as well as uh, i mean the door jam of the sphenoid and the basin of the inferior orbital fissure and you can achieve up to a 5 to 6 mm reduction if you do the complete decompression of the lateral wall so i'll now go through my patients this is one of the patient who came to us with cosmetically disfiguring proptosis you can see she has a fat predominant disease she's also a high myo she has good thickness of the lateral wall and whenever you see a, a patient's scan pre operatively you must see the location of the piriform plate the location of the fovea ethmoidalis because your anterior cerebral artery lies just there and also the aeration of the sinuses and also the location of drainage of the maxillary sinus which is usually in the anterior part of the inferomedial strut so if you compromise on the anterior part of the inferomedial strut we find that the maxillary sinus drainage gets affected and the patient has chronic sinusitis and sometimes the orbit implodes causing a future inophthalmos so the pre operative assessment of coronal scans is very very important now in this patient we see that she had a fat predominant disease so i decided to do a three wall decompression because she had also a hyperopia and i wanted the globe to come down a little bit so i chose the superior lid crease approach for the lateral deep lateral wall decompression the incision is made on the skin crease and then the dissection is done up to the periosteum i am incising on the subbrow fat now to reach the periosteum now the periosteum should be exposed right from the supraorbital canal to the lateral canthus that wide an exposure you need to access the orbit and the periosteum is incised about 4 to 5 mm from the orbital margin like this and then the periosteum should be lifted atomatically in such a way so that you don't have premature uh, uh, expulsion of the orbital fat so once the exposure is good you start creating the lacrimal keyhole with a high speed cutting drill now this uh, creates a nice uh, uh, socket uh, or a space for the lacrimal gland to then settle inside the orbit and it also gives you some uh, good access into the orbit to go into the um, deeper uh, areas like the superior orbital fissure now once you enter uh, and make this lacrimal keyhole you move towards the superior orbital fissure now this is the lateral wall where i you can go full thickness you leave behind the rim and you can reach up to the temporalis fascia and you can even open the temporalis fascia now i am going to go to the sphenoid door jam that is the thick bone in the greater wing of the sphenoid and you can see once that is done such a big area is created and this can give you a very good decompression now i use a bone wax mostly to control the diploid space bleeding and you can see the change in the bone direction once you reach the superior orbital fissure wherein i start using the diamond drill then and here i am now removing the bone in front of the temporalis fascia once that is done the periosteum is opened and then the fat decompression is done superior laterally you should be careful not to damage the ciliary ganglion otherwise you will have pupillary dilatation now coming to the medial wall you do a transcarenicular approach you can see that i have taken almost 10 to 12 mm incision 
and then you go and enter posterior to the posterior lacrimal crest so that you don't damage the lacrimal uh, apparatus. And I like to make the first opening right posteriorly at the posterior most edge of the thin bone so that you can then come anteriorly with your arm gels. And uh, this bleeds a lot because the sinus mucosa bleeds. You must make sure that you remove all the sinus mucosa to control the bleeding. You must not go superior to the frontoethmoid suture, otherwise you will have intracranial complications. And you remove all the bone right from the attachment of the horn mus muscle anteriorly to posteriorly right in front of the annulus of zero. Now we leave the posterior part of the inferomedial, uh, no, you can remove the posterior part of the inferomedial strut. The anterior 10 to 11 millimeter is left behind. Once you remove the posterior part of the strut, you have a further decompression effect. Now I'm removing, opening the periosteum and I'll show you the technique of fat decompression. Here I'm doing it under direct visualization under a microscope. So you can see all the vessels very clearly. And I first open up the septa in between the fat and then just suck with a suction tip and keep cutting as the fat comes out. A lot of fat I see in the medial orbit and I like to remove a lot of fat from the medial orbit also in addition to the interolateral uh, traditional approach. Preeti, one minute is remaining. Yes. And now we go on to the floor. I'm doing a swinging eyelid approach and uh, you reach the inferior orbital rim. Now in this patient, since I want the eyeball to come down, I'm removing some of the anterior bone also. Otherwise, at least 10 millimeter of bone, uh, the anterior part of the floor should be left behind. You put your suction tip right up to the posterior maxillary wall, lift the bone so that you do a complete decompression up to the palatine bone. And many surgeons remove the palatine bone also with a chisel and uh, hammer. Now, um, I do not de-roof the infraorbital uh, canal uh, because it causes paresthesia. So that is the infraorbital nerve and that is left behind. And then you move on to the basin of the inferior orbital fissure, which is the zygoma uh, in anterior to the inferior orbital fissure. So this is the content of the inferior orbital fissure. I go anterior to that and uh, you will reach the buccal fat as well as the maxillary sinus mucosa. So uh, you can see that this patient improved beautifully and her hyperglobus uh, is also corrected. The lower lid retraction is corrected and we achieved a 10 millimeter reduction in proptosis. Now this patient who had a luxation of globe also, uh, here she has a very well aerated sinus and she has huge amount of fat in the orbit. And so I decided to do only a two wall decompression along with fat. And you can see 11 millimeter of proptosis reduction just with that surgery. She's one week post-op here, just after suture removal, and she has a tremendous improvement. Now, uh, recent technology involves use of navigation as well as pneumatic drill. Uh, navigation helps you in the initial phases to learn, I would say, the anatomy, because you know exactly what are the structures. You can identify them during the surgery. You know exactly how much bone is left behind. Otherwise, it does not uh, add any further advantage, but it is a very useful learning tool. And now we have the ultrasonic aspirator, which is just like the FACO probe, wherein you have the irrigation and it uses ultrasonic energy, which is much safer and it, uh, it is safeguards your soft tissue. So this is the ultrasonic aspirator. And uh, uh, you can achieve a very good decompression. However, it is expensive instrument, but it is safe in the hand in the earlier cases when you're learning. And it gives you a good visualization because you have irrigation along with your Cutting. And here I'm using navigation along with the ultrasonic aspirator. So these were the two new technologies that are used in decompression. And these are some of my patients. Uh, some of the pictures have been sent by patients, so they are not comparable, but they have achieved a good reduction in proptosis. So, so to summarize, uh, we have discussed the changing indications in orbital decompression. We see more of cosmetic decompressions now. There have been changing trends in the number of walls of decompression and the fat decompression being considered as the first wall. And there has been some advancement in surgical tools in visualization and use of microscope. Thank you very much for your kind hearing. Thank you, ma'am. That was uh, very extensive and wonderful talk about decompression. Any comments or uh, questions from uh, panelists? Yeah. Do we have time to just discuss? Yes, yes, ma'am. Ma yeah. As as for imaging, it's like an overlap.
and the tracking of the central point of fitness is a great tool for following up on the ஸ்கேன் uh and what we need to remember is in ct uh, when there is a foreign body especially a wooden foreign body it it cannot be just one time it has to be a sequential imaging and it's often to be associated with the clinical findings there's often a sinus there's a fistula there's pus pouring from there so that part has to be emphasized i think that's something that we need to remember and a question to tarjani was uh in case of uh, dermis fat graft have you come across fat hypertrophy especially in children uh, and not, not so much ma'am i've seen more melts than hypertrophy actually in dermis fat graft to be very frank okay. so not really a lot of hypertrophy in children and as it is as a uh, sort of a protocol uh, for most children here um, most of the pediatric cases would be knee nucleation and as a protocol at lvpi we've been following the placement of a pmma implant so not many cases of uh, pediatric dfts that i have on my uh, okay this is uh, mainly for patients who have had not had a primary implant and those patients come and we end up doing a dermis fat graft and sometimes we do see the fat hypertrophy in which case we'll have to go and revise i think i mean you might you can correct me if i'm wrong the other question that i was also uh, having for you is in case of multiple surgeries what is your see the patient comes to you with multiple surgeries having done elsewhere whatsoever what's your first choice in a contracted socket i generally tend to assess them based on surface and volume and uh, uh, whatever is the missing element i sort of tend to address that now having said that if there are multiple socket surgeries done for surface augmentation that's the situation where you would have a lot of contracted socket i try to be very minimalistic whatever little bit i can do to sort of enhance by the use of fillers or probably some eyelid interventions like heart palate mucosal grafts to correct that severe entropion that is also there with uh, contracted socket and optical illusions with glasses i sort of go with a combination of these things rather than put my hands in a socket which has been operated many times yeah certainly having said that i was just wondering uh, because you have been working a lot on these sockets So my question to you, just for us to feel better, all the panelists and the uh, uh, listeners to feel better, what percentage of cases have you given up saying that no, I'm not going to do anything further with this socket, and have a, a spectacle mounted prosthesis or whatsoever? That would be a very small percentage. I've definitely tried doing some intervention or the other. The other thing that I wanted to mention was the use of a five FU and a steroid cocktail, which I would like very much uh, pre-surgery in such severely contracted sockets. Wonderful. So, it, which means all of us have to work harder to achieve that. The other important aspect I wanted to uh, highlight when the blood fracture was, there was a mention about uh, uh, the uh, sections. it has to be axial sagittal and coronal views we need to have and the size of the cuts also have to be more refined if i'm not mistaken i don't know if i don't remember uh, the uh, whether uh, he had mentioned about it but i think we need to have all three views the axial coronal and the sagittal as far as the fractures injuries or foreign bodies are concerned i think we need to have that in place so now coming to uh, mucor i think that's the buzzword now i mean i we are not sure we are not seeing that many here probably we are not uh, facing that uh, kind of a crisis yet and we are not far away from it uh we are in the southern most part so we still haven't got so many but what i understand is it is reassuring both savri and uh, uh moreka were saying that it is uh, not so bad in terms of treatment but i just like to question uh, dr savri about why don't you prefer the retrobulbar uh, amphotericin or did i miss it or did uh, did you from last year what we saw from when it all started and i probably sunil and a lot of ramesh and all and even uh, and uh, dr hani they've all been seeing 
uh, a lot of these i think even mangesh uh, we've all been seeing sorry even tarjani we are actually all doing so working on it the thing is that last year's mucor was a whole different ball game it was it was we were seeing the age group was 45 50 plus it was coming very traditionally sinuses orbits doing its usual thing that it does but post covid this one is I, i mean like i just jokingly but very sadly said to someone it's almost like it's taken on an alien a morphological thing and it presents sometimes in orbit no sinuses sometimes in the sinuses right in the ethmoids so when we are dealing with this what has evolved over the last two years i think for a lot of us working here is that yes you can't end up exenterating also the age group has shifted from 45 50 plus to 20 to 35 year olds which is i mean it's distressing to have to exenterate you know people who are just like about to start their life and are going to be bred on us of the family so now retrospectively as we are going over the data we are realizing that we don't want to exaggerate there are certain parameters tarjini is putting a whole big data together which are trying to publish which is we are trying to go back and say that okay so anterior orbit mid orbit with maybe medial rectus inferior rectus don't need to exaggerate like we used to think uh, orbital fat stranding not need to necessarily exaggerate conventional amphoterism be maybe does not work but unfortunately people do not cannot afford liposomal but liposomal is the way to go and systemic does hold off a lot of the orbital involvement so it's not that we aren't doing it but i think with retro orbital amphoterism be we just figuring out which cases are going to work because i for one actually question this very same thing when we were having our discussion with our team uh, in the hospital that why can't we just be bold and give each and every patient who comes with orbital involvement but somebody has to be ready to bell that cat and i guess we have to put our heads together and come with certain parameters say that you can because if we say it's okay i feel we are going to may may just let out a different element altogether but then since you're seeing a lot of it I think uh, Tarjini and you probably would be seeing. I I don't know the rest of the panel is also here. Would be seeing a lot of it. So probably you should do something about. He just told me yesterday he's seen seventy cases. Who is this? Amesh. Oh so, my! Oh, he's yeah. also quite seeing a lot in JJ. Sunil is seeing. I'm sure Mangesh must be also seeing because for some reason from the central part of Maharashtra we are seeing a lot of them. Right. Okay, so I think you should put it on a paper as to how to go about, because you have the maximum number of cases, and you can pull in and say. And we are not very far from it; cases are on the increase, and uh, we are having a lot of our. I hope not. Uh, crossing fingers, but we'll have to face the reality. So, so you mean to say you're still on the trial about uh, the retrobal bar amphotericity? I'm, I'm giving it. We are giving it. but we not we only recently started giving it tarjani has already tried i assume sunil has also tried ramesh i think has tried okay. i have given two cases two to three cases i am scheduled to actually give two more tomorrow okay okay but these people have already started trying them okay. i think thank you i think that's a very uh, useful tip for us yeah sunil sir want to say something so you need to unmute yourself Sunil, you need to unmute yourself. I like to add a couple of things here. Uh, uh, my first exaltation I had done under Dr. Lahane in 1998. So uh, Lahane sir had said, uh, Sunil, uh, you will have to do this some day or the other. These things are going to come back, and uh, they are going to be there because people are using antibiotics and antifungal left right and center. So he is he was almost prophetic when he said that in 1998. Today is on here, Bharpur is there. so uh, that is called uh, uh, you know far sightedness and uh, from from there to this i mean uh, sumit's uh, uh, paper is excellent uh, uh, which has been published in the igo uh, he's analyzed the whole thing so i i was very happy about it there are two points that i wanted to note here is that most of these patients of corona right now are coming with an acute kidney injury and what is happening is that most of them have a hypoproteinemia because in the injury you get protein urea Now, when proteinuria occurs, your creatinine and BUN will not rise. So you have to see your cystatin C. So you see your cystatin C clearance ratio, and then you realize that this patient is in renal damage. 
even before your creatinine and albumin and uh, BUN shows abnormality. In such cases, to give the liposomal uh, uh, amphotericin uh, intravenous or to give it a, as a systemic condition for something which is local does not make sense if you can give it locally. You, you give a bolus locally, it makes a whole of a lot of sense. The second thing is that most of these patients are coming with polymicrobial uh, infections. So they are in the ICU. So they have uh, enterococcus fecalis in their urine. They've got candida oris in their urine. Their tracheal cultures are uh, gram-negative ELDS uh, producers. So my uh, ex-wife used to be microbiology. She is a person who's dealt with uh, Clostridium difficile infections, drug resistant, as well as uh, EL extended spectrum uh, beta lactamase producers. Now what happens is that because of this, these patients have already got a lot of antibiotics. They've got a lot of antibiotics. Their kidneys have already been fired by uh, this. And then they come to us with mucor. You just don't have a chance to give a, a systemic uh, antifungal. Now, for that reason, the uh, isavaconazole is something like a step down. So the amphotericin doesn't cause, uh, causes a lot of side effects. The isavaconazole does not. Secondly, that uh, rescue, I mean, if it is not sensitive to amphotericin, the isavaconazole is uh, somehow sensitive. So amphotericin reserved for a local, uh, this thing makes a lot of sense. Besides this, when you look at COVID, there are multiple aspects in COVID. I mean, uh, having done 1,000 CME credit hours, I and mean, this is again thanks to Lahane sir. I mean, he and me used to sit and uh, read uh, Duke Elder's 14 volumes uh, uh, three times over my three years I've read with him. So uh, this has become a habit that till three o'clock in the night, I'm, I'm doing 1,000 uh, CMEs over the last one and a half years. Now, when you look at various aspects, the heart is involved. So you have an electrolyte imbalance. You have a kidney involvement. So the heart is involved because an organ crossed off. And then you have electrolyte imbalance. So when you consider all of these together, the patients have a, this thing. In, in fact, me, I didn't get COVID, but my heart rate was 22. I mean, for, for two days, my heart rate was 22. And I wrote to my friends and all, okay, this, bye boss, this is like 22. I mean, this is incompatible with life. And then I just added up uh, steroid, my uh, ECG is low volume, low voltage. So you correct your uh, uh, electrolytes and everything is fine. So giving uh, amphotericin destroys your kidney and again your electrolyte imbalance comes in. So dealing with this in that aspect, a local treatment, if you can focus more on local, it makes a lot of sense. It makes a whole lot of sense. And the amount of uh, um, success that we've got, I mean, uh, with uh, treating this locally, we'll have to publish this very fast. Uh, I was su suggesting to Akshay that the whole group get together, make it a national group, make it a mucormycosis study. Savri muted. Savri muted. Make it a national I study and we'll tell it, people. I think the main thing is that it's systemic plus local. Let's not deviate from... Yes, yes, yes. See, the whole point is what you can, you can somehow have a pulmonary aspergillosis and not mucor. You will have a urinary candidiasis where you need a voriconazole and voriconazole is, uh, doesn't work with uh, this thing or you can need a my, uh, uh, mycofungin. So you want to give amphotericin systemically where you actually need uh, uh, my, mycofungin or uh, uh, voriconazole. I mean, everything goes haywire. So what we've done well, is think in which there is bladder involvement, you give uh, betadine washes and the candida oris is gone. Yeah, so well, I think it's very well argued. Both of you have a point to make. I think some of the cases, it really suits doing a, a systemic and some of them are very yes. specific. Yes. Tailor made. Really Tailor well. made. Thanks for that. It really helps us and uh, we, are, we can now be prepared to deal with cases. Thank you so much. Thank I think you. it's very good that you put forward your presentation. It's really opening eyes and uh, Sabri, uh, we take your point as well. I think it's... Very clear. I have to thank Dr. Just... for this. I, 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 I hope he yeah. says a couple of words. <laughs> Ma'am, can I ask one uh, question? Yeah. Yeah. Ma'am, do we have some kind of protection in Tamil Nadu? We don't have that many cases. At exactly. least I have yes. <laughs> it's temperature or I don't know. It's wild. The weather is very, very chaotic. Yes. We had rains this morning. It was so hot early in the morning and mid morning it was raining heavily. Maybe it's being washed off. I don't know. But we thankfully are not seeing so many mucors. But we're seeing, yeah, we're not have, seeing so many. This presentation is really helpful for us. I know. I, I think we'll all have to be prepared. And uh, Preeti is more closer towards. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, thank you. Nani, sir, can you please unmute yourself? Yes, 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 yes. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Dr. Kim and every everybody uh, who who are, who have taken part in this. And I'm very happy, Sunil. Everybody who has uh, really presented very well, and I was uh, 
listening to all the presentation because one one time i was an oculoplastic surgeon but uh, because of sumit now i am not oculoplastic surgeon he has removed me I just now uh, whenever the patient comes i will i say the refer to sumit so i think uh, thank you very much and i appreciate the efforts of sumit and dr agini uh, the sopnes and dr baba this all apna pritam yes, so they have done uh, and also the parikshit so they have done wonderful job and i think the this is the uh, last session in aculoplasty thank you very much thank you sir and thank you slowly um, actually we really happy to have it so we is handed over to the right hands you <laughs> <laughs> been a fantastic session thank you all we all enjoyed it kashi thank you for giving asking people to keep to time thank you <laughs> yeah thank you everyone thank you all bye thank you thank you everyone good night bye bye, bye. 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 bye.